The Persona series is one of my favorite franchises in all of gaming. So much so that I've spent the past few years analyzing and critiquing every individual game, and this video is the culmination of all of that. Some edits were made to make the transitions between videos more natural. Chapters were also included to make jumping around to any review easier. The last thing I want to address is the video order. This compilation is ordered by the initial release date of these videos, with the only exception being the Persona 5 analysis, which is now the last video on this list. I feel as though the most in-depth video in this compilation works much better better as a finale than some random spin-off title. And fun fact is how I initially wanted to end the Persona retrospective, so think of this as a way for me to finally get what I wanted. With all that said, thank you so much for the support, and I hope you enjoy the show. The Persona series has been a mainstay in the JRPG genre for over 25 years, but has only begun to receive recognition in the West with the release of Persona 5 back in 2017. Since then, the main protagonist of Persona 5 made into Smash Brothers Ultimate as a guest fighter, and a slew of spin-offs and re-releases have been populating the franchise ever since. Like, too many fucking spin-offs, please stop. The modern incarnation of the Persona series is vastly different than what came before it. Starting with Persona 3, the series went from a more traditional JRPG to a slice of life dungeon crawling hybrid that has a huge focus on your in-game social life. Persona 3 quickly became the sleeper hit PS2 game back when it came out in North America, and a lot of new fans are probably wondering if this game is still worth playing. That's the question I'll be answering today when I take a deep dive into Persona 3's definitive edition, Persona 3 Fest whatever the hell fest means. One quick note before we get started, Persona 3 is a very plot heavy game. There will be a section of the video dedicated to talking about the major themes as well as the social links throughout the game. I'll also be showing off the game as a whole. This includes fusion mechanics, dungeon design, bosses, the works. So if you do not wish to be spoiled, please stop watching the video now and come back once you experience the game for yourself. If you just want to watch the video anyway, I appreciate it and I'll do my best to do the game justice. So sit back and relax because this is gonna be a long one. A very important thing worth noting is that none of the Persona games are directly connected in their plot lines. The most we'll get is little winks and nods to other games in the series. As such, you don't need to worry about knowing any other game in the series to jump in. You play as a high school student who recently transferred back to their hometown after many years of being moved around to different cities. For the sake of referring to the protagonist as something other than the protagonist, I'll be calling him Minato Arisato since that was the name given to him in the Persona 3 manga, and I like the name more than Makoto Yuki. Anyways, while Minato is walking to his new dorm, he begins to experience something that is known as the Dark Hour. During this time, most people are turned into coffins and don't experience anything. The few unlucky people who don't go through an hour of a twisted version of our own reality, where normal buildings turn to massive towers, shadows roam the streets to prey on helpless people, and worst of all, the electricity goes out. Minato manages to make it to the dormitory without encountering any shadows and is greeted by a small child. The child makes him sign a contract that state Minato will take full responsibility of his own actions. The boy disappears as the dark hour ends and Minato seemingly forgets the events that just transpired. The next few days go by like normal for Minato. He meets his dorm mates Yukari Takiba, a classmate, and Mitsuru Kurijo, the student council president. Minato begins to grow more accustomed to his new school life as he begins to make new friends and become more acquainted with the area. One night, during the dark hour, a massive shadow appears near the dorm and begins to attack. Mitsuru and the other student named Akihiko try to fend off the creature while Yukari attempts to escort Minato to safety. The two end up hiding on the rooftop of the dormitory, but they aren't safe for long as another massive shadow attacks the two on the roof. Yukari, in self-defense, pulls out her gun. Before she can pull the trigger, the monster knocks Yukari away, causing her to drop the gun on the floor. The shadow begins to approach the two, preparing for the kill. The voice of the young boy that made Minato sign the contract rings in his head to pick up the gun. Minato slowly trembles and sweats as he points the gun to his own head. His breathing begins to get heavy heavier as the music fades out and a loud heartbeat rings. Suddenly, everything goes silent. And then... Persona. Thou art I, and I am thou. From the sea of thy soul I come up. I am Orpheus, master of strings. As we suspected. If you're human, then this would have piqued your interest enough to at least be interested in playing the game. This will be the last warning, there are spoilers from here on out. This creature that Minato summoned is called a Persona. A Persona is the manifestation of someone's personality. A Persona will take the form of deities and aid the user in battle. 
The gun that used to summon a persona is not actually a gun, it is, in fact, a fake. The idea behind using a gun, or an evoker as it's called, is that the user needs to accept death of their own mortality in order to achieve their potential, which is why the act of summoning a persona is very gruesome, in this game anyways. As it turns out, the students that are in the dorm Minato is staying at are a part of a team. They're called the Specialized Extracurricular Execution Squad, or C's for short. They're a group that harness the power of their personas in order to eliminate shadows and find a way to end the Dark Hour. The team consists of a total of nine members, all of which I'll go into more detail later. But as of right now, the team is Mitsuru, the navigator, Akihiko, the captain of the boxing team, Junpei, I'll get to him later, and Yukari, the bitch. The massive shadow that attacked the dorm is actually one of the 12 that need to be eliminated in order for the Dark Hour to disappear. The group comes to a conclusion relatively quickly that every full moon, or once a month, one of the massive shadows will appear. This is where the game really starts to open up and can be divided in two halves. One half of the game is the dungeon crawler where you do random battles and level up so you can be prepared for the full moon boss of each month. The other half of the game is much more unique. It's much more of a life simulator than a standard RPG. Both sections of the game are heavily intertwined with each other. Things that you accomplish in one portion of the game will affect the other portion. I have a lot more to talk about the social aspect of the game, so I'll save that for later. Persona 3 is unlike most JRPGs in the sense that there's only one single dungeon in the game. This place is known as Tartarus, and is believed to be the nesting ground for all shadows. Tartarus is actually the high school you attend. During the dark hour, the school morphs into this massive dungeon. Tartarus is huge and filled with plenty of shadows for you to battle. The battle system in Persona 3 is called the One More System. You see, almost every enemy has a weakness. By exploiting the weakness or landing critical hits, you'll gain an extra turn in combat. You can only exploit the enemy weakness once to get an extra turn. If you attack the enemy that's already down with a weakness, it will still do the bonus damage, but you'll not get an extra turn. If every enemy is knocked down, you'll be able to perform an all-out attack, doing massive damage to every enemy on screen. Something that is exclusive to Persona 3, however, is the fact that if you use a spell to attack every enemy, it has to knock down all of them in order for you to get an extra turn. Think of it like this. If every enemy is weak to electricity and you use the spell Mazio to attack all of them but fail to knock down every single one, it does not count towards getting a one more. Attack all spells have a lower hit rate than regular spells, which adds a risk reward system to battle. Do I go for the gamble and try to knock down everyone in one attack with a higher chance of missing, or do I attack enemies with single target spells until they're all down using more SP? I'll be honest when I say I'm not really a fan of having the attack all spells being inaccurate. In my opinion, Opinion, I think that the higher SP cost for the skill is more than enough of a penalty in a game that has heavy RNG. Everything that I just said applies to the enemy as well. If they can knock you down with a critical hit or your weakness, they will get an extra turn. Another unique aspect of Persona 3, but I say this in a negative way, is the fact that your party members are AI controlled. Before I continue, I'd like to say one thing. I know that there's a mod for Persona 3 that will allow direct control of your party members. It's a fantastic mod, and I'm sure it took a lot of effort and hard work to be implemented, but I'm I'm not critiquing a modded version of Persona 3, I'm critiquing Persona 3 Fest as it is. With that being said, I can safely say that this is the worst decision in the entire game. There is no direct control of your party members in Persona 3, at most you get is the, uh, the tactics menu. So here's how it works. During the player's turn, you're able to open up the tactics menu and select the way your party members will act. The list is as follows. Act freely, full assault, knockdown, heal support, conserve SP, attack fallen, same target, assign target, and stand by. At the start of the game, however, you won't have all the tactics unlocked. Over the course of time, you'll gain new tactics for your teammates, but the fact that they aren't all unlocked from the start is super limiting in my opinion. Here's the reason why I think the tactics system is stupid. It's pretty much all RNG on what skills your teammates will use no matter what tactic you have assigned. The only thing tactics really does is help the AI narrow down what you want them to do, but it still doesn't always work. If you set someone like Yukari to heal and support, she'll, for the most part, use the single target healing spell constantly. This applies even if the person she's healing is close to full health. For some reason, Yukari is very stingy on the heal all spell too. If you have multiple people that have taken damage to an attack, your party members will only use the single target heal, wasting turns as well as more SP in the long run. On very rare occasions, I've had Yukari use the spell Medea to heal everyone. It only happens when multiple party members are close to death. Then on the other end of the spectrum, there are times when the AI will straight up use awful moves that they shouldn't even have to begin with if I'm being honest. You know exactly what I'm talking about if you've played this game. FUCKING MARIN KAREN! 
Why does this skill exist? I've never found a single use for it, but man, oh man, the AI loves that skill. I have no idea why, but if Mitsuru is set to any sort of attack tactic, she'll without a doubt try Marin Karen at least once. The worst part is, it almost never works. I've had multiple points where Mitsuru tried using Marin Karen multiple times in the same fight. The worst part has to be this though. You know how I said that you can only select tactics for the party members during your turn? Well, you can only do this in your turn, and there's no way to switch tactics in any other way. Let's say you're fighting a boss battle and you select your tactics for the battle. Everything is going normal until you get hit with a critical hit and are knocked down. When you're knocked down, you will stand up the next turn, but it skips said turn. The problem is that you don't have a chance to change your tactics because you waste your turn standing up. That means if you needed to quickly try another strategy, you need to get lucky and either not died or avoid any shit that gets you thrown down. Your party will continue to use the tactic they were set to before, when you really need them to do something else. Junpei has a skill to bring you back up when you're knocked down, but he has to be set to heal and support for him to have a higher chance of using it. Even if he is on heal and support, you'll find him using defense buff spells because the game has that set to a higher priority. The biggest flaw with combat is how much RNG is involved. Even in a really difficult game like Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne, you're in control of every action you make unless it's that fucking Mudo spell. The real challenge of that game is overcoming the odds by using buffs and debuffs. You're always in control of your strategy of that game. I consider Persona 3 the hardest game in not only the Persona series, but also in all of the Megami Tensei franchise, at least out of the ones I played. These flaws are in extreme cases, and despite the complaints I have with the battle system, it's still really good. Going into battle where you give the proper commands and destroy the enemy with ease and great teamwork feels amazing. It really makes you feel like you're the leader of a group. I just wish that there were more moments like this where everything just clicks, or at the very least, offer the option to control your party. These kinks were ironed out for the sequels. If you played Persona 4 or 5, and are gonna play this one for the first time, it'll be a bit of a rough transition and may feel a bit archaic. It's not the worst thing in the world, but it does take a bit to get the hang of. It may be incredibly unfair at points, but it's still manageable. You may have noticed by now that Minato has been using more than just just one persona. Unlike the others, he's known as a wild card, and is the only person able to wield multiple personas, except no he isn't, no he isn't, and no he isn't. There's a mechanic that's been used throughout all the Megami Tensei franchise called fusion. It functions like this, you take two or more demons, or personas in this case, and combine them together and transfer their skills to a new persona to use. A system that sounds so simple on paper, but has a lot of depth hidden underneath layers. Each persona is assigned an arcana, one of 22 in fact. Different arcana means that they specialize in different stats. Let's say you have a Persona of the Magician Arcana. This means it'll be much better at magical attacks and have a higher magic stat because of it. There's a lot to consider when talking about the system, and most of it can be found in the Velvet Room Guide or online. You can get some really cool Personas if you try your hardest, all of which are based on different deities from different myths, with my personal favorite being Satan, because it's fucking Satan. The most difficult part about this fusion system, however, and one that requires getting used to if you played the newer Persona games, is that the way transferring skills work. When you select the Persona, that you want to fuse together get a preview of the new Persona stats and skills. Skills that are going to be inherited are highlighted in green. The problem is the skill selection is completely random. Certain skills have a higher chance of being inherited than others depending on the Persona. Also, lower tier magic for some reason has a higher chance of being inherited than other types of magic. There's no way at all to choose the skills you're going to inherit. I know that certain Personas specialize in certain attributes, but I think that's super limiting. It is possible to get every skill that you want in a specific persona, but you'll find yourself doing this for a very long time. Granted, it's not required to have every persona be at their absolute best to finish the game. I just think that getting some skills on certain personas can be very, very annoying, especially when you're doing fusion requests for Elizabeth. In a very strange and backwards way, the limited skill inheritance can provide a rewarding experience. Much like how limited party member control can make you feel good when everything goes right. But should rewards through limitations be a good thing, or should we just have the opportunity to pick what skills we want to inherit? I'm firmly on the side of having party member control, but I honestly honestly don't mind not having direct influence over what skills are inheritable. I do think that later games are an improvement with how you can just pick the skills you want, but I don't think not having that ability is a big loss and is very easy to get used to. Something that I know takes a lot of convincing for people is Tartarus itself. It's no secret that Tartarus is the only main dungeon in the game, with the full moon events being small scaled areas. The main gimmick of Tartarus is that every floor of the tower is randomly generated, with the exception of boss floors and of course, the first floor. Tartarus being randomly generated 
it is a neat idea and thematically it fits, but in terms of gameplay, it is lacking in my opinion. Tartarus takes random chunks of level and rearranges it around while plopping enemies and sometimes treasure on most floors. The tower has six separate blocks, all of which are themed differently. A lot of the level design, because of the way each floor is generated, is very similar, however. I appreciate the fact that each block not only looks distinct visually, but also the way the music begins to build more and more as you ascend higher. This reinforces the game's themes, and honestly, I think it's a pretty good idea. The struggle of pushing through what seems like a never-ending task, only to have reminders that you are making progress every day and that there is an end. But if I was to judge it more as a game than an experience, I think it falters a bit. Tardis looks very samey, you can even see that every block has some sort of basis on how the levels are generated. And with how tall Tartarus actually is, you begin to pick up on it after a while. I used to be on the side that absolutely hated Tartarus, but when I really think about it, there's a lot that people don't really give it credit for. I do think that the area itself was a great idea, but the execution wasn't the best and could have used more work. It also helps if you space out your Tartarus trips evenly so you don't burn yourself out. Speaking of which, when you're outside of combat, you live your life like a normal student. You study, build relationships, play video games, the works. The stuff you do in the real world will affect what you can accomplish in the dark hour. The stronger your bonds are with the people around you, the stronger the persona you can fuse can be. It's safe to say that social links are the main draw of the game and what makes the modern Persona games stand out among the crowd of JRPGs. Social links are like mini stories that focus on a specific character in the real world, some of which are your party members. In order to access a social link, you need to talk to people in the real world, but some of them require you to have specific stats or fulfill a prerequisite in order to begin them. The best way to level up a social link, however, is a bit more complicated than you may first think. Choosing the correct answers in your conversation with them will grant extra points towards the social link. Once there are enough points, the social link will rank up, giving you an extra scene that expands their story. Every social link is represented with an arcana. Let's take Yukari for example. She represents the lover's arcana, which means if you rank her social link up, you'll become better at fusing personas of the lover's arcana. If you have a lover's arcana persona in your party, like Pixie for example, you'll gain bonus points towards the social link as well. Once you max out the social link, you'll gain the ability to not only create the ultimate persona of that arcana, but you'll also gain the most amount of EXP from a fusion that you can possibly get. If you hate yourself like I do, then you'll take on the daunting task of trying to do every social link in one playthrough from a new save file. This pretty much requires a guide to do since there's very specific things you're supposed to do on every playable day throughout the game. You have two actions you're allowed to take per day, one during the daytime and one during the nighttime. With the amount of options and the limited time, it can feel overwhelming if you want to do everything. Thankfully, GameFAQ's user Penguin Knight has written a fully comprehensible guide on how to max out every social link in one playthrough, giving you tips on what you should be spending your nights doing and what social links you should be doing each day, even giving you times when you should be going to Tartarus. There are 22 social links in the game and only 3 are plot related. But it's not like I have anything interesting to say about all the social links in the game. <laughs> Uh... Number 1, The Magician, Kenji Tomochika. Kenji has a crush on his teacher and spends the better part of the social link talking about her. There's a point where Kenji believes that he's dating his teacher because she insists that she tutor him privately. Kenji begins to become infatuated with her to the point where when he finds out that she's transferring to another school because of the rumors, that he'll fall alongside her. As it turns out, the teacher, Amiri, is actually engaged and was planning on marrying her fiancé. Amiri didn't know how to let Kenji know that she was not interested in him without hurting his feelings, but with Minato by his side, he was able to get over Amiri relatively quickly. He reveals to Minato that he wasn't sure if he liked Amiri to begin with, or just the idea of being in a relationship with a teacher. Kenji's social link is rather short and it doesn't really seem like he learned any sort of lesson by the end of it. Even by the end of the game, he's talking about how he wants to date the new teachers that are arriving by the end of the year. I would have preferred it if Kenji learned the value of relationships with women his own age rather than just ignoring any sort of development. Despite that, Kenji's social link is still entertaining, which I think still counts for something at least. Number 2, The Priestess, Fuka Yamagi she. Fuka's social link may sound uninteresting on paper, but it really does have some hidden depth. Her story is one about self-confidence issues. For a majority of the social link, Fuka tries cooking different kinds of food for Minato to taste test. At first, it starts off terribly, she doesn't know how to cook at all. Gradually, she begins to improve her skills and becomes dependent on Minato. She at first thinks she lacks the skill for cooking. She's clouded with negativity and always assumes it'll go wrong. When Fuka begins to hang out with Minato, she begins to become more confident in her abilities and begins to try harder to impress Minato, as well as the other members of C. Her newfound confidence and positive attitude really improve her life. By the end of the social link, she gives up on cooking and wants to work on her mechanical engineering that she told Minato about. I like this one a lot. We see Fuka gradually improve her situation the more we talk to her. It isn't an immediate improvement either. She still struggles with some negative thoughts throughout her story, but by the end she's thankful for Minato's friendship. 
Number 3, The Empress, Mitsuru Kurijo. When Minato first begins to hang with Mitsuru, the two of them would mostly just visit fast food locations as of Mitsuru's request. As the two of them begin to hang out more and more, Mitsuru begins to open up to Minato about her personal life. As it turns out, she's a part of an arranged marriage. Mitsuru says that she isn't interested in her fiancé and is only doing it for the good of the Kurijo group, the company that her family runs. Eventually, Mitsuru and Minato encounter Mitsuru's fiancé. He begins to berate Minato, telling him to know his place in society. This causes Mitsuru to snap and yell at her fiancé, breaking up the arranged marriage in the process. At the end of the story, Mitsuru thanks Minato for teaching her how to live her life for herself and gives Minato her motorcycle keys, symbolizing that she'll no longer run away from hardship. There's nothing wrong with the concept of the social link, but I feel like the pacing is a bit off. The main story focuses on Mitsuru and her arranged marriage, but I can't help but feel as though some scenes are placed in the wrong order. The first few scenes are perfectly fine. We get the beginning of Minato and Mitsuru's relationship, and then it's revealed that she's a part of an arranged marriage. But then there's an unrelated scene about Mitsuru saying that Yukari would be the kind of person person to ride her motorcycle before we jump back to the main plot. Then after that, there's another unrelated scene. The pacing of the story that they're trying to tell is very off and unnatural. If this was more of a story about Mitsuru being independent from the Kurija group, then it would make more sense if it was rewritten a little, but the social link is clearly supposed to be about the arranged marriage. The scene where Mitsuru stands up for Minato is very well done and it really shows that she does care about him. In Fuka's social link, every scene matters since it was all building up to her self-confidence being improved and all the scenes would flow together nicely. I can't really say the same about Mitsuru's social link because it's all over the place. Overall, it's alright, but it could have been paced better. Better. Number 4, The Emperor, Hidetoshi Odagiri. Hidetoshi is a part of the student council and believes that he's above everyone else there. He would often force his ideals on everyone else and was rather selfish. Hidetoshi tells Minato that the reason why he's so cold to people is that there was a scriptwriter that was used as a scapegoat for a crime and was sent to jail in the process. Hidetoshi believes that you shouldn't trust anyone so something like that story wouldn't happen to himself. Hidetoshi is assigned to figure out a case behind a cigarette butt being left in the boys' bathroom stall. He's very rough with people who he believes are suspects, blaming innocent students to see if they'd crack and verbally berate them to try to find the culprit. Eventually, Hidetoshi is called down to the office and given a list of suspects. It turns out that Minato is listed as a suspect and Hidetoshi immediately jumps to your defense saying, even if the whole school turns against me, I won't sell you out. This is where Hidetoshi learns the importance of bonds and trust. He drops a cigarette case because he realized that he was only on a quest for power. Hidetoshi begins to better himself from there and he reveals that the scriptwriter from the story was actually his father and he now understands the meaning of trust. I was honestly surprised with this social link because of how much Hidetoshi grows throughout. We mostly see him from his cold exterior until the moment he stands up for you. Hidetoshi threw away his opportunity at becoming the student council president just so he wouldn't lose his only friend. If I had one complaint about this social link is that the seemingly correct choices are the ones where you have to be a total kiss ass to him. There's a lot of choices to disagree with Hidetoshi's methods, but those aren't the answers that will increase the social link faster. But he does learn a lesson by the end of the social link because he's finally found friendship in Minato, and that part doesn't doesn't change. Number 5, The Hero Font, The Old Couple. This social link is unique in that there are two participants rather than one. The old couple named Bunkichi and Mitsuko opened a bookstore that Minato can visit when he finds a leaf from the permission tree. Minato begins to visit the bookstore more and more often, even before the place is open to the public. It's revealed that the permission tree was planted in memory of their son, a teacher who worked at the school Minato attends, who died in a car crash. The school is planning on demolishing the courtyard where the tree is located, and as a result, the tree would be destroyed too. Mitsuko and Bunkichi are devastated when they learn this and mistakenly believe that Minato started a petition to keep the courtyard the way it is. After a while, the couple agrees that demolishing the courtyard would be better for the school's education and that they shouldn't let their memories of their son hold that back. But all is well in the end when the school planned on moving the permission tree to another part of the school to preserve it. The story itself is sweet, but in my opinion it's rather pointless as a social link. This one is a bit of an odd case because there isn't much of a reason to Minato to be there, other than to experience the event with his own eyes. Even the social link with Hidetoshi, one that doesn't directly involve Minato for most of it, still had Minato have an impact on the outcome. You do bond with the old couple, but not in the way that affects the story like other social links. Overall, it's a good story on its own, but lacks the involvement that other social links do. That doesn't make it bad, it just makes it feel less important. Number 6, The Lovers, Yukari Takiba. Yukari's social link feels rather directionless, with only the vague theme of overcoming isolation. Ever since Yukari's father died 10 years ago, she hasn't been living with her mother. Yukari's mother has been dating multiple men over the years as an attempt to fill the void that was left after her husband died. There's a small portion of the social 
link that's dedicated to Yukari's relationship with her mother, but I think that there's too little of it and we don't get to see a conclusion to that story. The most we get to see is that Yukari is going to talk to her mother in person for the first time since her father died, which is progress, but that's all we get to see. The rest of the social link is just Minato and Yukari fucking around and not really doing anything until Yukari says that she feels less alone because of the time she spent with Minato. The social link was rather pointless and I feel like it was only added there just to give you an option to date Yukari. It's easily my least favorite social link out of the party members. Number 7, The Chariot, Kazushi Miyamoto. An interesting detail about Kazushi's social link is that it can be based off of three athletic activities. From my playthrough, I joined the track and field team, but there's an option for it to take place in a swimming club or a kendo club. When Minato starts off in the track team, he begins to talk to one of the members, Kazushi. Kazushi, after every practice, complains about his knee being sore. It gets to the point where he needs to visit the nurse's office at the end of practice. Kazushi reveals to Minato that his knee has been hurting ever since the day Minato joined the track team, and asks for him to keep it a secret. As the training goes on, the condition of his knee becomes worse and worse, to the point where if he pushes himself too hard, he'll never be able to walk again. Despite this, Kazushi insists that he carries on for his nephew's sake. Kazushi's nephew got into a car accident and is going through rehab to heal himself. Kazushi encourages his nephew to continue rehab when he wants to quit by promising that if Kazushi becomes the best athlete in Japan, his nephew will continue rehab. With the help of Minato, Kazushi is able to swallow his pride and tell the track team about his knee injury. Kazushi decides decides to skip the event so that he can get knee surgery. Kazushi tells Minato that he will be going through rehab with his nephew to support him. I like this one a lot. Kazushi's personal struggle to power through his pain for the good of his nephew is a noble cause, but the damage that he could cause himself was something that he didn't care about. He even admits that it was more of a pride problem because he didn't want to be known as the guy who needed help. By the end of the story, Minato helps Kazushi learn that you can't do everything by yourself. Number 8, Justice, Chihiro Fushimi. Chihiro's social link is one about learning to speak up for yourself. At the start of her story, she's afraid of men and only talks to Minato to help get over her fear. She gradually begins to open up to Minato and slowly begins to develop affection towards him. Money goes missing from the student council and Chihiro is blamed for stealing it since she's the treasurer. Chihiro and Minato are called down to the office so that they can hear their side of the story. Chihiro is able to speak up for herself and defend her stance thanks to Minato spending time with her. It turns out she was innocent all along and the money wasn't stolen but it was misplaced by a teacher. This social link focuses more on learning about Chihiro as a character rather than solving some sort of big plot like the other ones. It hits a lot of the same beats as Fuka's social link, but in my opinion, it is told in a much less interesting way. It's okay, but nothing too special. Number 9, The Hermit, Maya. This social link is rather unique since it's the only one where you interact with a character that doesn't show their face. This story takes place in the MMO titled Innocent Sin Online, which is a very cute reference to a video game that no one remembers, especially Atlas. Maya's social link doesn't revolve around any ongoing story, but rather focuses on the character and her feelings about her current situation in life. The main draw of the social link is finding out who Maya is in the real world. Maya will begin to open up to Minato about her personal life over the course of the social link, and it turns out that she's a teacher. Not just any teacher, however, but she's actually Minato's homeroom teacher, Miss Toriyumi. This social link definitely has one of my favorite epilogues in the game. You meet with Miss Toriyumi in real life, and she sees that your phone background is the screen capture of her saying, I love you, to Minato. This causes her to break down in embarrassment and attempt to ask out Minato on a date, but she doesn't go through with it. I like this one a lot since it's a different pace than the other social links while still being entertaining in its own way. The only real critique is the slang used throughout the entire thing. It's the same problem I have with Stuart Zergo from Ratchet and Clank Full Frontal Assault. A lot of internet speak that doesn't really add to anything and kind of dates the game. I still think that she's a good character and isn't defined by that one personality trait. Number 10, The Fortune, Kaisuke Hiraga. This social link changes slightly depending on the club you join before interacting with the character. It's like Kazushi's social link in that regard. From my playthrough, I joined the art club. The other choices are the music club and the photography club. Kaisuke is the art club leader who is pressured by his father to quit the club and become a doctor, just like himself. Kaisuke's social link revolves around the choices he has to make in finding his own path in life. Despite not liking his father's overbearing attitude about becoming a doctor, it's shown multiple times that Kaisuke knows what he's doing and would be great in that field. Kaisuke even makes a deal with his father that if he wins the art contest, that he'd be able to pursue his passion for art. Kaisuke not only ends up winning the contest, but is offered to study abroad in that field. Kaisuke's father is thrilled and even offers to pay for the flight. Before Kaisuke can leave, two elderly people collapse on the ground. Kaisuke immediately stops what he's doing to call an ambulance and keeps the people alive before it arrives. Kaisuke later decides that he'll become a doctor, not out of his father's will, but because he genuinely wants to help save people's lives. What I took out of this social link is that Kaisuke wants his career to be fueled by passion to do so, rather than what would make other people happy. I don't really think that this message is conveyed all too well throughout the story, it would have been better to see how Kaisuke's father treats him, and not hear 
hear how he's been treated. It took a couple of read-throughs on the wiki to understand how Kaisuke came to this conclusion. Number 11. Strength. Yuko Nishiwaki. Jumping the gun a bit, this social link is fucking boring. Literally nothing goes on in it. There's no lesson to be learned, and there's no character traits for Yuko that stick with me. The social link begins with Minato and Yuko casually greeting each other before deciding to hang out. Along the way, there are these kids she coaches on the high school track field, but nothing interesting really happens. I can't really remember much about Yuko other than the fact that she's the first female social link you can get into a relationship with. It suffers from the same problem as Yukari's social link, but is amplified here since we know about Yukari through the story but Yuko gets zero characterization. Even her wiki page is hilariously small. A total waste of time. Only did it so I could use Siegfried. And Siegfried... is badass. Number 12, The Hangman, Maiko Uashi. Maiko's social link is about how kids react to when their parents are having marital issues. Maiko, on the surface, seems to be a happy-go-lucky kid that has to do with the shit that is cram school, but she eventually reveals to Minato that her parents have been arguing a lot. She even convinces herself that her parents don't love her anymore. Maiko's parents end up divorcing near the end of the social link. At first, she wants to stay with her dad because that would mean she wouldn't have to move away from Minato, but ends up wanting to stay with her mother so that she can keep her happy. Maiko's social link is a really good one to experience, and it will even hit home if you went through the same things she did when you were younger. A complaint I have against it, however, is the same one I have against Hidetoshi's. It's the fact that you pretty much have to suck up to her in order to gain points towards a social link. There's a scene where she wants to run away from home to try to test her parents, and you have to encourage her to do that. No way in hell I'd ever tell someone to do that in this kind of situation. And is it just me, or does this social link have a lot of strange undertones to it? Like, you're a high schooler who's hanging out with an elementary school girl. To even start the social link, you have to buy her food and drinks. I don't know, something about this seems a little creepy and is probably illegal in some way. Oh, someone's at the door. Number 13, which is actually 14 because I skipped over a plot related social link. The Temperance, Bebe. Bebe is a transfer student from France who doesn't want to move back home and wants to stay in Japan until he dies. He's basically the first representation of a French weeaboo. Bebe's social link is the bare minimum of a social link story. Bebe's aunt died not too long after you start the social link, and he says that she's the main reason why he was able to visit Japan. Bebe's uncle is trying to force him to return to France, so to impress his uncle enough to let him return to Japan, Bebe makes him a kimono. That's about all that happens. The social link leaves a lot to be desired. Bebe seems desperate to return to Japan after he leaves, but we don't really get a sad satisfying answer as to why he feels that way. The closest thing we get is that he loves the culture. That's lame as shit. With how personally social link stories feel, I was expecting to hear that he hated his uncle or something. That would have been much more interesting because of the conflict would have had weight to it. Bebe isn't even an interesting character, since his only trait is that he likes sewing and he likes to eat at the local sweet shop. So it doesn't matter to me, the player, if Bebe returns or not because I don't care about him or have any conflict that would want me to say Bebe overcome. Bebe's social link could be removed like Yuko's and have zero impact on the game, and I'm serious about that. Number 14, The Devil, President Tanaka. This social link is very unique as it's one of the few social links that doesn't focus on a school student, but rather an adult in the business world. Tanaka at first seems like the lowest scum of the earth. He attempts to swindle Minato out of his money in exchange for business advice. At first, it's very obvious that he doesn't care at all about teaching Minato anything, but later on, he begins to open up to you, and you can see that this advice comes from Tanaka's own personal experiences. Tanaka had a rough upbringing. He tells stories about how kids made fun of him for only having rice for his lunch and that he didn't have any shoes for PE. He made it his personal goal to become the most successful out of all of his peers. Now that he's at the top of the food chain, Tanaka feels unfulfilled. That is until a woman visits him in his office asking for a donation. At first, he laughs at the idea until he realizes that by donating to the orphanage, he would have more children to teach the business world to. Tanaka admits that if it weren't for the conversations he had with Minato, he wouldn't have discovered this side of himself. This social link is really good because we see a gradual change in Tanaka's point of view. He doesn't become a saint out of this, in fact, he still keeps his demeaning attitude, but his intentions are now selfless rather than selfish. Number 15, The Tower, Mutatsu. Mutatsu is a bitter, old, depressed alcoholic. Just like me! Mutatsu is a pessimist. He's been through a lot of rough times and is willing to share his experiences with Minato. At first, Mutatsu seems very deflective of the company, but eventually warms up to it. Mutatsu believes that you shouldn't be wasting your life with work, rather, you should be using that time you have in life chasing after what you find most important. Mutatsu left his wife and son, and at first he doesn't seem to have any issues with this. Mutatsu seems glad that he did, in fact. There's a point in his social 
social link where we see Mutatsu drunk out of his mind, and he confuses Minato with his own son. Mutatsu reveals that he and his wife used to argue a lot, so when she left him, he became an alcoholic. He drinks night after night because he's afraid of trying to reconcile with his wife. Mutatsu hires a private detective to find his wife and son so he can apologize for all the hardships and hopefully retire with them back in his life. If Maiko's social link is about seeing a failing marriage from a child's point of view, Mutatsu's is about how this type of situation can affect an adult. Minato has less of a direct impact on the progress of this social link and feels more like a wall that Mutatsu throws his life story at. Not saying that this is a bad thing, but it's certainly less involved than the other ones. Number 16, the star, Mamaru Hayase. Mamaru's social link is just a worse version of Kazushi's in my opinion. Mamaru wants to become the best at his chosen sport so that he could be scouted and get a scholarship to support his family, but because his mother collapses from an illness, he has to take over her responsibilities immediately. By the end of the social link, he selflessly does, but it's a little too similar to Kazushi's social link. I like that social link because we not only get to know Kazushi, but we also get to see him go through the struggles of trying to compete with his knee injury. We see firsthand his determination to power through all the pain just so he can convince his nephew to go through therapy. Kazushi grows and learns a lot from his journey and overall makes him a better person. Mamoru doesn't get this kind of development. He just gets a different kind of job than the one he wanted to support his family with. At least with Kazushi, there was a lot more tension because there was a personal risk involved with it. If Kazushi pushed himself too hard, he would lose the function of his leg and could never walk again. It feels like that there were two different ideas to what the athlete social link should have been, but instead of cutting off the obviously weaker link, we got both instead. Number 17, The Moon, Nozomi Sumitsu. Yeah, I hate this social link. I'm not even gonna sugarcoat this one. It's easily my least favorite in the game. Nozomi's social link is not only confusing, but it's also the only one where the character becomes a bigger asshole than they start off as. Nozomi has the title of the Gourmet King, right? And because Minato proves to him that he has a knowledge of food, Nozomi lets Minato hang out with him. We see that Nozomi has an inflated ego and treats Minato like dirt throughout the entire social link. I guess what they were trying to go for is the fact that Nozomi is insecure about being compared to his dead brother, but Nozomi never really grows past that. Instead, Nozomi is a part of a cult that is worshipping the end of the world and is seeking paradise. I kid you not, Nozomi is revealed to have scammed a kid of his money because he convinced the kid not to give it to his tutor. He even tries to scam Minato out of 100,000 yen near the end of the social link. What the fuck is that all about? Eventually, people are hired to beat up Nozomi for scamming kids, and Minato comes to save him from it. I cannot believe this. There's no option to ever refuse to help Nozomi or to put him in his place. He's a total piece of shit throughout the social link, and I don't care about him at all. Number 18, The Sun, Akinari Kimiki. Akinari is a young man who is dying of an incurable genetic disease and is expecting to pass away very soon. He is very dismissive of Minato at first because he believes he's only spending time with him out of pity, but Akinari eventually warms up to Minato and appreciates his company. Akinari has a very bleak outlook on life, which is very understandable because he is going to die soon and there's nothing he can do about it. We see his frustration towards his situation, but he isn't selfish enough to this curse on everyone else. Minato and Akinari share a common interest in reading, and Akinari reveals that he never finishes the story he reads because he's pulled out of the fictional world he was just in and has to face the reality of his situation. Akinari is inspired to write his own story, much like the ones he's a fan of reading. His story is about a pink alligator that cannot hunt because all the prey notice his color and run away. The other animals don't like the pink alligator because he's different. The alligator eventually becomes friends with a bird that cannot fly, and the two would spend their time at a pond. The alligator accidentally swallows the bird while he sleeps losing his only friend. Akinari has trouble writing a happy ending for the story, and says that he'll get inspiration once he finds the meaning in life. At this point of the social link, Akinari's condition becomes much worse. He even stops taking his medication because it numbs his hands so he cannot write his story. He knows that he's going to die anyways and the medication was only prolonging his death. Eventually, Akinari is able to come up with an ending of the story. The alligator felt regret and sadness from eating his friend and cried so much that he drowned in his own tears. His tears turned into a beautiful lake where trees of delicious fruit begin to grow. This spot becomes the new place of relaxation for all the other animals of the forest. Akinari explains to Minato, even though he couldn't see what his life meant, doesn't mean it didn't matter to other people. As thanks to Minato for sticking by his side and showing him what life really meant, he gives Minato the notebook he wrote a story in. Akinari fades away, implying that he died earlier and that his spear can now pass on. During the epilogue of the game, Minato can meet Akinari's mother at the shrine. She reveals to Minato that Akinari thanked her for being born and that he was glad he was able to live his life. Akinari's mother was inspired by his words and now wants to live her life to the fullest, not for her own sake, but for the sake of her late son. Man, this social link is really special. The ending is genuinely emotional. Akinari's mother asks Minato if he has the notebook that Akinari used to write in. Minato offers to give it to her, but she denies it saying that she'll wait until she sees Akinari again to hear the story straight from her son. 
That's some heavy shit, man. Number 19, The Aeon, I guess. I guess his social link is very interesting because it ties in directly with her character development throughout the main story. You can only start this social link during the last month of the game after she recovers from a near fatal encounter with death. What makes Igus unique from the other party members in the game is the fact that she isn't human and is actually a robot. Igus is what's known as an anti-shadow weapon. Basically she's a robot given a personality so that she can use the power of a persona. This social link focuses on teaching Igus what it truly means to be alive. Igus learns that what makes life worth living is the bonds that people share, but what she can't comprehend is why it comes to an end eventually. Since Igus is a robot, she cannot age and die like a human. She begins to feel frustrated as the more human her personality becomes, and that there will always be a barrier that keeps her from becoming human entirely. She begins to ask questions like, why are we born, and why do we live? Stuff like that. Minato doesn't have any of these answers, and Igus eventually comes to her own. What makes life worth living is the fact that it will come to an end. Since everyone is going to die, that makes the connections you have with those around you more important. Igus uses this new resolve to muster up the courage to admit her love to Minato. I guess this social link is a very important one in the game because it gives extra context to her character development. I personally feel as though it's my favorite party member's social link in the game. It was very close to being my favorite social link entirely, but Akinari still manages to beat it out in the end. And that's all the social links in Persona 3. Overall, I would say that while most of them are good, some are even great, the low points are really fucking low. I think the biggest missed opportunity with the social links is the fact that none of the male party members get one. I get that they do go throughout the main story, but I think it would have been nice to include a side story with them. I like the one with Igus because it intertwines with her main character development. Fuka's is also a good one because she grows beyond what her character arc in the game is. I feel as though the most noticeable exclusion is a social link with Junpei. Even though Minato and Junpei barely get any one-on-one -on -one time with each other, and are even at odds for most of the game. Junpei still has a scene where him and Minato pretty much say that they're best friends, which I feel is unearned. Now why would you ever want to do what I did and do all the social links in one playthrough? Well, not only because it's the best way to experience what the game has to offer, but you also get a very special reward for doing so. Once you visit the Velvet Room after completing all the social links, Igor will reward you with the Cypher's Mask. With this item, you can fuse together the strongest personas in the game to create the ultimate persona, the second form of Orpheus, Orpheus Telos. And let's just say, if you play your cards right, he's pretty good. I believe it's now time to talk about Persona 3's most recognizable aspect, it's... soundtrack. Holy shit, I cannot believe how long I went on without gushing about this game's music. It's not only my favorite video game soundtrack ever, it's also my favorite music to any piece of media ever. It's filled with multiple genres that are all expertly crafted, ranging from hip-hop, electronic, rock, and jazz. The battle themes especially kick ass. I'm telling you right now, Virgin Last Surprise versus Chad Mass Destruction. In all serious though, let's talk about Persona 3's main story for a bit. For the past couple of months, Seas have been eliminating the shadows during the full moon operations. It's eventually revealed that there's another group that is operating during the dark hour, though their motives are different. This group is known as Striga, and they run a Hitman website. For a fee, they can find your coffin during the dark hour and kill the person inside of it, making it seem like an accident. Striga catches wind of C's plans to eliminate the dark hour, and this goes against their goal, so naturally, the two teams begin to butt heads. Striga instigates a lot of conflict for the group, but they don't really have any clear motives or any actual character. Besides Shidori, who I'll get to later, I don't think the members of Striga really function well as characters characters, but more so as a reoccurring obstacle, which is super disappointing because this game does a really good job with giving characters motivations. Speaking of which, it's time to go over the party members. Every members of Seas has their own motivations for fighting against the Dark Hour and go through their own character arcs, some of which are tied with other main characters in the party. Sadly, I don't think all of them are stellar. I have a couple I do want to talk about because I find that I have a lot to say about them. I'll get the weaker ones out of the way first. I think Fuka's social link is really good, but her involvement in the main story is very minimal. Fuka joins the party after one of the full moon operations because it turns out she has a persona that's really good with navigational abilities. Outside of her initial introduction, her major character development comes from her social link. There are hints of her reconciling with her bully and the two become friends, but we don't really get to see that on screen. Mitsuru's family has a close tie with the Dark Hour, and Mitsuru feels guilty about it. Ten years prior to the game beginning, the Kurijo group was working on harnessing the powers of shadows and control space and time. There was an accident during one of the experiments and the Dark Hour is created, along with 12 full moon shadows to protect it. Mitsuru wants to fulfill her father's wish of destroying the Dark Hour, which is admirable. When her father is killed, she's thrown off the path slightly. That is until Yukari slaps some sense into her and she gets back onto track. Mitsuru doesn't really change throughout the story other than living with the guilt of her family's experiments and wanting to rectify 
identify that. She's okay, if a little too distant from the group for my liking. Ikari is a cold, distant bitch who's an asshole to Junpei for no reason. Her whole story evolves around her family ties with the Kurijo group. It turns out her father was a part of the research team that was responsible for creating the Dark Hour. At first, Yukari is very resentful to her father's sins and denounces him. It isn't until after Kutsuki's betrayal that Yukari was able to watch the unedited video of her father. It turns out that her father loved her and was very regretful that he would not be able to see Yukari again. I guess Rikari learns forgiveness from this because this is where she awakens her ultimate persona. The only thing Yukari really does after this is console Mitsu from the loss of her father, and the two of them do become friends after this moment. I just don't really think that Yukari had a graceful character growth. Alright, let's get to the good ones. Akihiko and Ken's development happens around the same time, and it involves the same situation, so I'll be combining the two together for this recap. Ken Amada is an elementary school student who is revealed to potentially have the power to wield a persona on July 18th, but doesn't officially join the team until one month later when Akutsuki confirms it. Before Ken joins the team, he stays in the high school dorm for the summer because the elementary school dorms will be empty. You see, Ken's mom died in an accident two years prior to the game beginning, so he doesn't have anywhere to stay other than the dorms. While the rest of the group is okay with the decision to welcome him to the team, Akihiko and Mitsuru are concerned for reasons that aren't apparent just yet. Throughout the game, Akihiko has been visiting his childhood friend, Shinjiro Aragaki, and has been attempting to get Shinjiro to return to seas. You see, Shinjiro here is also a Persona user and used to be a part of the team as well, but during one of his his first missions, he ended up losing control of his persona and accidentally killing a bystander. Since then, Shinjiro has announced everything to do with his persona, C's, and even the connections he had with his friends. When Strega begins to become more of a problem, Akihiko and Minato essentially force Shinjiro to rejoin the team. At first, Shinji rejects the two, saying that it has nothing to do with him. It isn't until Akihiko mentions that Ken has joined the team as well that Shinji begins to take interest. He asks if Ken joined the team out of his own volition, and Akihiko confirms it with Shinji. After that, Shinji takes his old evoker back from Akihiko and agrees to help end the Dark Hour. During the full moon operation on October 4th, both Ken and Shinjiro are absent from the mission. When the two shadows are defeated, Akihiko realizes that October 4th was an important day to Ken and quickly rushes off to find the two. Ken and Shinjiro rendezvous in the back alleys of Tatsumi Port Island, where Ken reveals the truth to Shinji. Ken's mom didn't die in an accident like the police said, she was killed by Shinjiro's persona. Ken has spent the last two years trying to find out who killed his mother so he can avenge her death. When Shinji joined C's, Ken recognized him and his persona. So Ken waited until the anniversary of his mother's death to confront Shinji about it and in turn, get his revenge. Shinjiro, still filled with regret, tells Ken to kill him. He also lets Ken know that if he does go through with killing him, that he will live the rest of his life filled with regret. Before Ken can make his decision, Takaya arrives on the scene. Takaya tells Ken that getting revenge is pointless because Shinji was already going to die soon anyways. It turns out that the suppressants Shinji has been taking to tame his persona have slowly been wearing his body down and will eventually kill him. Ken is furious that no matter what happens, he'll never be able to avenge his mom. That's when Takaya decides to take the opportunity to kill the two. Takaya shoots Shinji in the chest, fatally wounding him. Before Takaya can finish Shinji off, he tries to strangle information out of him. He wants to know who the Navigator of Seas is so he can kill them. Ken lies, saying that it's himself. He lost his will to live after he realized he won't be able to get his revenge. He thinks his life is now meaningless. Takaya aims his gun at Ken, and before he can pull the trigger, Shinji jumps in front of the kid and takes another bullet for him. Just then, the rest of Seas arrives, causing Takaya to retreat. The team is unable to get Shinji any medical attention because during the dark hour, no hospitals will be functioning. Shinjiro dies that night, but not before telling Ken to use his anger as his strength. The team takes a loss of their comrade hard, but not nearly as rough as Akihiko does. Akihiko visits Shinjiro's memorial and admits to himself that it was because of his own obsession with power and fighting, he didn't realize what was going on around him. In a very emotional scene, he finds his new resolve. In battle, there's always a chance of dying. I knew that, but I was so focused on fighting that I didn't notice anything else. It didn't matter how tough I was. Look what happened! <laughs> yeah, I know. Crying won't change anything, will it? All right, Shinji. You watch from there with Miki. I still have things to do, right? Even after all that happened, Akihiko never lost his will to fight until the end. That shit's inspiring, man. 
Ken also takes this a bit harder than the rest. The only thing he had worth living for is now gone, and in his mind, his mother will not be able to rest peacefully. Akihiko confronts Ken after he runs away from the dorm. He lets him know that no matter what he does, the dead can't come back. And if he has the spirit, he can rejoin and fight to end the dark hour. This snaps Ken out of his trance. He realizes that he was only using revenge as a coping mechanism for the isolation he felt. Ken musters up the will to return to seas. He's now not only fighting for his mother, but also for the will of Shinjiro. If you cannot tell from the amount of detail I went into for this explanation, I feel as though there's a lot of depth for the character arc for these two. The only complaint I have about this entire scenario is the fact that Shinjiro feels a lot less like a character and more of a tool for Akihiko and Ken's development. In a way, it's more like an Uncle Ben type of death rather than the death of a character we care about. If we had more time to spend with Shinjiro as a party member and get to know him more personally, the impact of his loss could be much greater. When I see Shinjiro's death scene, I feel more sad for Akihiko because we get to know him more than Shinjiro. Most of the characters are saddened by Shinjiro's death because of what it means to Akihiko. The only person I can think of who seems upset about it, other than the obvious, is Junpei. There's a scene where Junpei gets angry at the students that aren't being respectful during the memorial. It shows that Junpei at least had some respect for him. There are dialogue options that you can pick to have Minato show that he did care about Shinjiro too, but as a player experiencing the game, we don't know Shinjiro more than just Akihiko's friend. I'm not saying that this ruins the scene or the character development, not at all. It's a really good portion of the game. I just personally feel as though there could have been more done with Shinjiro before he died. I still like this a lot, and the way it's handled is amazing. I saved the one I probably feel the most mixed about for last. Junpei Yori is one of the starting party members. He actually awakens to his persona not too long after Minato does. I would say Junpei's main character arc starts around mid-August. Junpei is bored out of his mind near the end of summer vacation. That is, until he stumbles across an oddly dressed girl sketching in a book. At first, the two don't pay much attention to each other, but over the course of time, the two begin to run into each other more and more. Eventually, Junpei and the girl, Chidori, begin to talk about more personal things. Chidori asks Junpei an odd question. What makes you feel alive? Junpei replies that him acting like a hero makes him feel alive, but he tells her that it's all fantasy. Shidori reveals a bit of her true intentions and asks if Junpei fights shadows during the dark hour. Somehow, Junpei isn't suspicious about this and tells Shidori how he is the leader of seas, and we all know where it goes from there. With the new information at her disposal, Chidori takes Junpei as hostage during the full moon operation on September 5th. She tells Junpei to call off not only this mission, but every other mission as well. Junpei admits that he can't do that because he isn't the leader of the team. The group is able to quickly come to Junpei's aid when Fuka senses that there are two Persona users back at the dorm. Akihiko Mitsuru admit Chidori to the hospital for her own safety where they try to wrangle information about Strega out of her. Despite her betrayal to Junpei, he still visits Chidori in the hospital. Chidori slowly grows more and more welcoming to the company over the course of a couple weeks. During one of Junpei's hospital visits, Chidori is oddly distant towards him. When he tries to see what's wrong, Chidori gets angry at him, saying that she's afraid to be around him now. During the night of November 21st, the other members of Strega are able to locate Chidori in the hospital. They break her out of her room and hand her an evoker. Chidori Chidori leaves her sketchbook behind, saying that it's all Junpei's fault that she's become afraid of dying. The following night, everyone is called to the command room for an emergency meeting. Fuka reveals that she's located the members of Strega right outside of Tartarus, but before she can say anything else, Chidori manages to use her persona to speak through Fuka's. She challenges the members of Seas to a battle. Junpei quickly runs off on his own to try to reason with Chidori. She doesn't want to listen and proceeds to battle the team. Chidori is defeated rather effortlessly, and Junpei quickly runs to her side. Chidori tells Junpei that he has given her the pain that she's never felt before, the pain of attachment. She tells Junpei that since she's become more attached to Junpei, she's begun to fear death. She has a fear of losing Junpei forever, and losing the connections that she made over the past few months. Takaya and Jin reveal themselves, and Takaya expresses his disappointment that Chidori has begun to cling onto life. Junpei begs Chidori to leave Strega and return with them. Takaya isn't having any of that shit, and he caps the son of a bitch where he stands. Hey! Junpei has a vision of him being in a hospital bed with Chidori visiting him. The two express their true feelings for each other, and Chidori tells Junpei that he can't die here. As a last ditch effort, Chidori uses her true power of her persona and brings Junpei back to life, but at the cost of her own. She passes away in Junpei's arms, telling him that she loves him. Takaya says that Chidori's death was meaningless, which gets Junpei fucking pissed! 
Takaya is about to retaliate, but Jin suggests that they make a retreat and save their energy for their true mission. Junpei wants to go after Strega out of rage, but Akihiko manages to calm him down. Junpei now realizes that he's not fighting for himself anymore, but he was given a second chance at life to fight for the memory of his loved one. For the most part, this is a really good story for Junpei, but there's one major thing that bogs down this entire story and quite frankly, ruins all the emotional impact that it has. In Persona 3 Fess, if you speak to Junpei throughout the game during certain days and give him the correct answers, you can bring Chidori back from the dead. This fucking sucks and ruins most of the impact of this character arc, and is also a slap to the face to the game's overall theme and story it's trying to tell. Persona 3 is a story about accepting death as a part of life and enjoying the connections you have while they're still around. It's a game about not fearing the end, but living life to its fullest. Having the option to bring back such an important character for Junpei's character arc goes against that main theme. Chidori's death now lacks the impact that it should because it's now a reversible problem, and the way they bring her back feels like a poor fan fiction. Apparently the flower she touched while staying at the hospital stored her life energy so that when she was dying from giving her life to Junpei she just took it back from the plants. I don't care that this is optional, it's in the game. Every social link is optional as well but those are all a part of the experience. It's only fair to give this scene a mention because it's a clear example of Atlas pulling their punches for the sake of fan service. That brings me to my main reason as to why I decided to talk about the party members in this fashion. While they all do have their individual stories, some obviously better than others, Persona 3 very much lacks in an ongoing plot until near the end of the game. Most of the story comes from how the characters develop over the course of fighting the shadows in the dark hour. The closest thing we have to a reoccurring antagonist is Strega, but other than Chidori, the group is very one note. The more I think about it, the more I realize how much of a missed opportunity Strega is. A group of artificial Persona users created by the Kurijo group is such a good setup, especially for a role for Mitsuru. They worship the concept of death in a cultish way, and we do get to see some of the effects that has on the city, but not much is done with that. Takaya is treated as though he's a big deal to Seize, but he spends most of the time lurking in the shadows and trying to stop Seize from ridding the Dark Hour. But the question I have on my mind is, why doesn't he want the Dark Hour to disappear? It's something the game never goes into, and as a result, I believe that they suffer as villains because of it. Alright, I believe it's time we wrap things up. I've gone over all the social links, the combat, the character the dungeon design, music, and pretty much everything else. Now all that's left to do is talk about the rest of the story. If after all that I've talked about so far still has an interest in you in playing Persona 3, then what the hell's wrong with you? Throughout the story, the small child from the beginning of the game has been casually checking up on Minato, usually to inform him when the next ordeal is going to happen. As time goes on, the small boy begins to remember about who he is and why he's alive. He tells Minato that his name is Pharos, and the two actually start to form a bond. After Seas finishes up their final full moon operation and defeats the last shadow, Pharos tells Minato that it's time for them to bid farewell and that their bond will not be forgotten. The group celebrates their victory over the dark hour later that night. Ikutsuki and Igus aren't there for the celebration because the chairman wanted to give Igus a tune-up. Even Mitsuru's father arrives for the occasion. The party is interrupted, however, as the dark hour comes as usual. This confuses the group as they defeated all the shadows. They quickly go to the Tartarus entrance, only to find Ikutsuki and a brainwashed Igus. It turns out that Ikutsuki was a part of the original team that were experimenting on the shadows that created the Dark Hour. Their plan was to awaken death itself, so that they could destroy the world and have someone rule over as king. By defeating the Twelve Shadows, they reunited as one and will bring forth death. Ikutsuki tells the group that sacrifices may be needed to bring forth the fall, and in no time he commands Igus to capture the group. The group is hung up on crosses and Ikutsuki keeps Mitsuru's father at Igus' gunpoint. Before Igus can execute him, Mitsuru begs Igus not to shoot. This momentarily snaps her out of Ikutsuki's control, and Mitsuru's father uses this time to shoot Ikutsuki. Both both of the men are shot by each other, but Mitsuru's dad is fatally wounded. Ikutsuki commands Igus to commence the sacrifice, but she cannot bring herself to do it as Minato's face reminds her of the promise she made to herself, that is to protect Minato at any cost. Igus is able to break free of Ikutsuki's control and breaks everyone out of their shackles. Ikutsuki, knowing he's outmatched, commits suicide by jumping off of Tartarus. The group is shaken up over the events and is left wondering if the fall Ikutsuki was talking about will happen without sacrifices. A few days later, on November 9th, a new student transfers into Minato's class. Ryoji here is a very polite kid who immediately asks Igus on a date. For some strange reason, Igus believes that Ryoji is a dangerous person. The group dismisses Igus' warning and befriends Ryoji. Him and Junpei especially become good friends. There's even a cool scene where the boys spend some time together during one of the school trips. On December 2nd, Igus finally understands why she feels aggression towards Ryoji, and confronts him on the Moonlight Bridge during the Dark Hour. At first, Ryoji has no idea why he's there, explaining that it called to him. Igus reveals that 10 years ago they battled in this same location and that Ryoji is death itself. 
It turns out that Igus was created with the purpose of defeating death and stopping the fall from happening, but she wasn't strong enough to do it. As a last ditch effort, she sealed death inside a nearby child, who turned out to be Minato. Minato carried death inside of him until he awakened his persona at the beginning of the game, which is why Orpheus transformed into Thanatos during his first battle. With death awakened and the 12 major arcana defeated, they all returned into one being, Ryoji. Now that he knows the truth, Igus and Ryoji have their rematch. Ryoji is able to effortlessly defeat Igus, nearly killing her in the process. Cease quickly makes their way to the Moonlight Bridge, thinking that Igus is battling Strega alone, only to be surprised when they find Ryoji there. Igus admits to Minato that the reason why she wanted to protect him was because she felt guilt from sealing death inside of him against his will. She then collapses and needs to be taken for emergency repairs. Ryoji is taken back to the dorm for questioning, and he reveals what his true purpose is. Ryoji is the appraiser for death. The goddess of death, Nyx, will be drawn to Ryoji, and by the end of the winter, she'll descend on humanity and bring about the end of the world. Despite the group's best effort to find a solution, Ryoji tells him that there's no way to prevent the fall, and that everyone will die no matter what. He offers them a remedy to this issue. Ryoji says if he were to die, the Dark Hour and all the group's memories about those events will disappear. Nyx will still come, but to the members of Seas, it'll be instantaneous, and they won't have to suffer in despair. Ryoji gives the group until December 31st to make the decision, but the final decision will be down to Minato to make, since he's the only one that can kill Ryoji. The group slowly warms up to the idea of facing Nyx head on, even though they know that they'll die. To them, losing their memories of the year isn't worth the trade-off since they know that their meaning to life is the connections they made. The only one against their choice is Igus, who after returning from the Kurijo group, requests that Ryoji be killed. She believes that she failed her purpose as she was created to defeat death, and that she has no value now. Igus expresses that she can't even feel sorrow for Cease because she's just a machine. The group helps Igus realize that her true purpose isn't to only fight shadows, but to live life like everyone else. December 31st comes and Ryoji asks if everyone made their decision. Since everyone is in agreement that they want to fight Nyx, Minato spares him. Ryoji expresses concern for Minato because he doesn't want want him to go through any more suffering, so it gives him one more chance to change his mind and kill him. Minato refuses. Because he realized that he cannot change Minato's mind, he decides to reveal where Nyx will be arriving so they can fulfill their last wish. On January 31st, Nyx will descend on the planet during the Dark Hour. They'll be able to find her at the top of Tartarus because its true purpose is to be a beacon that draws Nyx in. So in the meantime, all they can do is prepare for the final battle. The month of January is my favorite part of the game. The atmosphere is unrivaled in the series. There's an overwhelming sense of dread that fills the city and the civilians. A doomsday cult is started by Strega when they find out that Nyx is going to destroy the world. People even begin to worship death to the point of insanity. The city streets become more and more empty as the promised day approaches. Even through all of that, Seas never loses their motivation to do what they feel is right. This is the point where you can also start Igus's social link and experience more of her character development. I already went over this aspect in my social link review section, so I won't talk about it here. I highly recommend that you prepare for the final battle because once you enter Tartarus on January 31st, you won't be able to leave. So wrap up any social links you have left to do, buy the best equipment you can for your party, fuse yourself a fancy Lucifer's Blade, and finally, make sure you have the best personas for the job. Let's just say I went a tad bit overboard for my setup. Before Seas enters the Dark Hour for the last time, Yukari thinks that if they're able to beat Nyx, that the Dark Hour will disappear and their memories will as a result. Yukari comes up with an idea that they should meet up on Mitsuru and Akihiko graduation day and that they'll meet on the school rooftop and overlook the city together. Before the Nyx Annihilation Squad can reach the top of Tartarus, they're interrupted by Jin and Takaya separately. Not gonna lie, this is just a warm-up match before the main battle. This applies to all the Strega fights if I'm being honest. These guys put up no challenge in their boss battles. It makes me wonder why they're built up to be such a threat if their fights are so pathetic throughout the game. Look at poor Jin here, she just gets fucking slapped. <laughs> With Strega finally taken out of commission, it's time to face Nyx head on. When the group makes it to the top of the tower, they're greeted by Nyx's avatar, who's actually another form of Ryoji. The members of the group each tell Nyx that they're all tired of running away from death, and no matter what happens, they'll defeat Nyx. With that, the final battle begins. Nyx is my favorite boss fight in the entire series. Not just the Persona series, but the entire Megami Tensei series. Nyx has a total of 14 health bars and cycles through the arcanas that represent the full moon shadows that you had to battle throughout the 
game, each one progressing in difficulty, having different skills, and being resistant to different attacks. There's no way I can talk about this boss battle without mentioning the music, easily one of the best songs in the entire soundtrack. It's climactic and also calls back to the Velvet Room song to symbolize that this is indeed the end of the journey. When Nyx switches their arcana to the final one, Death, they become a lot more aggressive and use the most powerful attacks in the game. You're going to need to bring your A game to have enough might to defeat Nyx where it stands. Or you could just do this. Just when the group thought they defeated Nyx, it turns out that they were too late to prevent the fall. Nyx's avatar shoots a beam out of its back towards the moon, and reveals Nyx's true form. Nyx's power is too overwhelming for everyone, and one by one, they begin to fall. Just before Minato loses consciousness, his mind is transported back to the Velvet Room. Igor lets Minato know that his journey is coming to an end very soon, and that the power of his bonds will be the solution to this ordeal. A massive ball of energy forms in front of Minato, and he can hear voices of his friends and loved ones calling out to him, and thanking him for the time they spent together. With the combined with the power of his bonds, a new arcana is born, the universe. And with the power of this new arcana, Minato faces death head on. Even though Nyx is using the power of death on Minato, he still manages to survive every attack. The members of the Nyx Annihilation Squad begin to send their own life energy to Minato so he can have enough power to defeat Nyx with something called the Great Seal. The Dark Hour slowly comes to an end and Tartarus begins to crumble. When the group sees that Minato survived his encounter of Nyx, they're all shocked but happy. Igis, even though she's a robot, sheds a tear for Minato, proving the fact that she's now human. The months go by and before we know it, it's now the beginning of March. Minato, Junpei, and Yukari reminisce on how the passenger went by pretty uneventfully. In fact, it was so forgettable that Junpei and Yukari even forgot how they became friends. During the last few days of the school year, Minato can check up on his Maxto social links and see the epilogues if they have one. In all these conversations, everyone comments how Minato has been looking really tired lately. On graduation day, Minato has become so tired that he hasn't even left the dorm before graduation started. Igus knocks on his door and claims to have remembered the events that transpired before the defeat of Nyx. Igus and Minato go to the school rooftop by themselves so they can just wait for the others to arrive. On the rooftop, we see Igus and Minato relaxing, waiting for their friends. Igus begins to tell Minato that she's found the meaning in life, and rather than doing it myself, I'll just let her explain it. After fighting alongside you and facing the world's end, I finally began to understand what it means to live. Thinking for yourself, not running away, accepting the inevitable. All things eventually come to an end. Every living thing will one day disappear. Only by accepting this can one discover what they truly want, what the meaning of their life will be. I understand now why I was so tormented by my lack of strength. Protecting others became more than just an order I had to obey. I wanted to do it for my own reasons. I realized this once I decided to try and prevent the fall. When I thought I might never see you again, Something else became clear to me. What I wanted most. And so... I made up my mind. I decided that I would continue to protect you. I want to be your strength. I know I'm not the only one who can do this. But that's okay. <laughs> my life will be worth living if it's for this reason. should be happy. Hey! Everyone! I realize now that I have friends as well. You don't have to save the world to find meaning in life. Sometimes, all you need is something simple, like someone to take care of. I'll keep on living no matter what, so that I can protect you. Thank you... for everything. You must be tired. Please... 
get some rest. I'll stay right here with you. Soon, all your friends will be here by your side. That ending made everything worth it. Whenever there's discussion involving Persona 3, one of the first things mentioned is this ending. And for good reason too. It perfectly summarizes what the themes of the game are. We see Igus finally realizing that she has a reason to live. That reason is to protect her friends. Even Minato was subtly given his own answer to life. Throughout the game, you make all these unbreakable bonds with people of the city. You can easily make the case that Minato's reason to live was to keep those bonds safe no matter what the cost was. Even after his final battle with death, Minato kept himself alive until graduation. He was functionally dead for months at that point. When Minato finally passes away, he has a smile on his face. He fulfilled the promise he made to his friends. That's fucking powerful, man. Despite the problems I have with Persona 3, I still think it's a good game, it just misses the mark from being a great one for me. But this ending, it's easily my favorite video game ending ever. The high points, such as some of the social links in the final months of the game, are some of the best parts of this franchise, but when it drags and misses the potential in some parts, it's super noticeable. Look, if it sounds like I was being really critical about Persona 3, I probably was at some point. I still like this game a lot, if I didn't, I wouldn't make a video that's over an hour long about it. I wouldn't have gone out of my way to do every social link and talk so much about them all. I wouldn't spend as much time as I did fusing my favorite personas and even making the best one that I could. Persona 3 has some amazing aspects to it, but also has some stuff that I cannot stand about it. It's important to be critical about the things you like because that's how we can see improvements in the future, even if the thing in question is almost 15 years old at this point. And that was Persona 3. It's a very solid game that's certainly worth your time to check out. Playing the game at your own pace is the best way to experience it for sure. I hope that the thing you take away from this video is the the fact that this franchise means a lot to me, and I just want more people to play these games. They aren't perfect, but they really are special and may resonate with different players. I'm personally a bigger fan of its sequel, Persona 4. I think we're all in agreement that Persona 3 is a pretty good game. I may have some problems with it, but it doesn't mean I don't think the game is good. It's got a unique setting, cool mechanics, and themes that'll stick with you for a very long time. Something I think is perfect, however, is the game's ending. It's bittersweet and reinforces the game's overall message. In case you need a quick reminder, the game ends at the beginning of March. After the defeat of the Goddess of Death, Nyx, the members of the Seas planned on meeting on top of the school on graduation day. Minato and Igus are the first to arrive, and Igus tells Minato that she found the meaning in life and wants to stay by his side. Just as the other members of C's arrive on the school rooftop, Minato passes away with a smile on his face. No more, no less. It's such a powerful way to end the game too. Well, at least that's what I thought. Persona 3 Fest, on top of adding a lot of gameplay improvements and an extra social link, came with something else. It came with an expansion that takes place after the game's ending called The Answer. And The Answer... hmm... I'm not gonna sugarcoat this one. I don't like the answer. I don't like it at all. There are so many things that don't sit right with me from not only a gameplay perspective, but also a story perspective too. So let's just jump right into this one. Persona 3 The Answer takes place a few weeks after the death of Minato. It turns out that the group has grown apart since those events. Hell, Yukari and Akihiko don't even show up to give the revokers to Mitsuru. The other members of Seas have a final celebration of the defeat of the Dark Hour. Not all is well, however, when the clock strikes midnight and the dame seemingly starts over again. Not only that, but a mysterious figure bursts out of a trap door beneath the dorm's carpet and begins to attack. I guess is unable to defeat the new threat and is hopeless to stop the foe from attacking Ken. Before this enemy can lay the final blow on the young kid, I guess has a flash of Minato in her mind. This triggers her to summon her persona, but Athena transforms into Minato's Orpheus mid-attack. I guess is able to defeat the enemy and blacks out afterwards. I guess awakens one day later, equipped with a new armor. It turns out that the members of Seas have all been trapped inside the dormitory and have no way to escape. Not only that, but time won't advance past March 31st. It turns out that the person who attacked the members of Seas is actually an anti-shadow weapon named Metis. 
She claims to be Igus's sister and knows a lot about what's going on in their current situation. Metis explains to Seas that the reason why they're trapped in this time loop is because of something called the Abyss of Time was attracted to them and sprouted under the dorm. She says her only goal is to protect Igus at any cost, and the reason why she attempted to kill Seas was because they're somehow linked to this mysterious area. The group realistically thinks that she's full of shit and believes that there's a way to free themselves from this place further into the Abyss. Igus is appointed leader of this operation because she now has the power of the wild card, much like Minato. Spoiler warning here, this is what the next 15 hours of the runtime is dedicated to. There's next to no plot progression or any real conflict for a long time. There is a scene where the group realizes that they need to hurry up because the dorm only has a limited supply of food and they need to escape. But not too long after that, the issue is solved because they're able to visit a version of Polonial Mall that has the supplies they need. What's the point of even setting up this tension if nothing's going to be done with it? Most of the story falls into this general routine of the members of Seas making it to the bottom of the current section of the Abyss of Time, and are shown a memory of one of the members. All of the memories shown are when they awaken to their personas for the first time, but there's no real rhyme or reason as to why they're shown these memories. If anything, it's just fan service to show scenes like Akihiko and Mitsu meeting for the first time and Yukari receiving her father's letter, but it doesn't add to the story in any way and feels like it's just there to pad the game's runtime. And holy shit, this campaign is needlessly long. My playthrough ended up being around 20 hours, and I can tell you right now that over half of that time was just filler. Now, what are you to expect from the answer gameplay-wise? For starters, the answer doesn't have any of the social elements from the base Persona 3, which is totally reasonable. It's a different kind of game. It's very much a traditional JRPG, where you go through the dungeon, fight some bosses, and reach the end of the area where you discover more of the story. The problem I have isn't the idea behind this structure of content, it's the execution of it. The Abyss of Time is essentially this game's version of Tartarus. Instead of going upstairs, you're descending further down. Just like Tartarus, every floor is randomly generated and keeps a lot of the same rules of structure. Unlike Tartarus, the Abyss of Time isn't divided by blocks, but will change its level theming after about 10 to 15 floors. The selection of level themes is very limited, however, and I found myself getting tired of repeated the themes the further on I went. It doesn't help that unlike Tartarus, you can't break up the repetition by doing another task. So I found myself more aware of this issue since this is the only type of content on offer here. The battle system of the answer is unchanged from the journey, so if you haven't watched my video about it, then you really should so you can understand my general feelings. The cliff notes would be, I think it's good, but there's some design choices I don't agree with. Since I've already talked in depth about the mechanics, I'll instead talk about something the answer royally fucks up, that being the enemy formation and the boss design. In Persona 3 The Journey, most enemy formations were set up in ways to make it easy to knock down all of them if you had the right skills. Sure, sometimes the attack all skills could miss, but it wasn't the end of the world. In the answer, however, there's a catch. Most enemy formations have weaknesses that you can exploit, but in the same formation of enemies, there could be someone that repels that weakness too. So if you try to attack every enemy with a weakness, you'll almost always fail since one asshole doesn't get harmed by that element. It may sound like a small complaint, but this one change completely destroys most of the pace of the combat. Encounters become much more tedious since you can't rely on spells like Mazio in order to take out a group of smaller enemies. There are rare occasions when the enemy formation matches up in a way that you can easily do an all-out attack, but this is few and far between. But these encounters don't even compare to the boss battles. Holy fuck. These are some of the most unfair bosses in the series. Most battles have one big enemy with a bunch of lackeys, right? And what I think you're supposed to do is use small shadows as fodder to get a one more or to keep them stun locked. But the small shadows that do have weaknesses also have a passive skill to raise their evasion against it. Some of these bosses are just obnoxious. They aren't designed with a tactic system in mind at all. Sometimes the bosses pull off some godlike strategy that completely fucks you over. I swear that the AI knows your weaknesses when you get into the fight because of how efficient the bosses are wiping the floor with you. Compare this to yourself who has to work with AI-controlled party members. It's too much for them to handle and they don't have the flexibility to adjust their strategy on the fly. I don't mind hard bosses, but I'm not giving the tools to deal with it properly. Which means that the challenge comes from pure luck. Or you can grind, which is always fun. You get so little experience from most encounters that you'll most likely never be prepared for the bosses, which means I found myself reaching the bottom floor of an area, and instead of fighting a boss, I would just teleport back to the top and grind all the way down before I was even remotely prepared. Just like in the journey, you can take advantage of fusion to create new personas and change your strategy, but they somehow fucked that up too. In the answer, they remove the most useful component for no reason. The compendium doesn't exist in the answer, which means you can't save your fused personas and buy them later if you fuse them away. There was a point when I was a high enough level to fuse the persona Odin with the skill Mind Charge. It's a really good idea to do so, but that would require me to fuse away one of my best personas, Cert. I decided to go ahead and do it since Odin was really useful in the journey and I wanted him on my team again. 
Later on, I got stuck on a boss battle because Odin was weak to wind skills. If this was the journey, I could just go back to the compendium in the Velvet Room and pay the price to get Cert back into my party. To do this in the answer, I had to fuse another Cert and grind him up all the way until he learned the skill Ragnarok just so I can have him back in my party. This alone took almost an hour to do, just so I can have another strategy going into this boss fight. That is a major fucking problem. While I generally dislike the overall game design of the answer, there are still glimmers of what I liked about the journey. It's just not worth sinking hours and hours into it to get so little story progression. If the overall length of this expansion was maybe 6 or 7 hours and cut out a lot of the repetitive content, then it would flow together so much better. Speaking of which, it's time to talk about what exactly happens in this plot, huh? Once again, there's gonna be full spoilers from here on out, so here's your warning now. As Seas descends further into the abyss of time, they encounter a strange figure at every turn. Fuka slowly believes that it's someone they know, but brushes off the possibility. We see Igus go through a night where no matter how hard she tries, she cannot catch up to Minato. Igus collapses on the floor, wondering if her life has any meaning since she failed to keep her promise to Minato. A bright light envelops her and we see her shadow take the form of Metis. The group is confused at what they just saw, and Igus admits that the nightmare they just watched was the last dream that she has had. Metis realizes why the Abyss of Time was attracted to Seas, but before she can say anything, the strange figure appears in front of the team. Metis tells the group that this shadow is the manifestation of the regret Seas has had since Minato's death, and is the main reason as to why they are trapped inside the Abyss of Time. This shadow Minato challenges the group to a battle. It's a pretty cool boss fight as Minato still has his wildcard ability. He uses this power to copy the personas of your current party members. The only one he cannot mimic is Metis since he never knew her when he was alive. Seas manages to take out Shadow Minato and he disappears before their eyes. All the members of Seas are given keys for defeating Shadow Minato, and Metis explains that they are now able to leave the dorm and the Abyss of Time will disappear along with it. Metis also says that there is one door that they haven't opened yet, the door to Minato's room. She says that if they want, they can use the keys to go into Minato's room where they'll be transported to a time before Minato's death. Seas is presented with a choice. Either they accept the past as it is so they can move on in life, or go back in time and attempt to change the past. The group decides to mull over their decision up in the lounge. All the keys need to be united as one so someone can choose the door to go through. Akihiko and Ken are on the side of leaving the past as it is. If it weren't for their experiences of the past year, they wouldn't be the people that they are today. Even though they went through so much pain and loss, they wouldn't change their past for any reason. The only one against this is Yukari, who even after all that happened, would still risk going back to the past so she can see minutes again. And this is where I draw the line with this. Yukari is having troubles with accepting Minato's death, I get that, but she's willing to put the entire world at stake just so she can see him again. It's not even the fact that they don't know that he sacrificed himself to save the world. Ken literally says that that's what happened moments before this. So what exactly was Yukari's plan if they did end up going to the past? She knows that Minato was the reason as to why Nyx was defeated. What was she going to do, stop him from doing that? I get that Yukari is going through some tough times right now, but this just makes her seem stupid. Did she forget that the entire reason for facing Nyx was that they wanted to live? Wasn't the reason for keeping her memories of the past year was because she grew from those experiences? People give Yukari shit, and I certainly agree that she does deserve it, but Mitsuru also deserves her fair share of criticism, if not more than Yukari. Mitsuru encourages Yukari down this path, and even sides with her decision. Not because she agrees with it, but because she promised herself that she would stick by Yukari's side no matter what. Uh, you do know that this is a life or death scenario, right? The game clearly shows that this is the wrong decision, and frames Yukari in an antagonistic way. Way, but the members of Seas all end up battling in groups of two because of this. Yes, I guess herself is torn up about what decision to make, but in the end, she's still in agreement with not fucking with the past. This is supposed to be an emotional moment. The members of Seas are all supposed to be fighting against each other for what they believe in, but in reality, it's more just Yukari that disagrees with the team. It should be Igus, Junpei, Akihiko, Ken, Metis, and Koromaru that just stomps on Yukari and Mitsuru. I don't care that the teams are split up, so it's fair. This is death we're talking about here. I feel as though Yukari's selfishness here is probably the main reason as to why she has garnered such a negative opinion from fans. It feels as though someone in the writing team really wanted to have the members of Seas battle, but they couldn't figure out a way to do so without making Yukari seem like she didn't have any common sense. It's almost like the characters had to regress in terms of character development so this scenario could work. But Trust me, this isn't even the worst part of the answer in my opinion. I guess he merges the victor of this tournament and is granted the true key. Yukari, out of desperation, tries to take the key from Igus, but Menace explains 
it'll only work with Igus because she's the one who forged it. Yukari admits that she made a promise to change the world, but realizes she cannot do it alone, which is why she tried to reverse time. Everyone consoles Yukari, and Igus says that before they leave the Abyss of Time, they should peer into the past one more time to see the real reason as to why Minato died. By changing the door that leads to Polonia Mall, Seize is able to open a new door to the past where they witness what happened during the final battle. It turns out that this great seal is actually Minato's life essence, and it exists for the purpose of not keeping Nyx from destroying the world, but it exists to keep a creature called Arabus from reaching Nyx. Arabus is attracted to Igus' wild card ability and believes that if it kills her, the great seal will be broken. Seize, given the opportunity to face their inner regrets head on, fights Arabus. Arabus is an alright final battle. It doesn't compare to Nyx and has too much HP in my opinion. The most interesting thing Arabus does is charge up an attack that can be interrupted if you do enough damage. Seize manages to take the demon down, but it's revealed that as long as humanity lacks the will to live through hardships, Arabus will return. But this comes with some really heavy implications that if humanity is able to regain their will to live, Minato can come back to life since he won't need to be the seal anymore. And with that, the entire ending of Persona 3 has been ruined. Much like how Chidori's revival made my opinion sour on Junpei's character arc, the idea that Minato can come back to life in any feasible way completely ruins the emotional impact of his death. His fate was supposed to enrich the game's themes, but now it feels like Atlas got cold feet last second. I'm sorry, but I don't like the direction that they took with this and how they wanted to tell this story. Having a story about how the members of Seas would deal with the death of one of their closest companions is a great idea. It was even a possibility that Igus had to consider in her own social link. The idea of a character dying is that their story ends there, and when your story's main theme is how death is the ultimate motivator in life, having someone who can defy that message makes it seem much weaker than it is. This isn't even treated as some impossible task they can't accomplish because by the end of the game, that's their plan. Seas is even optimistic that it's something that they can do, and changing the hearts of society isn't exactly out of the realm of possibility with this series. It just really bums me out to see that with every remake or re-release Persona 3 gets, Atlas pulls further and further away from the game's overall theme. Stuff like Chidori coming back, Shinji not dying, and even Minato getting a get out of jail free card from his fate all makes me less enthusiastic about the story they're trying to tell. Sometimes, stories don't need a happy ending and they should be left how they are. I know that this was a bit of a rant, but that's just how I feel about this scenario. <laughs> and if anything, it's the main reason as to why I think the answer is disappointing. Well, after the defeat of Arabus, Seize is able to unlock the exit, and by going inside, everyone is transported to the Velvet Room. It's revealed that Metis is actually Igus' shadow, and represents part of herself that she wanted to lock away after Minato's death. Over the course of their journey through the Abyss of Time, Igus was able to overcome Minato's death, and is able to accept her human side back into her. It may sound a bit confusing, but shadows representing repressed human emotions isn't exactly new to the series, so it's a nice surprise to see the concept explored here. With that, Igus is able to dream once again. The following day, Seas leaves the dormitory for the last time, but not before Igus requests to not return to the lab since she has a new reason for living. She'll no longer run away from the hardships because with her friends by her side, she'll be able to overcome anything. Igus and the other members of Seas resume their lives, in hope that one day, they'll be able to find a way to change the world so they can rescue their fallen comrade. I know I was super negative about a lot of things in this video, and I just couldn't help myself. There's too much that I think the answer does wrong, but I think there's a few good ideas is here. I like the idea of a story focusing on what the members of Seas thought about the death of Minato. I like the idea that they have to struggle with inner conflict and eventually overcome it because of the bonds they share. I didn't mention it, but I think the soundtrack is really good. The fact that the battle theme is essentially a second verse to the Journey's battle theme is super clever. But I dislike how the answer represents these characters. I think that the content on offer isn't polished enough or paced well enough for a 20 hour investment. I don't like how character development has to be ignored just for the sake of getting cheap drama out of it. And I dislike what the story does to the ending I think so highly of. I'm not saying that Persona 3 the answer ruins Persona 3 as a whole, I'd have to be so fucking stupid to think that it does. Persona 3 is still a really good game that has a lot of things to offer, for better or for worse is up to you to decide. You can just play the journey and completely ignore the answer, hell that's what I did for a long time. I'm the kind of person that can look at a story in its own vacuum and judge it how it is. For me, the story of Persona 3 ended with Minato passing away on graduation day with his friends by his side, and hopefully 
hopefully in the future it stays that way. So the last time we were here, I took a deep look at Persona 3 Fest for the PlayStation 2, and while I think the game was pretty good, it was just shy from true greatness. I had my issues, some small, others not so small, but at the end of that video I still recommended the game while also mentioning that I actually preferred Persona 4 over that game, so allow me to take some time out of your day to explain why. Persona 4 is a game that needs next to no introduction. For the longest time, Persona 4 was the main moneymaker for the company Atlas. While I attribute a lot of Persona's mainstream success to Persona 5, Persona 4 wasn't exactly an unknown game. If you were a fan of JRPGs at the time, you most likely at least heard of Persona 4, even if it was in passing. It also helps that Persona 4's legacy didn't just end after one game. There were two spin-off fighting games that continued the story, two anime adaptations, one good one, an entire manga run, two crossover RPG spin-off titles, a dancing rhythm game, and even a live-action stage play. Yes, this is real and I'd pay so much money to go see this. <laughs> Just like Persona 3, Persona 4 had a re-release featuring extra content including new social links, characters, and new personas. It was titled Persona 4 Golden. It's the version of the game that I'll be using for the basis of this video. For the longest time, Persona 4 Golden was actually an exclusive title for the PlayStation Vita, but as of recently, the game has been ported to Steam. You know what, let's talk about that for a quick second because I have a couple things I want to say about this port. I used what's called a PlayStation TV to record footage for this video. A PlayStation TV is essentially just a PS Vita repurposed as a home console. In case you're wondering why my footage looks a lot lower quality than the Let's Plays you've been seeing recently, that's why. Because I kid you not, only one day after I finished recording all of the footage for Persona 4 Golden, the Steam version was leaked, then released a few days later. And you want to know what I did when I found this out? I fucking bought the game on Steam. Yeah, I'm serious. I bought the game again, and the port is actually pretty good. Seeing the game run at full 1080p HD and 60 frames per second is such a strange experience. The game will sometimes stutter before an all-out attack, but I'm not sure if that's because of the game or a problem with my hardware. If you plan on playing Persona 4, the Steam version is certainly the way to go. So thanks guys! After all the shilling I've done for you in the past, you repay me by making me look like a chump with low quality footage? It's a good port, but I'd appreciate a little warning next time before I put over 90 hours into an inferior version of the game. <sighs> well, anyways, Persona 4 is a very story heavy game because it's not only a character based journey, but it's also a murder mystery story. So going in as blind as possible will provide the best enjoyment. This video will contain spoilers for every social link as well as the main plot. This is your warning now. Please click off the video if you don't want to be spoiled. So with that out of the way, let's get started, shall we? There's a lot of setup needed for this plot, so I'll do my best to recap the first few hours. Persona 4 starts off in a very similar way to Persona 3. You play as a high school student who transfers to the rural town of Inaba so he can live with his uncle Ryotaro Dojima and his cousin Nanako Dojima for one year. This boy is named Yu Narukami, and unlike the Persona 3 protagonist, he isn't anything special. Narukami lived an average life back in the big city and was forced to move out of his comfort zone because his parents are going to be working overseas. While the Dojima family and Narukami make their way back to their home, they stop at a gas station. While the worker fills up the car, they offer Narukami a part-time position since there isn't much to do in the small town. Narukami has a headache after shaking hands with a gas station attendant, but he brushes it off as car sickness. The following day, Narukami tries his best to fit in at his new high school and quickly becomes acquainted with a couple of his classmates. There's Chie Satanaka, a spunky tomboy who loves kung fu movies, Yukiko Amagi, Chie's introverted best friend whose family runs the Amagi Inn. The Amagi Inn is apparently a famous landmark of the town that attracts a lot of tourists, so it's usually very busy there. And finally, there's Yosuke Hanamura. Much like Narukami, Yosuke is also a transfer student. He moved out to Inaba around six months before the game began because of his parents' work. His dad is the manager of a store called Juness. Think of it as Walmart, and since this is a small town run by local businesses, that makes him a bit infamous. More on that later. The first school day ends, but before the students are able to leave, an announcement plays warning everyone to stay inside. Not too far from the school, a student finds a dead body hanging from a telephone pole and informs the police. It turns out that the dead body is that of a TV announcer named Mayumi Yamano. I feel it's important to mention this now because she was involved in a scandal with a political secretary and his idle wife. So seeing that someone who has gained a lot of notoriety recently suddenly passing away from what seems like a homicide sends the town into a bit of a stir. 
Narukami and his new friends actually overhear this information from a few townsfolks who gathered around the crime scene. It's also revealed here that Narukami's uncle Dojima is actually a detective that was assigned to this case, along with his partner Adachi. While all of this is going on, rumors of a mysterious program called the Midnight Channel begin to spread around the high school. Apparently, if you look into a TV at midnight while it's raining outside, you'll be shown your soulmate. Since there isn't much else to do in this town, Narukami and the others try it out. Narukami isn't shown his soulmate, however, as he sees what seems to be a girl from his high school struggling against something. He has another headache and a mysterious voice begins to speak to him. Narukami touches the TV screen and is shocked to realize that he can stick his hand inside of it. The following day, Yosuke, Chie, and Narukami all discuss what they saw the previous night. Yosuke and Chie also saw the same girl on the Midnight Channel, and they think that they have the same soulmate. Narukami tells them about what happened the previous night, but it's brushed off as him having a bad dream. Yosuke even entertains the idea by going to the Juness Electronics section to see if they can go inside the TV. Much to everyone's surprise, Narukami is able to stick his hand inside of the TV. Not only that, he's able to go further inside than expected. Chie and Yosuke accidentally push Narukami inside of the TV due to their panic, and the three end up in this foggy area named the TV World. The group explores the area in hopes of finding a way back to their world. They stumble across this eerie room where there are torn up posters of Mayumi Yamano, as well as a scarf tied up in a noose. The trio stumbles back to the entrance where they run into this odd looking creature that resembles a giant teddy bear. In fact, this creature's name is Teddy and he resides in this world. Before the group can get any answers from Teddy, he summons a stack of televisions and pushes the group inside where they end up back in their own world. The group decides to go their separate ways and try to forget about what just happened. The following day, another tragedy strikes. The student who found Mayumi's dead body, Saki Konishi, is found dead in the morning. She was murdered and strung up alongside a telephone pole much like Mayumi Yamano. Yosuke doesn't take this news all too well because he had feelings for Saki. Yosuke believes that the TV world had something to do with not only Saki's death, but also Mayumi's as the police apparently couldn't find the cause of their deaths. He manages to piece together that the girl everyone saw on the Midnight Channel was Saki, and what we saw that night was her fighting for her own life against something. Yosuke quickly rushes off to Juness to investigate the TV world. Narukami joins him and the two enter the TV as Chie stays behind to hold their lifeline. This goes about as well as you think. Yosuke and Narukami crash down into the TV world and run into Teddy. Teddy believes that the two boys are responsible for the recent disturbances in the TV world since they came in on their own accord. Yosuke's hypothesis is proven correct when Teddy says that two people were forced inside of the TV and killed by creatures called Shadows. The weather in the TV world and the real world are linked. If it becomes foggy in the outside world, then the fog clears in the TV world. When the fog clears, that's when the shadows in the TV world become ravenous and will attempt to kill anyone stuck inside. The group theorizes that someone in the real world is intentionally pushing people inside of the TV with the purpose of killing them. Teddy gives the boy a pair of these slick looking glasses that clears the fog for anyone wearing them, and they make their way to where Teddy sends Saki Konishi before she died. The group manages to find what looks to be a replica of the Inaba shopping district, and Yosuke quickly rushes off to where Saki's family liquor store would be. But before they can get inside, things get hairy. Shadows appear from the entrance of the liquor store, and they surround the group. Narukami has another migraine, and the voice earlier calls out to him once again. When he comes to, Narukami is holding a blank tarot card. And with the oh-so-iconic word, he summons his true self. This doesn't have the same kick as the Persona 3 one, but the visual is still pretty cool. Narukami, with the power of his persona, destroys the shadows with ease. Inside the liquor store, Yosuke finds a photo of himself and Saki torn up. Saki's voice rings through the air, and we hear her true feelings about Yosuke. It turns out that she hated Yosuke, and was only nice to him because he was the Juness store manager's son. You see, since Juness was introduced to Inaba, a lot of local stores have been shutting down due to the lack of business. Saki Konishi ended up having to take a job working at Juness to help support her family, but they didn't approve of her working there. It wasn't just her parents that thought this, as there were many rumors spread about Saki and a lot of people began to talk behind her back and blamed her for ruining her family's business. Yosuke is shocked at Saki's true feelings, but his grieving is interrupted by… another Yosuke. This shadow Yosuke confronts the real one and begins to torment him by revealing his pent up insecurities. It's revealed that Yosuke has a great fear of isolation, and that he only puts on this carefree happy attitude so he could bury these fears. Shadow Yosuke exposes Yosuke's true intentions of exploring the TV world. He didn't do it for Saki's sake, in fact, he did it for a selfish desire to become a hero and get people to like him. Yosuke denies all of this and exclaims that this person in front of him isn't himself, but this denial of reality is what causes the shadow to transform into to a huge monster, leaving Narukami to take care of it. 
The shadow isn't exactly defeated, but it's weakened enough to return to its original form. Yosuke still attempts to deny what's in front of him, but with the help of Narukami, he's able to muster up the courage to face himself. I knew it wasn't lying. I was so ashamed that I didn't want to admit it. You're me, and I'm you. When you get down to it, all of this is me. The power of a persona in Persona 4 is only obtained if you're able to confront yourself. You see, everyone has a shadow. These shadows are repressed negative qualities of the real-life counterparts and are very exaggerated. To use Yosuke as an example, his shadow represents his inner struggle with fear of isolation and his selfish action to use Saki's death as an excuse to explore the TV world, so he could have something exciting in his life. Yosuke is able to come to terms with these feelings inside of him, and he is able to accept the flaws he has. This is what transforms his shadow into a persona. This theme of self-acceptance that eventually turns into self-improvement is very prevalent throughout the game. I'll go into more detail later, but I just wanted to bring it up briefly now to get everyone up to speed. Teddy reveals to the two boys that Saki and the announcer were killed by their own shadows, since they were stuck in the TV when the fog was cleared. Yosuke hypothesizes that if anyone else is thrown inside the TV, they'll be able to save them before the fog clears. With that, a small group of investigators is born. The investigation team will save whoever ends up on the Midnight Channel by going inside the TV rescuing them, all while trying to figure out who the culprit behind these attempted murders are. And that is the basic setup for the plot of Persona 4. That was a lot of information I had to explain there, so I'll summarize. There's a killer on the loose in the town of Inaba who has claimed the lives of two people. His method is kidnapping them and throwing them inside the TV world. Whoever appears on the Midnight Channel will be the killer's next target. Once the victim is inside the TV world, It'll be up to the investigation to go inside and rescue the person before they're killed when the fog is cleared. Along the way, the investigation team will try to attain the identity of the culprit and bring them to justice. The reason why I went into so much detail is because there's a lot of information that's required in order to understand what Persona 4 is actually about. And trust me, you got the abridged version of this because the opening of the game is around 3 hours long. It's a really interesting 3 hours, but it requires a lot of commitment to get through. Since this is a mystery story, all the pieces need to be placed at the start so they become relevant later. We learn that Narukami's uncle is a detective. It's established that the police won't be any help because of the otherworldly mechanics at play. I think that this mystery does a great job at keeping the plot always moving forward. A problem I had with Persona 3's story was that it felt like there were a lot of sections where not a lot was really going on. Sure, there were some times where something interesting is introduced or a revelation is learned, Strega comes to mind even though I personally didn't find them that interesting as characters, but there was a lot of times in that game where it felt like you were just waiting around for something to happen rather than actively trying to pursue a goal. Granted, that was more so because of the way that narrative was structured rather than sloppy writing. It fit the story they were trying to tell in that game. Persona 4 has the characters actively participating in the investigation on multiple occasions. There are many points in the game where Narukami and the other party members will sit down at their meeting spot and discuss theories and piece together the mystery. And as the investigation team gains more members, who are actually the victims that were saved in the TV world, they're able to get closer and closer to the truth. It's not all plot all the time, however. There are parts of the story where the characters need to wait for the killer to make their next move so they can try to get the drop on him. It made waiting around also feel important, and it keeps you on the edge to see what the killer has up their sleeve next. Persona 4 follows a trend started with Persona 3 of dividing the game into two parts. There's the dungeon crawling aspect of the game where you climb floors of randomly generated dungeons in hopes of reaching the end as soon as you can. And then there's also the social simulator aspect. For the sake of not repeating a lot of what I said in the Persona 3 video, I'll mostly be talking about what's changed between the two games. I'll go over the dungeon crawling aspect of the game first. The One More Battle system from Persona 3 has been brought over to this game. To give a quick reminder, the One More Battle system functions like this. Almost every enemy has a weakness that can be exploited with elemental magic. By exploiting this weakness or by landing a critical hit, you knock down the enemy but also receive what's called a One More. Getting a One More means that you can take an extra turn in combat. The meta goal for every battle is to knock down every enemy so that you can perform an all-out attack and deal massive damage to every enemy. It's the same basic idea that Persona 3 had, but there's a lot of differences this time around. If you attack an enemy that's already knocked down, you won't get a one more, but there's a chance that you can make the enemy dizzy. It isn't guaranteed that you'll make the enemy dizzy, but it can be really handy if you do. Being dizzy makes it so you spend a couple of turns on the ground and are helpless. I found this the most useful when there was a really tough enemy that I got a critical hit on, but couldn't exploit the other enemy's weaknesses. It will, at the very least, buy you some time. 
In Persona 3, skills that would hit every enemy had a 90% hit accuracy, which is much lower than the 95% the single target skills had. So skills like Zeo, the basic electric spell, had a higher chance of hitting than the Mazeo skill, the variant that attacks all enemies. This has been changed in Persona 4. The attack all skills now have a 95% accuracy compared to the single target's 98. Trust me, it's a much more substantial change than you think. There's another change to the attack all spells. You don't have to knock down every single enemy with the attack all spells to get a one more. Now all you need to do is at the very least hit a single enemy. On paper, this takes away a lot of the risk involved with attacking every enemy. For the most part, that's true. But because of the way dungeons are structured in this game, the type of skills you use are more important than ever. SP management is now a very important thing to consider throughout the dungeon because it dictates how long you can spend inside the TV world. It's most noticeable early game when your SP pool is very small to start with. This is to encourage the player to take breaks from dungeon crawling because whenever you leave the TV world, your SP and HP will fully restore, but you can't go back into the dungeon until the following day. This is a double-edged sword because you can use the extra time to prepare by getting new equipment and ranking up your social links, but this will drain valuable time that you need in order to finish the dungeon before the deadline. There's much more urgency now in general because if you fail to rescue the victims from the Midnight Channel, that'll be an instant game over. It's important to know that you can finish every dungeon in the game on the first day that they're available if you play your cards right. It's all about how you balance your skills, such as only using magic when you know you can knock down an enemy, and relying on items for healing. For me personally, this is where physical skills got some use, because instead of spending SP to use them, physical skills cost HP. These skills aren't new to Persona 4, but I found them a lot more useful here. Not many enemies are weak to physical attacks, but they do pack one hell of a punch, especially when you charge them up. In case you do end up relying on magic, you aren't out of luck. There are, of course, some items that can be used to restore your SP, but eventually this fox will join the investigation team after you start a social link with it. This fox specializes in SP restoration. It costs a pretty penny, but it's worth it for the full SP restore. The more you rank up the fox's social link, the cheaper the healing will be. I may as well mention this now. Social links with your party members now serve more gameplay purposes. In Persona 3, every social link was just to increase the amount of XP you earn during a fusion. But Persona 4 added some new features that make doing the party member's social links right away more attractive. When you rank up a social link with a party member, they will learn combat abilities and certain skills. These abilities are super useful, such as whenever you get a one more, there's a chance that a party member will ask to do a follow-up attack. These follow-up attacks differ between party members. Chie can instantly KO a random enemy, and Yosuke will get a guaranteed critical hit to instantly knock down an enemy. If a party member is inflicted with a status ailment or is dizzy, your teammate can pick up the slack and instantly cure whoever's inflicted. This is a great gameplay element, but it also thematically fits. The bonds you share with your teammates are important, so becoming close to them in the real world will allow them to become better teammates in combat. It's a great example of the way modern Persona games intertwines its social elements with gameplay. This system isn't perfect, however, because this can lead to some issues with difficulty balance. I would say the hardest parts of Persona 4 is the first couple of dungeons because once the character Risei Kuchikawa joins the team, her social link will become your number one priority. While her social link story is enjoyable, and I'll go into more detail about that later, what you're really after are her social link abilities because holy shit! The skills that Risei learns from her social link are insane. When her social link is maxed out, Risei is the ultimate support party member. She can shield the entire party from an attack that would kill, revive the protagonist if he dies, which this alone is crazy. Risei has a chance of buffing the strength of an all-out attack at random. However, Risei's most deadly form of support is being able to periodically enter the battle and perform an action. These actions adapt to your playstyle and can range from being some HP being restored, maybe she'll give the group some SP if they're in a pinch, but sometimes she will, oh I don't know, give the entire party a free mind charge and power charge. In case you don't know what these skills do, I'll give you a quick reminder. Mind Charge will more than double the damage you deal for one magic attack, and Power Charge is the same except for physical attacks. Only three party members, not counting Narukami, will learn Mind Charge or Power Charge. Chie and Kanji will learn Power Charge, and Naoto will learn Mind Charge. So it's a pretty powerful ability and makes the game much easier. Persona 4 is a much easier game than Persona 3, which can either be a good thing or a bad thing. In my opinion, Persona 4 is a hell of a lot easier, but it's actually more fun to play. For me, games don't need to be brutally hard for me to enjoy them, and I think that for the most part, Persona 4 offers a pretty decent challenge even with the Risei abilities. Obviously, it's going to be much harder on your first playthrough, and even on repeated ones, the game isn't mindless. 
Persona 4 takes a lot of the battle concepts for Persona 3 and streamlines them to make the overall pacing of the battles faster, easier to understand, and most importantly, having the most control over your strategy. Persona 4 bucks Persona 3's tactics menu and gives you the option for direct party member control. Some of the tactics are brought over from Persona 3 if you want to use them, but the game encourages party member control. This small change makes the battles a lot more enjoyable because now you can adjust your strategies on the fly and get more creative with the moves you want to use. No more RNG when it comes to what healing skill you want to use because of some fickle AI. If I want to use the Medea skill to heal my party, then that's up to me, not some vague heal and support tactic. A lot of Persona 3's blood still exists in this game. The fusion system in Persona 3 was basically unchanged other than some quality of life improvements. Combining Persona still functions off the same rules as Persona 3, so if you understand the mechanics that were in play there, then those skills will transfer over to this one. New to Persona 4 Golden's release, you can now manually choose what skills you want to inherit, so making your ideal Persona just got a lot easier. There's also this brand new fusion search function where it just takes the Personas that are currently in your party and tells you what you can make with them. Some Personas have been assigned new Arcana. Arcana is essentially the class of the Persona. A Persona of the Strength Arcana will specialize in physical attacks, and Persona of the Magician Arcana will be good with magic. Arcana doesn't really matter much in terms of combat, but when it comes to the social elements, that's when it's important. But you know your boy had to make some of his favorite Personas because he has no life. But I also have to give a shout out to what is probably the most overpowered Persona in the franchise. There's a Persona of the Tower Arcana called Yoshitsune. Yoshitsune focuses on using physical attacks as well as lightning magic. He's level 75, so you'll have to be near the end of the game in order to fuse him. Why do I bring this guy up? Well, it's because of his unique physical ability called Hasutobe that he learns at level 83. Hasutobe is the best physical move in the game. It deals light damage to all enemies 8 times, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when this baby is power charged, prepare to see your enemies turn into dust. I've been giving Persona 4's combat a lot of praise because I think the improvements it introduces are very substantial and add a lot to the game, but there is an area where I feel as though there weren't any improvements made, that being the dungeons in general. Don't get me wrong, the aesthetics of every dungeon is very unique and actually serves a purpose in giving us an insight to the personal struggle of the person who made it. The first dungeon is a castle because in this girl's mind, she feels as though she's a princess waiting for her knight in shining armor to take her away from her current life in the real world. There's a dungeon that looks like a secret government base because it reflects the state of mind of the character it represents. Sadly, the dungeon's designs doesn't live up to the expectations set by their visuals. Much like Persona 3, the dungeon layout is randomly generated for each floor. The dungeons of Persona 4 are much shorter, ranging from 8 to 11 floors. The size of each floor has been drastically increased, however, so you'll be spending a lot more time exploring every inch here than you would in Persona 3's Tartarus. Some floors in the dungeons actually have a fixed layout because they feature mini-bosses and gimmicks. Though, I'm being very generous when it comes to using the term gimmicks. It's mostly just an extra step you have to take in order to clear out the floor, such as making sure you collect a key in an earlier floor of the dungeon before reaching the end. It's very light and doesn't change a whole lot, but I guess it's there. Sadly, the level design for each floor is once again pretty bland, and because of the new camera angle, feels more cramped. I'm not sure if this is because of budgetary reasons or because Persona 4 is definitely built off Persona 3's engine, but we're once again back to having pre-made chunks of level being remixed for every floor. While the aesthetic of the dungeon changes drastically, the level design all ends up very similar. There's a lot of hallways and doors that go into side paths. It's functional, but in terms of gameplay, it all ends up feeling the same, so the exploration isn't winning any rewards anytime soon. The only time I think that this blocky design fits with any of the aesthetics is with the fourth dungeon because it's based off of a retro video game, so it's intentionally trying to be very grid-like in order to match the way Atlas designed their old games. Persona 4, while taking a lot of its core ideas from Persona 3, changes a few things in the way it structures and content to make it a different experience. Persona 4 still has the characters live a double life of exploring the mysterious TV world while at the same time keeping up with their studies and relationships. However, there's one alteration that completely makes the player rethink their schedule. Tartars from Persona 3 could only be explored at night, making it so that you can at the very least work on one social link per day. There was also a mechanic where the character's condition will change to different states, but there wasn't a lot to worry about since Tartars could be explored at your own pace. Persona 4 removes the tired mechanic, making it so you can explore the TV world whenever you want, which makes it sound like it would be a lot easier to manage. However, you can only explore the TV world during the daytime, and when you return, you're unable to do any other actions for the rest of the night. This change means they have to make a choice every day to either progress on the dungeon or use the day to work on your social links. 
The social system has been expanded so instead of having three social stats, there's now a total of five. There's courage, knowledge, understanding, expression, and diligence. Much like Persona 3, your social stats are important for starting social links as well as performing well on the school tests. Unlike Persona 3, however, there's much more emphasis on this system. Certain dialogue options can only be picked if you meet the required social stat, such as having enough diligence to stay extra late while tutoring a kid, or the most relatable scenario in the world, having enough courage to ask a girl for her phone number instead of using some lame excuse. Much like Persona 3, the social aspect is certainly the main draw of Persona 4. In case you need a quick reminder, social links are essentially the bonds you share with the people around you. There are multiple characters in the town of Inaba that have social links for you to go through. This includes all your party members this time around instead of just the girls. These act as mini stories that focus on personal problems that the characters are going through, as well as developing the world. These social links also serve a gameplay purpose too. As I mentioned earlier, completing social links with your party members will grant you skills that can really help you in battle, but there's a second reward too. By leveling up social links, you can earn more experience for the personas you fuse. Let's say that you're trying to make a persona of the Strength Arcana. The higher the rank your social link is with the character who represents that arcana, the more experience you'll earn during the fusion. By getting the arcana in that social link to rank 10, you unlock the ability to fuse the ultimate persona of that arcana, as well as maxing out the amount of experience you can earn during a fusion. Just like Persona 3, I wanted to max out every social link for this playthrough for the sake of showing off all the content on offer and to take a look to see if any of it's special. I ended up using GameFAQ user Yan Zhu's Persona 4 social link guide to make this possible. It's a day-by-day -day guide that tells you what you should be doing for every social link, all the test answers, and when you should go to the TV world. I recommend you use this guide when doing a run like this for the sake of not tearing your hair out. There are technically 25 social links in Persona 4 Golden, but if we remove the three plot-related ones, that brings us down to 22. But I'm actually going to do something a bit different this time around and remove all the social links involving your party members from this list. Party members' social links are actually very integral to their character development in Persona 4, so rather than constantly interrupting to give context, I'll just combine their social links into when I discuss their characters and their personal struggles. With that out of the way, this gives us a total of 16 to work with this time. This will also be listed in my own personal order rather other than through the number of their arcana, so just a heads up to avoid confusion. Number 1 and 2, The Strength, Ko Ichijo and Daisuke Nagase. This social link is started once you decide to either join the basketball club or the soccer club. This choice is actually very significant because it completely changes the social link. If you decide to join basketball, the social link is about a fellow teammate named Ko, and if you join the soccer team, it changes into being about Daisuke. You can only see one of these social links per playthrough, but I'll be talking about both of them for the sake of covering all bases. Let's talk about Ko first, because I joined the basketball team on my first playthrough. When Narukami joins the basketball team, he ends up befriending his fellow teammate Ko, as well as a member of the soccer team, as well as Ko's childhood friend, Daisuke. Narukami quickly gets along with his new friends and they spend their time after practice eating ramen at the local restaurant. One day, however, Ko cancels last minute and rushes off. Daisuke fills in Narukami with the details. Ko is actually adopted. The Ichijo family is very traditional as well as strict. Ko's grandma doesn't approve of him playing basketball because she believes it to be a barbaric sport. Ko was adopted because his adoptive parents were unable to have a kid, so they hoped that Ko could carry on the Ichijo name as their heir. But it wasn't too long after Ko was adopted that his mother gave birth to a daughter. The responsibility of keeping the family name alive falls onto her because she's blood related. Ko even agrees with that. Something inside Ko changes after that day, however. He begins to space out during practice and even ends up ditching a few days. Narukami eventually finds Ko on the school rooftop after practice and spends some time with him. Ko reveals that he hasn't been getting the same enjoyment out of basketball as he used to. It's not that he dislikes the sport, but he just doesn't have the same drive that he once did. Daisuke decides to set up a small game with another team by blackmailing some of the students once he hears Ko's feelings from Narukami. Ko and Narukami both end up giving it at their all in this game, but they still end up losing in the end. The trio heads up to the roof afterwards and Ko reveals his true feelings to his friends. Ko feels as though he has no more use for the Ichijo family, which is why they're suddenly okay with him making his own decisions. He was adopted because he was supposed to be the heir to the family, but since there is someone who's blood related taking that duty, Ko thinks that he's been replaced and that his family doesn't need him anymore. Ko ends up going to his orphanage and receives a letter written by the person who dropped him off there as a child. It turns out that Ko's blood parents passed away of an unknown illness and his name actually symbolizes healthy. His parents didn't wish for fame or fortune for their son, but they wished that he would have a healthy body so he wouldn't suffer the same fate as they did. 
Later on, something about this letter rubs Ko the wrong way as the signature was quickly smudged off and the paper was in great condition. He theorizes that this letter was actually written by his orphanage because they knew that he was depressed. They told a white lie in order to hopefully keep him happy. Ko realizes that there are people that genuinely care about his happiness and that the bonds he shares with everyone in his life, including Daisuke and Narukami, are what he should be living for. He acknowledges that his relationships with others are what makes Ko who he is today. Ko even confronts his adoptive parents and asks if they actually cared about him or just thought of him as a substitute. Much to his shock, his mother begins to break down crying and calls him stupid for even thinking that they didn't love him. The reason as to why they let up on his interests is because they wanted him to pursue what would make him happy. Ko decides that he wants to study overseas after he graduates so that one day he can help out his family in return for their kindness. Ko hands Narukami the letter written by the orphanage as a symbol. As long as Narukami holds onto that letter, he'll know that he'll always have someone. Ko's story is one about the fear of neglect. He's afraid that his adoptive family will stop caring about him because a new child entered their life. I think it does a great job at showing us how Ko suddenly feels about his situation, but we sadly only get to see glimpses of his relationship with his family, even though it's a core part of the story. And these glimpses are only told to us rather than shown. We learn a lot about Ko, which is super important. It's his story after all. But there's a lot of stuff that's implied off camera. I think it would have been great to see firsthand what it's like for Ko to be at the Ichijo home, but this could be a limitation due to budget, sadly. I think where it matters though, Ko's story does teach a valuable lesson, that being that you're never truly alone. Your relationships are what define you, not the name that you're given. If you decide to join the soccer club, the story will instead focus on Daisuke. When Narukami first joins the soccer team, most of the team members give him zero respect, much to his new friend's dismay. Daisuke hatches a plan to train Narukami himself because he's actually fantastic at soccer. Narukami manages to prove himself to the rest of the soccer team after Daisuke's coaching and ends up being accepted and treated as an equal. Not too long after this, Daisuke begins to slack off during practice. For some reason, he doesn't seem to be giving it his all anymore. Not only that, but even though he seems to be popular with the girls in school, he constantly blows them off and gives them the cold shoulder. Ko and Narukami have a discussion about this at the local restaurant. Ko says that Daisuke used to talk about girls in the way every other guy does, but now it seems as though he can't stand them. Ko believes that this attitude has surfaced because of Daisuke's previous breakup in middle school. Apparently, Daisuke was dumped because he refused to become intimate with her, even going as far as refusing to hold hands. Ko hatches up a plan to go on a group blind date with Narukami and their friend in an attempt to get Daisuke over his fear of commitment. Now, this plan doesn't go too well as Ko confronts Daisuke about his problems and the two begin to argue. Narukami steps in and calms down the two. Ko tells Daisuke that he knows how he's feeling. He knows that Daisuke is afraid of being rejected again and that any effort he puts forward will result in failure, not just in relationships, but even in his hobbies like soccer. The trio heads towards the riverbank and Daisuke admits that Ko is right. Daisuke really did like the girl that he dated back in middle school and in fact, he still has feelings for her. He was just afraid of expressing them to her because he was scared of rejection. Ko tells Daisuke that nothing will be settled unless he talks to his ex-girlfriend one more time. Daisuke takes Ko's advice to heart and talks to his ex after practice the next day. We don't get to see the entire conversation between the two, but it looks like they managed to patch things up. Daisuke's ex cuts the conversation short, however, as she made plans with her new boyfriend, who just so happens to be on Daisuke's soccer team as well. Yikes. Even though Daisuke was rejected, he takes this in stride because he's still happy that he solved their issues, even though he did want to get back together with her. With the help of Narukami and Ko, Daisuke learns that you should always put your best effort forward into things you care about, and that failure is just a natural part of life. Sometimes you'll find success, and other times it can end badly, but that should never demotivate you. I think Daisuke's social link has a lot of interesting ideas, and I think the premise is actually super relatable for a lot of people. Hell, I'm an adult and I still have these feelings that Daisuke has sometimes. The stuff actually involving Daisuke's fear is very interesting, but sadly most of the social link is dedicated to Narukami's training with Daisuke to become a better soccer player. It wasn't until you reach rank 6 out of 10 when the real plot kicks off. That's far too late in my opinion. There are a couple of points where we do get to see firsthand Daisuke's fear of women and failure, but it's only brief. Between the two characters, I drastically prefer Ko's story, because we get to know more about him firsthand rather than just being fed information. Sure, that one also suffers a bit from telling us a story rather than showing it, but there's still a concrete goal from the start of the social link that's developed through its runtime. I think Daisuke's problem is much more relatable than Ko's, but I think that Ko did a much better job at executing a story where we care about the character more. Daisuke is very shut off from his problem, which was the intention no doubt, but it doesn't make for a very compelling plotline. 
Daisuke's story on its own is fine, but there wasn't enough time given to Daisuke's thoughts and feelings to make this one as memorable and as impactful as Ko's. That's not to say it's bad, but there's a lot of missed potential. Something that both social links really do well, however, is showing us the bond that Ko and Daisuke share. I find their friendship very believable and organic, which really adds a lot to both variations of this social link because we see that these characters genuinely care about each other. Number 3, The Moon, I, Ebihara. This social link can only be started after you reach a certain rank in the strength social link. Ai Ebihara will become the team manager of Narukami's team, but she makes it clear that she's only doing it because she skipped too many days of school. Let's just assume that she's managing the basketball team to make it easier. If your courage is high enough, you can actually skip class with her, which starts Ai's social link. Ai seems like a very stuck up person at first, she's very materialistic and cares a lot about her appearance. She even coldly rejects a guy for talking to her because she doesn't think he's attractive enough. One day, after school, Narukami is talking to Ko Ichijo and the other members of the basketball team. The nameless members begin to say some very insensitive stuff involving Ai, such as that she's a loose girl and probably has a sugar daddy. Narukami and Ko both scold the other members for making up things behind her back, and the others leave. Ai comes in after that, overhearing the conversation. She thanks Narukami for standing up to her while they're on the rooftop, and she reveals that she may actually be in love since those events. It turns out that she has a crush on Ko, and she begs Narukami to find out what kind of girl Ko is interested in. It turns out that Ko actually has a crush on Chie when Narukami encounters him in the hallway. Ai is devastated by this news and is tempted to commit suicide by jumping off the school rooftop. Narukami manages to calm her down, and Ai tells her about her painful past. It turns out that Ai was bullied back in middle school because she was overweight and considered gross by the other students. They picked on her and called her names because of her appearance. Even when she confessed to her crush at the time, he called her gross and said that he didn't want to contract any of her germs. Ai's dad came across a fortune one day, so he and his family moved to Inaba, and Ai used this as a fresh start for her. She began to diet and study fashion magazines religiously, causing her to completely lock away her old self so she can be as likable as possible. By the end of the social link, Ai comes to terms with her true feelings and admit that she only skipped school and wore fashionable accessories for the purpose of getting attention from others. This didn't give her the happiness she wanted, but with the help of Narukami, she was able to face that part of herself. She drops the facade of being this desirable girl and lets the true Ai Hebihara back into her life. I enjoy Ai's social link. It shows how destructive insecurities actually are, and that what Ai didn't know she wanted was actually right in front of her the entire time. The companionship she wanted came from just being herself and not because she worked hard to look as attractive as possible. It's a simple story. It's not the looks that matter, it's what's really inside that counts. It's hard to write a character that's very unlikable by intention and win people over into caring about them, and sometimes I think that they try a little too hard to make her a bitch. But it's clear that her attitude comes from past trauma from bullying rather than some sort of superiority complex. Number 4, The Hanged Man, Naoki Konishi. If that name sounds familiar, that's because Naoki is actually related to one of the original murder victims, Saki Konishi. After the death of his older sister, Naoki was actually socially outcast, but not in the way that you may think. Naoki hates the pity that he's received and the special treatment that has been given to him. The only person he opens up to is Narukami because he's the only one who talks to him honestly. Naoki's social link focuses on him learning how to grieve from his sister's death. We learn some things about the relationship the two had, such as how Saki ate Naoki's cream puffs from the fridge and used the excuse that they were going to expire as a cover-up. So when Naoki's cream puffs were still in the fridge long after their expiration date, that's when he realized that his sister was truly gone. Eventually, Naoki and Narukami go to the spot where Saki's body was found by the police and Naoki reveals he's purposely been avoiding this area. He thought of himself as cold and disconnected because he didn't cry like the people did on TV. Thanks to Narukami, Naoki is able to release his pent-up feelings and is finally able to mourn the loss of his sister. A bit later, Naoki takes Narukami to the riverbank and thanks him for everything. He reveals to Narukami that he wants to help out the family business so that they can become a competitor to the Superstore. I really like Naoki's story. I only really covered the general beats, but there's a lot of time dedicated to how Naoki sees the world. He has a very grim outlook on life because of the horrible events that took place not too long ago. But he tries to work through it with the help of Narukami. Naoki even goes to Juness and talks to Yosuke, and the two are able to relate on some level. We get to see how Naoki reacts to pity when a housewife scolds him for being unsafe, and worries that he'll end up like his sister. Naoki keeps to himself and only gives short responses, and is unable to yell because it could damage the family business, but he's grateful that Narukami tells the lady off for him. This works as a great reminder to what the damage the killer is causing if the investigation team is unable to catch him. Number 5 and 6, The Sun, Yumi Ozawa and Ayane Matsunaga. Just like the strength 
strength social link, this one changes depending on what club you pick. You have the choice between the music club as well as the drama club. These two characters are completely separate, unlike Ko and Daisuke, who made frequent cameos in their social links. If you decide to join the drama club, you'll start a social link with Yumi Ozawa. Yumi is an ace at the drama club. She takes charge and really gets into her role. She goes above and beyond and helps Narukami practice even after the rest of the club leaves. Yumi does take her roles very seriously, however, since once she's chosen to be the lead female actress for a play, she almost completely disregards her friends and family just to stay focused on her training. One day, Yumi is informed that her mother has collapsed and is in the hospital. She rushes off and Narukami follows closely behind. It turns out that Yumi's mother lied to her daughter in order to get her to the hospital because Yumi's father is actually the one who's in trouble. Yumi Yumi's father divorced his wife so they could be with another woman, and Yumi resents him for it. She wouldn't have gone to the hospital if she knew the truth to begin with, so the white lie was necessary. At first, Yumi is upset at Narukami for eavesdropping on him, but ends up appreciating the company. Yumi begins to stop going to the drama practice and eventually decides that it might be the best if she quits the drama club and get a job to support her mother. Yumi's mom began to overwork herself so she could support Yumi and her dying ex-husband. She ended up collapsing and stayed in the hospital from exhaustion. Yumi's father desperately tries to reconnect with her daughter during her visits, and Yumi becomes conflicted. She hates her father for abandoning her mother, but she's thankful for her own birth. She doesn't have the chance to thank him in person because during one of the hospital visits, Yumi's father passes away, but not before he apologizes to his daughter about not being there for her. Even though Yumi doesn't forgive her father, she still sobs because of his death. During the next drama practice, Yumi is zoned out. She doesn't even notice the practice is over until Narukami points it out. Yumi then realizes why she devoted so much time to acting. She used it as a coping mechanism to hide her sorrow away. It was a chance for her to pretend that her life was different, and this was her way of escaping. After realizing this, Yumi decides that she'll be quitting the drama club so that she can use her free time to support her mother. She thanks Narukami for listening to and supporting her. Yumi, throughout the social link, is shown to be very conflicted about her feelings towards her father. Even though she says she hates him, I think part of Yumi at least still cared about him. I like the story, but Narukami is less of an active force in this story and more so of an observer. What I mean is, there aren't many choices that are made by Narukami that changes the perspective of Yumi like the other social links do. He's more so just a shoulder to cry on, which could be a nice change of pace for some people because sometimes all you need is someone to just be by your side during rough times. There isn't much of a discernible lesson this time around either. It's revealed near the end that Yumi used acting as an escape, but there aren't any examples of this happening during the social link. In Daisuke's social link, we get some first-hand experience how his fear of failure affects him. Yumi doesn't have any moments like this that really show how engrossed in acting she gets. We do see a scene where she really gets into her role, but because it's unclear whether she's using this as a coping mechanism or not, I just assumed that was because she was a talented actor. Joining the music club means that you'll form a bond with one of the trombone players, Ayane Matsunaga. Ayane is basically the opposite of Yumi. Yumi is very talented and outgoing, while Ayane struggles with her instrument of choice, so she ends up not being selected for public performances. One day, the other trombone player ends up injuring his arm, so Ayane has to fill the role for him. Even though the song that was picked has a trombone solo, the captain encourages her on and believes that she'll be able to do it. Ayane, with the help of Narukami, begins to practice and she actually begins to improve a lot from where she started. On the day of the public performance, the trombone player who injured himself, Takeru, arrives and announces that he made a full recovery and is able to play. Despite the fact that everyone is okay with Ayane taking the role, even Takeru himself, she decides to back down and give the job back to him. Ayane beats herself up over this decision. Her dream was to become an accomplished musician, but the moment she had her potential big break, she let it go because of her inner self-esteem issues. She decides that she'll need to be more selfish, but not in a destructive way. She learns that she'll need to go for certain opportunities rather than backing down and letting other people take them. Yeah, this one was just okay. It's a simple story for what is a very common issue that people have. Something that I notice is how similar the club stories actually are. There's Ko and Yumi, whose stories are about family relationships, and then there's Daisuke and Ayane, whose stories are both about self-esteem problems. Though, Daisuke's are from a past experience that affects his life and relationships, and Ayane's is more so just her growing out of her bubble. Ayane's self-esteem isn't something that really comes up in the social link until near the end, as in the moment she steps down from the role. It's not established beforehand, so it just sort of comes out of nowhere. Unless you count her wanting to play the flute instead of the trombone so she can blend in as a good way of showing her struggle, which I personally don't because of how minor it is. 
I think what would have improved this social link would have been having more emphasis on her self-esteem from the get-go. It's honestly the same problem I have with Daisuke's, and much like that one, I prefer their counterpart social links. Maybe I'm just a bigger fan of seeing stories that involve family issues. Speaking of which... Number 7, The Temperance, Iri Minami. Something new to the franchise starting with Persona 4 is the introduction of part-time jobs Narukami can take. These jobs require a certain social stat to be at a certain level in order to take. It's a decent way of earning money while at the same time working on social links. Narukami takes up the part-time job while working at a daycare and meets a child named Yuta, as well as his mother Iri. On the way home from work one day, Narukami comes across Iri and begins to talk to her. Iri hints at a strained relationship between her and Yuta because the two aren't actually related by blood. She's Yuta's stepmother. Iri's husband is working abroad so it's just her and her stepson. Iri's husband actually already had Yuta as a son, and she didn't know until the day the two got married. At first, she didn't mind the idea because that would mean she'd be a stay-at-home mother, but she doesn't seem to be making the effort to connect with her new son. Rather than trying to talk to her son, she subscribes to these spiritual theories of destiny being set in stone, so she thinks that any efforts to close the distance between the two would be pointless. We even see this from Yuta's perspective as he himself doesn't try to communicate with Eerie, even if it's something as simple as asking to use the TV. This lack of communication causes the two to become even more distant than before. Narukami notices that Yuta has an interest in a fictional TV series called Featherman R and suggests to Iri that she buys him a toy based off that show. This actually does a bit in improving their connection as Yuta asks Narukami what he should do in return for her kindness. These happy times are cut short however as Yuta's teacher berates Iri because Yuta's a poor student who's prone to violence, which is something Iri buys into. As Iri begins to cry to herself, Yuta mistakes this as Narukami bullying her and the kid fucking decks him in the stomach. Strangely enough, this actually brought Iri and her stepson closer as Yuta referred to her as his mom for the first time. Yuta finally accepts Iri as his mother, and she admits to Narukami that all the labels people gave Yuta were not true, and he's actually a really sweet kid. Iri realizes that she fell into believing what other people said about Yuta because she was afraid of facing her son due to the insecurity of not being his biological mother. At the end of the social link, Iri reveals that Yuta is being pulled from the daycare of his own volition, so that he and his mom can spend time together and become closer. This is a really cool concept for a story, but it's a shame that Eerie's character kinda brings it down for me. In personal stories like this, the character's likability and their actions are very important to make them have the most emotional impact. Eerie goes on and on about how she's tried to connect with Yuta, but when we get to see it in action, it doesn't seem like she puts her best effort in. I get that this is a result of her inner struggle, but it doesn't really leave a good taste in my mouth. I understand that this is more of a me problem rather than one to do with bad writing, but I honestly believe that Yuta puts way more effort into connecting with his stepmom if I'm being honest. Eerie comes off as a what was me type of character because of her belief in people's inability to change their own fate. So a lot of my complaints really come from a personal preference. The actual pacing of the social link is pretty good. There's a clear goal that's being worked towards on and the events lead off of each other naturally. It's a case of the character the story follows itself being the issue. And if you're having a character-based story, it's a pretty noticeable problem. This is one of the lowest social links in my eyes. Number 8, The Tower, Shu Nakajima. She was a very bright student that hires Narukami to tutor him since cram school wasn't doing a good job. Shu is very adamant at always trying to get the top score on every test in school, and his mom is very proud of her son for that. Shu slowly opens up to Narukami the more he tutors him. Apparently, a new student transferred into Shu's class who's very boastful, but because he can't beat Shu's test scores, the other students begin to bully the new student. Shu is very awkward about telling the story and seems very nervous for some reason. As time goes on, Shu becomes nervous about an upcoming test. He tells Narukami that his mom is very boastful about her son's grades and constantly coddles him because of it. Shu tries to act confident and says that he'll get the top score in the class again, but it's pretty easy to tell that he's worried. The next time Narukami goes to Shu's house, the kid tries to tell him something but can't seem to get the words out. Shu's mom suddenly bursts into the room and tries to confirm what she just heard on the phone was true. Shu begs Narukami to leave so he can talk to his mother alone. The next time Narukami goes to Shu's house, he notices that he looks very down in the dumps about something. Narukami looks at the calendar on Shu's wall and notices that it's his birthday. Shu admits that he forgot about his own birthday and reveals that his mom most likely did too because she isn't even home. Narukami quickly calls his friends up and sets up a birthday party for Shu. And you know what? That's pretty cool. When everything settles down and it's just the two boys again, Shu tells Narukami what happened. Apparently, Shu cheated on the test that he was talking about earlier because he was worried he wasn't going to get the best score in the class. Shu wasn't telling the truth when he was talking about that transfer student. It turns out the new student came from a school that was way above Shu's in terms of grades. So the new kid ended up beating Shu in the only thing he's good at. 
Shu, out of desperation, cheated on the exams so that people would stop making fun of him, and because he was worried that his mom wouldn't love him if he wasn't number one. When Shu's mom found out that he cheated, she said some really nasty things to him, such as how she thought that Shu wasn't even her son anymore. Narukami stays with Shu to comfort him during this emotional episode. Shu's suspension wasn't very long, and it turns out that his mother actually didn't forget about his birthday because she went out to get cake to celebrate. She apologizes to him about the horrible things she said and that she didn't mean any of it. She wants to start over her relationship with her son so that they can have a brighter future. Shu realizes that his mother will love him no matter what, and that obsessing about his grades is doing more harm than good. Shu gives Narukami the test scores that he got back from the mock exam so that when the years go by, Shu can look back and realize how dumb he was for thinking that his test scores were the only reason his mom loved him. I like the social link a lot. There's a lot of subtleties in this social link in comparison to the rest. Shu is very shy and isn't good at making friends, so a majority of his social link is dedicated to building up a relationship between him and Narukami. It's only after Shu begins to trust his tutor is when he slowly opens up about his insecurities. Shu is desperate to keep his spot as the best student when the new student begins to surpass his test scores. He damages his future because he was afraid of not being loved by his mother anymore because his grades were a point of pride for her. This mark on his permanent record was a blessing in disguise, because if Shu only stuck to his studies, got into a good college, and got a good job, he'd feel empty on the inside because of his lack of real relationships. It's only thanks to Narukami's companionship that Shu was able to get a new perspective on life. It's okay to goof off sometimes and not only focus on your studies. That doesn't mean you should neglect them, otherwise you'll end up making Persona videos on YouTube instead of having an actual career. Number 9. The Devil, Sayoko Uehara Narukami can take up the job of being a hospital janitor at night. After working there, he befriends a very flirty nurse named Sayoko. Sayoko has some deep issues. She used to work at a hospital in the big city, but was forced to transfer down to Inaba because of an incident involving another doctor who she used to have a relationship with. One of Sayoko's patients at the old hospital was a young child who dreamed of going to school and marrying Sayoko when he grew up, but passes away not too long after the social link begins. Sayoko genuinely cared about the boy, so something sparked inside of her and she became a workaholic after those events. Sayoko became a lot nastier to the nurses around her and demands everyone to work much harder. She ends up pushing herself to the point of collapsing from exhaustion. With the help of Narukami, Sayoko is able to admit to herself that she lost sight of her goal. Sayoko tried to drown out her pain and only focus on the work because deep down, she had abandonment issues. She grew to hate hospitals because after her job was done, she'd be alone again. Sayoko is able to remember the reason as to why she became a nurse in the first place, and that being to save lives. Her selfishness clouded her vision, but with the help of Narukami, she's able to get back on the right track. At the end of the social link, she decides to transfer to another hospital so that she can walk down the path she originally gave up on. In the epilogue, Narukami learns that Sayoko has joined a volunteer medical group so that she can help poorer countries, and is currently stationed in Africa. This one was just okay. It feels directionless at the start, but once Sayoko begins to open up to Narukami, the story becomes more interesting. The main plot is about losing sight of your current goal and learning how to get back on that path, which is something I can relate to on a personal level. This is another case where the social link means a lot on if you enjoy the character's personality, and thankfully, I think Sayoko does make a memorable first impression. Number 10, Death, Hisano Kuroda. Hisano's social link can be accessed once you worked at the hospital enough times. Narukami learns that she spends time down by the riverbank on Sundays. Hisano is an elderly woman whose husband recently passed away due to an illness. For some reason, Hisano believes that she's death itself, but it isn't clear at first why she thinks that. This social link focuses on Hisano telling Narukami about the relationship the two shared, because Narukami reminds her of her husband when she was young. Hisano's husband was an actor that would visit Inaba once a year during his tours. Hisano took interest in him and the two hit it off really well. They'd even send letters to each other in order to stay in touch until the following year when he would return to Inaba. Eventually, Hisano's husband quit his acting job so he could work in Inaba, as well as take the opportunity to marry Hisano. Hisano reveals that not too long after the two became married, her husband began to suffer from Alzheimer's. As the days went on, his memory of Hisano and his love for her began to deteriorate. Hisano thought it was her duty as his wife to look after him through all of this. It got to the point where every day, Hisano's husband would ask who she was even though she constantly reminded him. This tormented Hisano to the point where she wished for his death, because she believed that her husband died the day his memories were forgotten. Hisano's husband passed away beside who he thought was a complete stranger, but in reality he was with his wife until the very end. 
This was the reason as to why Hisano thought she became death itself, because she wished for him to pass away and go to God. Through her conversations with Narukami, she's able to realize that she isn't some personification of death, but she needs to live out the rest of her life as Hisano because it's what her husband would have wanted. She thanks Narukami for helping her find new meaning in life and reminds him that he should live his life to the fullest because that's what his loved ones would want. I really like the social link. It's a very personal story that's portrayed really well. Hisano does deeply care about her husband, and most of the tragedy behind the social link comes from how she deals with her husband's amnesia. The fact that even though she was in a lot of pain from seeing the man she loves forget about her, but stays by his side because the love they once shared really says a lot about her character. There's a point where Narukami looks for the old letters that Hisano and her husband used to write each other because Hisano accidentally sold them during her store clearance. And when Narukami gets them back, Hisano wants to burn them immediately because she doesn't want to feel the pain of remembering their time together. It's some sad shit, but that's what makes it more memorable and personal. Number 11, The Hermit, That Fox at the Shrine. This one is kind of weird. You remember that fox that I mentioned earlier, the one that can regenerate your SP for a fee? Well, that fox acts as a social link on its own, but it's different than what you would think it would be. This fox doesn't really tell a story, but it's more so just an excuse to get you to do side quests. Once you complete the quest that the fox gives you, the social link rank will increase. The higher the social link rank, the less money it'll cost for you to regenerate SP in the TV world. The only amount of story this one has is once Narukami completes all the requests for the fox. Many offerings are made to the shrine for gratitude. That money is eventually spent on renovations. This unlocks the ability to pray at the shrine to become closer to people faster than usual. There's not a lot to say about this one since it's all depending on doing side quests. These aren't really that interesting because it really only amounts to just going around and talking to people on certain days. It's more so just busy work that you have to remember to do in between days. The only interesting one in my opinion is having to catch the sea guardian fish because there's an entire fishing minigame surrounding it. The fox is certainly my least favorite social link because there isn't a whole lot to think about or examine. It honestly feels like a wasted social link slot that could have been filled by one of the alternate sun or strength social links. Number 12, Justice, Nanako Dojima. Nanako was Narukami's six-year-old cousin that you meet at the start of the game. After an event where Narukami and his friends take Nanako to June S when Dojima cancels the Children Week plans, the social link with her starts. Nanako spends a lot of time at home alone. Her mother passed away because of a car accident, and Dojima has recently become very busy because of the TV world murders, as well as another case that I'll get into later. Because of Dojima's absence, Narukami spends a lot of his free time with his cousin to keep her company. Since Nanako is a very impressionable kid, she believes that her father's absence comes from a place of hatred. She believes that Dojima doesn't love her and that he cares about his job much more than her. Narukami tries to tell her that he only stays out all the time because he wants to make sure that she is safe, but the message doesn't seem to get through to her. Nanako tells Narukami of a student teacher meeting that will be happening at her school, but she thinks that Dojima won't be able to make it. Narukami encourages her that he'll be able to if they ask together. Since Dojima is very caught up in his current case, he struggles to find a time that he'll be able to show up to Nanako's event. She doesn't take this too well and runs away from the house, saying that Dojima isn't her real father. Dojima and Narukami eventually find Nanako, and Dojima requests Narukami to talk to her alone since she'll be more willing to listen to him speak right now. Narukami tells Nanako that Dojima is worried about her, and that he was the one who managed to find her. The two share a heart-to-heart -heart where Nanako expresses how much she misses her mother, and believes that Dojima doesn't even remember her because he took down all the photos of them together as a family. With the help of Narukami, Nanako is able to realize that her father does deeply love her. Dojima even filled out the parent-teacher report saying that he'll be able to show up any time that they want him there. Narukami also shows her a photograph that was with the paper. It's a picture that was taken when Dojima, Nanako, and her mother all went to go pick flowers together. That's when Nanako finally understands that Dojima is also lonely because of the absence of his wife. Nanako now knows that she'll also have to be there for her father because he deeply misses his wife. This social link is rather unique because it focuses on how a strained relationship between parents and their children can really mess them up. Nanako is 6 years old, it's important to remember that, so she doesn't fully grasp the importance of Dojima's job. In fact, she doesn't know what's keeping her father so busy. But because she's so young, this neglect from her father has left a huge impact on her. Narukami being there for Nanako to comfort her was the thing that she needed most. The most important lesson Nanako learns is that just because her father is absent, that doesn't mean he doesn't love her. It may sound like I skimmed over some information, but that's because this is technically one side of the story. This social link was certainly intended to be completed alongside the next one because the two intertwined. Number 13, The Hierophant, Ryotaro Dojima. Ryotaro Dojima is Narukami's uncle who works as a detective. His social link revolves around an unhealthy obsession he has with an old case and how it's affecting his relationship with Nanako. 
The more time Narukami spends with Dojima, the more we see that he's been neglecting his daughter, not out of malice, but because of his inner pain. Nanako reminds Dojima of his wife, who tragically died in a hit and run a few years prior. Since the person responsible was never identified due to a lack of witnesses, Dojima has taken up the responsibility to bring this person to justice in his own time. Though this comes with the consequence of not being able to spend a lot of time with his daughter. Dojima eventually turns up empty handed, and with the help of Narukami, he realizes something important. Dojima was afraid of confronting Nanako because he was stuck in the past and was unable to accept the death of his wife. Seeing how his daughter has changed made Dojima afraid of being left behind again. In fact, he was scared of even taking Narukami in because he didn't want to become a family again. Dojima is afraid of losing what he has. Dojima gives up on chasing loose ends and vows to spend more time with his daughter. Dojima gives Narukami the coffee mug that his wife used to symbolize that Narukami is now a part of the Dojima family. Nanako and Ryotaro's social links complement each other really well. We learn what exactly was keeping Dojima away from spending time with his daughter, as well as his own insecurities. All the while how we see Dojima's absence has been affecting his daughter. Between the two, I prefer to see Dojima's perspective because it's a pretty tragic story of a man whose obsessions have been ruining his relationship with his daughter. And the fact that we have an entire social link dedicated to the perspective of Nanako really enhances the story of Dojima's. It's pretty much integral to play through both of them because that's how you get to see the full picture. And correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the only social link in the series that does this sort of thing to an extent. Excluding the party members, Dojima certainly has my favorite social link in the game. Number 14, The Jester, Toru Adachi. I briefly mentioned him earlier, but Toru Adachi is Dojima's partner at the police station. This is actually a brand new social link that was added in Persona 4 Golden. Adachi is a bit of a slacker and doesn't know when to shut up, which is actually used to the benefit of the investigation team since he accidentally reveals information to the group involving the case. Throughout Adachi's social link, we learn about his personal life. Adachi lives by himself and apparently can't even cook. As a result, his diet has become very poor, so Narukami invites him over to Dojima's place so he can cook dinner for him. Adachi is surprised by this offer and is somewhat reluctant, but he ends up coming over the following night anyways. Adachi is a pretty nice guy on the outside, but we get hints that he has some personal problems. He doesn't think highly of Inaba as a shut-in. Adachi lacks social skills and takes people's kind offers for granted. But the more time he spends with Narukami, the more we see that Adachi really does care for Narukami and his boss Dojima. Adachi even worries about Narukami when a tragedy happens later in the game. I like Adachi's social link mostly for his character. It's different than the other ones because there isn't some sort of lesson to be learned or some inner struggle that's worked on. It's more so just a look at Adachi's worldviews. Number 15, The Empress, Margaret. Persona 3 featured a set of quests from Elizabeth where you had to fuse a persona with a specific skill to get a reward. Persona 4 brings us back and acts as Margaret's social link. The intent is to give an idea of what exactly you can do with the fusion system. The personas you have to make are relatively good, especially the trumpeter with mind charge, but this is another case of the social link being focused on gameplay rather than story. But since you're already fusing a lot of personas throughout the game already, a tutorial is sort of unnecessary. I can't fault the game for wanting to have some sort of fusion challenge, but this is all information that can be found online with a quick google search. It's what I, and most likely many others, ended up doing. There's something interesting you can do after you max out Margaret's social link, however. On a New Game Plus save file, if you talk to Margaret during the last day of the game and are on the true ending, she'll have a conversation with Narukami. She reveals that her sister Elizabeth left the Velvet Room of her own volition, which greatly surprised her. She thinks that it's because Elizabeth found her own meaning in life thanks to the Persona 3 protagonist. Margaret wishes to find out the meaning in her own life, and invites Narukami to battle her in the Heaven Dungeon. Since I was already doing a New Game Plus run for the sake of seeing all the social links, I decided to take her up on the offer since there's nothing to lose. Margaret is certainly the hardest opponent in the game, and you need to be prepared to fight her. Margaret's main gimmick is that she switches personas every turn, and each one has their own strengths and can drain certain elements. Something to watch out for is the invisible timer that this fight has. After Marker does 25 turns, she'll attack you with a special version of Mega Dolan that'll deal 9,999 damage and cannot be blocked or dodged. That's where the real challenge of this fight comes from, because Margaret is a tank that can deal out damage and has a crazy amount of HP to boot. Functionally, it isn't much different than the Elizabeth fight from Persona 3, but there's a drastic change that makes the fight a lot less stressful, and much more fun in my opinion. Instead of this being a solely one-on-one -on -one battle, you're actually able to fight alongside your party members. Is this easier than Elizabeth? Yes. Is it a lot more fun? I think so. Will I ever stream my fight against Elizabeth eventually because I never did it in a video? Most likely. Margaret has a few nasty tricks up her sleeve. You should have seen the look on my face when she busted out her own Yoshitsune and did her own Hasatobe. Also when you're around halfway through the fight, she'll just say fuck it and use the Arahan and fully heal herself. But I stuck with it, and I managed to beat her with some skill and a lot of luck.
Just watch. No! When Margaret is defeated, she understands why Elizabeth decided to leave and tells Narakami a story. Elizabeth left the Velvet Room because someone close to her sacrificed his life in order to become a seal. His soul acts as a barrier that is protecting mankind from the ultimate destruction, and she plans on gathering the people closest to him in order to save this boy from his fate. Narukami manages to show Margaret the limitless potential of mankind and has opened her eyes to it, much like her sister before her. It's pretty obvious what this is referencing. Number 16, The Aeon, Marie. Marie is a brand new character that was advertised with Persona 4 Golden. She's a mysterious girl who's suffering from amnesia and takes resident in the Velvet Room, offering her assistance with skill cards. Skill cards are as simple as they sound. They're expendable items that can be used to teach any Persona you have the skill listed. Giving them to Marie makes it so you can purchase as many copies of the skill card you want. Marie's social link focuses on her journey of regaining her memories, as well as experiencing the world outside the Velvet Room. Throughout the social link, she'll become acquainted with everyone from the investigation team and begin to learn what it's like to live in this world. It's about halfway through when the social link really begins to focus on the mystery of Marie's past. See, she has this cub in her bag that she doesn't know the origin of or why she even has the thing. The inscriptions on it apparently mean separation, which triggers something inside of Marie, but she quickly forgets about it before she can recall the memory. Marie becomes frustrated at the fact that she has these flashes of memories but quickly forgets about them, but Narukami helps her realize that her old memories don't matter, and that she can create new ones for her to treasure. Marie gives Narukami the comb as a symbol that she'll be moving forward from her mysterious past so that she can focus on the future. On paper, this isn't a bad story, but if I'm going to pull back the curtain a bit, this social link is only one part of a much grander story involving Marie. Marie is super important to the extra content that was added in Golden, and much like my complaints with Rin from Catherine Fullbody, I think the inclusion was very sloppy, but unlike Rin, I think that Marie's character is also a huge issue. In a personal story like this, the likability of the character is very important. It's one of the reasons as to why I couldn't connect with Yukari's story from Persona 3. I found her personality to be very off-putting, but I also wasn't a big fan of her social link in general. Marie in Persona 4 Golden suffers from the same problem, but even more so in my opinion. Though she's also a lot more one-note. She's a cool and distant person unless you accidentally read her poetry, then she becomes flustered when you see her soft side. All of the investigation team consider her a close friend and the girls treat her as competition for Narukami's affection. Marie is also super important to the origin of the Midnight Channel, and is also a key to find out who caused the entire case to begin with. Atlas tried really hard to make Marie important to the overall story of Persona 4, but it doesn't work out because that story was written without Marie in mind. I'll save more of this for later because there's a lot of context from the main plot that's needed to explain why it just doesn't work. Since I'm on the topic, I may as well talk about something a bit more controversial, that being the extra scenes that Persona 4 Golden adds to the game. The original Persona 4 had a very specific mood to it by intention. You live in a small town with not much to do other than to hang out with some friends or work a part-time job to pass the time. Every once in a while, there will be an event to add some extra spice to the world, such as having a school camping trip or spending the night at the Amagi Inn. Persona 4 Golden added a couple more of these scenes, and I'm honestly very mixed. While yes, this gives us more time to explore how the characters would react in certain scenarios, and are for just plain old fun, but there are some scenes added here that really conflict with the tone of the original game. There's a scene where Narukami and his friends go to the beach during summer. That's totally fine and it expands on an earlier scene where the characters all get their scooter licenses. But then there's stuff that doesn't really fit too well, such as a point where the group forms a small band to play a Juness because an idol cancelled last second. This event goes on for a few days with the characters practicing the song and even doing a live performance with a fancy anime cutscene. This feels like a filler episode straight out of an anime or something. And there's also a point near the end of the game where the group goes on a ski trip. Like, where the hell even is this place in relation to Inaba? It kind of shatters the aspect that this place is a shithole with nothing to do when... well, there's actually a lot to do. It feels sort of cliche and that they're leaning too hard into anime tropes with the inclusion of these scenes. The modern Persona games all have anime tropes in them in some form, but they never overshadow the points that the games are trying to make. There's the wacky hot spring scenes, a group date cafe, and the point where the boys try to pick up girls with their scooters. These are all to add points of levity in the story, but Golden takes it too far in my opinion. <laughs> There's a murderer on the loose, guys. Can't we save the band rehearsals for later? A common piece of criticism against Persona 4 Golden, and by extension the original game, is the fact that tonally speaking, the game isn't nearly as dark as the other games before or after it. Which is something I won't deny. 
Just look at Persona 4 Golden's opening movie and compare it to Persona 3's, and see the drastic tonal difference between the two games. I agree that Persona 4 isn't nearly as dark as Persona 3, but is that really such a bad thing? Sure, there's a lot more moments of levity, but that doesn't mean that the story being told is bad or doesn't take itself seriously. It really doesn't matter to me what the tone of the story is as long as it isn't inconsistent or poorly told. With that being said, I think the social links are a huge step up from Persona 3 because almost all of them have their own unique story and are memorable in their own ways. The only ones that I think are bad are Margaret's and the Fox's because they don't really tell a story and just exist for gameplay purposes. There's also the case with Marie where I don't really think highly of her social link because I'm not a fan of her character, and as I said, I'll have more to talk about with her later. To quickly reiterate, I purposely skipped over the social links involving the party members because unlike Persona 3, the social links for the group acts as their character development, so I think it's fitting to combine that in with the character discussions. So let's start off with our first party member, Yosuke Hanamura. I'll quickly get everyone back up to speed since it's been a while since I mentioned the plot. Narukami meets Yosuke not too long after he starts school and the two hit it off nicely. Yosuke is the first person to decide to investigate the TV world because the girl he had a crush on was one of the first victims in the serial murder case in Inaba, and he believes that the TV world has something to do with it. Yosuke encounters his shadow not too long after that and he manages to accept his selfish side with the help of Narukami. It's interesting to note that the characters' personas all share design aspects that their shadows have. Yosuke's persona, Jiraiya, is wearing a scarf that flows like a cape. His shadow also had this during its boss fight. This is supposed to symbolize Yosuke's inner desire to become a hero, which eventually led into his selfish desires. Yosuke takes a lot of charge in the investigation after that. He comes up with a lot of theories and arguably does the most critical thinking out of everyone in the group. Throughout Yosuke's social link, we see that he still has feelings for Saki, even though he knows that she didn't return them. This all culminates in Yosuke blowing up at his co-workers for constantly badmouthing her. Yosuke then tells Narukami that when Saki died, he tried his hardest to forget about her. He wanted to forget that he was stuck in a small town where he was considered an outcast because of his family's business. He tried to bury those emotions deep inside of him because he wanted to be someone special. With the help of Narukami, Yosuke is able to realize that even if he never knew it, he was special to the people around him. Yosuke grew to love the town of Yenaba rather than resenting it because of the bonds he now shares with his friends. Yosuke talks to Narukami down by the riverbank and reveals that deep down, he didn't trust him at first. He was jealous of Narukami's innate abilities and how he was the leader of the investigation team, so instead of letting these feelings take control of him like before, he wants Narukami to quite literally beat these feelings out of him, thinking that it'll make the two equal. Narukami accepts his friend's request and the two have a man-to-man -man brawl to get their emotions sorted out. Right after their fight, Yosuke is able to see things clearly. He vows that he'll live his life as his true self and that he'll hold the time he spent with others dearly. With this new resolve, Yosuke's persona evolves into Susano. I love Yosuke's character. Sure, he can be insensitive at times and he makes mistakes, but I can relate with his struggles of thinking that people don't care about him because he isn't quote-unquote special. Something that his arc does really well is showing the bond that he shares with Narukami. It's really believable that these two are close friends after what they've been through together. What makes Yosuke a great character to me is the fact that after he faces himself and gains his persona, it doesn't erase all negative aspects about him. He acts selfless during the investigation and really does care about Narukami, but he still gets angry, he still gets jealous, but that doesn't mean he's resentful or hates the people around him. It always bothers me whenever I see people discussing his character online and they only refer to him as some perverted comic relief because there's so much more to him than just that role. Sure, they do play up those qualities of Yosuke during certain events for the sake of getting a laugh, but that isn't what defines him. What defines Yosuke is his thoughtfulness and his loyalty to his friends, and by the end of his character arc, Yosuke is able to face the future with a smile. That's what makes him special. Chie Satanaka is the second party member is also one of the founding members of the investigation team. She's a bit of a tomboy and isn't the brightest when it comes to academics. Chie's greatest strength lies in her loyalty to her friends, especially with her best friend Yukiko Amagi. When it's revealed that Yukiko was kidnapped and shoved into the TV world against her will, Chie is very adamant about going inside and saving her, even though she doesn't have the power of a persona. Despite Yosuke and Narukami's warnings, Chie rushes ahead when she hears the voice of her missing friend, unaware that it's Yukiko's shadow. Shadow Yukiko reveals that she's very weak and worthless. She also says that Chie is always around to save her when she's needed most. When Chie hears Yukiko's true feelings, something inside of her changes, and her shadow appears. Shadow Chie expresses that Chie is actually very jealous of Yukiko. She's got good grades, is very popular with boys, and has a really high social status in comparison to Chie. But the fact that Yukiko admitted that she depends on her best friend and that she's nothing without her sent Chie's ego into overdrive. Deep down, Chie would always be with Yukiko because she loved the 
feeling of being depended on. Chie tries to deny this side of her, which causes her shadow to transform. Chie's shadow sits on top of a throne of students wearing the Yasugami high school uniforms, while the shadow itself is dressed as a dominatrix. This is to represent the way Chie believes that she controls her friend and that she's Yukiko's master. The long black hair represents Chie's envy towards Yukiko, as the attack that involves her hair is called Bottomless Envy. When her shadow is defeated, Chie is very reluctant to accept the side of her. With the help of the others, Chie is able to face herself. While it's true that she did have those feelings inside of her, that doesn't change the fact that her friendship with Yukiko is real. Her shadow then transforms into her persona, Tomoe. Chie's social link begins with her and Narukami training together in order to improve their performance in the TV world. Along the way, we learn how Chie and Yukiko first met. Yukiko ran away from home when she tried to bring a stray dog inside and her parents said that she wasn't allowed to have pets in the inn. Chie found her on the side of the road and tried her hardest to cheer her up by making her laugh. Chie vowed to herself from that day onwards that she would always protect Yukiko. She also realized that at some point she lost sight of this and began to care more about herself. She began to only care about being the girl that Yukiko could rely on rather than being her friend. It's this self-acceptance that causes Chie to begin to move on to the right path. Chie already had the tendency to selflessly protect others after awakening to her persona. But it's after the time she spent with Narukami she learns what her power really is for. Her persona isn't used so that she can become more self-reliant, but it's to be used as a shield to protect people she cares about. Near the end of the game, Chie decides that she's going to join the police force under Dojima's guidance. I like Chie, but her character arc doesn't have as big as an impact as the other party members because a lot of her goals and aspirations came from a place of selflessness. There's a point in Chie's life where her priorities switched and were fueled by jealousy rather than to be a good person. All that she needed was to take a step back and examine herself in order to get back on the right track, which I'm sure is something that a lot of people can relate to, but I don't really think it's as strong as the other party members where their entire worldview changes. That doesn't make this bad by any means, but it's certainly weaker in comparison to the other characters, or even some of the other social links. Yukiko Amagi's family runs a hot spring inn known as the Amagi Inn. Yukiko was expected to take over the family business in the future, so she's always busy training herself or working at the inn. This causes her to decline offers to hang out with her friends, and she even needs to skip school from time to time. Lately, she's begun to get a lot of unwanted attention from the media, because the first murder victim, Mayumi Yamano, stayed at the Amagi Inn prior to her death. Yukiko ends up being thrown into the TV world not too long after she's interviewed on TV, and the group discovers this when they saw her on the Midnight Channel, acting almost nothing like her usual self. She goes on and on about how she's some princess in a castle and that she's waiting for her Prince Charming to rescue her. When the group manages to find Yukiko inside the TV world, her shadow believes that she is her Prince Charming that'll take her away from the castle and into a better life. Yukiko hates that most of her life has already been decided by others. She doesn't want to be forced into becoming the manager of her inn and wants to run away, but she can't because she feels chained down. Yukiko's shadows transform when her real life counterpart denies its existence. Shadow Yukiko takes the form of a bird inside of a cage. This isn't too hard to discern that this is supposed to represent that she feels trapped in life. Yukiko herself represents the bird as she sees herself as fragile or something that needs to be taken care of. When Yukiko is able to face herself, she admits that she wanted to run away from her own life or to be saved by someone else. In Yukiko's social link, she reveals that she plans on leaving Inaba so that she can become independent from the inn. Because if she were to stay in the town, she wouldn't be able to live a normal life because of her status as the Amagi Inn heir. So with the help of Narukami, she begins to learn how to live on her own. She decides that after graduation, she'll want to go into interior decoration as her career, but in the meantime, Yukiko begins to learn how to cook for herself and Narukami will taste test. But as Yukiko begins to interact with Narukami more and more, she begins to lose her drive to leave Inaba. Yukiko begins to feel guilty about wanting to turn her back on the people who've done so much for her in the past. She realizes how much she loves the Amagi Inn after she blows up on a shady reporter who threatened to slander the place when she declined an interview. Yukiko decides to not leave Inaba and that she'll work hard to take over the family inn. She never objected to the role of becoming the new manager, but what she didn't like was the prospect of this being forced onto her. That her life was being guided for her rather than living it her own way, which is why she thought running away was the only choice she had. But thanks to Narukami, Yukiko decides that she wants to stay in Inaba so she can protect her family's inn. Yukiko's character arc is a relatively simple one. She wants to rebel against her family's tradition and do her own things in life, but by the end she decides to take over the management by her own accord and not because she's being forced into doing it. So the idea is that it's a change in perspective, because she realizes that she wants to do this with her life and she has the choice to do something else. This revelation is actually foreshadowed in the way her shadow was designed. In case you didn't notice, the cage that the bird was trapped in was actually open the entire time. This is supposed to represent that Yukiko always had the choice of leaving, but in reality was actually too scared to do it herself, which is why she waited for her Prince Charming to rescue her. It's a small detail, but it goes a long way in giving us more insight into her character. 
Kanji Tatsumi is a tough-as-nails man who lacks a lot of social skills. He is an only child and doesn't have a father because he died when Kanji was young. From the little we see of Kanji before he's thrown inside the TV world, he's got an attitude that doesn't take anyone's crap. He even beat up an entire biker gang and was featured on television because of it. When Kanji is kidnapped, the shadow that appears on the Midnight Channel goes against all preconceived notions you might have made about Kanji. His shadow is cartoonishly flamboyant and goes on and on about how he hates being around girls because they're arrogant and self-centered. Shadow Kanji also reveals that it's because of his interest in feminine things, such as sewing, that people would ridicule him and assume that he's some creep. The way Shadow Kanji is designed represents the way Kanji believes people see him when they find out about his hobbies. Kanji's insecurities come from this toxic mindset people have, where if you have any feminine interests, you're obviously some sort of weirdo, or aren't considered a real man, whatever the hell being a real man is supposed to mean. When Kanji's shadow is defeated, Kanji still tries to reject it. That is until the shadow cries out for anyone to accept him for who he really is. Kanji punches it in the face and thinks that he's pathetic for having something like this existing inside of him. Kanji is able to admit to himself that what he really was scared of was the thought of being rejected. So he purposely tried to make everyone hate him so he wouldn't have to go through that pain anymore. Even though Kanji accepts his flaws, that doesn't mean that they no longer exist. His social link is dedicated to him learning how to grow past those flaws and to no longer be afraid of who he really is. There's this boy that becomes involved with the social link early on who lost a stuffed bunny that his friend let him borrow. Apparently some other kid made fun of the boy for having such a girly looking doll and told him that if he was a real man, he'd throw it away. So the boy did it but felt guilty afterwards. Kanji tries his hardest to find the bunny at the riverbank where the kid lost it, and when he can't find it, Kanji comes up with an idea. He tells the boy to apologize to his friend and ask what the doll looked like. The following day, Kanji has brand new dolls made for both the boy and the boy's friend. When the kid asks where he got it from, Kanji admits that he made it himself. He expected to be made fun of because of his talent, but the kid actually thinks Kanji is super cool because of it. Kanji ends up making more dolls, because the people that the kid knows requested to have their own, which Kanji happily obliges to. Kanji gets flustered again when Nanako asks if he could teach her how to make her own dolls. He realizes that even though he accepted his shadow, his heart is still weak. One day, two police officers begin to question Narukami and Kanji because they heard of a small child that was being harassed and bullied. Because of Kanji's appearance and past experience with police, they immediately question him, but Narukami tries to tell them that Kanji is innocent. The small child from earlier comes around and gives Kanji some cookies that his mom baked as a thank you. To clear up the situation, Narukami convinces Kanji to tell the police the truth. It's at this point where Kanji owns up to his interest and innate talents to the police officers, and tells them what went on during recent events to prove his innocence. By the end of the social link, Kanji tells Narukami that after all this time, he was able to visit his father's gravestone alone. Before his dad died, he told Kanji that if he wanted to be a man, he would have to become strong. Kanji didn't know what he meant by that, so he assumed that his father was insulting him for his hobbies. It's the reason why Kanji decided to bleach his hair and start getting into fights. But now, Kanji knows what his father's words really meant. Being a man is about how strong you are physically, or what your interests are. Being true to yourself and always giving your all, that's what being a man is. Before, Kanji would just let people think whatever they wanted about him, but now, he's going to put the effort into getting people to understand him. Kanji is no longer afraid of himself, and he wouldn't be at that point if Narukami wasn't there to be the first person to truly accept him as a person. I love Kanji. His character arc is fantastic, and the message it says is still relevant to this very day. It's a commentary on how horribly judgmental people can be towards people with interests that are considered weird or out of the norm. In Kanji's case, he tries his hardest to overcompensate his masculinity in fear of people labeling him because of his feminine hobbies. All that Kanji wants is to be accepted for who he really is without fear of being vilified or rejected. To this day, there's still a lot of discussion surrounding Kanji's sexuality, and I can't help but feel as though those people miss the point. Kanji's sexuality doesn't matter, and the game makes that clear because by the end of the story, it's still left up in the air. Kanji's interest or orientation isn't what defines him. What makes Kanji so memorable is the way he manages to take charge of his own life and is able to proudly showcase his talents, and if people don't get it, he'll help them understand. Risei Kuchikawa was an idol at the top of her game, but she suddenly decided to quit and move back to her hometown of Inaba to live with her grandmother. When Risei is kidnapped and thrown inside the TV world, the group manages to track her down into a strip club themed dungeon with Risei's shadow taking the form of one of the star girls. Shadow Risei is supposed to represent her inner want for attention. It's the reason why she's presented in such a provocative way. To clarify, she wants attention to her true self, because Risei classifies Rosette, her idol personality, as something completely separate from herself. Risei actually hates Rosette deep down. 
She doesn't like the manufactured personality that she's forced to abide by in order to continue selling more products. Risei is able to accept herself after the defeat of her shadow, and her shadow transforms into the persona Himiko. Risei's social link focuses on her reconnecting with herself after acting as an idol for so long. She even decides to tell her manager right to her face that she doesn't plan on returning to showbiz. After the two get closer, Risei reveals to Narukami the origin of her reset personality. Back when Risei was young, she was very shy and kept to herself. She was a very lonely kid. This eventually led into the other students bullying her for her lack of social skills. Risei submitted an audition for an idol competition in hopes that she could change herself for the better. She ended up winning and was given an opportunity to appear on TV. Risei was excited as her newfound popularity gave her an opportunity to meet new people and potentially form relationships. But this didn't last long, however, as Risei quickly discovered that her friends weren't interested in her, but rather the teen idol Rosette. Which is why it gave Risei such great satisfaction to leave it all behind. Well, that's what she thought. Over the course of time, people began to forget about Rosette, and the talk is about a new up-and-coming idol named Kanami Mishida, also known as Kanamin. It isn't too long before Rosette is old news. Even Risei's old manager moved on to managing Kanamin, as she'll be the one filling in the role that Risei was supposed to have in an up-and-coming movie, but declined. That's when Risei begins to break down in tears for reasons that she couldn't explain herself. She believed that in this moment, she lost everything that she had before. Thankfully, Narukami is there to comfort her. Risei realized something important from this experience. Rizet is an aspect of herself, not some fabricated character that she plays. So she decides that after Narukami has to return home, she'll go back into showbiz, even though she'll have to once again start at the bottom and work her way up. But this time, she'll show the world both Rizet and Risei Kujikawa, as she finally accepts that they are one and the same. I'm pretty mixed on Risei's story. On one hand, as someone who makes YouTube videos, I can relate to the point of having to play a character to an extent. Not to the degree of what Risei did, but there is a disconnect between myself and real life and the way I present myself in my videos. I think that the way Risei's story is told is a bit confusing. I believe that the idea they were going for is that Risei does accept the Brisette idol side of her as well as her shadow at the end of her dungeon, but that doesn't necessarily mean that she liked that aspect about herself. She tried really hard to ignore her life as an idol, but only realized that she actually enjoyed that life after she lost everything. So the point of her arc is realizing that Reset is as much as Risei as her normal self is. That's what I got out of it, and that could be wrong for all I know. That's the major problem I have with this character arc. I just don't think it's told in a very clear way, and I personally got somewhat confused while trying to fully grasp it. The story is certainly carried on whether or not you enjoy Risei as a character. She certainly has the whole notice me senpai trait, but I think that her character does go beyond that trope and is recognizable on its own. Naoto Shiragane is the final party member to join the investigation team, but he was an active force throughout the game beforehand. Naoto was a well-known detective and has been featured in the media often. This granted him the nickname The Detective Prince. Naoto has been assigned to the serial murder case in Itaba and strangely enough wants to solve the case himself without any assistance. He actually ends up making a lot of progress on his own. He manages to deduce that Kanji Tatsumi would be one of the kidnapping victims as well as discovers that people who appear on the TV will eventually be shown on the Midnight Channel. After the investigation team captures who they believe is the culprit behind the murders, Naoto still has his suspicions due to the fact that the murderer's latest target's cause of death was able to be identified, which is something that wasn't possible for the other two victims. Naoto believes that the real culprit is still on the loose and the person that was captured was nothing more than a copycat killer. He also begins to believe that the investigation team has a leg up over the police because the people who disappeared would often join their group after they were found by the police. Naoto takes his job very seriously, and is willing to put his life on the line to act as some sort of bait for the killer. He goes on a TV interview with the purpose of fitting into the pattern of the recent kidnapping victims. Naoto does end up getting kidnapped and is thrown inside of the TV, so the investigation team can go in and save him. This was a reckless attempt at trying to identify the killer's methods, but Naoto was banking on the fact that he'll be saved by Narukami and his friends. As the group gathers more information in order to locate Naoto, Narukami discovers that despite his professional attitude, Naoto is a workaholic who the police believes tries way too hard to solve the cases by himself. As such, they see him as a child who has no idea what he's doing. The investigation team manages to find Naoto inside the TV world, where he was waiting impatiently for them to arrive. Naoto's shadow critiques Naoto himself for acting like the people he hates deep down, telling his shadow to stop throwing a tantrum and not to act like a kid. Shadow Naoto reveals that Naoto has some deeper abandonment issues that were hinted at earlier. While Naoto would work on cases, he'd be praised as an ace detective, but once the case was solved, he wasn't needed anymore. He'd be discarded without a second thought. Naoto always wanted to be one of the cool, manly detectives from fiction. 
and no matter how hard he tries to imitate his idols, he'll never be taken seriously in his workforce because Naoto isn't actually a man to begin with. Despite Naoto's talents as a detective, she'll always be mistreated in that field because of her gender, especially when you remember that this story takes place in Japan where sexism and gender stereotypes are still rife. Naoto works as a detective, which is a predominantly male career, so because of something she can't control, she loses out on a lot of opportunities and doesn't get the treatment that she deserves. It's the reason as to why Naoto dresses and acts like a man. After the investigation team defeats her shadow, Naoto reveals the group her past. Her parents were detectives that died in an accident when Naoto was young. Her grandfather ended up taking her in and raising her. Naoto read a lot of detective novels in her grandfather's study, and ended up wanting to follow in the footsteps of her parents. She started off by helping her grandfather in secret, and eventually gained the title of Junior Detective. Which was something that ended up garnering her a lot of criticism, because if there were any reasons to look down on her, people could just use her age as an excuse. While Naoto can eventually grow older and become an adult, she'll always be criticized for her sex. Naoto realizes that what she should strive for isn't to grow up or become a man, but she should be working towards accepting herself for who she is, which is something that she wouldn't have realized if it wasn't for the help of the investigation team. Naoto's social link is about her learning to work with others. Someone broke into the Shiragani household and robbed the place of certain belongings. This phantom thief sends Naoto letters that not only taunt her, but provide invaluable clues in order to retrieve her stolen items. Narukami ends up helping Naoto a lot when it comes to deciphering what these clues are supposed to mean, and the two make a great team. The items that the two end up recovering all relate back to Naoto's childhood, stuff like a fake detective badge that she made as a kid, or a pen that acts as a multi-tool. Eventually, the two manage to track down who seems to be the Phantom Thief, but he pulls a knife on the two as a threat. Naoto immediately recognizes it as a fake and the man runs off, leaving it behind. It turns out that the man the two encountered was actually Naoto's grandfather's secretary. Naoto's grandfather noticed lately that Naoto lost sight of her original drive of becoming a detective, so he set up these challenges for her so that she could hopefully rediscover herself. Naoto is able to admit to herself that she was pursuing the murder case in Idaba not to seek the truth, but to prove herself to others. She wanted to be known as the fifth in the Shiragani line of detectives so that she could be accepted. Because she found a hope with the investigation team, Naoto is finally able to accept herself. She isn't quite the detective she wants to be yet, but she's going to pursue the truth because that's what matters most to her. Naoto is a really cool character. Despite the fact that she joins the team close to the end of the game, there's still a lot of time spent developing her character before that point. On paper, her inner struggle is similar to Kanji's, but is different enough to make her stand out on her own. I really like how Naoto's social link has her come to terms with her workaholic nature, and she's able to take a step back and realize that her obsession with the Inaba case was because of a selfish desire rather than out of passion. Thanks to Narukami and the investigation team, she finally has a place where she belongs and won't be discarded after the killer is caught. Teddy is a very interesting character. He's introduced near the start of the game, and his character arc goes on throughout most of the game. In fact, his social link is one of the few automatic ones. Teddy is this mysterious creature that Narukami and Yosuke encounter when they go inside the TV world in order to find out what killed Saki Kanishi. Teddy begins to admire Narukami after he awakens to his persona, referring to him as his sensei for almost the entire game after that point. Teddy ends up taking the role as the group's navigator for some time. Despite his outward appearance and his comedic attitude, Teddy is very insecure about his identity. Teddy doesn't remember much of his past. He can only recall waking up in the TV world without any memories. As Teddy spends more time with Narukami and his friends, he begins to feel more lonely after the return to their own world. Even though Teddy is anything but human, he still has human characteristics and even develops an insecurity of his own. Seeing Narukami and the others confront their true selves made Teddy question what exactly he is. Teddy wants to know what his true purpose for being born is. This all comes to a boiling point when Rise confronts her own shadow. Rise believes that she has no real self, and when Teddy hears this, he begins to apply this to himself. Because of Teddy's identity crisis, a shadow is born from him. Shadow Teddy represents his fear of having no past. Deep down, Teddy is afraid that all of his searching will be for nothing. Teddy's shadow even taunts him for that. But with the help of Narukami and the others, Teddy is able to face his fears. Even though Teddy might not find anything, he'll still be himself. Teddy knows that he isn't just a hollow being, and with the help of his new friends, they'll find the truth. Teddy awakens to his persona and is able to fight alongside the front line with the others. Not too long after this, however, Teddy is able to leave the TV world and go into the real world with everyone else. But not only that, he somehow grew a human body in between the last time the investigation team saw him. This is one of the few things that's never properly explained and is more so written off as a joke. According to Teddy himself, he grew a body so he could score with Chie and Yukiko. Alright, sure. Teddy spends a lot of time in the real world and learns how it works. He even builds a strong relationship with Nanako. 
Some progress is made with Teddy's quest to find his identity. He doesn't remember the specifics, but he does recall that the TV world is influenced by the thoughts of the people in the real world. Teddy believes that he was someone special, but can't quite remember how or why. The group even takes Teddy to the doctor so he can be examined. When they get the x-rays back, apparently they're too garbled to even read, which is strange. Around November, tragedy strikes involving the Dojima family, and Teddy feels guilty about not being able to do anything. He feels as though he let Nanako down, so he quite literally fades away from existence. Teddy wanders around the endless fog aimlessly after losing his humanity, until he hears a car approach him. It turns out that Teddy stumbled across the Velvet Room, and he has a conversation with Narukami where he reveals everything. Teddy now remembers his past. It turns out that Teddy has much more in common with shadows than he first thought because, well, he is a shadow. Not a shadow as in a representation of an individual's insecurities, but more so of one of the random enemies that you battle. Teddy is a shadow that somehow gained human emotions and became self-aware. Teddy forced himself to forget that he was a shadow so that people would like him. He even found a way to change his appearance into that of a welcoming bear to achieve this. Teddy locked away his memories and attempted to run away from his true self. With the help of Narukami, Nanako, and his other friends, Teddy is able to realize that just because he's a shadow, that doesn't mean he's worthless to everyone. Even though he was born as a shadow, Teddy was able to overcome the barriers and become his own person. Love him or hate him, Teddy is a pivotal character to the story that Persona 4 is trying to tell. Persona 4, on the surface, may seem like a game about a murder mystery surrounding a small town. While this is a very prominent part of the experience, and is an underlining plot that's told throughout the game, I believe that Persona 4, more than anything else, is a story about identity. There's a lot of people who claim that the party members in Persona 4 don't change once they awaken to their persona. They say that their character arcs end after they face themselves in the TV world and nothing more. I don't agree with this statement at all. Every party member has an ugly side to them that they don't want to admit. Accepting these flaws is certainly the first step, but that doesn't solve the issues entirely. By forming a close bond with each of these characters, Narukami is able to help them grow past these flaws and become better people because of it. It's the reason as to why characters don't awaken to their ultimate personas until you finish their social links. Teddy is a prime example of this. He faces his shadow and accepts that he's fearful of the answers he might find about his past. That doesn't mean that his insecurity magically goes away. It's only after he spends time in the real world forming a bond with his sensei that he's able to grow past his fear and realize that being a shadow means nothing to who he really is. Every character is like this. The way I see it, the character arcs are split up in half. The first half is when they're kidnapped and thrown inside the TV world where they face their shadow. The second half comes from the time that Narukami spends with them in their social links. Sure, I think that some are better than others, but I don't think any of them are bad by any means. Yes, this is the third time I've made this statement throughout the video because that's the point I want to hammer in the most. Persona 4 makes it very clear that the bonds you forge with others are going to be very important throughout the journey. So tying the character development to the bonds is a no-brainer in my eyes. Tying the story directly into the gameplay makes it feel much more personal. Yosuke wouldn't have been able to change the way he did if it wasn't for spending time with Narukami. Everyone changes thanks to Narukami. He was there for them when they needed a shoulder to cry on, someone they could vent to, someone that would make them feel like they mattered in the world. The Persona 4 cast genuinely feels like they're close friends. They're able to laugh together, cry together, make fun of each other for their quirks, and most importantly, accept each other for who they really are. This is something I can't say about Seas or even the Phantom Thieves to an extent. Their individual developments might not matter to the murders in Inaba, but saying that the characters in Persona 4 are one note or don't grow just isn't something that I agree with. Everyone will always have their favorite Persona cast, and I think it's pretty obvious which one is my favorite. Okay, there's not much else for me to go over. So now, I believe it's time to talk about the rest of the game's plot. Remember, this game is a murder mystery. Knowing the answer to the mystery takes a lot of fun out of experiencing it for the first time, so this will be your last warning now. If you don't want to know who the culprit behind the murders in Inaba are, I suggest you get off this video now and play the game yourself. It's on Steam for a cheap price, so I highly recommend it. Let's jump to where Naoto joins the investigation team. At this point in the game, the group has managed to figure out some things about the case. Whenever someone is interviewed on TV, they end up on the Midnight Channel for whatever reason. The killer watches the Midnight Channel, and whoever he sees will be his next target. When Naoto was kidnapped, she was apparently stuffed into the TV very quickly afterwards. According to her, it only took a couple of minutes for her to get thrown in after she was drugged when the doorbell was rung. 
Since the group is unable to come up with any more theories, they decide to wait for the killer's next move. While this is happening, Narukami receives a threatening letter in the mail by who he assumes is the killer. When he shows the letter to the investigation team the next day, Naoto tells him not to show the letter to Dojima, because if he were to be put under surveillance, and if the group were to lose their leader, that would be bad. The days go by like normal until Dojima comes home one day with another letter in his hand. He's very suspicious of the letter and stands by as Narukami opens it up. This letter reads, If you don't stop this time, someone close to you will be put in and killed. Dojima snatches this letter from Narukami, his suspicions proven. Dojima takes Narukami to the police station and interrogates him about his involvement with the case. Since there's no way around it, Narukami explains everything to Dojima. He tells about the TV world, personas, everything. Dojima obviously doesn't believe a single word and expresses his disappointment. For Narukami's own safety, he leaves him in the interrogation room for the night, taking his cell phone with him. This scene is very controversial for one reason. Dojima doesn't believe this story involving the TV world and personas. Of course he wouldn't, it's completely absurd from an outsider's perspective. Even though Narukami could easily prove that what he's saying is true because there's a TV in this interrogation room. Sure, that would make the most logical sense, but I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second and try to see what Atlas was doing with this scene. So the first thing we should do is look at this from Dojima's perspective. In Dojima's eyes, Narukami isn't someone who should be trusted in this scenario. Narukami and Yosuke were both arrested previously when they were mistaken for carrying weapons at June S. His friend group consists of people who were previously reported to be missing, as well as a well-known delinquent, Kanji Tatsumi. Dojima had his partner Adachi keep tabs on this group multiple times throughout the story because he believed that his nephew was involved with something dangerous because of the previous reasons. So when he finally confronts Narukami about his involvement and he responds with this outlandish story, he's obviously very hurt. This especially hits home if you max out a social link beforehand where Dojima lets Narukami into his life as family. Also, remember what I mentioned earlier about what Naoto said. Showing the police the TV world would be nothing but bad news. In fact, it could potentially make the investigation team prime suspects in the murder case because the murders only started one day after Narukami arrived in Inaba. There's also the fact that they'd be the only people who'd know about the TV's world existence. Sure, the police wouldn't be able to pin the case on them just like that, but it would throw a wrench in their plan to save people because they'd most likely be kept at the police station with no way to go into the TV world. So I understand Dojima's thinking and why he wouldn't listen to anything Narukami is trying to say, but what baffles me is the super simple way they could have avoided all of this confusion. How about have Narukami get up from his chair and try to show Dojima and Dachi that he's telling the truth, but then Dojima scolds Narukami for trying to stand up during an interrogation. It'll force Narukami to stay in his seat so he wouldn't even have the opportunity to prove that what he's saying is real. Because as of right now, it feels very sloppy that Narukami wouldn't, at the very least, try to show Dojima that it's real. Because from his point of view, the cat's out of the bag so he might as well try to tell the truth. I think the intention was that Dojima at this point had zero interest in trying to hear Narukami out because he believes that his life was in danger because of the threatening letters. We cut to Teddy and Yosuke working at June S, where Yosuke decides to give Teddy his own cell phone. Yosuke tries to demonstrate how it works by calling the Dojima household, but when Nanako answers, she tells the two about the threatening letter that Dojima saw and how he took Narukami to the police station. Yosuke tries to gather the rest of the investigation team together so they can check on Narukami. At the same time, however, Narukami decides to check the Midnight Channel because it was raining outside when he was dragged in, and much to his shock, his young cousin Nanako is shown. Narukami has no way to contact his friends since Dojima took his cell phone and has no interest in listening to what he has to say. Naoto runs to the Dojima residence since Nanako is home alone and our killer is most certainly going to go after her. Naoto blames herself for not putting the pieces together sooner. Nanako wasn't shown on TV, but her voice was heard to the general public. She was interviewed by a politician and she was supposed to remain anonymous. Since Inaba is a small town, it didn't take people too long to figure out that it was Nanako who was interviewed. Nanako ended up in the local paper where her full name and a photograph of her was used. By the time Naoto reaches the Dojima household, it's too late. Nanako has been kidnapped. Yosuke, Kanji, and Teddy rush over to the police station and force their way into Narukami's room, where they tell him the bad news. Dojima overhears that Nanako has been kidnapped and Naoto confirms it with him over the phone. Dojima rushes off in a vain attempt to look for any suspicious vehicles. The girls arrive shortly after and everyone begs Adachi to let Narukami go so they can search for Nanako. Adachi says that before they do anything, he needs to know what's going on. The group decides to look over the information in order to get everyone up to speed and to hopefully help Adachi understand. 
When Naoto went to the Dojima house, she noticed that the killer didn't force his way inside and that the door was wide open, so this means that Nanako had to open the door on her own. It's important to note that earlier in the game, Nanako says that she always listens to what Dojima tells her to do, and that includes to never open the door for strangers. At first, the group thinks that it's someone that Nanako knows personally, but Naoto suggests a different perspective. The killer has to be moving a large TV with them wherever they go because the victims all end up getting thrown in immediately after they're kidnapped. This means that they're using a somewhat large vehicle to accomplish this, but at the same time, it has to be a vehicle that no one would find odd outside of someone's house because most of these kidnappings took place during the daytime. There's only one type of vehicle large enough and inconspicuous enough to pull off such a thing. That would be a delivery truck. Since the delivery service is run by a local company, Nanako wouldn't find the person to make the deliveries a stranger because it would always be the same person. Adachi decides to look over the report that Dojima made involving the first murder case that he decided to reinvestigate. Much to everyone's surprise, a delivery man is mentioned. Alright, now we're getting somewhere. Back at the start of the game, there was a news report following a scandal between a TV announcer and a politician's secretary and the secretary's wife. The secretary and the TV announcer were having an affair behind the wife's back, and when news came out about it, the secretary lost his job and took up the family business working as a delivery man. Our main suspect is the man involved in the scandal, Toro Namatame. Adachi quickly rushes off so he can inform Dojima about Namatame, but not before giving a not so subtle hit that Narukami can sneak out while Adachi's gone. As the group makes their way to Namatame's address, they notice that there was a car accident not too far from them. Dojima attempted to give chase to Namatame, but ended up crashing when Namatame flipped his truck with the emergency brake. Naoto investigates the scene and finds not only a large TV in the back of the delivery truck, but a diary as well. The diary is written by Namatame. In one of the entries, he describes that he discovered the existence of another world inside of the TV and says that he must use this power to save people. Along with that, there's a list of names and addresses of every victim, even the ones that weren't released to the public. This is enough information to convince Adachi that Namatame is behind the murders. The group is unable to find Namatame and Nanako, so they make the assumption that he used the TV in the back as a last ditch effort to escape the police. After the group admits Dojima to the hospital, the investigation team enters the TV the following day so they can save Nanako. The group makes note that Nanako's dungeon looks like a storybook version of heaven, because deep down, she desperately wants to see her mom again. It's also a callback to Nanako's social link where Narukami explains that her the concept of heaven and that Nanako will go there someday to meet her mother again. The investigation team manages to corner Namatame at the top of this dungeon where he's holding Nanako as hostage. Namatame immediately recognizes most of the members of the investigation team as people that he saved, but doesn't elaborate on what that means when questioned. Namatame does admit to kidnapping people who appear on the Midnight Channel. He claims that the people in the Midnight Channel are asking to be saved, so he puts them inside the TV to save them. Suddenly, Namatame seems to become possessed by something and talks about himself as if he's some hero fighting against evildoers. Yosuke and Kanji quickly use the opportunity to push Namatame away from Nanako so that Narukami can get her to safety. All isn't well, however, as Namatame begins to attract a large number of shadows, transforming him into the being known as Kunino Sagiri. With the team's best effort, they're able to take down the massive monster, causing Namatame to transform back into his regular self. The group quickly rushes Nanako and Namatame to the hospital, because of the exposure of the TV world has caused both of them to become very sick, Nanako especially since she's so young. There isn't much the group can do other than wait and pray that she makes a recovery. Not too long after Namatame's capture, a thick fog rolls into the city. This is actually the same fog from the TV world. It's somehow forcing its way from that world into the real world. The characters discover this when Kanji decides to put on his glasses and see that the fog has been erased. The group holds a meeting at their usual spot in Juness where they try to come up with an explanation for what's going on, but no one's able to think of any theories. When they check the newspaper to see if anyone was reporting on the fog, they notice that there's a story written about Namatame. The investigation team has done their part, now it's up for the police to hopefully build a case for the lunatic so that he can be convicted. Not all is well, however, as Narukami receives a phone call from Adachi. He lets him know that Nanako's condition has become much worse and that he's needed at the hospital right away. Pick bro.
Tojima stumbles out of Nanako's room and slowly makes his way down the hospital's hallways. Adachi quickly realizes that Dojima is going to Namatame's room with the intention of killing him for taking his daughter away from him. Dojima knows that the police won't be able to build a strong enough case to put Namatame away from good, so he wanted to punish the bastard himself. Adachi manages to drag Dojima back to his room, leaving the investigation team to think about what just occurred. It's at this point where Teddy disappears from the real world because he believes it's his own fault that Nanako was dead. I already went over this when I talked about Teddy's character arc, so I won't repeat the information here. The remainder of the investigation team rush in when they hear a loud crash come from Namatame's room, and they find out that he's attempting to escape. The group blames Namatame for what happened to Nanako, and Namatame tries to plead his innocence. The conversation is cut short when the midnight channel begins, and they see a figure of Namatame on the screen. This surprises everyone, including Namatame himself. The Namatame on the midnight channel begins to taunt the investigation team that he'll escape with his freedom, and that he's above the law. The broadcast ends, leaving everyone in shock. If Namatame can't be convicted, there's nothing stopping him from throwing more people inside the TV. Yosuke, in an emotionally charged rage, suggests that they stuff Namatame inside the TV so that he can't get away with what he's done. Yosuke wants to avenge not only Saki Konishi, but Nanako as well. He isn't going to force anyone to stay and help him with this, but he asks Narukami what their call should be. This is the group's only chance. Something about this entire situation bothers Narukami, but he can't quite put his finger on it. Sure, the Midnight Channel just showed Namatame basically admitting to his crimes and that he'll try to continue saving people if he doesn't get convicted, but that doesn't mean anything because the group doesn't know what happened through Namatame's perspective. Yosuke began to act with his emotions instead of using his brain to think it through, which is why I don't blame him for it. Yosuke is still open to reasoning, and with enough convincing, the group is able to calm down and think about things rationally. There are still a lot of unanswered questions, but Namatame is in no state to speak to the group, so they decide to leave him for the night. Adachi finds the group and tells them to go back to Nanako's room as she somehow managed to recover. It turns out that Nanako didn't die. She managed to be resuscitated after her heart and lungs collapsed. Even though that this is a stretch and may challenge your suspension of disbelief, this is something that can happen in the real world. But I also have a bit of a theory about this. If we jump back to the previous scene and decide to actually go through with throwing Namatami inside the TV, Nanako actually doesn't come back to life. The group let their emotions blind them from the truth, and as a result, they'll never figure out what exactly happened involving the murders. It's not hard to tell that the fog in Persona 4 is supposed to be symbolic of falsehood and lies. It's a plot and thematic reason as to why the town of Inaba becomes cloaked in fog after Namatame is believed to be the killer. You get an alternate ending if you decide to kill Namatame where the fog never lifts from the town, even on the day where Namakami is supposed to go back to his home. The fog is still in the town. The mystery is still unsolved. If Narukami lets this fog cloud his vision and he's unable to obtain the truth, his punishment is losing one of his closest family. The fog does have supernatural properties, so I assume that's the reason as to why Nanaka would stay dead if the case goes unsolved. Just a little food for thought. The Seekers of Truth meet up in their usual spot the next day and go over the facts once again. The group manages to spot a few inconsistencies if Namatami were truly to be the killer. He had no motive for killing Mayumi Yamano. When he saw the other victims, he referred to them as people that he saved, which would make no sense if he planned on getting them killed in the first place. Naoto thinks that what he meant is saving them through death, but brushes off the idea when she remembers that Namatame on the Midnight Channel said that he failed to save Nanako, who he believed died. But most importantly, the warning letters Narukami received specifically mention that people will be killed. Not only that, the way the letter is phrased implies that whoever wrote it wasn't the person responsible for the kidnappings. So maybe what Namatame said was true. He was trying to save people by putting them inside of the TV. The only way the group will be able to prove this is by speaking with the man himself. Naoto uses her connections to arrange a meeting with Namatame. The group begins to ask questions in order to get Namatame's side of the story. I'll do my best to summarize. After Namatame's affair became well known, he lost connection with Mayubi Yamano and fell into a deep depression. Namatame discovered he had the power to interact with the TV world after he instinctively reached out to the Midnight Channel when he saw Mayumi on it. He thought that it was a drunken dream, but later discovered that Mayumi was killed the following morning. Namatame was convinced that the Midnight Channel and Mayumi's death were connected in some way. The next time Namatame watched the Midnight Channel, he saw Saki Konishi and tried to warn her the following day that she's in danger. She brushed off the warning and ended up getting thrown into the Midnight Channel the same night where she was killed. Namatame felt deep regret that he couldn't save the girl. The police wouldn't even listen to his words about the Midnight Channel because he sounded crazy. When Namatame saw Yukiko Amagi on the Midnight Channel, he managed to convince himself that inside the TV world was safe because of the reaction Yukiko gave when he suggested the idea. Since telling her about the Midnight Channel and the murder on the loose was out of the question, Namatame decided to take action and keep people safe from the murderer by putting them inside the TV. 
but unknown to Namatame, what he's been doing was actually been putting people in danger. It's only after he fled into the TV world to avoid the police is when he first experienced the TV world firsthand and how horrible it is inside of there. So Namatame didn't murder Mayumi and Saki, but he's still responsible for the kidnappings and he vows to face the consequences. Before the group leaves, Namatame begs him to find the true culprit so Mayumi can rest in peace. I think Namatame works really well as a red herring to the true culprit. He fits almost too perfectly into the case that it's very easy to confuse him as the true murderer. That was clearly the intention of his character, so I think that it works well in the game's theme of the truth being much more complex than you think. A really cool detail is that you can actually see Namatame in a few scenes prior to being a suspect. I noticed that when the investigation team was chasing one of Risei's stalkers, you can actually see Namatame's delivery truck drive by in the background. That's a pretty cool detail. Despite the group's best effort, they're unable to find any new information on the case. It seems as though the general public actually completely forgot about the murders at the start of spring. Narukami steps outside with Naoto and Yosuke to think. There's one person that can fit into the criteria of being connected to the first case, and wouldn't be suspicious for approaching the Dojima house, as well as being around Mayumi and Saki. There's only one person that fits this criteria, and that would be Dojima's partner, Toro Adachi. Before the investigation team does anything too hasty, they confront Adachi in person so they can confirm their suspicions. Someone else killed them. Adachi-san, do you have any idea who that might be? I have no idea what you're talking about. Cause we think it might have been you. What? That's ridiculous! We already know Namatami's the one who put them all in! What did you just say? Adachi quickly tries to escape after his slip-up and ends up ducking inside of the TV. The group decides that they will track down Adachi the following day. They have their culprit. Teddy rejoins the party after Narukami and him have a conversation in the Velvet Room where he finds out that Nanako didn't die from her illness. With the investigation team reunited, they head off to confront Adachi. Let's take a moment to talk about Adachi. Even if you were able to guess that there was something strange about him, I think the game does a pretty good job at hiding the twist. The entire scenario involving Namatame does a great job at throwing suspicion off of Adachi because of the way it's presented. This dungeon takes place near what could be considered the end of the game if this is your first playthrough, and the victim is Nanako, so it's a very personal conflict. You're too focused on Namatame and Nanako to even think about Adachi. Plus in Persona 4 Golden, Adachi has a social link, so why would you expect him to be the killer? But that's not even considering the real reason as to why Adachi is such a memorable villain. Adachi's social link adds a lot of nuance to his character, so I'll be drawing some details from there really quick. Adachi always tried his hardest in life to follow the rules and do exactly what he was told to do. This, realistically, was supposed to promise him great success in life. Adachi ended up being an ace at the police academy, and when the time came for his life to move forward, he was shoved into the small town of Inaba because that's where he ended up being assigned. Because of something completely out of his control, he's now stuck in a small town that he hates because there's nothing to do. His only connection being his boss Dojima who constantly berates him, and a kid that's much younger than he is. He can't relate to either of them, so he spends most of his time alone, basking in his own misery. Even when Narukami tries to reach out to his Dachi and become friends with him, he's still distant and unwilling to change because Adachi believes that he's above this town. Because of this attitude, Adachi spends most of the time alone in isolation, drinking and watching TV. Adachi became very fond of the TV announcer Mayumi Yamano and developed a crush on her. Adachi also discovers the Midnight Channel as well and his ability to stick his hand inside of the TV. When word about the affair between Yamano and Namatame comes out, Adachi is stationed to be her bodyguard at the Yamagi Inn. Adachi tries to confirm if the rumors were true, but Mayumi tells him to back off. Adachi assumes that the affair was true and out of anger decides to shove Mayumi into the TV. This is where Adachi's game began. He not only killed Mayumi, but was also responsible for shoving Saki inside of the TV. When Saki was found dead and Namatame called the police to tell them about the Midnight Channel, it was by luck that Adachi was the one who answered the phone. Adachi managed to convince Namatame to start kidnapping people while he just watched from afar. It didn't take long for Adachi to figure out that Narukami and his friends were responsible for saving the victims, so he decided to purposely throw the team off course by providing incorrect information. So, Adachi started this game because he was bored with his life, which is something that he admits himself. This has garnered the character a lot of criticism because people say it's unrealistic. But this is something I don't agree with, because there's a lot of supporting evidence in his backstory that supports his point of view. Adachi was bored out of his mind, stuck in the small town of Inaba. He doesn't have any friends, believes that he deserves more than he has, and overall just despises the people around him, because they didn't work as hard as he did, but they have it better off than himself. 
Adachi has mentally snapped and reached the end of his line, so when he discovers that he has the power to cause chaos with no repercussions, he decides to indulge in it. Even when the threat of being caught is introduced to him, Adachi loves the idea because it keeps things exciting for him. Adachi seemingly obtained power when he finally entered the TV world himself. He says that by the end of the year, the two worlds will merge together and everyone will be turned into shadows, which will result in the death of mankind. Adachi's motivation comes from his self-isolation and his superiority complex, which is a very realistic motivation. People in the real world do terrible things because of this kind of stuff, but the difference is that Adachi has the power to carry out his desire to destroy everything. It's tragic and definitely played up, but it's very real. But the main thing I enjoy about Adachi is how he subtly contrasts you, both the character and the player. Throughout the game, every party member faces their inner selves, their shadows. These shadows represent their inner struggles and fears that they are eventually able to overcome. The only party member that doesn't need to face themselves is Narukami, mostly because he doesn't have a character that could potentially have a struggle. But the game does something really clever. Throughout the game, you form social links with the people around you. These people help shape who you are and give you power in battle. Adachi is supposed to represent what a life without any strong bonds can do to someone. Narukami spends his time making friends and having new experiences, while Adachi spends his time in isolation, looking out for no one but himself. The two are supposed to be polar opposites, and this even shows in Adachi's persona. His persona is Magetsu Izanagi, which is a twisted shadowy version of Narukami's starting persona. Adachi's arcana is even the Jester, which is another name for the Fool, which is Narukami's arcana. Though, if Adachi's social link is a high enough rank before Adachi is outed, his arcana will transform into the Hunger or Lust arcana when Narukami speaks to him alone, but the point still stands. Adachi is supposed to represent what can happen if you live a life without bonds and are unwilling to change yourself. Adachi had the opportunity to adjust to his new life, learn and grow from the experiences, but his nihilistic attitude and refusal to accept reality is what led him down his dark path. Adachi is one of my favorite characters in the game because of how complex he actually is, and does a great job of being a love-to-hate villain who at the end of the day can be very relatable for some players. I would never try to justify Adachi's actions, but I can at the very least show empathy for someone who feels was screwed over in life. Yes, life can be unfair to a lot of people, but it's how we respond to these moments is how we shape who we really are. Adachi's failing came from trying to reject any hardships and his refusal to change himself. It's a trap that anyone can fall into if they're not careful. The group manages to take down Adachi, but much like Namatame, he suddenly becomes possessed by a greater power. It reveals itself as Amino Sagiri, and mankind's desires are its own desires. Amino Sagiri is the source of the fog in the TV world, or the hollow forest as it calls this place. A few things are revealed here, the biggest one being that the TV world is actually the human subconscious, and the thoughts of humanity can shape the ongoings in here. Whenever someone would recently become on the minds of multiple people, the TV world would display more of the person on their mind. So when someone like Kanji was interviewed after he beat up the biker gang, everyone had him on the mind so he appeared on the Midnight Channel. This is important because the Namatame that was shown to the group after Nanako's supposed death was actually not Namatame's true feelings. They believed that he was the killer in that moment, so the Midnight Channel reflected that by showing what they all wanted to see. Amino Sigiri says what mankind desires is to be shrouded by fog so they won't have to deal with the hardships of facing the truth. The truth can be painful for most people. They would rather live in peaceful ignorance. They would rather live lives where nothing can go wrong. The few outliers are the ones who manage to face themselves and turn their pain into strength. Amino Sagiri granted these people the power of being able to enter the TV world whenever they wanted to. It's pretty obvious that he's referring to the investigation team. Amino Sagiri is interested to see the new facet of mankind, but is not sure to trust it yet. Amino Sagiri transforms into its true form, and the investigation team has to battle it in order to prove that mankind is stronger than it thinks. The group manages to prove to Amino Sagiri that covering the world in fog isn't what they desire and the god accepts their reason. However, it warns the group that if mankind's desire changes, the fog will return. Amino Sagiri disappears, leaving Adachi in its place. With the true culprit finally captured, the group is finally, finally able to celebrate and rest easy. The case finally closed. Usually, the month of January is used to max out any social links that you may have missed as well as to do some of the brand new events, such as building a snowman with Nanako after New Year's. But, if you manage to max out Marie's social link before the battle against Amino Sagiri, you'll gain access to the finale of her story arc. Narukami can go to the Velvet Room on New Year's to wish everyone a Happy New Year, but Marie is missing. Margaret tells him that Marie has decided to leave the Velvet Room because of the bond that Narukami and her have forged. Margaret offers to locate Marie, but it may be dangerous. 
The next day, Narukami passes out and sees a vision of Marie, thanking him for the time they spent together. She bids him a farewell and fades into the darkness. As time goes on, Margaret is able to locate Marie inside of the TV world, and forcefully pulls the investigation team into a TV during their ski trip. When the group comes to, they're inside of the hollow forest that Amino Sigiri mentioned. This is the reality that Marie created when she entered the TV world. It turns out that Marie actually regained her memories after she opened her heart to Narukami, but she didn't like the answers that she received. The group decides that they'll venture inside the hollow forest so that they can save Marie, but they only have one day to do it however, because once the forest closes, it'll disappear forever. If this happens, Marie will disappear forever, not just from reality, but from everyone's memories as well. It's pretty much an excuse as to why Marie wasn't in the original Persona 4. This implies that she was always a part of the story, but the characters failed to save her so the memories of her disappeared. I don't really think that we needed an explanation for Marie's inclusion, but alright. Marie's dungeon is very... unique. I am not a fan of this dungeon at all. This dungeon has the gimmick where after every battle, half of your current SP will be depleted. All of your character's equipment is changed to exclusive items that can only be found and used in this dungeon. So your goal is to make sure you loot every chest you can so you can use this dungeon's exclusive SP items, as well as the equipment that can aid you in SP restoration in general. This is more of an annoyance than an actual challenging gimmick that you have to manage. Physical skills were already pretty powerful in this game, but this dungeon pretty much forces you to use them because SP is more valuable than ever. There's no point in restoring SP after every battle because how punishing the detraction is. So all these SP items and armor are kind of sort of really fucking useless. I appreciate the idea of shaking up the dungeon crawling formula, but this is less of a fun challenge and more so an annoyance. This is easily my least favorite dungeon in the game because of this gimmick, which I know sounds harsh, but that's because this gimmick just isn't fun. The group manages to locate Marie and they find out that one of her eyes has the same pupils as Amino Sagiri. It turns out that Marie's true name is Kasumi no Okami, and her purpose is to be a scout for Amino Sagiri. She was placed in the real world in order to find out what mankind's desires are and report it back to Amino Sagiri. Marie also reveals that if she isn't killed, the real world will be destroyed. It turns out that when Amino Sagiri was defeated and the fog wasn't needed anymore, it was all absorbed into Marie. Her purpose is to fade away along with the fog because once it overpowers her, she'll turn into a monster. The group comes up with a plan to destroy the monster once it arrives to hopefully save Marie from her fate. The boss against Kasumi no Okami is actually pretty interesting. This box reflects all types of damage, so the only way to deal damage is to use skills that break elemental resistances or use items that do the same thing. <laughs> this is the only time in the game where those types of skills are actually useful, believe it or not. It's a refreshing gimmick that isn't super intrusive, unlike the SP one. With the defeat of Kasumi no Okami, Marie's body appears. At first, it seems as though this was a futile attempt at saving Marie's life until she wakes up. This truly was a Disney fake-out death. With the fog gone, the hollow forest has no reason to exist anymore, so the group quickly escapes before it collapses. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the story. As I said earlier, it really depends on how much you like Marie's character, and as I said earlier, I don't. I think that she personifies all the cliché and tropish problems that Persona 4 does have, but unlike the other aspects of the game, it's never really developed past a surface level. Marie's inclusion into the main plot doesn't really have much of an impact either, so it turns out that Marie is the one responsible for not only giving information to Amino Sugiri, but also has the burden to remove all the fog from Inaba after its defeat, okay? This information doesn't change the way I look at the story, so it feels tacked on. Like, Atlas really wanted to have an explanation as to why Marie exists now in Persona 4's story, but it doesn't really give a new perspective on the events, so it just feels cluttered. Marie has her fans, but I'm not one of them. I think that she's too much of an archetype rather than a character like I said earlier in the video. I hate using the term Mary Sue, but that's just how I feel about it. This might be a bit off topic, but I feel as though I should mention this because it's a brand new addition to Persona 4 Golden. Since we have the months of January and some of February as playable days now, that means we get a Valentine's Day event with any of the characters you decided to romance throughout the game. Persona 3 had a dating mechanic too, but it was forced onto you. Every social link with a female would always result in you dating them, with no opportunity to decline their confessions. Persona 4 fixes that up by giving the option to stay just as friends with the women your age, or if you really want to, you can date multiple women at once. 
However, if you do decide to go through with that, if you really want to be a cheating dirtbag, by the time Valentine's Day rolls around, you have to choose one girl to spend the day with. And if you're dating your party members and decide to decline their invitation, you have to tell each and every one of them face to face that you won't be spending time with them on Valentine's Day. Each of them have their own reactions to this news, but all of them will make you feel like the biggest piece of shit in the world for playing with these girls' feelings. But for some reason, whenever I played the game, I always ended up spending the day with Naoto for some reason. It's pretty strange, I wonder why that is. Though, no matter who you spend the day with, Valentine's Day is the final playable day of the game. Because after February 14th, the game fast forwards to March 19th, two days before Narukami has to return to his hometown. March 20th is when you get the chance to check up on all your social links one last time to view their epilogues to their stories. Everyone you met has found new meaning in life and appreciates the time you spend with them. You can even visit the old investigation team meeting spot one last time. In fact, the other party members had the idea to do the same thing. So as a group, the gang reminisces on the past year, but they find it odd that no one knows how the Midnight Channel rumor even began. In fact, the more they think about it, there's a couple of unanswered questions. Amino Sugiri mentioned that he granted the power to interact with the TV world to the people who managed to face themselves and gain their personas. But Narukami never faced his shadow, he just had the ability to interact with the Midnight Channel when he first arrived in Inaba. Narukami received a letter from Adachi before he left his house as well. When reading it aloud, he finds out that both Adachi and Namatame heard of the Midnight Channel rumors when they first entered the town of Inaba. As we saw earlier, neither of them faced their shadows but they had the ability to interact with the Midnight Channel too. This bothers Yosuke, he realized that everything involving the Midnight Channel, the TV world, and the serial murders all seem to fit together too well for it to be a coincidence. He theorizes that there is some sort of conductor pulling the strings from behind the shadows to make this all possible, and this mastermind is most likely the one who told Adachi about the rumor in the first place. Narukami thinks back to when he first arrived in Inaba to see if anything strange happened. Other than meeting his cousin and uncle, there was one other thing that happened. As Narukami gets closer to the truth, the clouds in the sky become much darker and it starts to rain. Narukami confronts who he believes to be the one behind the rumors and the one who gave him his power, the gas station attendant that he shook hands with at the beginning of the game. The gas station attendant is revealed to be the goddess Izanami, and she's responsible for not only both of the Sagiri, but also the entire fog itself. Originally, her plan was to test humanity's desire for truth by giving individuals the ability to interact with the human subconscious. She believes that Narukami and her meeting was destiny, and she challenges him to a battle to prove mankind's potential. The group realizes that as long as Izanami is still around, the fog will never go away. If Narukami leaves without taking care of the goddess, the town will once again be covered in fog, and all of his friends and loved ones will be turned into shadows. So, for one last time, the investigation team heads into the TV world to confront Izanami. Izanami reveals that mankind's downfall is their own anxieties. The Midnight Channel was created as a device so people could learn more about each other, so mankind can understand one another. But because of mankind's anxiety and desire to compare themselves to others, they began to overlook the truth and only believe what they wanted to believe, which is why Izanami came to the conclusion that having the world shrouded in fog would be better off for mankind. Izanami then covers herself in fog and transforms into a titan-sized goddess. Then, our final battle begins. Izanami, despite having access to really powerful magic, doesn't seem to have a lot of health. That is, until you get to the point where she becomes impervious to your attacks. Narukami uses the orb of sight that Igor granted him earlier to reveal Izanami's true form. This is where the boss becomes a lot more aggressive and has access to some of the most powerful magic in the game. Izanami's boss doesn't quite hit the highs as Persona 3's final boss did in my opinion, but it's still climactic and has a fucking awesome song for Izanami's first form. Izanami's true form proves to be too powerful for the investigation team, as she uses the will of mankind to attempt to drag Narukami into the fog. Every time she tries this, one of the party members will sacrifice themselves in order to save Narukami, but eventually, he ends up succumbing to mankind's desires. While Narukami lays lifeless in the fog, the voices of his friends and loved ones echo through his mind, all of them encouraging him to stand up against Izanami and thank him for the positive impact he had on their lives. Even Adachi will be there if you max out a social link. With the power of his bonds, Narukami is granted access to the world arcana. He uses this new power to summon his ultimate persona and shows Izanami the true power of mankind.
With the defeat of Izanami, the fog in not only the real world, but also in the TV world has been lifted. We get to see this world's true form as everyone is once again reunited. Narukami can now go home the next day without any regrets. It's also revealed that Izanami and the Sigiri were actually originally from Marie. Many years ago, she was shattered into fragments, but since all of her separate selves have been defeated, they've all returned to Marie. Her true name is revealed to be Izanami no Mikoto. The following day, Narukami and his friends head towards the train station, and after one final goodbye, he gets on board. Normally, this is where the game would end, but Persona 4 Golden has an epilogue if you maxed out Marie's social link. Narukami returns to Inaba during summer vacation. We get to see how the group has changed and even get a surprise party for Narukami, welcoming him back to Inaba. Marie even found work at a forecast station, but she uses her power over the weather to make sure that Narukami's stay will be filled with nothing but bright skies. She even admits her love for him on TV. The game ends with one final shot of Narukami reuniting with his friends and family. And that was Persona 4. Man, what a game. If you couldn't tell already, Persona 4 means so much to me on a personal level. That's not to say that all of my praises come from emotional bias. I think I did a good job at giving everything in the game a fair shot. But I think that Persona 4 accomplishes almost everything that it sets out to do. Sure, there's some stuff that I'm not a big fan of, especially at Golden where there are additions that don't mix well with me, but any Rocky additions added in re-releases can't deter my love for this game. Sure, the game isn't nearly as dark as the other games in the franchise. I acknowledge that there's some cliches and anime-inspired tropes that exist in the characters and the story. But where I think it matters, Persona 4 gets it right. There's barely any social links that I dislike. I think all the characters are fleshed out and memorable in their own ways. But most importantly, I think that the message of Persona 4 is fully realized and was genuinely life-changing for me. I'm about to get a bit personal here. Back when I first played Persona 4 in 2014, I was not a happy person. Sure, I was only about 15 years old at the time, and I had my whole life ahead of me, but nevertheless, I was going through some rough shit. So, playing this game that I thought was going to be about solving murders, only to experience a story about facing your inner demons and growing past those insecurities really stuck with me. I could relate to the characters on a personal level and ended up getting pretty attached to them. Persona 4 taught me to not be afraid of myself. It taught me that my flaws are what make me who I am, and that I always had the opportunity to become a better person. Yeah, it's a bit cringy, but by playing Persona 4 when I did, I managed to face my own shadow before it was too late. Most importantly, however, Persona 4 taught me that there will always be people to accept me for who I am. And that was something that I needed to hear when I was growing up. So no amount of Marie or band practices will ever change the appreciation I have for this story and its characters. Persona 4 is not a perfect game. A perfect video game will probably never exist in my eyes. But... Persona 4 changed my life, and that's something that I'll always be grateful for. If you were to ask people their opinions on the Persona franchise, an overwhelming majority would assume that the topic of conversation would be about the quality of Persona 3, Persona 4, or Persona 5. As a self-proclaimed massive Persona fan, I'm very guilty of this school of thought. It got me thinking, why don't people talk about the Persona games prior to Persona 3 nearly as much? That's not to say that there isn't discussion surrounding the classic games, in fact, Persona 2 in particular is a favorite among quite a few people, but a game that almost no one seems to talk about is the game that kicked off this SMT spin-off series to begin with. So I've decided for the next couple of Persona videos, I'll be giving the spotlight to these games. This is actually my first time playing through Persona 1, and I'll be using the PlayStation Portable remaster that was released back in 2009 for the basis of this video. 
Persona 1's North American PlayStation 1 release is actually pretty infamous because of how many things were altered or just straight up removed from the game. Thankfully, the PlayStation Portable translation is much more faithful to the Japanese source and the missing content has been restored. I'll go into more detail about the original translation when I talk about the Snow Queen quest, as I think it's actually very interesting. There will be spoilers throughout the video for Persona 1, so if you're the kind of player that likes to go in blind, I suggest you click off the video now. Not that there's much to really spoil to begin with. Persona 1 starts off with a group of high school students playing what's called the Persona game. Supposedly, this game will let you see your own future. You play as a student named Naoya Tudu. I think his nickname is supposed to be Naoran, but I don't really like that name so it's going to be Nam. Every major character in this game has a nickname that they're referred to by, so I'll be using those names to avoid confusion. When the students try out the Persona game, they're not shown their future. Instead, the group is startled when they see a spirit of a small child weeping. Before they can do anything, lightning strikes Yukino, Nanjo, Mark, and Naoya, rendering them unconscious. In their dreams, they come across this mysterious man named Philemon. Philemon speaks to Naoya and gives him the power of the Persona so he can face the challenges that lie in the future. When the group comes to, they head to the hospital so they can get a checkup, but also to see their friend Maki. Maki has apparently been hospitalized for over a year, and has a history of poor health. She seems to be very resentful towards her mother and believes that she doesn't even care about her. Mark tries to steer the topic of conversation away from that, but Maki suddenly suffers from a migraine, causing the group to get a doctor for her. While everyone waits outside the ICU, an earthquake shakes the hospital and suddenly, the entire building is shifted into a labyrinth. The ICU also vanishes, leaving the group worried about their friend's safety. The group awakens to the personas one by one when they come across a group of demons. The friends manage to get to the hospital lobby and run into one of their other friends, Ellie. Ellie takes the group to a shrine because Maki's mother, Setsuko, has been injured and she knows a bit about what's going on. Setsuko explains that she was an engineer that worked for the Sebek Corporation and was responsible for the construction of the Deva system. The Deva system is used to alter reality. It's the reason behind the tremors and the sudden arrival of demons. The president of Sebek, Kandori, wants to use the Deva system to alter reality, the reason for which is currently unknown, but he's willing to destroy the town in order to accomplish his goals. When Setsuko attempted to stop him, she was shot by one of his goons and was left for dead. She's brought back to the St. Hermelin High School so she can rest up in the infirmary. Suddenly, Maki catches up with Naoya just before he and Nanjo leave the school. She somehow managed to make a full recovery and acts as though she wasn't even in the hospital to begin with. In fact, Maki's personality seemed to take a complete 180 as she's more upbeat and snarky than the Maki we saw in the hospital. This is actually where the story will split into two routes. The main story that most players will go through is known as the Sebek route. This route follows Naoya, Maki, Mark, and Nanjo during their mission to stop Kandori's experiments. Something interesting about Persona 1 is the fact that the fifth party member for your team isn't set in stone. If someone asks to join your team, take Brown for example, you can decline his invitation and possibly get someone like Ellie as your fifth party member. This is a really cool idea because it adds replay value because these characters all play differently from each other. In fact, each character will react to certain scenes in different ways. This does a good job at showing off their individual personalities, which I think are all pretty entertaining at the very least. The only party member I didn't get to see much of was the character Reiji, since the method of getting him to join as your fifth party member is really obtuse and not at all possible without a guide. You need to talk to some very specific people before you even go to the hospital at the start of the game. Then, you need to clear an entire dungeon with a missing party member in order to get him to join. From what I've heard, he's a pretty good late game character, but I didn't really feel like going through the entire game again to test this out. The gameplay in Persona 1 is vastly different compared to the modern Persona games. This isn't some social simulation dungeon crawling hybrid, this is a JRPG in the purest form. This is an old school JRPG. The dungeons are presented in a first person perspective and are fairly standard in terms of complexity. There are some gimmicks sprinkled here and there. Stuff like having to flip some switches before progressing, and even some light puzzle elements such as having to light up the floor in a certain way to unlock a door. These kinds of gimmicks don't really appear all that much, so they aren't necessarily intrusive. I actually find the dungeon exploration itself pretty painless, which is something I wasn't expecting to think. The main source of challenge for exploration is actually just finding out the proper way to go in order to proceed further into the dungeon. These dungeons end up having a lot of meat to their bones, since the floors do end up getting pretty big in the later half of the game. But the thing that kills it for me is the fact that the- I said the thing that kills it for me is the- The thing that- The thing- The thing that kills it for me is the fucking enemy encounter rate. Okay. Are we good? Alright. I guess I may as well cover the basics of combat really quick. Persona 1's combat system is a very mixed bag for me. The battle system on paper is very simplistic. You choose all of your actions, then watch as your party and the enemies take their turns in order of their agility stat. 
Something interesting to take note is the fact that in Persona 1, the position of your party members on the battlefield is something you have to manage. Every attack has a range that you have to consider. Let's say that you want to attack a demon with a sword swing. You have to consider the distance between the party member and the enemy. A character like Maki uses a bow for her weapon, so she can actually hit enemies no matter where you place her. Magic attacks actually have an unlimited range, so you can hit a target no matter what if you're using a spell. This mechanic only becomes something to worry about when you can't use magic and have to rely on swords or guns instead. Just a side note, I absolutely love how in Persona 1 the characters can use guns. This isn't like in Persona 5 where the guns are fake and only seem real in the metaverse. These are actual firearms shooting real bullets. Guns are actually a pretty good source of damage in this game. Especially the assault rifles that Naoya and Brown can use, since they can hit targets multiple times. Persona 1 differs greatly from the modern Persona games in the way it handles Personas in battle. So get this, in Persona 1, instead of having different skills cost different amounts of SP, it's the Persona themselves that have an SP cost to summon them. So instead of healing skills and buffs having their own separate SP costs, they all function off of a universal cost that's given to them by the Persona themselves. Personas also don't level up in this game in the traditional sense. Every Persona functions off of a ranking system. When you first use a Persona, it starts off at rank 1, with the maximum rank being rank 8. Ranking up Personas grants you brand new skills and increases the stats of the Persona itself. You gain rank experience every time you summon a Persona. Once you use the Persona enough times in battle, it'll gain another rank. The last thing I'd like to mention about the combat system is the fact that in Persona 1, every party member can use different Personas. There's no story explanation behind this like the wildcard ability in the modern Persona games, it's just something that the characters can do in this one. This doesn't mean that any character can use every Persona, however. Every character has different affinities with different Arcana. So someone like Nanjo would be best with Hierophant, Strength, Moon, and World Arcana Persona, but would only be okay with some other ones. You should pretty much only be giving party members Persona that are classified as the best affinity because there's a chance that some special attacks can be triggered. That doesn't mean that there isn't any value in using a Persona that the character is only okay with. Something that I ended up doing was giving Mark a Persona of the Sun Arcana for a bit. Since the Persona stats combined with the character stats, this ended up raising Mark's agility stat to the point where he could wipe out the enemies in a single spell. I think that this is a really cool idea because you can customize any party member to have them in almost any role that you want them to be in. The limitations in place keep the characters from blending into one another from a gameplay perspective, because I know someone like Yukino is really bad with the Hanged Man Persona but I know Brown is great with that Arcana, so I'll give that Persona to him instead. Persona 1 features a very interesting take on the standard turn-based combat, but there's a lot of problems with the execution of its gameplay that brings down the whole experience. I'll run down the list really quick. To fuse new Personas in Persona 1, you'll need what are called Spell Cards. By combining Spell Cards together, you're able to create a new Persona that you can give to a party member. Spell Cards are essentially the essence of demons that you fight throughout the game. By negotiating with the demons you encounter, you're able to convince them to give you their Spell Card if you manage to make them eager. Every demon has a personality type that you can see before you negotiate with them. As the game goes on, these personalities become much more complex by combining types together. Early game demons may only be wise or joyful, but late game demons can have a combination of up to four personality types. What you're supposed to do is pick one party member to contact the demon on the battlefield. Then you use one of the four actions listed for that member to hopefully increase the meter in the way you want it to be. What you should be aiming for is to make the demon eager, but if you make the demon happy, it'll give you an item, money, or experience. Making a demon scared will cause it to run away, and making a demon angry, well, makes it pissed off. The problem I have with the negotiation system is the fact that there are far too many different types of contact methods, and how much RNG is involved. Every party member has four contact methods. Since there are usually five party members at any given time, that gives you a total of 20 different options to pick from. Even though some options are shared between party members, there's a chance that the demon will respond differently if you pick one character over another. So it's really just left up to guesswork to see what may or may not work, but that's not even the worst part about it. There's a chance that when you pick an action that's supposed to make a demon eager, it'll instead increase the meter for one of the other reactions. I have zero idea why this happens, but when I realized it, the entire experience became much more frustrating. Suddenly, whenever a demon became angry when I tried to contact it, I had no idea if it was because I was picking the wrong choice or if it was because of the game's RNG. This seems to be an intentional design choice to make negotiations not follow the same pattern, but this left me more confused than engaged. I ended up cracking in the later half of the game and I broke out a guide to help me with negotiation. Even with a guide, it was annoying when the seemingly correct choices just didn't work and the game decided to make the demons angry instead of eager. 
This is also assuming that you're even the proper level to begin with. The average level of the party will determine what demons you're able to get spell cards from. This means that if one character is level 27, but the other characters are in their 20s, the average party level will be around 21. So you'll only be able to recruit demons that are level 21 or lower. That doesn't sound so bad on paper, but the problem with Persona 1 is that demons will almost always be a much higher level than your party if you don't grind. But I'm convinced that the level of the demon does not reflect the stats that they might have. Another issue I have with Persona 1 is the general game balancing. Despite the fact that demons are classified as a higher level, most encounters offer little to no challenge. Your party can deal so much damage with just basic attack all spells that the enemies might not even get a single hit in. Fighting enemies becomes a chore once you get to the point where you're blasting them all away in a single attack. What usually ended up happening for me was I'd choose the skills I'd want my party to use, then in every battle following the first one in the dungeon, I would just hit the replay button and have my party cycle through those attacks again. Just make sure you have someone casting healing magic every turn, and there's almost no way you can lose the fight. This actually ended up working in most boss battles as well. The only time I ever had to adjust my strategies was in the final boss because of its gimmick of switching elemental affinities, or when I had to use guns because the enemy blocked magic. But the overwhelming majority of battles were pretty brain dead. There's a spell that supposedly lowers the encounter rate called a stoma, but I swear it's useless in this game. A stoma only works to ward off weaker demons, but as I said, the demons are usually a really high level in comparison to you. So a stoma is out of the question unless you grind enough levels. A stoma can be very useful when revisiting older locations, but you rarely need to do that in order to proceed. So if you want a stoma to work on the current dungeon you're in, you'll have to grind enough battles to get the party average level above the enemies you fight. At that point, you may as well just fight battles while you progress through the dungeon because of how long it would take. Thankfully, battles aren't difficult per se because of how fast you can wipe the demons out, but it can get really annoying when you're exploring a particularly big dungeon. The last thing I'd like to mention is the experience scaling really quick. Persona 1 is a very strange way of dealing out experience points to the party members. The amount each party member earns per battle is decided on what actions are performed in the battle. If you have a single character wipe out the entire enemy team in a single blow, the party member who performs said action will break in a lot of experience points in comparison to the other characters. This could potentially lead one character being much further ahead than the rest of the team in terms of power. I'm not a fan of this idea because character actions in battle is based on the agility stat, so there's a chance that the enemies will be defeated before everyone is able to make a turn in combat. The solution to this problem is to only have some party members act while the others sit around and defend. So if you want everyone to be a consistent level, you'll need to bench out the characters that are too powerful so everyone else can play catch up. Doesn't this defeat the purpose of grinding if I can't use my powerful party members? I think the combat in Persona 1 is serviceable at best. There are some really cool ideas, but these ideas aren't executed to their fullest potential. The fusion system is the most developed part of the gameplay because there are a few things you need to consider when making a Persona, such as the Arcana Infinity and even the items you can throw into the mix to increase certain stats or give the Persona a skill it may be lacking in. I ended up using the fusion search function a lot this time around because it was a quick way to see what Arcana would be best for what character. But the actual battles you'll be using these Personas in are very forgettable for the most part, and since Persona 1 has a big focus on gameplay, it's a pretty noticeable flaw. The biggest strength of the Persona series has always been its characters and the stories involving them. Miss Potential comes to mind when I think of this story, but to explain my reasoning, I'll have to give a synopsis to get everyone up to speed. Naoya, Maki, Mark, Nanjo, and another party member of your choice end up cornering Kandori in his office at Sebek. Kandori reveals that he has a Persona of his own and uses the power of Nyarothrotep to knock the group down and escape. After zooming with Kandori's goons, the group is able to once again corner him outside of the Deva system. Suddenly, a small girl in black appears before the group and refers to Kandori as her father. This small girl is named Aki, and she has access to her own otherworldly powers. She uses those powers to send the group and Kandori into a parallel world. The group wakes up inside of their school and find out that they're in another reality when they come across one of their fellow classmates named Yosuke. It turns out a few months prior to the game beginning, Yosuke and his girlfriend Chisato were used as test subjects for the Davis system and ended up in this alternate reality. He also says that Aki kidnapped Chisato and has no idea where she's being kept. It's also revealed here that the Maki traveling with the party is from this reality too. So this means that the Maki inside the ICU is still missing. This alternate reality is what the Davis system is linked with. Kandori is trying to use this reality in some way to accomplish his goals, but I want to talk about Kandori for a second. He is the primary antagonist of this game. The problem I have with Kandori is that as a villain and as a character, he's a very simplistic and underdeveloped one. His goal is to use the Davis system to create a reality where he can become a god and have absolute power, but we know nothing about Kandori's motivations. 
His character is also shockingly underutilized in the story. Other than the trait of being the villain, I know next to nothing about Kandori or why he makes the choices that he does. I actually think that Aki is a better antagonist. She's a reoccurring character that the group has to fight, and later on in the plot, there's a revelation that's learned about her in this world that makes it much more interesting, but I'll save that for later. Most of this plot can be boiled down to the group trying to find a way to stop Kandori on their journey towards his castle. There's a point where the group is trapped in the black market by someone named the Harem Queen. The Harem Queen apparently rules over the black market and uses the power of a magic mirror to grant her wishes. When the group manages to find the Harem Queen, they're surprised to find that their opponent is actually Yosuke's girlfriend Chisato. Aki apparently gave Chisato the magic mirror after kidnapping her, and whenever she uses the mirror, more moles grow on her face. Chisato says that she hates Maki, and the only reason why she decided to date Yosuke was because she knew that Maki had a crush on him. Chisato was always jealous of Maki because she felt as though she pales in comparison to her for the most part. Chisato's beauty was a source of pride for herself because she believes that's the only thing that gives her worth. So she sacrifices her own beauty to terrorize people into worshipping her. After Naoya and Maki defeat Chisato, we learn this information. She admits that she did become attached to Yosuke, even though her original intentions were to harm. When Yosuke manages to find Chisato, the two are able to reconnect. Chisato is ashamed of her actions and believes that she doesn't deserve Yosuke. Chisato is able to muster up the courage to show Yosuke her ugly side, and accept her punishment of having that side of herself permanently exposed. Yosuke is able to accept Chisato's flaws because in his own words, he isn't perfect either. Everyone is flawed, they get angry, they get jealous, but that doesn't mean they're terrible people and are unable to change. These are the kind of stories I want more of in this game. Sure, I think that this seems a bit rushed and it wraps up a little too cleanly, but you can see glimpses of what Atlas was going for. There's an idea here that just needed more time in the oven. There just needs to be a bit more refinement than this small character story could have been really good. Sadly, Chisato is one of the only developed characters in Persona 1. I said earlier that the party members had distinctive personalities, but that doesn't translate into being well-developed characters. Let's take Mark for example, because he's a very prominent character throughout the story and a mandatory party member. We get to see examples of his personality. He's a bit of a joker, cares deeply for Maki, and gets into bouts and arguments with Nanjo a lot. But over the course of the story, his output on life or his opinions on the current situation never changes or is even explored for that matter. Nanjo actually does change a little throughout the story. He believes that the best decisions to make are usually to benefit oneself or for the greater good. He suggests that innocent people die on different occasions in order to save themselves or to end the problem swiftly. I guess it's because of the time he spent with the party, he begins to mellow out a bit. Nanjo always called Mark by his real name, Masao Inaba, but in the end of the game, he refers to him as Mark for the first time, finally getting over their petty arguments, and the two start to become friends. This suffers a lot from the show don't tell rule. I wish we got to see how Nanjo changes throughout the story and get more insight as to why he's a bit of an ass to begin with. Show us Nanjo getting a new perspective and how it changed his outlook. The most developed character in the game as a whole has to be Maki, because there's a clear focus on her and a lot of the plot revolves around her. As I said earlier, the Maki that's in our party isn't the same Maki that we met in the real world, but a Maki from an alternate dimension. This alternate world is actually very interesting because it's revealed to be a reality created from the real Maki's mind near the end of the game. Apparently, Maki's mind somehow came in contact with the Davis system and her inner desire for a better world for herself caused the system to create that dimension. This is the reason as to why Maki has been hospitalized. When she was linked with the Deva system, her mind was fractured in the process. This caused the creation of the Maki in our party, who's supposed to represent the ideal version of the real Maki. She's healthy, upbeat, and confident in herself. The other creations of this experiment are Mai, a girl in the white dress that we saw at the start of the game, Aki, and the personification of Maki's nihilism, Pandora. Aki represents the negative qualities of Maki, and is a temptress for chaos, and she gets people to indulge in their negative qualities. Aki takes a liking to Kandori because of his desire for destruction and rule. We saw an example of this earlier when Aki enables Chisato's negative qualities by giving her the magic mirror and a place to rule over. Mai doesn't really have that big of a role in the game's story. She does appear near the beginning, but doesn't make another appearance until the group needs to get a compact from her in order to enter Kandori's castle. Mai is the opposite of Aki and represents Maki's more innocent and caring side. Since we're talking about Mai, I want to bring up something really quick. Persona 1 features two endings for each quest in the game. In the Sebek route, the ending you're going to get is decided during the scene where you try to convince Mai to give you her compact. If you answer her questions wrong, that's it, you're locked into the bad ending. There's no way to know this on your first playthrough because the game doesn't end right away. The game will end abruptly right after the Kandori boss fight and when Maki has a crisis. These events take place after a few hours of gameplay, so a first time player wouldn't know they made the wrong choice until it's too late. That's a load of shit. Thankfully, I knew before going into this game about this trap, and I made damn sure to pick the correct options. 
When you're on track for the good ending, when the ideal Maki finds out that her world was created from herself, she begins to feel immense guilt. Maki blames herself for the actions caused by Aki, and for causing everyone so much trouble. Aki reveals that her ideal world spawned from a place of jealousy. She hated the fact that while everyone else was out living their lives, making friends, and having fun, she was unable to be a part of that due to her illnesses. She imagined an ideal world where everything was better for herself, and wished that the real world would disappear forever. The ideal Maki flees into the Lost Forest so she can attempt to hide away her sorrow. While that was happening, Aki broke the metaphorical seal that was keeping Pandora at bay. Pandora swallowed up Aki, and Pandora plans to destroy Maki's ideal world. If that were to happen, the real Maki would die. The group eventually finds the ideal Maki and try to help her realize that none of the events were her own fault and that Kandori's experiments are to blame. Maki still tries to deny it, but Nanjo helps her realize that she isn't alone in the world and that her friends would be deeply hurt if she were to disappear from their lives. Maki rejoins the group after these events, but before they can go stop Pandora, they need to get the final compact from Maki's consciousness. Only Naoya and Maki are able to enter the Sea of Souls because Maki's soul was calling out to only those two. When the two find the real Maki, the ideal Maki scolds her for wallowing in her own sorrow rather than taking charge and changing herself for the better. She cites Naoya, Mark, Nanjo, and in my case, Ellie, as a source for her changing herself and learning. Ideal Maki wants her real self to follow in the footsteps of her friends so they can all grow and change together. This is enough for the real Maki to hand over the compact and she disappears from the Sea of Souls before any further conversation could be had. Miss Potential comes to mind when I think of Maki's character arc. There's a lot of great ideas here that just weren't fully developed. There are some really strong concepts for this scene when looking at the plot from a surface level, but there isn't much build-up or payoff to a lot of the characters. A lot of the stuff involving Maki's split personality and nihilism isn't really introduced until close to the end of the game. I think that's the most interesting part about this story, but sadly most of the story is focused on stopping Kandori, who I felt was a very uninteresting character. I see the scene where the ideal Maki is talking to her true self and it just isn't striking the right chords with me. The idea is certainly there, the intention is good, but it's the execution that leaves a lot to be desired. And sadly, this applies to a lot of Persona 1's plot. I don't think that the plot is bad, but it feels like we're just hitting bullet points rather than seeing anything naturally develop. With all the compacts in hand, the group heads off to the Avidia world so they can take down Pandora. The Pandora boss fight isn't too difficult. She has a second form where she hatches from her previous skin and becomes a butterfly. The color of her hair dictates what skills work against her. When it's blue, she's weak against magic. When it's pink, she's weak against physical attacks and guns, but absorbs magic. The only real annoying thing about this fight is the fact that Pandora can switch her hair color at any moment during the fight. This includes in the middle of your turn. So if you load up on magic skills and she changes her hair to pink, then you'll end up doing nothing but healing her instead. After the defeat of Pandora, everyone begins to fade away from Maki's ideal world except for Maki herself. She isn't the real Maki, but just an aspect of her, so she needs to stay behind. Before Naoya leaves, however, she gives him a kiss on the cheek and admits her love for him. The months go by and the real Maki is able to leave the hospital and rejoins her friends for graduation. When the game ends, we get to see what happened to every character in their future. Just a small thing I like is the epilogue for the protagonist. As for his fate, that's for you to decide. Normally, this is where I'd give my final thoughts, but because I'm playing the PlayStation Portable version of Persona 1, I have access to what was originally a Japanese exclusive alternate story. But before I dive right into that, I need to give a brief history of Persona 1's North American version. Back in September of 1996, Megami in Bunroko Persona was released for the PlayStation 1, and only two months later in November of the same year, the game was translated and released in North America with the name Revelations Persona. This version of the game had a lot of alterations made to it in an attempt to increase its broad appeal. All references to Japan and Japanese culture were either altered or outright removed. Almost all of the demons and Persona names were altered along with the magic in the game. The most infamous part has to be the altered character designs. The characters' names were changed along with their races to be more American. Nanjo became Nate, Reiji became Chris, Brown became Brad, and so on. But the most well-known change has to be with the character Mark. Mark's name is Masao Inaba, but he's usually referred to by his nickname. Revelations decided to keep the name Mark, but his character design was altered in very unsubtle ways. I mean, just look at him! They completely changed his hat! Mark gets a lot of flack for his redesign, but I actually think that Naoya has it worse. I just hate what they did to his face and hair. Dark purple is just way cooler than bright red IMO. I could go on all day about what's changed in this version of the game, but I want to focus on the Snow Queen quest. It's somewhat common knowledge at this point that the Snow Queen quest was cut out of Revelations Persona, the reason for which is actually still unknown to this very day. A theory that I and others believe was that the translation was rushed so the game could be released during the holiday season. 
The North American version was released only two months after the Japanese release, with the release month being November. So that alone says something. I believe that there was an honest attempt at translating the Snow Queen quest, however, since one of the FMV cutscenes featured in the Snow Queen quest has an English voice acting. And while the quest was dummied out, you can still access it thanks to cheating devices, but the text is unreadable. Whatever the reason behind the exclusion of the Snow Queen quest is, it doesn't really matter in today's day and age where the PlayStation Portable version of the game has all this content available for us English players. So let's give it a look to see if we were missing out on anything good. To access the Snow Queen quest, you need to do a few prerequisites once you get back to the school after the hospital dungeon. By walking around the school and gathering information, you can learn about something called the Snow Queen play. Apparently this play has been a tradition of St. Hermelin High for many years. The actress who would play this Snow Queen during the play would have to wear a mask during their performance. This mask is believed to be cursed because the students who wore the mask during the play all died of unnatural causes. All except one, Naoya's homeroom teacher, Ms. Saiko. Once you hear about the curse of the Snow Queen, you can find the mask inside the school storage room to start the quest. Miss Saiko tells Yuki, Naoya, and Ayase about the Snow Queen play after she sees the mask in Naoya's possession. Miss Saiko takes the mask from Naoya, believing that the curse was just an urban legend because nothing happened to her the last time she wore the mask. When she puts it on, that's when everything hits the fan. Saiko becomes possessed by a greater power and freezes the school with ice magic. When the trio comes to, they find themselves in the courtyard with the possessed Saiko. The mask itself begins to speak and it introduces itself as the Snow Queen, and she seems to have a deep hatred towards Saiko. The Snow Queen plans to use Saiko as a sacrifice to bring forth the Eternal Night, which will cause the world to freeze over. The only way to stop the Snow Queen is to find a way to remove the mask from Saiko before the Eternal Night. Philemon contacts the group and gives them the Demon Mirror to assist them with the removal of the Snow Queen mask. The Demon Mirror was shattered by the Snow Queen mask, so no one could use its power to separate the mask from the wearer. So it's up to Naoya, Yukino, Ayase, and two party members of your choice to gather the Mirror Shards required to be effective against the Snow Queen mask. It's important to note that the only party members you can choose from in this quest is Ellie, Brown, and Nanjo. Maki, Mark, and Reiji are exclusive characters to the Sebek quest, while Yukino is an exclusive character to the Snow Queen quest. Something interesting about the Snow Queen quest is that the ending you get is purely dependent on how many mirror shards you acquire. You need at least 8 mirror shards in the Demon Mirror to fight the Snow Queen and get the good ending. You get the bad ending by not having enough shards by the time you challenge the Snow Queen. You get these shards by exploring the three major dungeons and doing certain things in said dungeons. It's nothing too cryptic, because by the end of my playthrough I had 11 of the 12 mirror shards. As long as you're thorough with exploration, you'll be perfectly fine. A really cool part about the Snow Queen quest is the non-linear nature of it. You have to complete all three towers before you can fight the Snow Queen, but you can tackle these towers in any order you want. The intended order is the Hypnos Tower, Nemesis Tower, and the Thanatos Tower, the latter being the most difficult, while the Hypnos Tower is the easiest. There is a benefit to completing the towers out of the intended order. You get these key items called Ambrosias, which are required to get the ultimate persona of any character. You get two Ambrosias from playing the game in the intended order, but to get everyone's ultimate persona, you'll need to start with the most difficult tower. The Snow Queen quest is generally considered to be harder than the regular game. I do agree with that statement. Two of the three towers make you race against the clock. You have a limited amount of time to find the mirror shards and defeat the boss at the top of the tower. The main source of challenge comes from the inability to save while you're inside the dungeon. Once you enter the dungeon, you'll be locked inside until you either finish it or die trying. On a select floor of each dungeon, you'll find a healing station, velvet room, and shops to help you with your journey. Despite the time limit seeming a bit intimidating at first, you have more than enough time to complete the dungeon while grinding in the process. It's the lack of saving that you should be worried about, because in Persona 1, you get sent right back to the title screen upon a complete party wipe. I agree that the Snow Queen quest is more difficult on paper, but I still think it's a rather comfortable experience. Just like in the Sebek quest, I managed to get away with just using auto commands to repeat spells for every battle because a lot of the enemy formations allow you to get away with that. In case you're feeling a little underprepared for the dungeons, there's a dedicated grinding dungeon called Devil's Peak that you can visit. Devil's Peak unlocks more floors after you complete one of the towers. So if you need to get a spell card from a demon that you were too low level to negotiate with at the time, you can find them inside of Devil's Peak. I really like that there's a unified hub of demons to battle because it minimizes backtracking if you're looking to get a spell card or if you need to grind. The Nemesis Tower actually ended up being the easiest one for me because of its gimmick. This dungeon doesn't have a time limit unlike the other two, but the difficulty of the boss at the end is determined how long it takes for you to get to her. This information isn't told to the player right away, but it's only learned after you find one of the mirror shards inside of a chest. I actually had no idea that this was the gimmick of the dungeon because I accidentally found the boss room very early on without knowing I wasn't supposed to go there yet. This made the boss a complete joke and I decimated her in just a few turns. 
On the opposite end of the spectrum, I fucking hate the Thanatos Tower. This one not only has the 3 hour time limit to worry about, but the secondary gimmick is the most annoying thing in the entire game. If a party member dies in combat in the Thanatos Tower, they lose access to their persona. Not permanently, mind you, because you can get the persona back by going to the second floor and entering Tartarus. Inside Tartarus, there's a room where you can retrieve anyone's persona. Here's why I find this really annoying. This is the only place in the dungeon where you're able to get your persona back. This tower has 7 floors, and the entrance to Tartarus is on the second floor. So if one of your party members bites the dust on floor 6, you'll have to go all the way down just to grab their persona again. It's very important that your party member has their persona because if they don't, they take a fuckload of damage. Over 1000 points of damage in some cases. So they become practically useless at that point. It's especially awful if you lose one of your healers too. It's more tedious than difficult. The story of the Snow Queen quest is about as simple as the one from the main game, but I actually find the plot here to be better executed overall. Every tower is ruled over by one of the Snow Queen's previous victims. The Hypnos Tower is guarded by Kumi Hirose, a student who was under a lot of stress because her parents expected high test scores, as well as the expectations that the drama club had on her. Kumi was given the role of the Snow Queen in the play, and the mask manipulated her into committing suicide. In exchange, she'd be granted the dream world that she desired. Kumi used the power of her guardian, Hypnos, to put students and teachers of St. Hermelin High to sleep so that they can live out their own dream worlds where there's no conflict or hardship. Kumi believed that she was using her power for good, but after the group manages to defeat Hypnos, she's able to accept that what she was doing was wrong. Kumi realized that she only escaped into the world of dreams so that she wouldn't have to face any hardships of life or the troubles of facing her own problems. She's able to pass on in peace thanks to the group. I actually did enjoy this story because the entire dungeon is based off of her current ideals. We get to see the dreams of the people that were trapped inside the tower and get a bit more insight into their characters. Sure, Kumi's revelation is a bit rushed, but the idea is really good. I like villains that believe that what they're doing is right before ultimately realizing that their intended good actions are from a place of selfishness. Not every villain is this interesting, however. I think that the ruler of the Nemesis Tower, Michiko Matsudera, is very boring in comparison to the rest. Michiko is a bully who was also picked on herself. She took the role of the Snow Queen out of spite for one of the other drama club members because she believed that she stole her boyfriend from her. Michiko is not portrayed to be a sympathetic person unlike Kumi. Because from the information we learn of her, she was a pretty terrible person. In her dungeons, she tortures two students because she believes that they're ugly. And for some reason, she doesn't understand why people hated her in life. Michiko doesn't learn any lesson, or even humility, and vows to get revenge on the party. This comes off as a Kandori situation, being evil for the sake of having a villain. But there could have been a lot more done with Michiko to make her way more sympathetic, or at the very least, have her learn the errors of her ways. This is one of the few stories in the game that I think is legitimately bad. Despite the fact that I dislike the Thanatos Tower, I do think that the ruler of this area, Yuriko Yamamoto, is actually a very interesting character. Yuriko was a student who took great pride in her looks. She was a very popular student as well. Yuriko was also very fearful and uncertain of her own future deep down. She was afraid of growing old and losing the thing that she thought made her special. Yuriko eventually gave in to the Snow Queen's will and took her own life. Over the course of time, she actually began to regret her decision. Yuriko believed that her life had peaked while she was still young, and that it could only go downhill from there. But fighting the group finally put her at ease, and she's able to admit to herself that she had a good life, but threw it away because of the fear of the unknown. She became miserable because of the isolation she suffered from while in the tower, but became excited once the party had entered her domain. She's thankful to the group for putting her to rest. Yuriko's story is pretty cool, but somewhat poorly told. We get a big info dump just before her boss battle about her backstory, which isn't a good thing. But the idea was clearly there, and there was an attempt at telling a story with her. I know I sound like a broken record at this point, but Persona 1 has a lot of great ideas, but the execution of said ideas is where it stumbles a bit. After getting at least 8 mirror shards, the group heads towards the courtyard so they can use the mirror on the Snow Queen. Saiko is thawed from her ice prison, but the Snow Queen mask takes a mind of its own. We see the ghost of a woman with a disfigured face cry about how everyone always takes Saiko's side before battling the group. This ghost was actually Saiko's best friend in high school who passed away named Tomomi. Saiko explains to the student what happened to her friend. It turns out that both Saiko and Tomomi were competing to see who would be playing the Snow Queen in the play back when they were in high school. Tomomi ended up getting the role, but didn't know that Saiko actually backed down because she was worried about the curse. Saiko even tried to convince her that the Snow Queen curse wasn't real so she would continue to play the part. Tomomi became disfigured from the mask and eventually passed away from the curse. Her soul was trapped inside of the mask, so when Saiko put it on at the start of the story, she used her opportunity to strike. 
Despite the fact that Tomomi has been defeated, the school isn't transformed back to normal. Before the group can do anything, a figure calling herself the Night Queen appears before them. It turns out that when the demon mirror was used against Tomomi, she saw what she had become. When Tomomi became self-aware, her persona, the Night Queen, separated from her because it had nowhere to go. The Night Queen, also known as Nyx, still plans to carry out the desire of inflicting the internal night on the world, so it's up to the group to confront her at the top of the Ice Castle. The final battle against Nyx is actually really disappointing. I hate to say that because I did enjoy the Pandora boss from the Sebek route despite its annoying mechanic, but Nyx is a complete joke. The persona I had equipped just so happened to either block or absorb most of her attacks. My entire party got wiped out really quickly, but for some reason, Nyx just couldn't kill me. She could only do damage with her physical attack, but she only used that a couple of times. I ended up just leaving my character to automatically use gun attacks for the entire fight, and I actually won like that. That has to be the easiest final boss in any Mega 10 game I have ever played. No joke. With Nyx defeated, the curse is lifted from the school and the ice begins to melt. The party doesn't waste any time preparing to leave the school so they can help Mark and the ideal Maki stop Kandori's plans. The game ends with the party heading towards the Sebek building with Mark so they can rescue Maki. And that was Persona 1. Overall, I think that the game was just okay. Persona 1 has a lot of great ideas in its story, and I like the personalities of the characters. I didn't talk about it, but I actually think that Ayase is one of my favorite characters from this game because of her assholeish personality. The story itself is pretty interesting, and when looking at it from a bullet point perspective, it seems very strong. I just don't think it's developed well enough to have the impact that Atlas was going for. I know I was very critical throughout this video, but that's because there's so much potential with the story Persona 1 is trying to convey. If there were any games in the Megami Tensei franchise I would want to see remade from the ground up, Persona 1 would be at the top of that list. There are some great ideas and concepts throughout the game, but the execution of its story and gameplay leaves a lot to be desired. Don't get me wrong, I don't regret the time I spent playing Persona 1. I thought it was really cool to see how my favorite Mega 10 subseries got its start, but I can't exactly fully recommend this one to players without telling them to go in with a very specific mindset. Persona 1 is not a bad game, just a very flawed one, but you can tell that there was heart put into this title. In some areas, you can really see that spark that really made the Persona franchise what it is today. But this is one of those games where I most likely won't pick it up again for a very, very long time. Alright, it's been a bit since I last covered the Persona series, so after taking a small break from the series, I'm more motivated than ever to get right back into the swing of things. Despite my personal feelings towards the original Persona, the game sold very well, especially when you consider the size of Atlas at the time. Atlas would be crazy to not capitalize on this success, and around three years later in 1999, we were introduced to Persona 2 Innocent Sin. Only in Japan. Alright, let's just get right into this now. Persona 2 is actually a duology. The first part, Innocent Sin, was originally never released worldwide. The reason for which has never been officially stated, but it's most likely because some of the game's imagery could have stirred up a lot of controversy. We did, however, end up getting the second part of the duology, Eternal Punishment, in the year 2000. It wasn't until 2011 when us North American players finally got to play an official translation of Innocent Sin in the form of the PSP re-release. This is the version that I'll be using for this review because I actually do have some experience with this game. I played it not too long after I finished Persona 3 for the first time, and I honestly don't remember a whole lot from that experience. Over the years, Persona 2 has slowly been gaining popularity, especially Innocent Sin. It's still not nearly at the popularity of the modern Persona games, but people who have played the game have fallen in love with the cast of characters and the story. With the nature of Persona 2 being a duology, this review specifically is going to be about Innocent Sin. I want to review the game in the context of its release, so with the story specifically, I'm going to be ignoring any extra context or answers in Eternal Punishment so we can see how the game stands on its own. So this is your spoiler warning now. If you have any interest in Persona 2 Innocent Sin, please stop watching the video now. Persona 2 is a very story-heavy game with a huge focus on its characters. I don't want to rob any surprises from anybody because the story is actually really good. The game opens up at Seven Sisters High School with our main protagonist, Tatsuya Suo, fixing up his motorcycle. Unlike the Persona 1 protagonist, Tatsuya here is actually a pretty popular student, so much so that he catches the attention of the boss of Kasumi Yaga High, Kichi Mishima. And Kichi sends Tatsuya a letter claiming that they have one of their students from Seven Sisters as hostage and wants to meet him at Samaru Prison. With no time to waste, Tatsuya and his fellow classmate Lisa Silverman rush over only to find out that this hostage situation is a complete joke. 
The entire scenario was set up by Akichi's friends. It turns out that the boys were going to form a band of their own, and they wanted Tatsuya to be a part of it. Lisa argues with Akichi for wasting everyone's time, and it gets so heated that Lisa, Akichi, and Tatsuya all begin to awaken to their personas. They pass out afterwards, and awaken the realm of unconsciousness where they meet Philemon. Philemon warns the kids of an entity that threatens their existence, and that their home, Samaru City, is also going through a strange phenomenon. In Samaru City, rumors have the potential to become reality. When the group wakes up, Lisa wants to try out a rather famous rumor to see if what they just dreamed of was real or not. So the rumor in question is a rumor about a wish-granting entity known as the Joker. If you do a certain chant and call your own phone number, the Joker will be summoned to help fulfill your dream. But if you freeze up and are unable to tell him, he'll steal away your ideals because he believes that if you're unwilling to follow through with them, you don't deserve the right to have dreams to begin with. If Joker takes away your dreams, you'll become what are known as Shadow Men. If this happens, you'll slowly fade away from existence and you'll be forgotten by the masses. It'll be like you were never born to begin with. This ends up happening to Akichi's friends when they try out the Joker rumor. Joker also seems to have it out for Tatsuya, for reasons that our protagonist can't remember. Joker attacks the group but refuses to kill them until Tatsuya remembers the sin he committed. Even though they just got their asses kicked, Tatsuya is very eager to jump back into investigating Joker. Lisa and Akichi tag along for extra firepower. The group ends up going back to Seven Sisters High School where they find out that a rumor about the school emblem being cursed has come true, and that their principal was spotted with a masked man. While the students try to figure out a way to break the school emblem curse, they come across two reporters that are also looking into the Joker rumor. The freelance photographer is actually Yukino from Persona 1, which is pretty cool. The introductions are cut short, however, when demons suddenly storm the room. It turns out that not only Yukino still has access to her persona, but Maya also seems to have some light experience with summoning a persona as well. Since since Maya and Yukino have the same goal in mind, they decide to join Tatsuya's group in order to take down Joker together. This is the basic setup to Persona 2's plot, and it's a lot to take in at once. In a very short amount of time, we're introduced to a lot of major characters, reintroduced to the concept of a persona, have had future plot elements foreshadowed, and have had the concepts of rumors explained to the player. This all happens in the span of less than an hour, and it's honestly a lot to take in all at once. It's not a terrible introduction, but it feels as though a lot of information quickly skimmed over so that we can get a full party assembled. But after this introduction to the characters, the story becomes relatively straightforward. We have our ragtag group of Persona users going up against not only Joker, but also a cult based off the zodiac signs known as the Masked Circle. Unlike Persona 1, the party members of this game are set in stone. This has a very obvious benefit of giving every character major development throughout the story because the devs know which characters are going to be with you. Persona 1 suffered a bit because the fifth party member ended up feeling underdeveloped and underutilized because the story was written in a way where it didn't matter much who you picked. Without giving too much away, there's a much greater focus on the party members themselves and the relationships within the party. These characters all react to events in different ways and discuss them with each other. It gives us a really good idea to who these people are outside of the story. Character interactions are also top notch. There's a bit more comedy and in innocent sin than what I was expecting. Lisa and Ikichi's interactions are some of my favorite ones in the game because of how much they argue about pretty much everything. This game is still dark, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of scenes used to keep the game from being depressing. Visually, the jump from Persona 1 to Persona 2 is significant. Innocent Sin came out three years after the previous game, and it really shows. The biggest difference just being the change in perspective. In Persona 1, almost every area was in a first-person perspective, the exception being these small rooms that you can explore for items or to talk to party members. In Persona 2, the entire game is presented in this isometric perspective that uses a mix of sprites and 3D models to create the environments. This visual style has actually aged very well. Persona 1's environment design suffered a lot with it being displayed in the first person perspective. Most of the dungeons were confined into being these big mazes with very blocky designs. It was very claustrophobic and didn't do a great job of being the environment it was supposed to represent. In contrast, Persona 2's environments are much more organic and realistic. The first dungeon is a high school, so the layout is filled with hallways and classrooms you're supposed to explore in order to break the school's curse. Almost Almost all the dungeon design is grounded in reality, aside from the few that are affected from the rumor system, and also the last dungeon. The in-game cutscenes have also seen a massive improvement. Characters now have unique sprites that react to what's going on in the story, and are overall more expressive, with one of my favorites being the sprite of Akichi. Something especially cool is the fact that the characters all have multiple portraits instead of just one. This adds so much to the overall cutscene direction. Characters now look scared, embarrassed, or angry when saying certain lines. The Persona 2 duology was the only time this 
was even in the series. Even Persona 5 Royal sticks with using one base face for every character that changes facial expressions, with only a single alternative portrait. I don't usually talk about graphics in my videos, but I thought it was worth mentioning here because of how impressed I am with the presentation. Persona 1 still looks fine, but Persona 2 is on a whole other level. But graphics aren't everything to me. Something that you do for a good majority of the classic Persona trilogy are random encounters. I didn't think very highly of Persona 1's battle system and balance, so I was hoping that Persona 2 would fix the problems I had with it. On many levels, yes, I think Persona 2 improves on the original game's battle system while having some interesting mechanics of its own to make the game stand out. However, there are still a few issues here that in some ways makes the battle system worse than in Persona 1. Some already know what I'm about to say, but for those who haven't played the game, I'm going to have to go into more detail. Persona 2's combat system is very similar to the first games, but there was some unnecessary fat that was trimmed off. For example, Persona 1's combat system took place on a grid. This meant that you had to consider where you'd place your party members because most attacks had a certain amount of range that you had to worry about. Some skills even had the ability to provide splash damage to a certain amount of the battlefield. Persona 2 drops the system in favor for a more traditional setup. I honestly don't miss the grid system, it wasn't really anything to worry about, and I ended up just keeping almost everyone in the front row anyways. Plus magic had unlimited range anyways, so your position at the end of the day didn't really matter. Instead, Persona 2's combat combat revolves around the fusion spell system. To perform a fusion spell, you have to have your party members use certain skill in a certain order. For example, if you have two characters use fire spells next to each other, you'll discover the spell Blazing Burst, which deals much more damage to an enemy than just using the spells individually. Discovering a fusion spell makes the characters use it once automatically, but after, you can pick and choose when you want the spell to be used. Fusion spells are only casted when the last party member begins their turn. So let's say you have a fusion spell that requires three party members to use. The first two will pass their turn so they can prepare to cast the spell. This adds some risk to using fusion spells because if a party member dies or has an ailment on them, the spell will be cancelled and those turns will be wasted. There are a lot of fusion spells to discover, and while some of them follow the same rules, such as applying an element to the sword skill straight slash, the more powerful skills require you to have a very specific setup, like the end game skill Grand Cross, which sees all five party members casting their ultimate skills in a certain order. But it's certainly worth it because of how much damage you could potentially do. You can discover some of these skills on your own, but I recommend using a guide for the more specific spells because they can be a bit of a pain to find. Something interesting is that if you finish a battle with a fusion spell, there's a chance that one of the personas that participated in the spell will mutate. A persona mutation can result in many different benefits. There's a chance that the persona can learn a new hidden skill, increase its own stats, gain additional ranks, and even change forms in the Velvet Room. The Persona 1 ranking system is back in this game, meaning that you have to use the persona multiple times in battle so it can learn a new skill. Performing fusion spells spells actually count towards the ranking of every party member's personas, so it's a great way to rank them up quickly. Plus there's a chance you can get lucky and the persona will gain multiple ranks due to a mutation. The fusion spell system is core to the combat of Persona 2, there's no denying that, but a decision that I dislike is the fact that in order to make the fusion spell system seem more important, other skills had to be nerfed. For example, the spells that are supposed to attack all enemies have been changed to now only affect a certain group of enemies. There are a few exceptions to this rule, but for the most part, skills like Magero or Maragi have become far less useful. Enemy formations in Innocent Sin pretty much discourage the use of attack all spells for the most part. Sometimes you can get lucky and get a formation that you can wipe out with Magero, but this is few and far between. It's certainly not a design choice that ruins the game for me, but it's just a bit disappointing that some fusion spells only give the illusion of being being useful because other skills were nerfed. Much like in Persona 1, characters are able to wield multiple personas in battle and can switch to them on the fly this time around. The Persona Affinity system has been changed a bit since the original game as well. In Persona 1, personas could activate certain abilities depending on their affinity with the user and if the situation demands for it. If the affinity with the Arcano is classified as bad, the persona could be equipped but not be usable in battle. In Persona 2, unless the affinity is classified as worst, any party member can equip and summon a persona persona in battle. Here's where it gets a bit different though. Affinity will affect how much SP it'll cost to summon the persona, as well as increasing the mutation chance. For example, if the affinity with the arcana is good or great, you'll get a discounted SP cost and a decent mutation chance. While if the arcana affinity is bad, you'll have to spend 50% more SP in order to summon the persona and the mutation rate will be around a 1% chance. The way you acquire new personas in Persona 2 is different enough to talk about while at the same time being very familiar to the other games. Just like in Persona 1, 
one, you have to contact demons and attempt to make them eager. If you're successful in making a demon eager, instead of giving you a spell card, the demon will actually give you a stack of tarot cards that represent the arcana that they are a part of. The amount of cards you get depends on how powerful the demon is. These cards are used in the Velvet Room to summon new personas to add to your arsenal. Here's where the differences start. You don't have to be the same level as the demon this time around to get the tarot cards. This means in any conversation with any demon, you can always get a reward for making them eager. However, by being the same level or higher than the enemy, when you make the demon happy, you are able to form a pact with them. The main appeal of forming a pact with a demon is that if you make them eager in another battle, they'll throw in blank tarot cards alongside the ones they already gave you. You can bring these blank cards to Kaneko over here and he'll turn them into whatever arcana you want. This is such a good concept because it means you're never out of luck if you can't find the demon of the right arcana to converse with. I don't really mind this change because the tarot cards are functionally the same as just fusing demons together. I don't really find this better or worse than the previous method, but I appreciate that there was an attempt to do something different here even though it ended up not sticking with the franchise. Another great idea is the fact that you can actually summon and equip personas that are a higher level than you. There's a 5 level threshold that you have to work with, so if you're level 30, you can summon and use a persona that's level 35. I like this idea a lot because it cuts down on level grinding. Speaking of which, Persona 2 fixes one of the issues I had with Persona 1, where the experience you gained from battles was divided up in a weird way that would leave one character over leveled. Now it's even across the board. So it may sound as though I actually like the battle system in this game a lot. Well, not exactly. There are not only still a few problems that were unfixed from Persona 1, but there was another one that was introduced that actually ruins a lot of my overall enjoyment of this game. Let's start off with one of my complaints that wasn't really fixed. The contact system in Persona 2 is still about as annoying as before. In some cases, I actually find it worse here. There's still the problem with having too many contact options to consider when talking to demons, but it's even worse here now because you have the option to pair up characters together for contact. It's so needlessly complex, especially when you realize that for a good majority of demons, you can get them eager without doing these team up contacts. Like I get the idea and it helps show off the character interactions more, but it feels pretty needless. But Persona 2's battle system has one major flaw that ruins the entire experience. Difficulty is something that I've mentioned in the past a couple of times. What I usually say is that I don't care if a game is easy as long as it's fun to play and isn't brainless. It's the reason as to why I think Persona 4 Gold and Persona 5 Royal are still fun games to play even though they're pretty easy at the end of the day. In my opinion, Persona 2 Innocent Sin, at least the PSP version, is far too easy and brainless that it feels as though the game plays itself for most of its run. This is my biggest problem with the game as a whole because what you're doing for 70% of the game is dungeon crawling and battling enemies. Just for reference, I decided to pick hard mode for this playthrough because I've heard that this game wasn't that difficult. The reason as to why this game isn't difficult mostly boils down to how little damage you receive from enemies and the overall balance of certain skills. Unless you're actively trying to limit your equipment, most enemies won't do enough damage to really worry about, unless it's an instant kill move like Mudo. I mentioned in my Persona 1 video that I ended up using the replay button a lot during random encounters because I would nuke them so fast that they didn't have much of a chance to do any damage to me. And the same thing happens here as well, but now, I don't even have to worry about taking damage because it's so incremental. Once you manage to unlock the fusion spell that buffs up defenses on all allies, that's it. The game is over right then and there. Just by applying buffs to your physical and magic defense, you pretty much can tank anything that hits you with ease. You see how much damage this guy is doing to me currently? This is the final boss, and I'm taking single digit damage from him, which, wow. Speaking of boss battles, they're almost all a cakewalk since to a certain fusion spell that you can get relatively early. By using any wind spell combined with the physical skill Sonic Punch, you gain access to the skill Pegasus Strike. With the power of 120, this bad boy can carry you through almost any boss that doesn't reflect physical. If you decide to increase the physical attack of your party with Materu Kaja, this skill can deal almost 1000 damage in a game where the numbers are usually very low. The boss fight against Joker, both phases, went down in only a few turns thanks to this skill. What happened here sums up the boss fights in a nutshell. Buff the party, set up a healer, and spam Pegasus Strike. You'd be surprised at how often this works. I kid you not, there was a point where I left the game running on auto and didn't change my strategy, and I won without breaking a sweat. Before anyone asks, I have not played the PS1 version of Innocent Sin, even though it's a fan translation. If I knew beforehand that Innocent Sin on PSP was going to be this brain dead easy, why did I pick it exactly? The answer is very simple. I try my hardest to say as official as I can on this channel. This means playing the copies of the games that I own on official hardware. Unless it's literally impossible for me to play the game otherwise, I stay away from emulation and fan translation. 
Innocent Sin is no exception, and I'm sorry, but I'm judging the game based off the version of the game we got in the West. Maybe the PS1 version doesn't have the battle issues that I have mentioned here, so if emulation doesn't bother you, it might just be better to check out that version of the game instead. Anyways, when people are usually discussing Persona 2, it's not necessarily because of the gameplay. Where most of the praise lies with Innocent Sin in particular is the story and the characters. It was one of the things I was looking forward to the most when revisiting this game for this video. I alluded to this earlier, but Persona 2's narrative focuses a lot more on the individual party members and their relationships with other people. This is very integral to the story that Innocent Sin is trying to tell, and is foreshadowed in its early hours. While the story on the surface may seem like a simple, save the world type of narrative, in the back there's a plot slowly building that's far more personal for our characters. So let me just give some context real quick. Our group's primary focus is stopping a cult called the Masked Circle that Joker is a part of. While their goal is unclear at first, we eventually learn that the Masked Circle is planning on fulfilling a prophecy known as the Oracle of Maya. If they succeed with their plan, the world will be destroyed and the surviving people that took refuge in Samaru City will be guided into a utopian age. The stakes are certainly high, and this group is not to be messed with. They're willing to detonate bombs around the city, as well as torch police stations in order to see their goal through to the end. While our group seems like a ragtag bunch of individuals, there's actually a lot more history between Tatsuya, Lisa, Ikichi, and Maya than what's first shown. Remember when we first met Yukino and Maya at Seven Scissors High School? When Maya first summons her persona, Tatsuya, Lisa, and Ikichi begin to break down crying for some reason, as they're reminded of a warm memory. Ikichi describes this feeling as a warm hug from his mother. That's not the only strange thing that happens here. Yukino asks everyone if they've played the Persona game like she did back in high school. Akichi and Lisa have different reactions to this question. Akichi said that he had a dream where he played it when he was younger, but Lisa seems a lot more uncomfortable with the question. She says that she didn't, but she looks as though she's guilty about something. This is something that happens a few times throughout the first half of the game. Lisa slowly begins to piece the information together, and this all culminates when one of the members of the Masked Circle, King Leo, gives them a message from Joker. It's at this point where Lisa remembers the sin that they committed against Joker. When everything manages to calm down and the group meets back at the Kuzanoha Detective Agency, Lisa asks Akichi if he remembers playing a game called the Masked Circle when they were kids. At first, Akichi thinks that it was all a dream until he slowly begins to piece it together himself. Tatsuya still doesn't know what's going on, so Lisa asks him to visit Alaya Shrine and she'll tell him everything about the Masked Circle and Joker. Buckle up boys, cause this is where shit starts to get depressing. Philemon instructs the group to face their traumatic past by entering Mount Iwato and finding the reflective pools. If they're able to break free from their sins, they'll be able to gain the power to face the future without fear. During their excursion through Mount Iwato, we learn a lot about the group. Ten years prior to the game beginning, Tatsuya, Ikichi, Lisa, and another boy part of this group named Jun all met at the festival being held at Alaya Shrine. They all hit it off well with each other relatively quickly and came up with a game. Since the kids were all wearing Featherman masks when they first met, they came up with a game that whenever they would meet again, they would be wearing the same masks. The kids Kids called this game The Masked Circle. They spent a lot of their free time hanging out with each other and playing games. One day, the kids came across an older girl praying at the shrine so she can follow her dreams in the future. Lisa suggests that if she were to join the Masked Circle, she could be whoever she wanted to right now and not have to worry. The rest of the kids took a liking to this girl and gave her the nickname Big Sis, and the five of them would meet frequently to play with each other. In fact, it's actually because of Big Sis that the kids played the Persona game for the first time. It's the reason as to why their older counterparts could awaken to their personas without doing the ritual. These good times didn't last forever because one day, Big Sis had to break the news to the kids that she'd be moving away the following day. Out of desperation, the kids decide to lock Big Sis in the shrine overnight, with the one protesting being Tatsuya, who ended up getting thrown in alongside her. Tragedy struck that night when a younger version of King Leo set the shrine on fire. Tatsuya managed to get out and he attempted to protect Big Sis, but ended up getting stabbed by King Leo. Out of desperation, Tatsuya managed to awaken to his persona and he used his magic to severely burn one side of King Leo's face. The kids believed that they murdered Big Sis that night because it was their fault she was locked in the shrine when it was burned down. There was a bit of hope, however, because there was no bodies reported on the scene of the accident. The damage had been done to the children, however. They ended up hiding away their masks inside of Mount Iwato and vowed to never meet again, traumatized from the events. At first, Lisa believed that Big Sis was Joker because of King Leo's description of what Joker under the mask looked like. But that theory was shadow when it turns out that the Maya that's been with the party throughout the dungeon has actually been a doppelganger created by rumors spread by the mask 
Circle. Thankfully, the real Maya arrives just in time to stop Joker and the Shadow Maya from killing the group. That's when it's revealed that Maya is actually Big Sis, and Joker's true identity is the group's childhood friend, Jun. Jun begins to have a mental breakdown because he believes that Maya died at the hands of Tatsuya, strangely enough, and flees before the group can do anything. I'll go into a bit more detail about Shadow Maya in a bit because I want to save that discussion for when I talk about her character, but as of right now, the team's objective has changed. Now that they remember the innocent sin that they committed, they're able to forgive not only each other, but themselves. However, Jun is still out there suffering from false memories, and is unable to forgive himself for what happened. It's no longer about putting the masked circle to rest for good anymore, but now the group has to save Jun before it's too late. This is the part where the story gets really good. The first part of the story is used to help flesh out the main characters rather than develop the plot in any way. We're introduced to the antagonist, but there was no reason for our characters to go on the journey other than the fact that they were the only ones with the power to stop Joker in the masked circle. When it's revealed that Joker is Jun, it adds a personal stake to the plot because we know that the characters care about Jun. Since the game spent so much time building up and developing our cast by this point, we ourselves end up caring about Jun's safety because of how much he means to Tatsuya and the others. We know that Jun isn't thinking straight, that's told to us directly, but there's a more subtle representation of his struggle. During your trip through Mount Iwato, you're able to find the Featherman masks that the kids buried 10 years prior. All of them are accounted for, Lisa's, Akichi's, Tatsuya's, and Maya's, which the kids hid away after they thought she died. The only mask that's missing from the count is Jun's mask. At some point, he came back to Mount Iwato to dig up his mask because unlike the others who tried to bury their sins, Jun just couldn't forget the sin that he committed. Persona 2 has a greater focus on building the main character's personalities, and I actually think that the game does a pretty good job at developing them further. It's still not perfect, but I found myself far more interested in the personal struggles of the characters this time around. Let's run down the list real quick. Lisa Silverman is one of the first characters you meet in Innocent Sin. Lisa doesn't exactly have a great relationship with her father. You see, her dad was a big Japanophile who moved from this side of the world from America, so he could get a citizenship and become the Japanese man he always wanted to be. Lisa is a Japanese-born Caucasian, and because of her appearance, this led to people bullying her when she was younger. Even when she was in high school, there were assumptions made that she was fluent in English because of her American heritage. Much later in the game, we come across Lisa's shadow in one of the four temples based off the Zodiac. These shadows aren't the same ones as, let's say, Persona 4, because they're more so doppelgangers that were created when the mass circle spread a rumor that our heroes were actually terrorists that set off bombs around the city. Before this rumor could come true and force the group into becoming members of the mass circle, they spread a counter rumor in hopes to save themselves. This plan ended up only working somewhat, because while they didn't end up becoming members of the mass circle, evil doppelgangers were created to fill in the space. These shadow versions of the characters have the same memories of our group, but are much more vile and evil thanks to the mass circle's rumor. Anyway, Lisa's shadow revealed that Lisa's dad wanted her to become the ideal Japanese girl. This ended up sparking something inside of Lisa, and she wanted to rebel against her dad's obsession, which led her down a dark path. She started to experiment with hardcore drugs and would swindle money out of old men. But that's not all. Lisa, deep down, was very desperate to be noticed by her peers, even though she says that she just wanted to be normal. Her shadow says that's the reason as to why she went after Tatsuya to begin with. She wanted to have the same status that he did in school, Lisa doesn't deny any of what her shadow is saying, but she's adamant that her feelings for Tatsuya are true. Even if he doesn't return them, she knows that she'll never stop loving him and will always be by his side no matter what. I actually really like Lisa's personality, but I think her personal growth is only just okay. I really like the idea that she tries so hard to rebel against her father that she's willing to do these terrible things to herself just so she can be her own person. It's sad what she does to herself, and I like that she owns up to it. She regrets those decisions that she made after she's able to accept what happened in Mount Iwato but I feel as though this aspect of Lisa is quickly brushed past and is never mentioned outside of this one instance. I feel as though this could have been explored more, but I'm not too sure if this would have made the game too dark or not. Just a little food for thought. I think Lisa is a pretty good character on her own and works really well when bouncing off of Akichi, since the two argue about almost everything like they're still children. Her crush on Tatsuya is used for comedic effect a lot, but it never got on my nerves. They definitely knew when to reel back her character and let her actions speak for herself. Akichi Mishima on the surface seems very arrogant and narcissistic, but he actually has a much lower self-esteem than what's first presented. When Akichi was a child, he was best friends with one of the most popular girls at his school, despite his shyness and introverted personality. This attracted jealousy from his peers, and they ended up picking on him because of his weight. They taunted him and said that there was no way that his friend Miyabi would love him back because he was overweight. This caused Akichi to develop an eating disorder in an attempt to lose weight. He also wears a metaphorical mask so he can seem much more confident than he actually is. Akichi 
Akichi's childhood crush, Miyabi, felt immense guilt from the bullying that Akichi received, so she decided to let herself gain weight in order to make Akichi feel less alone. But by the time she reconnected with Akichi, she felt as though she wasn't good enough for him because of the weight she gained. Akichi was unaware that this was the same girl that he loved since he was a kid, and she didn't have the heart to tell him. It wasn't until Akichi attempted to rescue her from one of his rivals where he learned the truth, that the chubby girl in front of him was his childhood sweetheart. Miyabi ends up running away before Akichi can talk to her, and we don't see her again until we find out she's been taken by Akichi's shadow to the Scorpio Temple later in the game. It turns out that Miyabi turned to using the Joker rumor to lose weight, and she ended up joining the masked circle in the process. Shadow Akichi proclaims that he's the one who owns Miyabi, and that it's Akichi's fault that Miyabi went to an extreme measure to lose the weight she gained. Akichi manages to defeat his shadow and rescue Miyabi. Akichi tells her that he doesn't care about the weight she gained because he loved her for who she really was and not what she looked like. This is a really sweet moment between these two, and it shows how mature Akichi actually is deep down. A big worry I had with Akichi was that he was going to be nothing but a comic relief character. While he is used to provide humor in his actions and banter with Lisa, he is much more than just the funny one. Hell, his relationship with Lisa has actually developed and expanded on past the two bickering a lot. Something that the two have in common is that they both have issues with their fathers. Akichi's father treats his son like an extension of himself rather than his own person. Akichi's dad wants Akichi to take up the family business when he's older and wants him to be a hyper-masculine Japanese man like himself. Akichi is afraid of his own father because of past emotional mistreatment, so Akichi dresses and acts completely different to who he actually is. So it's no surprise that Akichi can relate to Lisa in that regard, and both of them try their hardest to break away from the expectations of their fathers. Even though the two argue, we do see that Akichi does care about Lisa and her safety when she could potentially be in danger. For me personally, Akichi is one of my favorite characters in the game for both his personality and the struggle he goes through and eventually overcomes. There's honestly not much to say about Maya Amano outside of the Burning Shrine incident from 10 years ago. Maya is one of those characters that doesn't change a whole lot throughout the story, but we do see a lot of her and her personality. Maya's most recognized trait is her super positive attitude and unwavering optimism. Despite the fact that Tatsuya is the protagonist of the game, Maya takes a lot of charge within the group and acts as a bit of a leader in some scenarios. Not all is perfect with Maya, however. Because of the Elias Shrine incident, Maya has developed pyrophobia that sometimes gets the better of her. This doesn't come up too often because Maya overcomes this fear in order to help save the children at the Aerospace Museum. This is more so used to hint that Maya is supposed to be big sis before the reveal happens. Maya does show moments of weakness to keep her from feeling bland, such as near the end of the game where she breaks down after reliving the final memory with her father. Let me make this clear. Just because Maya doesn't get a whole lot of development, that doesn't make her a bad character because she's still a realized character. She has flaws and moments of weakness, but at the end of the day, she still tries to stay optimistic to keep the team morale up. But I have the same problem here as I did with Lisa because there could have been a lot more done with her other than just her involvement in the main plot. Something I do legitimately find disappointing is the way her shadow was handled. Before Mount Iwato, Maya is missing from the group and her shadow rejoins in order to spy on them. Throughout the dungeon, Shadow Maya chimes in with her own views and challenges the opinions of the other members. As the player, you're pretty much able to tell right away that something is wrong with her because her portrait is different from the regular Maya. Also, her personality is the exact opposite of the real Maya. This one is far more cruel and thinks that words like I'm sorry mean nothing due to how people are supposed to be instantly forgiven because someone apologized for their actions. This is the only time we get to see Shadow Maya because she's killed after her boss fight by the real Maya. I just think it's kind of lame that this is the most underutilized Shadow character because giving us a glimpse at Maya's ugly side is such a good idea that's sadly used far too early. Yukino is a returning character from the original Persona, and is a party member for most of the game. There are actually a lot of cameos from other Persona 1 characters in this game. Some of them you have to dig a little deep to find, but Yukino is the most prominent one. Much like in Persona 1, Yukino is a tough-as-nails girl who isn't afraid to get her hands dirty. Yukino's experiences in Persona 1 are referenced a couple of times in Innocent Sin. When exploring Mount Iwato, she's disappointed to hear that there's another sad story connected to masks in reference to the first game's Snow Queen quest. Yukino was designed to be a a temporary party member. This results in her not exactly having a lot to do in the story or much character expansion. If you enjoyed her in Persona 1, she's essentially the same as in that game, but this time a bit more mature and with a really cool design. They try to build a relationship with herself and a member of the mass circle named Anna. Anna was a troubled high school student who eventually dropped out of the school completely and joined the mass circle as one of their top members. This girl reminds Yukino a lot about herself while she was still a punk. She wants to use the lessons that her old teacher, Miss Saiko, taught her back in school to 
hopefully save this girl from a life of crime. Depending on certain actions made in the story, this little side plot can either have a satisfying conclusion, or you can fuck this up and not only kill Anna, but also Yukino. Can you take a guess which ending to the story I got? Alright, so throughout the game, you're giving these choices to either let characters handle situations on their own, or help them out. By letting the characters sort out their own problems, you're showing them that you have faith in the team. So by the time you finish Mount Iwato, Philemon rewards your team with the evolved versions of their starting personas called Prime Persona. Everyone except Yukino, that is. Not too long after that, there's a very similar moment to the rest of these choices, except it involves Yukino. The person that she loved is killed in action, and you have the choice to leave Yukino behind so you can explore the Caracol without her, or you can force to go along with you. Because I thought this was following the same trend as the other choices I made prior, I decided to leave her behind so she can have time to sort this stuff out our own. Apparently this was the wrong decision because you later come across Shadow, Yukino, and Anna. This battle ends with Shadow Yukino jumping into the sea of unconsciousness with Anna, and we never see her again. The real Yukino is left as a brain dead husk of her former self, which is such a depressing fate for this character. I don't know, something about this just doesn't seem right to me. I just dislike how this is the only choice where the correct answer is the force the characters to do something instead of having faith in them like the rest. It's inconsistent with the rest of the choices. Now this is going to be a bit interesting, because I actually want to talk about Tatsuya's character real quick, because unlike other Persona protagonists, Tatsuya is one of the few that actually has a character of his own while playing as him. Sure, he's still a mute, but Tatsuya is more than just someone to insert yourself into. When Tatsuya was a kid, he not only spent a lot of time with his friends playing the mass circle, but he ended up spending a lot of time with June personally. The two of them became inseparable, to the point where they exchanged gifts that their fathers gave to them. Jun gave Tatsuya the silver Zippo lighter that he's seen carrying throughout the game. After the Elias Shrine incident, Tetsuya began to distance himself away from people and just all around became a loner. Miss Saiko from Persona 1 is his school's guidance counselor, and she describes him as very distant and looks like that he's always in a lot of emotional pain. I personally believe that Tetsuya never fully forgot about his past sin because he still carries around the Zippo lighter that Jun gave to him, along with the memories associated with it, so he at the very least remembers Jun from his childhood. One of my favorite moments from Tetsuya happens just before the group fights Joker again. Tatsuya takes out Jun's lighter before facing him with a look of determination. Without saying a word, we understand how Tatsuya feels in this situation, how desperate he is to save his friend. There's a lot of moments where you can tell how Tatsuya is feeling just based on his portraits. Without him saying a single word, you can see the kind of person Tatsuya is. Now I'm not going to say Tatsuya is a super developed character in Innocent Sin, but there's a lot more effort to make him a more interesting silent protagonist than even the modern Persona games do. Because outside of Joker from Persona 5, I can't really tell you anything about Makoto or Narukami that isn't from supplementary material. And not to say much about Eternal Punishment yet, but Tatsuya's character only gets better from here. Finally, there's Jun, who acts as a replacement for Yukino after we defeat his Joker alter ego. This happens pretty far into the game, and most of Jun's development is tied to the endgame plot. So let's start where we left off real quick. There was a book that was written by King Leo and a man named Akinari Kashihara called the Inla Catch, which not only contained the Oracle of Maya prophecy, but also a prophecy that dictated that there was a surviving group of Nazis from World War II hiding away in Antarctica rebuilding their ranks dubbed the Last Battalion. The context of this book were actually completely false. That was until Samaru City's mysterious power turned those rumors into reality. So not too long after the group finishes up their business in Mount Iwato, the Last Battalion finally starts their war against the Mass Circle in order to gain control of Jabalba once it rises. Tatsuya, Lisa, Akichi, and Maya quickly make their way to the bottom of the Caracol in order to stop Joker from raising Jabalba. But he's not alone because also at the core is the leader of the last battalion, uh, demonetization. Anyways, Jabalba turns out to be a Mayan spaceship that has been hidden under Samaru City for centuries, which carries the city all the way up to the Earth's atmosphere. Jetpack Hitler manages to steal the Heaven Crystal Skull and escapes leaving our heroes to battle Joker. They manage to save Jun, but suddenly his father father arrives and expresses his disappointment in his son, stealing away his persona afterwards. Alright, so this is a lot to take in, so I'm gonna break it down. Jun's dad is actually the same Akinari Kashihara that helped write the Inla Catch, but the man standing before us here is not actually Jun's father, but an imposter and the main villain of the game, Nyar Lethotep. Chun's father died many years ago because he fell into the clock tower at Seven Sisters High. Nyarlethotep took the form of Jun's dad in order to manipulate him to accomplish his goal of destroying the world. What he ended up doing was rewriting Jun's memories in order to convince him that Maya was killed by Tatsuya at the Elia Shrine. This is what caused him to become the Joker, and Nyarlethotep gives Jun the power of the persona to help accomplish his goal. This obviously scars Jun psychologically because during the final dungeon of the game, there's a few points where he's on the verge of a mental breakdown because he's not sure 
which of his memories are real anymore. Jun must have drew the short straw in life because, goddamn, this kid does not get a break. It's heavily implied that Jun's mother neglected Jun as a child, and his parents were always arguing with each other at home. It's the reason as to why Jun spent a lot of time at the Elias Shrine. He wanted to run away from his terrible home life. Jun eventually grew to hate his family, even denying that Akinari was his father when he came to bring Jun home one day. But outside of his involvement with the story, I think Jun is a pretty decent character from a personality standpoint. He's very caring and is highly protective of his friends, especially Tatsuya. But sadly, Jun doesn't get a lot of time to shine in this story because you get him so close to the end of it. A lot of Jun's story is explained through flashbacks because he's not in the party for a very long time. His involvement in the story is really good and he's very integral character to the plot, but his personality outside of the story isn't quite explored that much in my opinion. Since the Oracle of Might has almost been fulfilled, the group makes a mad dash to the center of Jabalba so they can stop the Fuhrer and Nyarlathotep before the Grand Cross begins. And can I just say that I absolutely hate the final dungeon of this game? It's grueling for two reasons. Reason number one, it's a really damn long dungeon consisting of nine floors of twisting and turning corridors that make you feel like a rat in the maze. Reason number two, the encounter rate is devilishly high here in this dungeon for some reason. I didn't feel the need to talk about the encounter rate earlier because I actually don't think it's that bad for a good majority in the game. In fact, there are a few points where the Astoma skill actually works well because the encounters are usually around your level if you've been battling in every dungeon. For some reason, Shababa just has far more encounters than any other dungeon in this game. And you can't get away with using a Stoma because enemies can be up to 10 levels above your party. So your entire time in Shababa will end up looking like this for a few hours. The group ends up reaching the center of Jabalba where they come across the Fuhrer and promptly knock him down with ease. But it turns out that the Fuhrer was actually Nyar Lethotep and he reveals that the center of Jabalba is actually the collective unconsciousness. People are born here and in their death, they return to the same place. Nyar Lethotep turns into an amalgamation of everyone's father for one final battle. Despite his overwhelming power, the group manages to pull through and defeat the Crawling Chaos. Afterwards, Philemon arrives and is oddly calm about what's going on. The truth is, Philemon and Nyarlathotep orchestrated this entire plot. You see, the two of them made a bet based on mankind's potential. Nyarlathotep would be the negative force that mankind would need to battle in order to prove their worth, while Philemon is the positive force that mankind needs in order to gain the strength to continue fighting. The only catch is, Philemon is not allowed to directly help mankind and is only able to offer guidance so they can figure out the future for themselves. Nyarlathotep is the reason as to why Maki's mind was connected to the Deva system in Persona 1, and why rumors and Samaru City are coming true in this game. Nyarlathotep summons Miss Ideal with the Spear of Destiny in order to stab Maya in the stomach. This is the same spear that pierced the side of Christ in the Bible, which caused him to bleed endlessly. Because the story was passed down for over 2,000 years because of rumors, the spear works against Maya in the same way. The group is unable to stop Maya from bleeding out, and with the final piece of the Oracle fulfilled, the world comes to an end. The Grand Cross stops the rotation of the planet, destroying everything except Samaru City because it was protected by Shibaba. Our heroes actually lost. But there is a solution. Philemon offers to erase the day that the kids first met by giving up their memories together. A new timeline will be born that won't lead to the destruction of the Earth. With this being the only option, the group vows to meet again in the new timeline and show Nyarlathotep the true power of mankind. And with that, a new timeline is born. The game opens up at Seven Sisters High School with our main protagonist, Tatsuya Suo, fixing up his motorcycle. We get a glimpse of what this new timeline looks like. Just like what Philemon proposed, no one remembers each other and they all live happy lives. Jun in particular has a much better relationship with his mother, and he wants to become a teacher much like his dad. The game ends with Tatsuya and Maya accidentally bumping into the train station, sparking a bit of deja vu inside of Maya. There's a lot to take in with this last portion of Innocent Sin, and this ending leaves a lot to be desired because the questions that this ending gives the player are answered in Eternal Punishment. I think that the biggest flaw with the last few hours of Innocent Sin is just how much the game throws at you story-wise. It can be hard to keep up with it at points unless you've been following everything that's been told to you and you talk to NPCs around the city. It can honestly start to feel very confusing. The biggest thing to take away from this ending is that the group was willing to sacrifice their memories for each other for the greater good. They're optimistic about meeting each other again in this new timeline, but it isn't guaranteed that they will. 
Even just by bumping into each other at the train station could result in nothing happening. But that's for Eternal Punishment to hopefully answer. In the context of Innocent Sin, it's a really sad ending. It feels as though our characters are just destined to no longer be together. Ultimately, Philemon is just as responsible as Nyarlathotep with the destruction of the world because of their experiment. So his offer of creating a new timeline isn't exactly as kind as he wants it to seem because it's partially his fault. I haven't finished Eternal Punishment yet, so hopefully my questions will be answered. And that's the end of Persona 2 Innocent Sin. Overall, this is a very good story that's sadly really hampered by its borderline brainless gameplay. As a reminder, I'm referring to the PSP version of the game when I'm saying this. This game is primarily remembered because of its narrative and characters, not necessarily because of its gameplay. And I can totally see why after playing through this game again myself. The best part about Innocent Sin is its story, but that's not the entire package. In order to experience those characters and interesting plot threads, you're gonna have to experience the gameplay side of Innocent Sin. While the general mechanics are fine, the game just never takes full advantage of them in battle because there's no need to use those mechanics. I hate complaining that a game is too easy, but this is just one of those cases where it's borderline boring. So you might just be better off playing the PS1 fan translated version of the game if you want to experience Innocent Sin, because hopefully the difficulty issues aren't present in that version of the game. And from what I've played of Eternal Punishment so far, I can already tell you I won't be repeating the same criticisms. The actual story can be very complicated at times. There was a lot of stuff that I had to leave out of this video for the sake of getting to the important parts. But at the end of the day, Innocent Sin's story was really good. There's a reason as to why people would consider it the best in the franchise. I personally wouldn't go that far, but I like it more than let's just say Persona 3's narrative. I can cautiously recommend Innocent Sin on the PSP if you're willing to look past the gameplay flaws, but this game was certainly a step in the right direction for the franchise and a massive improvement over the original game. Next time, we're going to be venturing back into Uncharted territory with the only game in the Persona franchise I have yet to finish at this point. So join me in part 2 of this review when I cover Persona 2 Eternal Punishment for the PS1. Persona 2 Innocent Sin is a good game overall. Sure, I think that the PSP remaster definitely butchered the combat mechanics to a large extent, but what kept me going through all of that was the game's story and cast of characters. Innocent Sin ended on a very somber note. Despite our hero's best effort, they couldn't stop the world from being destroyed by Nyarlathotep. The only solution to this problem was to erase the group's memory of meeting each other. By doing so, a new timeline is created where the events of Innocent Sin never happened. At the end of the day, it seems as though the childhood friends were destined to stay apart. Though, this game ended on a cliffhanger because in the new timeline, Maya and Tatsuya bumped into each other by accident at the train station. We're not shown what happens next, but it's implied that this gave Maya some sort of deja vu. It was because of this cliffhanger that I went straight into playing Eternal Punishment after finishing the Innocent Sin review. I wanted to see how the story would continue, and if any of the problems I had with Innocent Sin were fixed in this version of Eternal Punishment. I guess I should mention the elephant in the room real quick. Much like Innocent Sin, Eternal Punishment was initially released on the PS1, before receiving a remastered version for the PSP. This version of the game features added content, as well as the same battle system that was featured in the Innocent Sin remaster. The problem with this port is the fact that you're not playing it unless you can read Japanese, because much like Innocent Sin on PS1, the game was only released in Japan. I believe the reasoning this time around was because the PSP was already fading out of popularity because of the launch of the PS Vita, and since Persona 4 Golden came out the same year as Eternal Punishment PSP, I can only imagine that game taking more priority due to the fact that Persona 4 was already big at the time. Since there's no fan translation of Eternal Punishment PSP yet, the only way you're playing this game in English is through the PS1 version. For the purposes of this review, I'll be looking at Eternal Punishment in the context of someone who's played both parts of the duology as intended. So let's get started now, shall we? Maya Amano is our protagonist this time around, and the game opens up with her being assigned to write a story about the Joker rumor. Just like in Persona 2 Innocent Sin, if you call your own cell phone number, you'll summon a deity known as the Joker. The difference this time around is that instead of Joker granting dreams to those who seek them, he acts as a hitman who will kill anyone who you request. Maya's roommate and friend, Ula La, accompanies her to Seven Sisters High School because the two plan on going to a party after the investigation. It's here when the two meet a detective that's been investigating the recent murders named Katsuya Suo, the older brother of Tatsuya. It's implied that the two have a strained relationship, and Katsuya is using the Joker investigation as an excuse to try to check up on his little brother. Maya and Ula La's investigation doesn't go so smoothly, 
as they eventually find the principal of Seven Sisters murdered in his own office. Maya, Ulala, and Katsuya chase after a suspect, but end up encountering the Joker. Joker apparently knows Maya because of his experience with her on the other side, as he calls it, but Maya has no idea what he's talking about. Joker sends a demon to attack the trio, and they all begin to awaken to their personas slowly. Joker manages to wipe them all out in a single attack, and they awaken in the realm of unconsciousness where they meet Philemon. He warns the group that the rumors in Samaru City are becoming a reality, and that something threatens the very fabric of this side's existence. Philemon seemingly isn't at full strength because he's barely able to get the message across before the group is sent back to the real world. After investigating the school a bit more, the trio manages to come across both Joker and the suspect behind the principal's murder, Anna. Joker tries to remind Anna of her life in the other timeline, and claims that the world she lives in now is one born from evil. The group tries to battle Joker again, but it's in vain because he casts a spell to put everyone to sleep. Before he can finish everyone off, Tatsuya bursts in and fends off Joker. He hands Maya a Seven Sisters High School emblem, claiming that if he heads to the Kusanoha Detective Agency, she can spread a rumor that as long as Maya holds the emblem, she'll be protected from Joker. The deja vu boy leaves, but not before telling Maya not to get herself involved and to forget about their meeting. Wondering if what Tatsuya said was right, the three head to Kusanoha and test the waters. Thanks to the chief's connection, they manage to get in contact with a man named Bao Fu, a wiretapper who runs an underground website dedicated to collecting and spreading rumors. He takes interest in our group because they manage to survive an encounter with the Joker. Bao Fu believes that the foreign minister, Tatsuzo Sudo, is involved with the Joker. Thanks to a wiretap he put on Tatsuzo, Bao Fu was able to discover that before the public even knew what the Joker rumor was, Tatsuzo was already discussing it. There's also rumors that Tatsuzo has connections to some shady businesses, and that his son Tatsuya Sudo was behind an unsolved arson case. Thinking that this is too much of a coincidence, Bao Fu suggests that the four head to where Tatsuzo's son is being held to get some information about the Joker. It's implied that Bao Fu has some ulterior motives, but they are currently unknown. One thing is for sure though, as long as Maya holds onto the emblem given to her, she'll no longer be a target for Joker, which means that there's slim chances she'll run into Tatsuya ever again. So Maya makes the decision to burn the emblem, putting herself back on Joker's radar, but also opening up the opportunity to discover the truth about the Deja Vu boy. Jesus Christ, that is a lot to take in, but when summing it all up, it's actually very similar to the setup to the plot of Innocent Sin. We have a group of Persona users trying to go up against Joker, but in due time they end up getting involved with the affairs of a cult known as the New World Order. Their plan is the same as the Mass Circles, but replace Shibaba with another spaceship called the Torafune, and replace the Grand Cross with the ancient Earth Dragons. But the differences are in the details, because unlike every other Persona game, this one focuses on a cast of adults. This is the only time in the series where this is a thing, and it's something that I want to see tackled again because we're getting to the point where high school students are being overused in this series. Making the cast a group of adults opens up plenty of opportunities to tell more adult-oriented stories. One thing that Eternal Punishment story focuses on is the mystery surrounding Tatsuya. It's actually a brilliant plot element because it caters to two types of players. If you've played Innocent Sin, then it's not hard to tell that Tatsuya has his memories from those events in this new timeline. Though, for reasons that aren't apparent yet, he's very adamant about making sure Maya and his other friends stay out of his business. It makes you ask yourself, why is Tatsuya acting like this and why does he remember the events of Innocent Sin? If you were a part of that group that played Eternal Punishment back when it first came out in the West, or just skipped Innocent Sin, you get to experience this mystery in the same way that Maya does. Maya has no idea who Tatsuya is, but he seems to know her, and for whatever reason, he wants to try to keep her away from trouble. Paradoxically, Tatsuya attempting the distance himself from Maya makes us, the player, want to learn more about him and what his deal is, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Persona 2 Eternal Punishment came out only one year after the previous installment. This means that the game uses the same engine, along with repurposing and reusing environmental assets. Mechanically speaking, Eternal Punishment is the exact same to Innocent Sin, with only a few minor differences. So instead of re-explaining the gameplay and the mechanics, I'll instead be talking about the differences between playing Eternal Punishment on the PS1 versus playing Innocent Sin on the PSP. I want to start off by saying I haven't really dabbled much in the PS1 era RPGs. Part of me was very unsure about the gameplay portion of Eternal Punishment because I wasn't quite sure if I was spoiled by playing the PSP version of Innocent Sin, which featured a completely revamped UI, faster battle speed, and just quicker travel in general. 
I was expecting something very old school and outdated. And I'm not sure if this is a hot take or not, but after playing Eternal Punishment on PS1, I actually ended up enjoying the gameplay a hell of a lot more here. The first thought that entered my mind when playing Eternal Punishment was the game's difficulty. The thing that ruined a good majority of my enjoyment of Innocent Sin on PSP was the extreme lack of challenge. There was no point to use the game's mechanics to their fullest because you could get away with just using the auto battle feature most of the time. This was doubly true when you applied buffs to the party. Your party would receive barely any damage, so battling enemies lacked any sort of tension. I knew before going into it that Persona 2 on PS1 would be far more challenging than the PSP remasters, but I wasn't sure to what extent. The little I read about the game online before starting had me thinking that this game was going to be very difficult. People commonly refer to Eternal Punishment as the most challenging Persona games in the series, or at the very least, one of the hardest, which is something that I can't fully agree with. If I were to rank the Persona series in terms of how much trouble each game gave me, it would look a little something like this. I'd place Eternal Punishment just above Persona 4, but below Persona 3. Though, I would say that Eternal Punishment offers a more fun and fair challenge than Persona 3 because of the former's difficulty curve. Overall, I would say that Eternal Punishment is not a super difficult game, but I'm not too sure if that's because at this point, I'm already used to the mechanics of the Persona 2 duology and have played a lot of Mega 10 games in the past. Even though I went into the game blind, I didn't have much trouble dealing with anything that was thrown my way because I always took my time in between dungeons to make sure my party had useful personas and updated equipment. My final playtime was around 52 hours, which is almost double the playtime I had at the end of Innocent Sin. To be fair, Innocent Sin on PSP has better load times and the game just runs faster overall. There's even an option to turn off animation so you can speed through the grinding. But at the end of the day, there were many more times in Eternal Punishment where I spent a good few hours grinding to keep my characters updated. This isn't a complaint towards Eternal Punishment because at the end of the day, this is something that I did to myself. On the bright side, this allowed me to really absorb the mechanics of Eternal Punishment and really appreciate the design changes and just the way the game is structured in general. I said this earlier in the video, but Eternal Punishment's combat system is almost identical to Innocent Sins, but there are a few changes here that overall improve the experience. The contact system has been dramatically simplified when compared to the previous two games. Persona 1 and Persona 2 Innocent Sin gave every party member four different methods of contact, so this typically meant that you had around 20 different contact options to choose from. Innocent Sin also introduced team-up conversations as well, which expanded your options to an overwhelming degree. Eternal Punishment takes a bit of a different spin with its contact system. Every character now has a contact method that's unique to themselves and reflects their personalities. For example, if you choose Maya when contacting a demon, she'll interview them as if it's for a magazine article. Baofu has a shady past and a history of wiretapping, so his contact method that involves those skills. There still is complexity in the contact system because you can get brand new results by pairing up characters with each other, much like in Innocent Sin. Something that I'm not a fan of personally is that when pairing up the characters for contact, the character order is what determines the action the group performs. Let's say you want Katsuya, Bao Fu, and Ulala to interact with the enemy. You have to select the characters in a specific order to get the interaction that you want. But the game isn't entirely clear on what the result of pairing up the characters would be until you execute it. The most you get is a little hint of the current relationships of the characters at the bottom of the screen, which influences the outcome. At this point, you're all probably sick of hearing me talk about the contact system in these games, but I personally feel as though that this mechanic doesn't need to be as complicated as it is. This is why I appreciate that in games like Nocturne and SMT4, the negotiation system is straightforward. I just think in a game where the main challenge comes from the combat system, having the negotiations be tough to do without a guide isn't exactly the best design choice. That's not to say that I dislike this system, however, I still think it functions as intended and there weren't any points where I became frustrated. But once again, I believe that using a guide when contacting demons is pretty much necessary if you don't want to waste a lot of time experimenting. If we're going to go into a bit more depth involving difficulty, something that I noticed right away was how brutal the start of the game was. The first dungeon doesn't really stop you from just waltzing up the clock tower and taking on the first boss, but doing this is a huge mistake because you won't be prepared at all for the upcoming demons. I got my ass slapped so hard on the first attempt because I wasn't expecting how much damage I'd receive from the enemies, so I ended up spending some time grinding up my character levels as well as performing fusion spells to trigger mutations to increase my persona's stats. In about an hour or 
or so, I maxed out the ranks of the starting personas and even got a heal all spell on Maya, which ended up helping so much. Boss fights in general are just way more interesting this time around. This isn't just due to the fact that you take way more damage in Eternal Punishment, but also because some of the bosses this time around feature some gimmicks. For example, one of the boss fights near the end of the game will regenerate almost 800 HP after every turn. So the main challenge comes from finding a way to deal as much damage as possible so the boss's regeneration won't undo all of your efforts. Not all bosses are created equal, however, because there are some bosses that push the envelope just a little too far. There's a boss about halfway through the game where their minions keep spamming status ailments. This was easily the most frustrating part of the game because there's a chance that the entire party could be put to sleep and you just waste turns trying to recover. Thankfully, I had a persona that could reflect gun damage, so I ended up winning due to sheer luck. Taking this as a sign to things to come, I ended up grinding quite a few times throughout the game. If you're the type of person that just bum rushes through Eternal Punishment's main content, there will be many points where you may just end up getting stuck due to not having necessary skills or personas to deal with the bosses effectively. So yes, this is one of those games where I really do recommend some sort of grinding. Make sure you fuse brand new personas so you'll always have the option to change your strategy. Make sure those personas have their ranks maxed out so you have access to all the skills you need. If you're not a fan of taking time to do this, then I'm not sure if Eternal Punishment is the right game for you. I personally love this kind of stuff, because it actually requires me to use the mechanics at the game's disposal, but I understand the argument saying that grinding is tedious. Here's a tip in case you do decide to play Eternal Punishment yourself. In between dungeons, the bomb shelter at Kasumi Yaga High School is going to be your best friend. The bomb shelter has a total of 8 areas you can explore to refight the enemies from the previous dungeons. The further you progress through the game, the more areas open up. While encountering enemies here give you a decent amount of experience, I recommend grinding at the start of the next dungeon rather than here. I mostly use the bomb shelter to acquire a lot of tarot cards for fusion. What I suggest you do is form a pact with a couple of demons in the furthest area you can explore and continuously make them eager. Not only will you get a lot of tarot cards for the arcana that demon represents, but you will also be able to stockpile a bunch of free cards that you can turn into any arcana that you need. This ended up being my primary way of obtaining tarot cards for fusion, because it ended up being a lot faster and easier than trying to track down a demon of a specific arcana that I needed for a persona fusion. An easy way to rank up a newly fused persona is to make sure they have at least one spell in their skill list that doesn't deal any damage to enemies. What you do is enter a battle and set everyone's strategies to use support or ailment magic. A persona's rank will increase once you summon it a certain amount of times, so just leaving the game on auto, you can go do something else while the character's personas get stronger. This method isn't exactly quick, but it's very easy to do. Overall, I would say that Eternal Punishment's gameplay, mechanically speaking, is slightly better than Innocent Sins, if only because the negotiation system is much easier to understand and execute. While I still may not be a fan of making the negotiation a challenge, I still can recognize that there are improvements made here that match up with my preference. When it comes to my overall enjoyment of the combat system, I actually did have a pretty good time at the end of the day. Which is very weird for me to say because even though the gameplay in Innocent Sin is almost the exact same, I didn't enjoy the gameplay of the former much at all. All it took was one small change to make the experience so much better. In the case of going from Innocent Sin PS to Eternal Punishment PS1, the higher enemy damage made me actually think and strategize instead of using the auto battle feature. Out of all of the classic Persona games, Eternal Punishment is my favorite when looking at it from a pure gameplay department. At the time of writing this video, I have yet to play the PS1 version of Innocent Sin, so I reserve the right to change my mind whenever I get around to playing that version of the game. So yeah, the gameplay is good and all, but what I was really looking forward to was seeing how the Persona 2 story would continue in Eternal Punishment, something that I praise Innocent Sin a lot for was the relationship that the party members had with each other, and the interactions within the party. I thought that the group in that game was well established, and they all bounced off each other naturally. I had some expectations going into Eternal Punishment, and sadly, I don't think it quite hits the mark this time around. Don't get me wrong, the cast in Eternal Punishment is solid, these are well-defined characters that go through their own personal developments, but in my opinion, I feel as though the party lacks a great chemistry as an entire group. There are some excellent character moments between a select few members, I quite like a lot of the interactions between Bao Fu and Katsuya, because they work on the opposite ends of the law, so hearing them argue about their different points of view is very entertaining and helps flesh out their characters. What makes me think this is the fact that the group doesn't really have much in common with each other. The pin that held the innocent sin cast together were their memories of their past sins, and their relationship with Jun. I was invested in the story surrounding that group because there were a lot more personal stakes involved with the plot. The Eternal Punishment cast, while having their own motivations to go on their journey, lacks anything that really binds them together. This could very well be intentional to show the complications of being an adult, and how a lot of things are out of your control, but intentional or not, I feel as though one party is far more interesting 
building as a group than another. As individual characters, this party is mostly strong. I don't have the same attachment to this group as I do the group from Innocent Sin, but that's mostly because of my personal preference than weak character development. There is one exception to this, however, and I'll explain more in detail once I get to them. First up the bat is Maya's best friend, Ooh La La. She's one of the first characters you meet in Eternal Punishment. And while it may not seem like it right away, Ooh La La suffers a lot from self-confidence issues. This eventually led her to comparing herself to Maya a lot, where she ended up developing a deep jealousy of Maya. Ooh La La was upset that Maya had been managing to find success in her career, while she struggled to even find a field that she was good at. Coupled that with bad past experience with men and a drinking problem, we have someone who's filled with a lot of negative emotions, which makes her a prime candidate for the New World Order's plan. Plan. You see, the New World Order wants to harness the negative emotions of the people of Sumaru City so they can summon the Earth Dragons to bring about Armageddon. This energy is called Kegare. The way that they obtain Kegare is via a rumor that was spread over the news by a fortune teller a part of the cult. If anyone were to use the Joker rumor, then they would become a Joker themselves. What this means is that their negative emotions, such as sin or jealousy, has driven them to the point where they're willing to take a life of another. Ooh la la, in a drunken state, calls her own phone number to put a hit on my Maya out of jealousy, believing it to be nothing more than a rumor at the time. It's the reason as to why she's so protective of Maya at the start of the game, when she learns that Joker is after Maya. Ooh la la blames herself for the danger she put her friend in. Ooh la la eventually becomes a Joker herself and the group has to battle her. After Joker ooh la la is defeated, the group takes her back to the Velvet Room in order to have her Joker side suppressed. But the truth is, there's no way that this curse can ever be lifted entirely from her, as negative emotions are just a part of all humans, and it'll be up to ooh la la to keep herself in check. If she were ever to fall in the same trap as she did before, then her Joker counterpart will resurface. Ooh la la is a prime example of what happens if you let your negative emotions get the better of you, and this is something that her shadow criticizes her for near the end of the game. She can't change what she did, but she can still better herself by standing by Maya's side no matter what. Something that rubs me the wrong way with Ooh la la's character arc is the fact that the people around her don't exactly question or critique her actions involving the Joker fiasco. Yes, she was intoxicated at the time she called Joker, but I can't help but feel as though Maya doesn't exactly have any strong reactions to her best friend putting a hit on her. Ooh la la does try to rectify her past sins by sticking by Maya's side, but I feel as though it's unrealistic and not believable that Maya wouldn't react at all to learning this information about her friend. I can't help but feel as though this would damage the relationship between these two characters, but it's never brought up again until near the end of the game, and I think that's a huge missed opportunity. I understand that the point of her story is to make sure to keep your emotions in check. Ula learns not to keep her insecurities bottled up and talk to Maya about her problems. But I think that the story could have gone far beyond than what's presented here. Ulala's story is a very unique one in the context of the rest of the Persona series because she's the only character that has a considerable focus on the topic of jealousy. While yes, Junpei Yori and Yosuke Hanamura have some aspects of jealousy in their story, it's not the central focus of their characters like it is for Ulala. So I find it super disappointing that this wraps up far too neatly and too quickly. I don't care that Ulala was drunk when she called the Joker phone number, she still had the desire to murder her friend. Yes, she owns up to that mistake and wants to make amends for what happened, but this should be the start of a much bigger story involving the friendship between Maya and Ooh La La, and the trust issues that a situation like this would cause. Maya is a positive and caring person, yes, but you mean to tell me that she saw no problem in what Ooh La La did? I find it so disappointing that there could have been a much grander story involving repairing any potential trust issues Maya may have with Ooh La La, but it was just ignored. This is the only time Ooh La La is in the spotlight, and I wish they did more with her. Ooh La La is probably my least favorite party member in this game, but that's because she had a lot of extra potential that went unutilized. Her actual story is fine, but it ends too abruptly to have the impact they were going for. Bao Fu is a very interesting character. When we first meet him, he claims to be from Taiwan, but strangely enough, he's fluent in Japanese. I mentioned earlier in the video that he joins the party with ulterior motives, and we eventually learn what those are about halfway through the game. It turns out that Bao Fu isn't exactly who he says he is. His real name is Karu Saga, a Japanese prosecutor that was presumed dead. He and his partner Miki were investigating a money laundering scheme involving the Minister of Justice in the Taiwanese Mafia. That was until Tatsuzo Sudo marked the two for death so they wouldn't be able to expose the criminal activity. Kaoru managed to survive his encounter with a mafia leader, Young Pao, because he managed to awaken to his persona, but his partner Miki wasn't as lucky and was killed by Young Pao. Kaoru was filled with regret and despair from then on, promising to avenge her. Discarding his old identity in favor of the name Bao Fu, he vowed to himself to get revenge on both Young Pao and Tatsuzo, even if it meant turning to a life of crime. Lucky for Bao Fu, Young Pao's mafia, the Ten Tao Len, has been reluctantly 
actively working with the New World Order. They kidnap the victims of the Joker curse so they can be sent to have their Kegare extracted from them. So the main reason as to why Bao Fu teamed up with our group was so that he could eventually get his revenge, because deep down, he was afraid that he would fail on his own. But Bao Fu's biggest struggle comes from his inability to forgive himself for what happened to Miki. It's one of the more subtler aspects about his character because it isn't fully addressed until the final dungeon. But his entire identity came from a place of sorrow. He wore this metaphorical mask in order to run away from his true feelings, but his journey throughout the game helped him learn to have faith in others to help him out when needed. And more importantly, he is able to gain the strength to forgive himself. Bao Fu was able to get closure with Miki during a vision that was conjured by his shadow. At the end of the game, he's able to retire his Bao Fu persona and return to a more honest life as Keru. It's because of stories like Bao Fu's that the fandom wants to see another persona game following adults. The plot surrounding him is very mature and deals with the concept of self-loathing and vengeance in a way that isn't tackled in this series again. What really won me over to Bao Fu was his interactions with the other characters. He's got a very cynical outlook on life and butts head with every party member at some point or another, but it's not in a way that makes him toxic as a teammate. The way I see it, it's a mask that he wears to hide away his inner sorrow until he's able to cope with it. Overall, he's a solid character in my eyes. Katsuya Suo is a homicide detective that is assigned to investigate the Joker killings. He ends up joining Maya and Ulala after he's suddenly taken off the case. Katsuya wants to discover the truth behind the Joker and the New World Order's involvement, but this slowly takes a back seat when he learns that his younger brother Tatsuya is involved in one way or another. Despite the strained relationship he has with his brother, Katsuya is very adamant about keeping his younger brother safe. Katsuya doesn't have much time to spend with his younger brother due to his job, so eventually the two grew apart. But Katsuya still tries his best to care for Tatsuya, even putting money aside from his paycheck to support him in the future. Katsuya became a detective for a somewhat personal reason, that being the clear the innocence of his father. Ten years prior to the events of Eternal Punishment, Katsuya's father was also a police officer who was investigating Tatsuya Sudo, the man who would eventually become the first Joker. Tatsuzo would eventually catch wind of the investigation involving his son, so he used his power within the police force to falsely charge Katsuya's father so he'd be incarcerated. This left a stain on the Suo family name, so Katsuya decided that it would be up to him to clear the name of his father. He would give up his dream of becoming a patissier, so he could go to law school and eventually find himself in the same position as his father. This choice didn't come without any regret, which is something that his shadow reveals to the group. Deep down, Katsuya resents his brother and father because he had to give up his own dreams in pursuit of clearing the family name. While it's true that Katsuya does have these feelings, they don't overpower the love he has for his family, which if you ask me is a very realistic aspect of his character. It's much like Ula La's jealousy towards Maya. While both are good natured people, the difference is that one of them submitted to their negative emotions in a time of weakness, while the other was able to stay strong and not give in. Katsuya's growth isn't as grand as someone like Bao Fu's, but that doesn't make him a bad character. I've seen people refer to him as a bland character online, and I personally disagree with that notion. I personally found his origins of a detective exciting, and how could you hate a guy who tries as hard as he does to reconnect with his brother? If I were to rank these characters, I would say I like Katsuya more than Ulala, but not as much as I like Bao Fu. Eternal Punishment takes notes from Persona 1 in the sense that you get to choose who your fifth party member will be. Around 10 hours into the game, we learn that Nanjo and Ellie from Persona 1 are investigating the New World Order and their connections to the Joker curse. You have to spread a rumor for which character you'd like to meet once you learn of their involvement. This choice will determine which character route you'll go through. If you pick Nanjo, you'll journey with him to where the NWO are holding the Joker curse victims and discover that Takahisa Kandori from Persona 1 has been revived through the power of rumors. He now works alongside the NWO, helping develop the Joker separation machine they use to collect Kegare. If you decide to pick Ellie as your partner, the group will instead head towards the Sumaru TV station and confront a woman named Chizuru Ishigami. Chizuru is working with the New World Order, and is the one responsible for spreading rumors in their favor through her fortune telling. No matter who you pick as a party member, the team up is only temporary, and the route is only a momentary diversion from the main path. Much like Yukino from Innocent Sin, they're more so just a stand-in for the eventual fifth party member. But I feel as though Yukino had more screen time dedicated to her, and the game even tried to evolve her character more. For full transparency, I've only played through Nancho's route at the time of this video, so I'll not be making any judgments on Ellie's route. If I were to compare Yukino's inclusion in Innocent Sins to Nancho's in Eternal Punishment, I think Yukino was more interesting as a party member. While I don't think Yukino's extra development was perfect in Innocent Sin, there was clearly ideas to expand her character. Nancho feels more like an extended cameo because there isn't much going on with him in this story. They try to say that Kandori represents Nanjo's shadow, but I don't think there's enough time spent with either of them for me to really see what they were going for. 
Something nice to see is how much Nanjo has really changed since Persona 1. In that game, he was a very cruel person that was willing to do terrible things for the greater good. In Eternal Punishment, Nanjo has matured. He's a far more compassionate person who's learned, in his own words, to not forsake the lesser for the greater. It's cool to see how his experiences in Persona 1 impacted him in this game, but there isn't much new here to really expand his character. That's probably as the reason why Nanjo is in this game for only a few dungeons. This once again falls into the same trap that Persona 1 did, where the optional party members don't leave much of an impact on the game because it was written in a way where it didn't matter which one you chose. The stuff that happens in Nanjo's route doesn't really have much of an effect on the main story at the end of the day, other than gaining a new perspective. I can only assume that the same applies to Ellie's route, but at some point I'll have to go through her route to see if that's true or not. There is one more character I'd like to talk about before moving on to Tatsuya, that being our main protagonist, Maya Amano. I like Maya in Innocent Sin. She wasn't my favorite party member in that game, but I liked her upbeat personality and her tendency to be the leader of the party in that game. Something that I noted in my Innocent Sin video is that while I felt like Maya was a realized character, she didn't exactly have any sort of character arc like the rest of the cast did. So when I learned that she was going to be the protagonist of Eternal Punishment, I was looking forward to see what direction the writers would take her characters, and if I'm being honest, I think that Maya is the most disappointing part about Eternal Punishment's narrative because in this game, she's a silent protagonist. Before you all go tearing me apart in the comments section, allow me to explain my thoughts. Remember in my Innocent Sin video where I took some time to discuss Tatsuya as a character, even though he was a silent protagonist? While his personality wasn't as fleshed out as the rest of the cast, he still did have aspects to make him feel like a character of his own. So for Eternal Punishment, the writers had the opportunity to expand his character further and let him speak his own mind, free from player control. The reason why this works is because Tatsuya in Innocent Sin was initially written as a silent protagonist before being turned into a standalone character. This doesn't work for Maya because she's already an established character. What's the point of stripping away the things that people like the most about Maya? Is it to stay with with tradition of having a silent protagonist in a Mega Ten game? Well, that's not a good decision in my eyes, tradition or not. There are multiple points where something bad has happened in the story or to one of the characters, and I'd ask myself, what does Maya think? How does Maya feel about this? But I never get the answers to these questions. This is even more frustrating because I know if the same events were to happen in Innocent Sin, we would get to see Maya's reactions to them. I understand that this is an alternate timeline, but come on, there's so much potential for Maya's character here. Even if I were to pretend that Maya was always a silent protagonist, I just think she doesn't even compare to Tatsuya when it comes to expressing herself. There are a lot more moments that really show off Tatsuya's personality in Innocent Sin than there are for Maya in Eternal Punishment. It's also a lot harder to nail down Maya's personality for that matter. We just sort of have to take the game's word for it that she's a positive person because it isn't really shown off this time around. Her dialogue options are also a bit more generic than Tatsuya's overall, so when directly comparing the two as protagonists, it doesn't really do Maya any favor. I'm not going to say that Maya is a bad character, but I think there could have been a lot more done with her, which is doubly disappointing considering Innocent Sin left me wanting more with her character already. The last party member I want to discuss is none other than the deja vu boy himself, Tatsuya Suo. His character is tied very heavily to the overarching plot of Eternal Punishment, so I may as well tackle two birds with one stone here. A large aspect of Eternal Punishment's narrative is the overall feeling of deja vu. As I pointed out earlier in the video, the setup of Eternal Punishment is largely similar to Innocent Sins. We have a cult rising to the power accompanied with the mysterious Joker rumor that has swept over the city. The cult's main goal is to raise a spaceship that's buried under the city so they'll be safe from the destruction of the entire world. Once the old world is cleansed, the new one can be established. As you saw in the character review section, the differences lie in the finer details, but this sense of familiarity is intentional due to the involvement of the previous antagonist, Nyarlathotep. But how exactly does this relate to Tatsuya? Well, it turns out that the Tatsuya in Eternal Punishment is the same one from Innocent Sin. In case you need a reminder, at the end of Innocent Sin, the only way to reverse the damage caused by Nyarlathotep was to create a new timeline where the cast of that game never met. But when the time came around for everyone to forget, Tatsuya was the only one who refused. After all that he and his party went through, he didn't want to forget about them or the lessons that they learned. Tatsuya ended up breaking the promise he made to Maya and his friends, and went into the new timeline with his memories intact. However, this ended up with coming with more consequences than what Tatsuya had expected. Tatsuya is considered a paradox by Nyarlathotep, and his mere existence is the reason as to why the Crawling Chaos is able to manipulate events once again to lead to the world's destruction. If Maya, Akichi, Lisa, and Jun were all to regain their memories of the previous world, then the contract binding this timeline's existence will be broken, causing the world to 
revert back to its destroyed state. Tatsuya, in an attempt to atone for his sin, decided that it would be up to him and him alone to stop Nyarlathotep and the NWO. He doesn't want to get the people who he cares about involved with this mission, because it could result in the total annihilation of their world. This is the reason as to why Eternal Punishment shares a very similar structure to Innocent Sin. Nyarlathotep is pulling the strings in order for the world to go down the same path that led to its destruction, intentionally making it so that the Innocent Sin cast will be in familiar situations so they can regain their memories. Tatsuya is always one step ahead of our group, and shows up in the nick of time in order to stop the plans of both antagonists. Tatsuya acts very cold and distant from Maya's group in order to keep them from getting involved, but that doesn't deter them from their goal of stopping the New World Order. After much pestering, the group manages to convince Tatsuya to tell them why he's been acting so distant, but Tatsuya's only condition is that after they learn the truth, they would have to back off and leave the rest to him. It quickly becomes apparent that the group has no intentions of letting Tatsuya suffer on his own. While the most notable aspect of Tatsuya's character is the regret he feels for betraying the promise he made, his character goes far beyond this. In an attempt to repent for his sin, Tatsuya forced himself to grow up faster and act like an adult. In his own perspective, an adult is someone who takes responsibility for their own actions alone. If they make a mistake, then they alone must face the consequences. This mindset is seen as childish by the rest of the adults. What Tatsuya doesn't know is that one man can't carry the entire world on their shoulders, so his character arc through the rest of the game is learning what it truly means to be an adult. Tatsuya doesn't have much of a reference for how to be an adult because of what happened with his father, so when Tatsuya joins the party, he finds a role model in Bao Fu. The two are able to connect on some level because they both feel as though they're responsible for the suffering of another. One of my favorite scenes in the game is when Tatsuya is having a conversation with Bao Fu about the difficulty of being an adult. When Bao Fu gives his cynical answer, a deadly silence fills the area. None of the characters disagree with what Bao Fu said, but at the same time, they don't want to admit that there's some sort of truth behind his words. Tatsuya is without a doubt my favorite character in this game. I caught him fairly early that Tatsuya still had his memories from the Innocent Sin timeline because of how evasive he was towards the rest of the group, but what I wasn't expecting was how depressing his story ended up getting. If we take into the accounts of the events of Innocent Sin, we have a man who just after reuniting with his childhood friends, has to give it all up for the greater good. At first, he reluctantly accepts that this is something he has to do, but when the time comes around and Tatsuya has to say goodbye to his friends, he ends up caving into his fears. He realizes that he'll never have the same connections ever again, so he decides to go against the promise he made and remembers the events of the other timeline. What I like most about Tatsuya is the fact that he doesn't try to justify what he did. He knows he fucked up, he knows the consequences for his actions, but instead of sitting there and crying about it, he wants to stand up on his own two feet and rectify what he did. While his goal is admirable, the issue comes with how Tatsuya went about accomplishing them. He thought that this was a burden that he alone had to deal with, but in reality, it doesn't have to only be himself, and that's something he learns throughout his journey. Tatsuya is a very realistic character. He's someone who in a moment of weakness made a selfish decision, but at the end of the day, he wants to make things right, no matter what he has to give up to make that so. And that brings us to the finale of the game. Just like in Innocent Sin, the city has been raised thanks to the Tora Fune, and the end of the world is nigh. But once the group is able to defeat the NWO's god Gozen, the earth dragons and the Tora Fune are sucked in a portal that was formed in the sky. It turns out that this is all thanks to Nyarlathotep, who teleported everyone to the collective unconsciousness for one final test. He's holding Akichi, Lisa, and Jun captive in his domain. If the group is able to overcome their shadows and defeat him, then he'll let them go. But if they fail, Nyarlathotep will have the three regain their memories, which will result in the destruction of the world. Agreeing to his terms, the group sets off to encounter their shadows one by one. This is a very cool final dungeon for thematic reasons. Nyarlathotep represents humanity's shadow, as well as the adversity humans need to overcome in order to grow, so it's only fitting that the final test of eternal punishment is testing the resolve of our characters. At this point, they have all overcome their external struggles, but have yet to face their internal ones. I also enjoy how it's Nyarlathotep himself that's taking the role of everyone's shadow in the party. His default appearance is of Tatsuya Suo which he wears in order to mock the young man for his mistakes. Nyarlathotep's power comes from what he calls the three poisons of humanity, anger, vengeance, and ignorance. He uses his knowledge of the party to try to make them give in to their negative emotions as their shadows. Depending on certain actions made as Maya, you can influence whether or not the characters will fall for the trap. This essentially makes the first phase of the final boss harder, depending on how many times you're unable to have the party control their emotions. In due time, the group makes it to the deepest part of the collective unconsciousness where they have to battle Nyarlathotep 
Lithotep in his true form. When I fought him, I apparently got the easiest version of this encounter, and in all honesty, it's not that hard. It's much harder than his boss battle Innocent Sin, don't get me wrong, but I think it was just the combination of personas I was using that made some of my characters practically unkillable. Maya's ultimate persona, Artemis, is surprisingly overpowered because while she's weak to all physical attacks, there's no magic in the game that harms her. It all just gets reflected, which is pretty overpowered if you ask me. Artemis isn't the only persona that has this sort of ability because I was using Odin on Tatsuya, which pretty much does the same thing, but blocks all magic instead of reflecting it. The hardest part about this fight is how long it takes to complete. You'll be going through a lot of SP items in order to keep up the pace, but if you made it this far already, you'll most likely be prepared to fight this guy. In due time, Nyarlathotep will eventually fall, shocked at his defeat. He claims that as long as humans exist, he will as well since he's the shadow of all of humanity. This is a fact that our characters accept. A human can't exist without a shadow. What matters is if they let their shadows rule their lives or not. With that, Maya and Tatsuya put the crawling chaos down, ending his influence over the world. Though, there still is one more thing Tatsuya must do. He repented for his sin, but he still to hold up his end of the promise. As long as Tatsuya exists in this timeline, the timelines will eventually converge, so Tatsuya makes the difficult decision of returning to his destroyed world. Even though there's nothing left except Sumaru City, he's optimistic that he'll rebuild a greater world with the survivors. Tatsuya was borrowing the body of the Tatsuya native to the Eternal Punishment timeline, and now that his duty has been fulfilled, it's time for him to go home. It's ambiguous whether or not Tatsuya is successful at rebuilding the world of his own timeline, but I like that it isn't explicitly answered. Answered. In my opinion, Tatsuya used the lessons that he learned while on this side to assist him in the future. He learns what it means to be an adult, and now it's time to apply that knowledge. An unknown amount of time passes, and we see that peace has been restored to the world. Everyone has found new meaning in life. The Tatsuya from this side was affected by the innocent Sin Tatsuya, as his relationship with his brother is becoming stronger. Tatsuya even asks Katsuya to take him under his wing so he can become a detective. But one day, Maya spots Tatsuya at a crosswalk, and instead of talking to the boy, she decides to leave him. Maya no longer wants to live in the past. Instead, she wants to take the lessons that she learned with her into a brighter future. And that's the end of the Persona 2 duology. I really like the story of Eternal Punishment, and if you ask me, it's almost as good as the one from Innocent Sins. The only thing that holds it back from being on par, if not better, is the cast of characters. I really liked the cast in Innocent Sin. I think that they not only gelled better together as a group, but I think that there were more characters that I think were developed better overall. That's not me saying something like, I think X character is better, but more so, Innocent Sin has more characters that I like overall. If Maya was her own own character and not relegated to the role of a silent protagonist, I think that this story had the potential of being better than Innocent Sins. Eternal Punishment would have really benefited from having a protagonist that reacts to the events around them. I would have liked to see more moments where Maya was her own person, but sadly we don't get that. But thankfully, I think that characters like Katsuya, Baofu, and Tatsuya really pick up the slack. Tatsuya especially, holy shit. But when we compare Innocent Sin to Eternal Punishment, which one do I think is the better game overall? Innocent Sin has a fantastic story with very real and well-developed characters. I think it does a better job in that regard than Eternal Punishment because there were some characters in this game that I'm not so hot on, either due to missed potential or general underutilization. But the story is only some of the experience with Innocent Sin. The gameplay is borderline brainless and not enjoyable in the slightest to me. Eternal Punishment does have a few more misses in its cast than Innocent Sin, but I think the narrative that the game is trying to tell about changing fate is very strong and has a lot more subtleties than the other games do. And I think Eternal Punishment is also much, much better in a gameplay sense since there's a reason to actually use the mechanics instead of just leaving the game on autopilot. So between the two games, I'd say Eternal Punishment is better. I see a lot of people only really talk about Innocent Sin when referring to Persona 2, and I can't help but feel that those people are really missing out. I get that not everyone wants to play a PS1 RPG and are waiting for the fan translation of the PSP version, but Eternal Punishment on PS1 one is more than a playable experience. One that I think would be better played on PS1, considering what the PSP version did to Innocent Sin in terms of difficulty. So good job, Eternal Punishment. You may have been overlooked for now, especially in comparison to Innocent Sin, but one day, you'll get the recognition that you deserve. About one year ago, I released my video on Persona 3 Fest for the PlayStation 2. A video that, despite its flaws, is one that I'm ultimately still proud of. Admittedly, however, part of me always thought my look at Persona 3 was somewhat incomplete. 
I know it might sound weird to some people due to the fact that I covered both their journey and the answer. What exactly is there left to talk about involving Persona 3? The answer is quite simple. I still haven't covered the PSP port that was released back in 2009. You see, Persona 3 Portable is far more than just a handheld version of an already existing game. There are a lot of additions and changes made from Persona 3 Fest that, at the end of the day, make this its own separate experience entirely. My thoughts on Persona 3 Fest are basically unchanged since I released that original video. The changes that Persona 3 Portable introduces range from the smaller ones such as changing how overworld exploration works to something major such as a brand new female protagonist option. This is far more than just a skin swap because the female protagonist in this game comes equipped with her own exclusive content. For the purposes of this video, I'll mostly be discussing and evaluating what Persona 3 Portable adds, so I'll only be talking about the female protagonist this time around. The male protagonist route is the exact same as its PS2 counterpart, so if you're interested in hearing my thoughts regarding that, you can check out my original video on Fess. For this video, I'm going to assume that you've either already watched that video or have played the game yourself. There's going to be a lot of spoiler discussion for both Fess as well as the additions that the female protagonist brings to the table. So here's your spoiler warning now. With that out of the way, let's get acquainted with Persona 3 again really quickly. Persona 3 follows a group of high school students known as C's trying to find a way to eliminate the 25th hour of the day known as the Dark Hour. During the Dark Hour, any normal human transforms into a coffin and are oblivious to this time's existence. There are a few unlucky people who don't go through this transformation have to explore this twisted version of our own world where they're at risk of being attacked by these creatures known as shadows. Seas makes it their goal to harness the power of their personas so they can defeat the shadows and eventually discover the truth behind what caused the dark hour. The main backbone of Persona 3's story is the exact same whether or not you pick the male or female protagonist. Your character is still a transfer student who after many years of being moved around, returns to their hometown only to discover that they have the Persona potential. Not too long after joining Seas, your character is appointed leader of the team due to their above average skills and their ability to wield multiple Personas. Where the main differences lie are in the way that this story is presented. Persona 3 Portable, right off the bat, has a lot of visual downgrades. This was due to the limitations of the PlayStation Portable. Cutscenes are now presented in this visual novel style rather than the way we're used to. Instead of having a fully explorable overworld, we now have this point and click setup to work with. There's a lot of discussion online debating the quality between Persona 3 Fest and Persona 3 Portable. This change is usually the first one that's brought up, and while there's no doubt that the PSP version of the game looks worse, I can't help but feel as though these downgrades aren't exactly that big of a deal. Minus a few line changes here and there, the only difference between the story of Fast and Portable is the lack of 3D models and cutscenes. This is more so true to the mail route because the content here is the exact same as featured in Fest. There is still plenty to enjoy in the story due to how strong the script of the game is, but if I'm going to be fair, the cutscenes can end up feeling very visually uninteresting. This is especially true when there are multiple scenes that take place in the same location. There's also the fact that Fest features animated FMVs and key moments of the story to emphasize the importance of those events, which the game succeeds at. For me personally, I do agree that the visual aspect of Portable can hinder some of the more emotional moments of the story, but that doesn't mean that the storytelling in Portable is any different than Fess. It's visually less engaging, but all of the characters you know and love are still here and accounted for. This is why the downgrade didn't bother me too much. Persona 3 is very much a dialogue-driven narrative, not so much a visually-driven one. The visuals do add to the story, sure, but I don't really think that it's a requirement to enjoy it. But if the only difference between Fess and Portable were the cutscenes, then this debate wouldn't exist to begin with. What makes Portable a good alternative to Fess are the mechanical differences alongside the game's brand new content. Persona 3's main structure has been altered to be more in line with Persona 4's. A lot of Persona 3's original DNA still exists in this version of the game. For example, the way that the tiredness mechanic works is different. In the original Persona 3, your party members will grow tired after spending too long inside of Tartarus. When a character becomes tired, they're far less useful as a party member. This is only a huge annoyance at the start of the game, because I believe that the character level is what determines how fast they'll become tired. Once they reach a certain level, it won't be much of an issue. The way this system works in Portable is far more preferable in my eyes. Instead of becoming tired while exploring Tartarus, the characters will instead only become tired once you leave the Dark Hour. In order to keep this system balanced, the first floor of Tartarus no longer restores your HP and SP for free. Much like Persona 4, you have to pay a fee in order to do this. I enjoy having more control over when I should leave Tartarus rather than the game deciding me it's time to go home, because you can essentially stay in the dark hour for as long as you want if you play your cards right. 
It's very easy to reach the current highest point of Tartarus as early as the first time you visit it. The main gameplay mechanics are also taken right from Persona 4. There were the smaller ones such as the protagonists having their own dedicated weapon class and the sea social link giving the party members combat benefits, but the biggest change added to this game is the fact that you can now directly control your party members instead of using the tactic system. This is a huge addition. Persona 3 is the odd one out in the series due to the fact that it's the only game where you have to rely on AI-controlled party members. There is some limited control offered here with the tactics system, but at the most, all this does is narrow down the skills that AI can potentially use. I personally wasn't a big fan of this system due to the fact that it was somewhat unreliable, because the tactics were sort of vague rules to give to your party. There was no way to ensure that a party member would use a debuff skill over healing magic because certain requirements needed to be met for that action to be performed. The tactic system in Persona 3 is certainly unique. There is fun that can be had with giving out the proper orders to your teammates and watching them pull off the strategy you had in mind, but this system can end up becoming very frustrating once you realize how limited it actually is. I went into this more in my Persona 3 Fest video, so I won't dwell on the subject here. But something that I want to discuss is the effect this change has on the overall balance of Persona 3. It's a pretty big deal to give direct control over the party members in Persona 3 because the game was designed with a tactic system in mind. None of the enemies or bosses were redesigned to fit in this new combat system. This undoubtedly makes the game easier because now you can adjust your strategy on the fly instead of praying that your current tactics would fit the job. So there's an obvious question that needs to be asked. Was Persona 3's original challenge due to smart design or was it hard because of the intentional limitations put on the player? In my personal experience, Persona 3 Fest is the most difficult game in the mainline Persona series, because no matter how you slice it, it's the game that has the most amount of random elements to it. Sure, every turn-based RPG has some amount of luck to it, for example, even something as simple as landing your basic attack has some sort of RNG to it, but there is no other Persona game where the skills that your party members will even use rely on RNG. The tactics menu does increase the odds of getting what you want, but the fact of the matter is that there's always a chance the AI will make a decision that you won't agree with. Persona 3 Portable's direct party member control eliminates a lot of the RNG with the combat system. You're able to use skills and items in more creative ways thanks to having full access to your arsenal at all times. A character like Akihiko went from a party member that I used a lot at the start of the game before benching, ended up becoming someone that stuck with me throughout my entire playthrough. Mitsuru is far more useful because you can control when you want her to use mind charge and status ailments, instead of relying on the game to do so. In terms of overall challenge, I think Portable is a game that you still have to think and strategize in, but it's hard to deny that Fest is a far more difficult experience overall. For me personally, I always thought that Fess's challenge was more so due to the limitations of the combat system than having a legitimately tough enemy. The raw stats of the shadows you fight are unchanged from Fess to Portable, but I always found the battles to be more difficult in the former due to the handicaps that are forced on you. It's not exactly what I would call a fair challenge to limit the way you play the game. Even though Portable is a far easier experience because of controllable party members, it's a lot more fun because of how I'm able to take advantage of the party members' movesets. But anyways, the main reason as to why I wanted to talk about Persona 3 Portable wasn't because of the changed combat. The female protagonist route gives access to a lot of exclusive content. The main draw for me personally is the set of brand new social links and new story events. For the most part, the social links between the male and female protagonist are the exact same. There are a few differences here and there with the ones involving the female party members, such as Fuka is almost entirely focusing on the cooking aspect of her social link, but it's not enough for me to change my original verdict on them. I mostly want to focus on the 8 brand new social links that were added specifically for the female protagonist that ended up replacing some of the old ones. But before we jump in, I quickly want to discuss how good of a job Atlas did at making the male and female routes distinct from each other. I'm not just talking about the exclusive content, because there are a few more subtle ways that they achieve this. The female protagonist, Katone Shiomi, has a far more outgoing personality than Makoto Yuki. Makoto was very reserved as a protagonist. What I mean is that he rarely would ever speak his mind or is the one to instigate conversation. He's very much an introvert. He's much more the type of the person who's willing to listen and offer his own thoughts only when asked. Which is why I find it very striking that Katone is the complete opposite of Makoto. Katone's dialogue options are very energetic, and just overall have an optimistic aura to them. But one of my favorite additions to keep these two distinct from each other is the fact that Katone has brand new music exclusive to her route. 
She has a different battle theme, Tartarus boss theme, overworld music, and summertime music. This is just one of those changes that the developers really didn't need to implement at all, but all these new tracks are fantastic in my eyes. I especially like the tracks Danger Zone and Sun. I know that this is a bit of a weird diversion, but it's something I wanted to talk about briefly. Anyways, the new social links for Katone are, for the most part, pretty solid with only a few exceptions. Some of these social links are ones that I personally believe should have been in the normal game, such as the ones with the male party members. But there are a couple here that were added that I wasn't expecting, and were a pleasant surprise to say the least, so I'm going to discuss them in no particular order. Number 1, The Chariot, Ryo Iwasaki. If we're going to start off with anyone, it may as well be with our fellow classmates from Gekkokan High School. More specifically, let's take a look at our extracurricular activities. While playing as Makoto, you have the choice between either participating in swimming, kendo, or track and field. This is how you unlock the social link with the character, Kazushi Miyamoto. As Katone, you still have access to sporting events, but the character you end up starting a social link with is a girl named Ryo. In my playthrough, I ended up joining the volleyball team, but the social link is the same no matter which team you join. Ryo is very serious when it comes to sports, to the point where her strictness begins to affect the relationship she has with the other team members. It eventually gets to the point where the other teammates decide to quit the sport and begin to resent Ryo. On the surface, her attitude and overachieving personality may seem as though it comes from passion, but it actually comes from a place of frustration. It turns out that Ryo is childhood friends with a boy named Kenji and has developed romantic feelings towards him. Deep down, Ryo knows that Kenji doesn't return those feelings for her because he's only interested in older women, so she keeps her emotions bottled up. The last thing she wants is a potentially damaged relationship the two already have. Ryo would end up taking her frustrations out while she played sports, which would eventually boil over to her teammates. Thanks to the help of the team's coach, everyone is able to reconcile and the team manages to convince Ryo to confess her feelings for Kenji. It doesn't exactly go over too well because the young boy is oblivious to her advances. Even though it's not the result that Ryo wanted, she does feel a lot better and less stressed out than before. By the end of the social link, Ryo admits to Katone that before she joined the club, volleyball was nothing more than an instrument to relieve her frustration. But it's because of the time she spent with the protagonist she was able to find genuine enjoyment from the sport. I gotta say, I'm not really a big fan of this social link. This is mostly due to the fact that for the most part, not a whole lot happens. There are multiple ranks that are dedicated to Katone and Ryo just practicing together alone. It's a small story that feels as though it was forcibly stretched to fit the standard 10 rank format. If I'm being honest here, I wasn't really expecting the social link story to go in this direction. At the start, we get a glimpse of the kind of attitude that Ryo has towards her teammates and how she constantly expects so much out of them. She gets very frustrated at the idea of them even taking time off for their own enjoyment. What I thought this story was going to focus on was how destructive the idea of perfectionism is. My first impression of this character led me to believe that we were going to see a character who's obsessed with the idea of being the best in their field, that they would end up putting barriers between themselves and their loved ones. This could lead to its natural conclusion of learning when to take a step back after becoming self-aware of their actions. That's an idea I'd personally find compelling, and I only have these expectations because Kazushi's social link from the mail route was very well done in my eyes. In that story, Kazushi ends up pushing himself to the absolute physical limit and runs the risk of permanently damaging his leg. Kazushi puts himself through this pain in order to inspire his nephew to go through his own physical therapy. It's more interesting to me because there are more stakes involved, and there's more time spent with Kazushi as a person. I think comparing Ryo to Kazushi doesn't do her any favors, and if I were to look at this social link on its own, I think it's only just okay. Number 2, The Hermit, Sayori Hasegawa. Sayori is a second year student who lived overseas for a few years. As a result, she's a few years older than Katone despite being in the same grade. Sayori is the oldest student attending Gekogan High School, and because of her age difference with the rest of the student, she has troubles interacting with them. Sayori is a very passive and distant person. This ends up making her a prime target for bullying. The main focus for this social link is seeing how Sayori's passive attitude eventually lands her in hot water. Not too long after the social link begins, a boy asks Sayori out on a date. While this invitation was an innocent one on the outside, it turns out that the boy is a rotten cheater. And when this guy's girlfriend finds out about him going on a date with Sayori, he puts the blame on her. This ends up severely damaging Sayori's image because later on, she's featured in the school's newspaper with an article slandering her, claiming that Sayori is the kind of person who parties all night long and seduces men. Eventually, the school staff gets involved and Sayori is shamed and temporarily suspended from the school. But wait, it gets even worse for Sayori. After her suspension is over, she reveals to Katone that she'll be transferring to a private school and that her parents think she's a disgrace to them. Holy 
fuck. This social link focuses so much on kicking this poor girl into the ground, which is a very great way to make me feel immediately bad for her. This is especially true when you consider that a core aspect of her character is the fact she doesn't like to instigate any trouble with people. Sayori is the exact opposite of the way people portray her. Hell, we learn that she never even said a curse word until she was hanging out with Katone, and even then it was just to see what the feeling is like. Sayori just rolls with the punches and tries not to let it negatively affect her, but she doesn't really take a stand to try to stop it herself. This isn't a critique, mind you, because it's the entire point of her character. She doesn't want to experience more conflict, so it would be easier for her just to keep her mouth shut. It's because of the time she spends with Katone, and seeing the way that she reacts to these situations, is the reason as to why Sayori is able to learn to speak up for herself. Even though her reputation at Gakugan High School is permanently ruined and her transfer cannot be stopped, Sayori is able to muster up the courage and go on the PA, and tell everyone that what they heard of her were lies. This is an important moment for her character. The main theme of Sayori's social link is how dangerous public opinion can be. If enough people believe a lie, it will eventually become the truth in their eyes. While the lies bother Sayori, she lacked the courage to speak out against them, but it's thanks to the time she spent with Katone that she's able to find her strength. The ending of the social link, while bleak, still has an optimistic feeling to it. Sayori is transferring to another school because of the rumors, but she promises to keep the lessons she learned in the new environment. If Sayori feels weak, she'll think about the time she spent with Katone and the courage she had to speak up against the entire school. It's safe to say that I like this social link a lot, and I personally feel as though it's a bit underrated. I really don't see a lot of people talk about Sayori much, but I'm not sure if that's because fans haven't played through it or are just uninterested in this story. But this social link kept me engaged from beginning to end. It's a very solid one. Number 3, The Magician, Junpei Iori. Now this is the stuff I was looking forward to. A very odd admission with Persona 3 social links is that none of the male party members got one. To this day, I'm not sure why this was the case, but the FEMC route fixes this. One of the first social links in the game is with Junpei, who just so happens to be one of the first party members you get. Junpei gets a lot of character development through the main story, so his social link mostly focuses on building the friendship he shares with the protagonist. The social link does a great job at foreshadowing certain aspects of Junpei's character in the main plot. We get to see his desire to play the hero very early on when he he becomes very protective of Katone. Turns out that someone's been taking very provocative photos of Katone behind her back, and Junpei wants to get to the bottom of this and put a stop to it. While this is partially the focus of the social link, the main goal that's accomplished here is showing us a side of Junpei that isn't really expressed in the main story. We learn throughout the link that Junpei has a hard time expressing himself to others. He wants to be seen as an unshakable wall used to protect everyone, but eventually, he learns that he can rely on others. Junpei learns that he is able to speak his mind with his friends and he doesn't have to be the class clown of the group. And that's thanks to the time he spends with Katone. Something very interesting about Junpei is the fact that you can't start a romantic relationship with him. The Persona series is somewhat known for its dating sim mechanics, which is something I always found strange. Mostly because these mechanics are very shallow. I'm not criticizing the game for this, but dating characters isn't a big focus. Sure, you can have some cute events with characters, but at the end of the day, it's just an option that was added for fun. I just find it interesting that Junpei is excluded from this mechanic. This is most likely due to the fact that his relationship with the character Chidori is integral to his character development. But even after her unfortunate death, Junpei doesn't have any interest in Katone romantically at all. Even in his main social link, he's more interested with just being friends than to start a relationship with her. It's a refreshing change of pace in a series that's become very notorious for constant Twitter wars because of this system. Speaking of their friendship, I think that Junpei's social link really makes that rooftop scene in January have more of a payoff. When Junpei admits to the player that he considers you his best friend, it originally didn't really feel earned because we barely had any one-on-one -on -one time with the guy. But thanks to the social link for the female route, this scene has much more meaning behind it. While not a whole lot happens in this social link, I think that the character development here really helps flesh Junpei out more than he already was. It's not an essential social link to his character, but helps give a new perspective. I like it. Number 4, The Star, Akihiko Sanada. Akihiko was the captain of the school's boxing team, and to put it lightly, didn't have a great childhood. Due to past trauma, he has a hard time interacting with others and spends a lot of his free time training by himself. One of his first steps into opening himself up is by spending more time with Katone once you have a high enough charm stat. After Katone spends enough time with Akihiko, he eventually reveals to her that he's actually an orphan child. When Akihiko was young, he and his sister had moved into an orphanage after the death of their parents. Though this wasn't the only loss for Akihiko as his sister would also eventually pass away in an accident. Akihiko blamed himself because he felt that he was powerless to save his sister, which is why he dedicates himself to the intense training. Akihiko doesn't want to feel powerless again, so he's trying to improve himself. Akihiko eventually begins to grow anxious about Katone's safety on the front lines of battle. 
even though he knows that she's capable of taking care of herself, he can't help but feel as though to associate her with his deceased sister. Akihiko was eventually able to admit his feelings to Katone. While he accepted the reality that his sister was gone, he can't escape the pain and anger that he feels. Akihiko has a deep fear of losing what's important to him, so his own solution was to close himself off from others. But what Akihiko learns isn't to shut himself off emotionally, but rather that he should be fighting to protect the things that are dearest to him. Honestly, I'm very disappointed with this social link. We don't really learn anything new about Akihiko's character because the stuff involving his sister's tragic death is already addressed in the main story. And since this is the primary motivation for his social link, it feels as though it's a retread rather than an evolution of his character. I really like Akihiko in the main plot of this game. I think he has the most heart-pulling development because of the losses he goes through. After the death of his childhood friend Shinjiro, Akihiko was able to admit to himself that he was too distracted on his quest for power to acknowledge what was going on around him. He is able to find a new resolve because of those events and grows as a person. This socially acts as though the new resolve was thanks to it and not the actual story. While we do get some new details on what exactly happened to Akihiko's sister, it's ultimately unnecessary because it doesn't change the way I look at his character. Arc. Unlike Junpei's social link where we get to learn more about his family life and see the side of him that was never expressed in the main story. I enjoy the early ranks of this social link because we get to see Akihiko in unfamiliar situations to him and get to see how he would react. He's shy, gets flustered, and overall just tries his best for Katone. I'm sorry, but the actual story of this social link doesn't really do it for me personally. Maybe if they focus on something else, it could have been better. Number 5. The Strength, Korumaru. So this was a surprise. I legitimately had no idea that Kaoromaru had a social link before going into this game, and when I found out that he was going to be replacing Yuko's social link, I honestly had no idea what they would do with him. A lot of you took notice that in my original Persona 3 video, I didn't spend any time talking about Kaoromaru. This is mostly because I didn't really have anything interesting to say about him. I mean, everything you need to know about Kaoromaru is told to the player in his introduction. Koromaru's master was a priest at the Naganaki Shrine, but he would eventually pass away due to being involved in a car accident. Koromaru would now live as a stray dog, spending most of his time at the shrine protecting his master's memory. It's eventually discovered that Koromaru actually has the potential to summon a persona of his own, and he joins Seas in their battle to end the Dark Hour. After his introduction, Koromaru just sort of hangs around and doesn't really do a whole lot in the main story. I mean, I wasn't really expecting him to have much importance because he can't even speak on his own. So other than just mentioning that he exists, I didn't really find much of a reason to talk about him. But giving Korumaru a social link was the last thing I expected for the developers to add. But is it any good? Well, I'm honestly shocked at how much I enjoyed it. This social link is mostly used to get a good idea as to how Korumaru feels after the passing of his master. This is a story that's told without any dialogue with Korumaru. We learn that he misses his master dearly, and that he feels more alone than ever after his passing. Korumaru is loyal until the end. He's willing to protect the shrine from anything that could harm it, whether that be from shadows to disrespectful teenagers. Something that's brought up near the end of the social link is that Koromaru is having a hard time accepting the death of his master. And while Seas tries to act as a good replacement for him, that's not what Koromaru wants. What he desires is to be treated as an equal to Seas and not as a pet. Not much character growth happens in this social link, but I believe that this is excusable because we instead focus on Koromaru's feelings. And for a character that lacked much to do in the main story, this really does help us understand his feelings a lot more. Though the presentation for this story did end up becoming very visually boring to me. This is one of the few social links in the series that would have benefited a lot if we were able to get the full visual experience. What I mean is that the game goes out of its way to describe a lot of Koromaru's actions, so the player has an idea of what's going on. Since Koromaru doesn't speak, we're supposed to rely on the way Koromaru reacts to events to get a feel for his character. But it doesn't work so well when there's no real visuals to accompany this. And while I said earlier in the video that the lack of 3D cutscenes isn't that bad, this is one of the few exceptions. I think that if this social link was infest, then the storytelling could have been a lot stronger thanks to the visual aspect. I am aware that this social link can be seen as just a joke inclusion because it follows the funny dog, but it's clear that there were some good ideas here, but it's just limited in the visual aspect. It might sound strange to praise Koromaru's social link while at the same time being disappointed in Akihiko's, but that's mostly because Akihiko's social link dwelt on an aspect that was unnecessarily flat. Out. Compare this to Koromaru, where his social link is what really fleshes out his character. One expands on an underutilized character, while the other one bloats an already complete one. While I don't think that this link is perfect, I think that it at least somewhat accomplishes what it sets out to do. 
Number six, The Justice. Ken Amada. All right, I guess I have to talk about this one, huh? Ken is a very shy child, so much so that he doesn't seem to have many friends his age. When he first joins Seas, Ken spends a lot of time alone, and it isn't until Katone invites him out for dinner that he begins to feel more comfortable. At first, Ken is very evasive of Katone's questions about his life, even down to the point where he's afraid of showing his interest to her. But after a few ranks, Ken slowly begins to open up about himself. The thing that Ken hates the most is being treated as a kid. He's someone who wants to skip over his childhood and move right into his teenage years. This results in him being pretty insecure about the way he is now. He doesn't think he's worth spending time with Katone because in his eyes, he believes she'd rather be spending time with someone like Akihiko because there's less of an age gap. But what Ken learns throughout the social link is that it's okay for him to just be himself. There's no use acting like someone you're not because even though he didn't see it at first, his friends at Seas already do appreciate him. It's a very simple story that's actually resolved very early on in his social link. Normally, this sort of revelation would be had at the end of the story, but there's still a lot of ranks left after this happens, and let me just say, the remainder of Ken's social link takes a very, very strange direction. It's at this point where Katone becomes a motherly figure for Ken. In case you need a reminder, two years prior to the game beginning, his mother died in an accident caused by the character Shinjiro's persona. Ken's main motivation throughout the story is avenging the death of his mother since she was the only family he had left. So Katone takes care of Ken in a lot of ways, mostly by getting him different dinners and always lending an ear to the young boy. But eventually, Ken develops romantic feelings towards Katone, which he hides away at first because he believes the age gap between the two characters is too significant. But at some point, these feelings become too strong for him to hide away, and he'll eventually admit them to Katone, as long as she returns them. I'm sorry, what? Apparently, if you pick certain dialogue options for Ken, you can eventually eventually turn your relationship into a romantic one. Uh, why? I mean, I made the joke in the original Persona 3 video that Maiko's social link had some strange undertones, and even then I was mostly kidding. But this is just hard to excuse, or even to justify its inclusion for that matter. The remainder of the social link just makes me uncomfortable because Ken and Katone have to hide the relationship from the rest of Seas. You can even go as far as spending Christmas with just the two of you. This really did not need to be in the game, and thankfully I'm not alone in thinking this. Number 7, The Moon, Shinjiro Aragaki. Shinjiro is the last character to join the party. He used to be a member of Seas, but ended up leaving the group when he lost control of his persona. This ended up killing Ken's mother, so Shinji stepped down from the group due to the guilt he felt. Though his retirement is only temporary as he rejoins Seas once the villain group Strega begins to become more of a problem. In all honesty, I always thought Shinjiro was a character that needed a social link. Because outside of his involvement in the main story, we didn't learn a lot about him. Which is why when he dies in the story, I personally was more sad for Akihiko than I was for the loss of him as a comrade. Shinji's social link, to jump right into my opinion of it, does a great job at fleshing out his character beyond what the story showed us. Underneath his tough and serious exterior lies a man who's actually very caring for the people around him. He worries a lot about the diets of the members of Seas, and is even a fantastic cook. This stuff was only hinted at in Fess, but Portable goes all the way with it by showing us there's a lot more to Shinji than his depressing past. Yes, he's tough on the other members and can be very intimidating, but he only wants what's best for them. Shinji begins to open up more to Katone as the social link progresses, and you can really see that her company has left a huge impact on him, because other than Akihiko, he doesn't really have any other friends. And while the two may bicker a lot, he's glad that he has someone like Akihiko in his life. Shinji is someone who doesn't fear his own death, but he doesn't want anyone to be saddened when he's gone. He even goes as far as telling Katone not to cry when it happens. He doesn't explicitly say he's going to die soon, but it's heavily implied he's prepared to pass away during the October 4th events. Not gonna lie, this scene really made me feel for Shinji. He's the first character in the entire party to accept the reality of life, and the fact that it's eventually going to end. It's what the entire game's about, after all, and it's only fitting that Shinji eventually ends up being the character to inspire the rest of the party. I think that this social link does a great job at fleshing out Shinji's character, but this social link comes with one fatal flaw, and unfortunately, it's one that you cannot avoid unless you decide to not finish it. You see, at the end of the Rank 9 event, Shinji will tell Katone that he lost his pocket watch. You can actually find this watch for yourself at the police station and return it to Shinji in order to max out his social link. But be warned, if you do this, you'll severely alter the events of the story. Normally, Shinji would die on the night of October 4th after taking a bullet to save Ken's life. It was Shinji's way of atoning for what he did, so you'll never believe what giving him back his pocket watch actually does. The scene plays out as normal, but instead of Takaya's bullet killing Shinji, the pocket watch that he now has actually absorbs the bullet, saving his life. What a load of bullshit. What sort of Indiana Jones luck does Shinji have to keep his watch in the exact spot that Takaya would shoot him? 
Sure, he's in a coma for the rest of the game, but it's confirmed that he eventually leaves the hospital, and you can even get an exclusive ending with him if you play on New Game Plus. This is on the same level as the Chidori revival event that's featured in both Fess and Portable, but in some ways, I find it worse here because it makes two character arcs much, much weaker now. This more so applies to Ken, but Akihiko's character arc suffers because of this as well. Shinjiro's death is a core aspect to both of these characters. Akihiko admits that he lost sight on what's important on his never-ending quest for power, and we get this emotional scene of him breaking down at his best friend's memorial. Akihiko knows that Shinji would want him to carry on, and he's able to discover his new resolve. Ken, on the other hand, is completely wrapped up in the guilt. It isn't until Akihiko talks to him one on one when Ken realizes his quest to avenge his mother was a coping mechanism he used for the isolation he felt. What Ken decides he's going to do is return to seas in order to end the dark hour, but he's now not only fighting for the memory of his mother, but also to honor the last words of the man who gave his life for him. And while the actual text is unchanged, the context is now completely different and far worse than before. To explain why, I'm going to use a bit of an odd example. We all know the origin story of the character Spider-Man, right? How when Peter Parker had the chance to use his power to stop a robbery, he instead ignores it because he believes it's not his problem, until he eventually finds out that his actions inadvertently cause the death of his Uncle Ben. Through his own actions, he learns that since he has the power to help people, that it's his responsibility to do so. The reason why this works so well is because his uncle died from what happened. Not hospitalized, he died. The same rule applies to Ken's arc in Persona 3 Fest. Shinjiro, the person who Ken wanted to get his revenge on for years, ended up saving his life at the cost of his own. Shinji's last words are about telling Ken to not waste his life, and the young boy takes that to heart. And after all, isn't that the main theme of the game? That death isn't something to fear and we should all live our lives to the fullest, fighting for what we believe in? And the worst part is, this is required to do if you want to max out his social link. At the very least, the Chidori revival scene can be ignored. Hell, a lot of people in my comments section didn't even know it existed until they watched my video. This decision makes me disappointed. At the very least, I enjoy the actual social link ramifications notwithstanding. I honestly think it would have been better if they kept the social link in, but have the story still play out with his death. I think that it would have made it more impactful, because we got to spend a lot of time with Shinji, and seeing him die after getting to know him would tug at our heartstrings more. But hey, what do I know? Number 8. The Fortune Ryoji Mochizuki Ryoji was a very important character in Persona 3's narrative because it turns out he's actually the appraiser of death. His role was to become a beacon that the goddess of death, Nyx, would use in order to end the world. But as a character, we didn't get a lot of time to spend with him, which is a shame because I actually really liked his personality while he was around. Ryoji's social link is very unique in the sense that you have a very strict time limit to max him out. You can't afford to miss a single day he's available, so his social link should be your top priority. Anyways, Ryoji's social link is mostly used to foreshadow his real purpose. In the context of the story, Ryoji has no idea that he is the appraiser. In fact, he seems to have severe amnesia because he doesn't remember much about his life before transferring to Gekukan High. Throughout Ryoji's social link, he slowly begins to regain his old memories. While he can't fully piece them together, he has the feeling that he's no Katone for a long time. This is supposed to hint that Ryoji's true identity is a young boy Pharaoh so you have a social link with throughout the game. But other than that, there's honestly not a whole lot to this social link. I mean, if you're a fan of Ryoji like I am, then it's nice to have extra time dedicated to him. It makes Ryoji's proposition near the end of the game have more meaning to it, if that means anything. I always thought it was strange that he said he loved what he experienced of the world when we didn't actually get to see any of what he experienced. But having a social link with him makes his inevitable turn into the next avatar have a lot more meaning. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really change a whole lot. It's a nice addition, but not one that I think is required to enjoy his story. Part of me thinks that they could have done a lot more with Ryoji's social link. Its mere existence doesn't really add much to his character other than giving him more screen time. At the very least, the other member of the Fortune Arcana, Kaisuke, actually attempted to tell a story about forging your own path instead of following what would make other people happy. My overall opinions on the execution notwithstanding, there was an attempt at telling a story with Kaisuke, one that had the potential to speak with a lot of people. Ryoji's in comparison isn't nearly as interesting or compelling, even though I like the character in question a lot more. And that's all for the major additions included in Persona 3 Portable. There were a few things I didn't talk about like skill cards and whatnot, but that's most of the things I wanted to talk about. So what do I think about the female protagonist as a whole? Well, for the most part, I largely think that both routes are the same quality, but if I have to pick which route I find more fulfilling, I think I would have to pick the male route at the end of the day. I think the female route is nice and the exclusive content on offer here ranges from being really good, really bad, to really strange. 
but at the end of the day, this is more of an alternative experience to the male protagonist than an outright replacement. This is something that the game even acknowledges. The intended experience, even for portable, is to play through the male route. But there are a few things here in the female route that I think would have been great to see in the male route. Social links with the male party members is a great idea, but the way it's executed in the female route is a bit mixed for me. But hey, I'd rather do Akihiko's social link than someone like Momaru's or god forbid Nozomi's. But the real comparison for me lies in how the themes of Persona 3 are represented between the two protagonists. From the way I see it, the concept of death is represented differently in Portable than it is from Fess. This is down to the fact that the protagonists have different personalities. In Portable, there's more of an optimistic tone overall, I'd say. The music is far more cheering, and Katoni has a lot of dialogue options that lean on the positive way of thinking. Contrast this with Fess's darker color scheme, somber atmosphere, and overall more depressing tone. Both of these ways of portraying the message are effective in their own ways, but I believe that Portable's more optimistic outlook clashes too heavily with Persona 3's original story at certain points. That's not to say that I think Fess is perfect in the way it presents its own theme. I can't stand the idea that Chidori can come back to life, for example. But the overall downer feeling of Persona 3 Fess is what makes the small moments of happiness and hope stand out more. The female protagonist's tone feels at odds with itself a lot of the time because it leans too far into the happy tone. That's not to say I dislike lighthearted moments in these games. Persona 4 is my favorite game and it's not nearly as dark as the rest. But the problem is that the original story of Persona 3 doesn't fit too well with this new tone. And there are more discrepancies here because of the previously mentioned Chidori revival being included alongside Shinji's fake out death. I would still rather play through the male route because it doesn't have nearly as many tonal inconsistencies, even if some of the social links are worse. But if I were to choose playing between Fest and Portable for my ideal way of playing Persona 3, I still think I would pick Portable because of the quality of life additions and gameplay improvements. Plus, Portable doesn't come with the answer, so it's automatically better in every way. But if it's your first time playing through Persona 3, I think Fest is the better option because it's closer to the developer's artistic vision. While it is technically more flawed in my eyes, it's the experience that Atlas wanted players to have. Don't get me wrong, Portable has some great additions, but there are also a lot of things that hold the game back from being a total improvement over Fest, and in some ways, make the game worse as a result. But no matter which version, Persona 3 is absolutely worth your time, even though it is rough in a lot of areas. It's not my favorite in this series, but it really does stand out. Who knows, with the success of Persona 4 Golden on Steam, maybe we're due for a port that features all content from Portable while keeping the visuals and tone from Fest? Probably not, but I can dream, can I? As to where Persona 3 falls on my personal list, I'd place it right smack in the middle. It's a bit better than Innocent Sin as an overall package, but I think Eternal Punishment just beats it out slightly. I know that this video was somewhat different in structure than the other ones, but it's really important that you've seen my Persona 3 videos to get full context for this one. You can find a link to that in the card at the top as well as in the description. But no matter how many complaints I may have with Persona 3, it doesn't change the fact that it's a special game to a lot of people. The game is special to me too in a way. It's thanks to this game I was able to find Find an audience that was willing to listen to my opinions about the series that I love so much. So thanks Persona 3, I think you may be flawed, but you'll always be remembered for what you did exceptionally well. The Persona series is no stranger to having spin-off titles. There are two fighting games, three dancing games, and even two full-on crossover dungeon crawlers. I actually do plan on covering these games in the future. I mean, this retrospective wouldn't be complete without them, but for today's video, I'm going to be jumping ahead to the latest in this long line of spin-off games, Persona 5 Strikers. Though, calling it just a spin-off is actually doing the game a huge disservice. You see, despite the fact that this game was developed by Koei Tecmo, the team behind the Dynasty Warriors games, this is very much a follow-up to the original Persona 5, not just in terms of story, but also in the way the mechanics were adapted into this new genre. I'm going to be doing something a bit different this time and discuss my thoughts on the story first. This is mostly because while I enjoy the story of this game and have a few things I want to discuss, there isn't as much dissection to do here as there would be in a mainline game. Plus, the game is brand new, so I want to give people the chance to experience it for themselves. I don't want to be the one to ruin any of the surprises in the story. I'm going to be avoiding talking about major spoilers, but there's going to be some minor ones just to get my point across. So if you absolutely want to know nothing about the story if you're interested in Strikers, please skip to the gameplay portion of this video if you're only curious about that. I'll give you a few seconds to do so. A few months after the events of Persona 5, Joker and Morgana return to Tokyo so that the gang can go on a camping trip during summer vacation. 
Not too long after their arrival, however, trouble begins to prop up when it's discovered that the hot new AI assistant app known as Emma is linked to the metaverse. At first, the Phantom Thieves believe that the palaces are appearing again, but it's not as simple as it seems. These new cognitions, known as jails, function drastically different. Their purpose is to be ruled by a monarch, and these leaders are responsible for stealing the desires away from people, brainwashing them into doing the monarch's bidding. While inside the jail, Joker comes across an AI known as Sophia. While Sophia seemingly doesn't have her memories, she proves herself useful to the Phantom Thieves thanks to her combat abilities, as well as her knack for being able to pinpoint the locations of other jails. You see, the jail in Tokyo wasn't just a one-off incident, as there have been jails popping up all over Japan. While our group has no involvement, the police begin to suspect that the Phantom Thieves are connected to the sudden change of hearts that have been happening thanks to the Monarchs. So the Phantom Thieves are now on a cross-country road trip in order to not only free the captured desires, but also prove their innocence and discover the truth about Emma's connection to the metaverse. That's the basic setup to Persona 5 Strikers, and for the most part, the story falls into an episodic-like format, more so than the original Persona 5 does. The Phantom Thieves will visit a new city, discover that there's a jail, return that area's captured desires, and then be on their way to the next part of Japan. But this formulaic setup isn't used to tell a lazy story. Something I was surprised to see was how much Strikers focused on evolving the characters past the original Persona 5 story. When I first started the game, I thought that having jails was going to be nothing more than an excuse to get our characters back into the metaverse, but I was honestly shocked at how much effort really went into making these new dungeons distinct from palaces. While palaces are meant to reflect reflect the distorted desires of the ruler and how they view the world, jails are more so focused on the monarch as an individual along with their past trauma. Something that I noticed right away in Strikers is that the villains are presented in a far more sympathetic light. This is in strong contrast to almost all of the palace rulers because those people were irredeemable criminals. Someone like Kamashida is a character that you can't sympathize with. He does horrible, disgusting things to his students, so it's satisfying to see the fan of these change his heart and have him confess to his crimes. He works well as a one-off villain because he's someone that we want to see fail, even if we don't know too much about his personal life. You can't really say the exact same thing about the Monarchs and Strikers because not only what they're doing isn't nearly as despicable as Kamashita, we get more insight as to why these people turn into Monarchs. For example, the first villain the Phantom Thieves take down in this game is the idol, Alice Hiragi. When we're first introduced to her shadow, we see that she has the desire to control others. She treats people as nothing but toys for her amusement, elevating her own social status and overall just abusing her powers because it's entertaining. But when the Phantom Thieves visit her trauma cell, we learn that while she was attending Shujin Academy, she was the prime target for bullying. These people made her youth miserable and even attempted to sabotage her by spreading the same insults while Alice was trying to start her career. This leads her to abuse the Emma app in order to humiliate the bully as an act of revenge. This small taste of power would eventually lead her down the path to becoming the monarch we see at the start of the game. While the Phantom Thieves are able to sympathize with her, that doesn't change the fact that what she's doing by using the Emma app to manipulate the masses is wrong, so they have to put a stop to her. All of the monarchs fall into this category of being sympathetic villains, whether that be because they want the recognition that they believe they deserve, fixing a past mistake, or doing what they believe is the best for society. The monarchs in this game make for very interesting antagonists for the party. Something that I very much appreciate about this story is the fact that the characters themselves can relate to the villains. The first three jails that the Phantom Thieves visit, on surface level, sound awfully close to certain palaces in Persona 5. I mainly want to focus on the jail located in Sendai because that's where I felt it the most. This jail's monarch is Ango Natsume, an author whose novel titled Prince of Nightmares is all the rage in Sendai. It's to the point where fans of this piece are willing to assault people and beat them to near death for any criticism it receives. But as it turns out, almost all of the contents of this novel are plagiarized from other pieces of work. But because of the Emma app, people are none the wiser. If we remove the Emma app from the equation, we have a story of a man who plagiarizes others' work for fame and fortune. It's a very similar story to the Madarame arc, even down to Yusuke being a key player in both stories. While Yusuke was a victim in the original Persona 5, he actively takes charge in trying to stop Natsume from going down the same path of his old sensei. This is a very familiar situation to Yusuke, and he's able to relate to Natsume since he's a fellow artist. There's a lot of time dedicated to how Yusuke views Natsume's work, and by the time they change his heart, he demands the author to not quit writing and instead try again with his own original work. This story focuses on Yusuke's views of what an artist should be, which is something that we never got out of the original Persona 5 story. This is something that Strikers does a lot. We see the basic concepts of the original palaces bleed into the jails, but these ideas are turned on their heads because the characters are able to apply their experiences to understand the monarchs. 
but this isn't done to the point where it becomes predictable since there are plenty of original ideas here. Overall, I think that the antagonists in this game are pretty solid, but the thing I'm honestly surprised with the most is the overall quality of the writing and, more importantly, the characterization. The Persona spin-off titles are pretty infamous with the way the characters are portrayed. The biggest example of this is in Persona Q, where characters are boiled down to nothing more than just one single core trait. Needless to say, I was worried that Persona 5 Strikers would suffer from the same fate, but thankfully the characters all act as the same phantom thieves we all know and love. And as I stated when talking about the Monarchs, the characters are actually developed further. But something I want to focus on are the two brand new characters created for this game, those being the AI companion Sophia and the public security officer Zenkiji Hasegawa. Let's start with Sophia because she has a lot more screen time dedicated to her. Sophia's story focuses on her trying to understand the human heart, as well as discover her reason for existing. When we first meet Sophia, she has no memories. The only thing she knows about herself is that her directive is to be humanity's companion, and a good chunk of the main plot focuses on her learning what that directive means. Outside of the metaverse, she exists as an app on Joker's phone, where she's used to detect the locations of jails all around Japan. Even though Sophia has access to all of the knowledge she needs thanks to the internet, she doesn't understand the complexity of the human heart and how emotions can control people. There are many points throughout the story where Sophia tries to contemplate the actions of the Phantom Thieves. She asks Joker questions relating to the events in the game in order to gain a better understanding. What I do appreciate about Sophia is that even though she's an AI, she still has a very well-defined personality, which is the most enjoyable aspect of her character. The story she's involved in is somewhat generic, but it's well done. An AI trying to learn what it means to be human is something that's been explored in a lot of media. It's even been explored with Igus from Persona 3. Without giving too much away, learning Sophia Sophia's true purpose is connected to one of the major antagonists of the game, and the story between these two has a pretty satisfying conclusion, but it doesn't exactly reach the emotional highs it's trying to. This is mostly because Sophia's relationship with this character is dumped on us during the second to last dungeon. I just think that there wasn't really enough time to establish this. I think that this scene works well as an explanation of Sophia's origins, but not as much as a big character revelation. I do really enjoy Sophia, but between the two additional characters, I personally believe her to be the weaker link. This is mostly because I think that Zenkichi was just the more interesting and compelling character. I really, really like Zenkichi. When he's first introduced, he reveals to the Phantom Thieves that the police suspect them of the mysterious change of hearts all over Japan, and he wants to help them clear their name. While he may look intimidating and untrustworthy, he's actually a very easygoing person who's used for a lot of comic relief, but there's a lot more to Zenkichi than it first seems. He's a character that suffered through a tragedy of his own. This not only damaged his self-worth, but also fractured the relationship he has with his daughter. On the surface, it's a very similar story to Nanako's and Dojima's from Persona 4. In fact, if you've played that game, it's even the same tragedy. But what separates these two stories from each other are the differences in how those events affected the families. Senkichi's character arc focuses on not only rebuilding the relationship with his daughter, but also catching the perpetrator of the crime. I know this sounds a bit vague, but going into any more detail than that would require me to spoil more than I want to with a game this new. But I still want to give my overall thoughts on the execution of Zenkichu's character because I ended up getting pretty invested with his story. He's someone who has a strong sense of justice that has to keep tabs on the Phantom Thieves throughout the game. Even though they are potential suspects to the police, he eventually does grow attached to them in a way that's paid off beautifully. Zenkichi is the one to show the Phantom Thieves that the world isn't as black and white as they believe it is. Good people can do bad things, and those bad actions can't be excused, no matter the intentions or past trauma that led them to that point. Overall, I like the story here. It isn't anything too complex, but what's here is solid. It's safe to assume that you've already played the original Persona 5 if you're thinking of getting Strikers, since for all intents and purposes, this is a sequel. The characters allude to past events, and old ideas are twisted and shown in a new light to provide a different experience. This is complemented with some solid characterization, and genuinely really fun moments with the original fan of these and the new characters as well. But now onto the gameplay portion of Persona 5 Strikers. While the story quality was a pleasant surprise, what really had me interested in Strikers was the gameplay. I just want to start out by saying that I have no prior experience to these Dynasty Warrior-esque games, so I'm talking about this game as a complete newbie to the genre. After putting around 40 hours into this game, it has a lot more in common with the mainline Persona games than what I was expecting. Persona 5 Strikers takes the core mechanics from its turn-based counterpart, and crafts a fun and exciting action combat system out of them. It's nothing that I would call particularly deep, but it's far from being shallow. You alternate between your normal and special attack buttons to execute combos. These inputs are universal across all party members, but Strikers goes through the effort of making each character unique. Ryuji's gimmick, for example, is that he can turn himself into a hard-to-stagger tank, and charge his combo finishes to a devastating effect 
effect. Compare this to Yusuke, who attacks far faster than Ryuji and can quite literally perform Virgil-style judgment cuts. If I'm being honest, I didn't use every character equally. I definitely had my favorites for sure. Yusuke, Ryuji, and Haru were in my party for a good majority of the game. I used Makoto and An as my backups. They share the same gimmick of applying elemental affinities to their basic attacks. I do like playing as them, but I find my main party more useful in a lot of scenarios. Morgana's main gimmick is that he can transform into a bus mid-fight. It's an alright attack. I didn't really use him much, but he's not a bad party member. Sophia, on the other hand, is someone that I just didn't really like playing as. Sophia uses two yo-yos as her main weapon. The gimmick with her is that if you press the attack button with proper timing, you can power up her yo-yos when she catches them. This timing is somewhat strict, but there are visual cues to help you learn the timing of your button presses. I just couldn't get the hang of it. You're always surrounded by enemies in this game, so trying to pay attention to the visual cues ends up being more trouble than it's worth. What would you rather do? Learn the precise timing of an attack by studying the character animations in order to maximize the character's damage? Or just hold the triangle button at the end of a combo as Haru to achieve the same effect but with less effort. Sophia definitely has her uses because she specializes in blessed damage and healing, but for me personally, I'm just not a fan of her gameplay style. Something that I appreciate about Strikers is that you gain access to all of the party members very early on. Since the characters share a universal control scheme, it's not a challenge to figure out the differences between party members. The game even gives you a quick explanation of the character's main gimmick when you first take control of them. What really helps separate the characters are the specific abilities that they have access to thanks to their personas. At any point in battle, you can hold down a button to freeze time so you can summon your persona. Much like the main games, you can exploit enemy weaknesses and get critical hits in order to knock down enemies for an all-out attack. The main difference in Strikers is that Persona skills now have a certain range to them that's highlighted before you perform the skill. Personas are very useful in combat because they can be used to quickly clear out rooms of enemies, and are almost integral against the bigger shadows in boss battles. In order to do decent damage to these enemies, you need to exploit their weaknesses until all of these shield icons break. When that happens, you're able to do massive damage with an all-out attack. Strikers teaches you almost all of its core mechanics in the first few hours, and doesn't really evolve past that. The closest we get is the mastery system. After directly controlling a party member enough, they'll learn a new mastery art skill. These are more so just buffs to their already existing attributes than outright game changers. Thankfully, you can change your party composition outside of combat in order to keep things fresh, and something that I for sure wasn't expecting to be in this game was Joker's wildcard ability. The Velvet Room in Persona Fusion still exists in Strikers. Whenever you defeat an enemy, there's a chance that a Persona Mask will drop from it. This is your primary way of acquiring new Personas for battle since the drop rate is already pretty generous. You can switch Joker's Persona anytime if you want to adjust his elemental affinity or gain access to new skills. Using a different Persona will also change Joker's combo finishers, so it's a good way to cast magic without draining any SP. Though, a spell casted through a combo finisher won't be as powerful as just casting it normally through the skill menu. Persona Fusion has been altered in Strikers, and I'm honestly not a fan of this new direction. You're given a list of all possible Personas you can make at your current level, along with any alternative ways to fuse said Persona. This, on its own, is perfectly fine, but the problem is that for some reason, the Personas that are used as ingredients have to be at least a certain level that's listed or higher. Granted, there's a way to instantly level up a Persona in the Velvet Room. You can spend what are called Persona Points to give a selected Persona experience points. But there are a few limitations with this system. Joker's current level acts as a power ceiling, so you can't just make any Persona level 99 unless Joker himself is level 99. There's no problem with that since the ingredients used for fusion are always a lower level than the Persona you're trying to make. But some of these Personas ask for some very odd combinations, such as including early game Personas that you have to have at a ridiculously high level. Now hold the fucking phone! In the other games, all you needed were the right Personas and you could fuse whatever you wanted to. Sure, the protagonist has to be a certain level, but putting this on the Persona requirements too just makes the process far more tedious. The best way to level up Personas is by spending Persona points, but it costs a lot of points to bring certain Personas up to the required levels, and the best way to get Persona points is by discarding Personas from Joker. What I ended up doing was discarding my highest level Persona in the Compendium, buying it back, and repeating the process. Sure, this ended up costing a lot of money, but it nets back a bunch of Persona points. I find the idea of making sure you have the correct level of Persona needlessly tedious. Anyways, combat never really got tiring for me because Joker is just as customizable as ever. In terms of difficulty, I'm apparently in the minority thinking that this game is moderately difficult. I don't think that it's an incredibly hard game by any means, but boss battles always kept me on my toes. 
The optional bosses especially are pretty tough, but the reward is worth it because you unlock new personas for fusion. Regular encounters don't put up much of a fight, but there were a few mini bosses that definitely caught me off guard. Dungeons do have frequent checkpoints that let you go back to the Velvet Room or to return to the Overworld through stock on items. Something that Strikers doesn't feature from the regular game is the social sim aspect that the series is famous for. The absence of things such as confidants and social stats doesn't really bother me personally. With the way this story is structured, it would be a nightmare to add those into the game. But you still do get gameplay benefits for increasing your bond level with your team. Your bond level is essentially a second experience bar that rewards you with bond points whenever the level increases. You can spend these bond points on passive upgrades, such as increasing the effectiveness of items or increasing how much money you earn from battles. I understand that this isn't the exact same as confidant abilities, but I appreciate that the developers tried to implement them in some way or another. As much praise I've been showering with this game with, there are a few complaints that I think need to be addressed. Most of them are minor, but I believe that they are at the very least worth mentioning. Much like the regular Persona 5, there are requests that you can fulfill in jails, but in my opinion, I find most of these uninteresting. A lot of these requests amount to defeating a certain number of shadows or re-challenging previous boss battles. These requests aren't difficult or test the player in any interesting ways. The boss rematches especially feel like padded content because they aren't any different from their first battles. Not all requests are boring, however. There are some interesting ones here such as having to reach a certain part of the map without fast traveling or alerting shadows. I like these requests because it tests the player's knowledge on the map design. They aren't too challenging because you can still ambush enemies without it counting as a failure. One that I mentioned earlier is that there are optional bosses against very powerful shadows. These fights are very fun and are especially hard if attempted right when you unlock them, but sadly I find half of the requests pretty unremarkable. Something that I find very annoying about Strikers in general is how often you have to return to the overworld when doing all of the game's content. You can't register a request as completed until you return to the real world. So if you want to clear out the list, you have to back out of the current dungeon you're in just so you can cash in for a reward. This is particularly annoying because you can only accept 8 requests at a given moment. This feels like an arbitrary limitation. What exactly would having the player cash in requests during the dungeon do other than save time? I understand this is more of a nitpick, but it occurred enough times for it to get legitimately annoying. These are the only two things about the game that bothered me, and even so, they aren't really that big of an issue. Sure, the requests are lame, but I still find enjoyment out of them because of how much I like this combat system. It isn't that deep, but there's plenty of fun that can be had with it. My biggest fear in terms of gameplay was the thought that it was going to be a mindless button masher. While it can get slightly repetitive, especially if you marathon the game, Persona 5 Strikers manages to stay at a consistent high quality because of the surprises it throws at the player. Overall, I think that Persona 5 Strikers is a very solid game that manages to evolve not only the characters, but the story and gameplay alongside it. In my opinion, Strikers is a spin-off in name only as it features almost everything that people like about the series. The biggest change is with the combat. I understand that going from a turn-based RPG to a different gameplay style may put some people off, but Strikers manages to stay true to its roots while providing a fast-paced and addicting combat system. The only thing it's lacking in is the social simulator aspect, which doesn't bother me personally, but I have to acknowledge that there's a portion of the Persona player base that's mostly in it for this aspect. If you're one of those people who are on edge about Strikers because of this exclusion, I implore you to at least give it a shot. Almost everything about this game is great, including the character writing, which is something I was not expecting to say about a Persona spinoff. If you're already interested in Strikers, then this game is going to be something you'll love. In my eyes, this is a worthy follow-up to Persona 5, and I would love to see another game in this style. This is a road trip I'm not going to forget about anytime soon. My relationship with Persona Q is a very complicated one. There are many aspects of this game that I like, and just as many that left me both frustrated and disappointed. For those who are unaware, Persona Q was released for the 3DS back in 2014. While Persona spin-offs were nothing new at the time thanks to Persona 4 Arena, what made Persona Q immediately stand out was the fact that this was a full-fledged RPG featuring the casts of Persona 3 and 4 in their prime. While the Arena games gave us a taste of what these two casts teaming up would be like, Persona Q was intended to take this to a whole other level. You see, Persona Q is actually a crossover with another series developed by Atlas called Etrian Odyssey, a series of dungeon crawlers where the main appeal are the gigantic labyrinths you explore. I personally haven't played these games outside of Persona Q, so I'm not sure which mechanics and design choices are from Metroid and Odyssey, or new ideas that were introduced or implemented here. I'm going to be judging this game solely as a Megami Tensei fan. This distinction is important because Persona Q is a very polarizing game for me. 
in order to explain why I'm going to have to go into a lot of detail, both in terms of story and mechanics. There are not only going to be major spoilers for Persona Q in this video, but I'm also going to be assuming that you've played P3 and P4 for the sake of being able to reference specific scenes from those games in this video. So, if you don't want to be spoiled, please click off the video now. With that out of the way, let's just dive right into it. Something interesting about Persona Q right off the bat is that you have the choice between two protagonists to play as. For this playthrough, I decided to pick the Persona 4 protagonist because I recently did a run of Persona 3, and thought that this would be a nice change of pace. This choice doesn't affect the main story, but certain events and dialogue will be different depending on who you choose. One of the key differences is actually in the game's opening. In my case, the game opens up at Yasugami's High's Culture Festival. All is well with the investigation team, that is, until they hear the mysterious ringing of a bell from a clock tower. Not only that, but the team also runs into Margaret, who's hosting her own fortune-telling booth that doubles as an access point to the Velvet Room. She explains that the bell toll came from outside of their reality, and requests the group to investigate the Velvet Room. Upon entering, things aren't the way they should be. The Velvet Room looks distorted, and there's two mysterious doors chained up by four locks. That's not all, however, because after the group leaves the Velvet Room, they discover that they're in an alternate reality version of Yasugami High. This is signified by the different festival displays, as well as the clock tower that appeared in the courtyard. After some investigation, the team discovers that the different class exhibits lead into dangerous labyrinths. Inside of these areas, the group has access to their personas. At first, they believe they somehow managed to make their way into the TV world, but it's quickly disproven when they come across these two students named Zen and Rei. These two have amnesia, but have apparently been here in the school for a long time. They explain that they can't leave the school through the front doors, but believe that the answers they seek will be at the bottom of the labyrinth. While Zen and Rei don't have personas, they can still defend themselves from shadows with their weapons and special skills. If you were to pick the Persona 3 route, then things would play out just a little differently. During a routine visit to Tartarus, everyone suddenly finds themselves in the Velvet Room with Elizabeth and Theodore. Before we can get any answers as to what's going on, the elevator suddenly begins to plummet into darkness. When Seize comes too, they find themselves in the alternate Yasugami High where they meet Zen and Rei. It's at the end of the first dungeon when either Seize or the investigation team arrive to provide some much needed backup against the boss. After things calm down and the teams make their formal introductions, we discover that by clearing the first dungeon, one of the locks on the two doors in the Velvet Room has been broken off. Not only that, but Zen and Rei regain some of their memories. And with that, our characters' goals are in sight. Seize and the investigation team are going to have to join forces to clear out the remaining labyrinths in order to return home, while also restoring Zen and Rei's memories along the way. That's the basic plot setup to Persona Q, and despite being very front-loaded, not a whole lot happens until near the end of the game. After the other team joins your party, the main story quickly takes a back seat as the dungeon crawling takes center stage. There are a few cutscenes sprinkled here and there, mostly to provide quick comedic relief, but there isn't much in terms of genuine character growth, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Persona Q plays very differently from what mainline fans are probably used to. As I mentioned earlier, the game takes a lot of its design and mechanics from the Etrian Odyssey series. This means that almost all of the playtime is spent going through winding labyrinths and fighting random encounters. Much like Persona 1, you travel through these dungeons in a first-person perspective. Encounters are completely random, but thanks to this icon in the corner here, you get a good idea when they may occur. The biggest gimmick, however, is the fact that you have to manually draw out your map on the bottom screen. There's plenty of options and icons you can place in order to customize your map to your liking, though this is mostly optional because you can turn on auto mapping in the options screen. This doesn't completely eliminate this requirement, however, as you still need to place icons such as doors, stairs, chests, and shortcuts manually. I find it odd that auto mapping doesn't, at the very least, place down the icon for doors and shortcuts. I only mention this because of how often you have to stop in place to do this yourself. It gets very annoying and tedious very quickly. You can just ignore placing these icons, but then you're actively making the game harder for yourself. I thought the point of auto mapping was to let players ignore that aspect of the game if they weren't interested in it. There is some satisfaction to be had when making your ideal map, and the game even incentivizes you to fill out each floor 100% by giving you some decent accessories. But in order to have map percentage registered, you have to physically step on each of the tiles and open all of the chests. So at that point, why not just have everything autofill? I know that this is such a weird thing to focus on, but let me just say this is the least of Persona Q's problems. Persona Q's main combat mechanics are actually pretty decent. They remind me of Persona 1's, but with a few more mechanics added to keep things interesting. 
Your party consists of five active members. You select your skills at the start of the turn, and the order your characters act in is based on their agility stat. By exploiting the enemy's weaknesses or landing a critical hit, instead of being rewarded with a one more, your character will instead earn a boost. Boosted party members take priority over everything else, meaning that they'll act first no matter what their agility stat is. You're also provided the benefit of having your skills cause zero HP and SP. Your boost will be removed if the party member takes any damage, or performs an action that doesn't yield another boost. That's not all, because depending on how many characters you have boosted, there's a chance that you can perform an all-out attack at the end of your turn. You need the minimum of three party members boosted if you want a chance of this happening. The more characters that are boosted, the higher the odds. You should pretty much always accept this when given the chance, because it's just free damage. Hell, if you want to fight with an all-out attack, you'll even gain extra experience. Although attacks are pretty out of your control because there's always a chance that your party member can lose their boosted state by getting hit or just by missing, so it's not something you can rely on like the other Persona games. The boosted state is pretty integral to the combat system because you'll quickly realize that the SP cost of skills in this game is ridiculously high, especially late game magic like Agidine. This is the main reason as to why the boosted state itself is so useful. If you get lucky and land a critical hit or use a weaker skill to enter the boosted state, then you can cast a very powerful skill for free, assuming that you don't get interrupted of course. Your SP pool at the beginning of the game is pitiful, but after you clear the first floor of the starting dungeon, you'll unlock a workaround for this. Due to the nature of this world, the protagonist is no longer the only person that's able to wield multiple personas. You can equip sub-personas for both the protagonist and the rest of the party. Party members on their own only have access to a very limited skill selection, but by equipping sub-personas, you can not only expand their skill pool, but also give characters access to more HP and SP. What's special about this bonus HP and SP is that it regenerates in between battles, meaning that the high SP cost can potentially become a non-issue. There are two ways of getting new sub-personas. You can either win them at the end of an encounter, or you can take the ones that you're no longer using to the Velvet Room for a fusion. While performing a fusion, you can choose what skills are inherited from the old personas. It's very much like Persona 4 Golden in that regard. Unlike the PS1 trilogy, you can actually equip any sub-persona to any character. But you should always be mindful as to who will benefit from their skill selection. Giving a character like Kanji a sub-persona that specializes in magic would be pointless because his strength stat is his best attribute. There are some accessories that swap certain character stats around, but I didn't find them necessary. I personally just stuck with giving my characters accessories that would improve their current build, rather than trying to force them down a new path. Much like the previous Persona games, Persona Q features skill cards. You can use these to teach your party members new skills that they can't learn naturally, and can access even without having a sub-persona equipped. You can extract a skill card from a sub-persona in the Velvet Room by paying Yen. The prices will vary depending on the skill and which card you get from the persona is fixed. But this system adds even more potential layers of customization to the characters. I use skill cards a lot to make up for any skills that my party members were lacking in, such as giving Kanji the skill Power Charged, or the Persona 3 protagonist some party-wide healing abilities. The core combat mechanics on paper are actually very interesting, but the execution of these ideas end up leaving a lot to be desired. To run down the list real quick, there's a staggering amount of playable party members you have access to. After the first dungeon, you have a total of 16 characters to choose from when constructing a party of 5 members. While on the surface this does offer plenty of opportunities to form your dream party composition, the problem is that none of these backup characters gain any experience from battle, meaning that if you decide to commit to a certain team for a good majority of the game, and decide to switch things up because you find that one character is lacking, then anyone new you pick up will be severely underleveled. It's honestly shocking that for a game with a cast this large, that there's no way to keep everybody viable. It's worth mentioning that any requests that reward experience will be distributed to every character in the game, but it's not nearly enough for the backup members to keep up with the main party. Persona Q's overall combat balance is also something that needs to be called into question. With the right setup, characters can become incredibly overpowered. One of the more infamous examples is giving Naoto the passive skill Impure Reach. This skill increases the chance for status ailments, binding skills, and instant kill attacks to land. This makes her the single best character to use against random encounters, because her instant kill attacks almost always land unless the enemy blocks light or dark damage. She's also great to use when you just want to bind enemies due to her insanely high luck stat. I guess is also hilariously overpowered with the right setup. I made her my heavy damage dealer by abusing her Orgia mode and giving her access to the skill Shura Tensei. This move drains your HP at the end of every turn, but boosts your attack power to an insane degree. It was to the point where I managed to one-shot the final boss completely by accident. These two skills that I just mentioned are also pretty easy to get on these characters thanks to skill cards, but you don't get 
get access to the ability to make skill cards until halfway through the game. While you can ignore using these characters, the problem is that the game encourages this type of playstyle. Persona Q has a very kill or be killed mindset, because enemies can do a crazy amount of damage to the party. The game even suggests early on to abuse the bind skill so you can refrain from taking any damage. A much more elegant solution to avoiding damage is to just kill everything with Naoto before the enemies even get the chance. Just make sure you pick skills in case Naoto misses for whatever reason, and you're pretty much golden for the dungeon. I think that this problem could have been solved if the effectiveness and light and dark skills were cut in half. Once you discover how overpowered they are, it's hard to resist the temptation of abusing that power. Despite how unbalanced the game can be at times, I actually did have some fun with the core combat mechanics. It at the very least never became boring. I'm the kind of player that likes to maximize the effectiveness of my party, so there was always a goal that I was working towards and satisfaction for when I was doing insane amounts of damage per turn. The game never became innocent sin levels of easy, but I think you might be better off playing the game on a difficulty that's at least higher than the standard one. I still prefer the combat mechanics from the mainline games, but what's here isn't terrible. But my problems with Persona Q's gameplay sadly don't just end with the core mechanics. A lot of the aspects surrounding the combat are what I take issue with. Battling is only half of the equation in Persona Q. There's just as much, if not more, emphasis put into the actual dungeon crawling. It's easily the most difficult part of the game too, and will be the make or break aspect for your enjoyment of this title. There's a total of five labyrinths to explore, all of which range in terms of complexity, length, and gimmicks. Those being You in Wonderland, the group Date Cafe, the Evil Spirits Club, the Inaba Pride Exhibit, and finally, the Clock Tower. While it may seem like a small selection on paper, these are actually very meaty dungeons. A universal gimmick that's shared with every dungeon is the inclusion of these powerful enemies known as FOEs. FOEs, unlike other enemies, are actually visible during exploration, and act as an obstacle for the player. Much like the dungeons themselves, FOEs also range in terms of complexity. Take for example the card soldiers at the beginning of the game. These guys move on a set path and are easily avoidable because of it. Compare this to one of the muscle dudes in the Inaba Pride exhibit that actively chases you down, but can be warded off thanks to the holy flame you have to carry. FOE manipulation is a large part of Persona Q's dungeon design. More often than not, FOEs are usually placed in a way to directly block your path. The few exceptions that don't move are still something you need to be aware of, such as these cupid guys that can charm you into walking directly into them. FOEs are actually a pretty good idea to keep the dungeon design fresh, but a problem I have with them is just how much trial and error is involved. You're taught early on that there's always a way to circumvent FOEs. To once again use the card soldier as an example, you can wash the paint off of these roses to distract the FOE long enough to sneak by. This is done a couple of times throughout the dungeon, and is used one final time before the end where you need to distract three FOEs in the way that will allow you to slip by. Not only is this dungeon supposed to test you on what you just learned, but it also teaches you that FOE positioning when solving a puzzle is integral. At first, this doesn't seem so bad, but later on in the game, you need to be so precise with how you move and where the FOE is on the map. There are plenty of points where I swear the only way to progress is to get caught by an FOE. There's this one FOE in the Spirit Club that moves faster than your party, meaning that you need to use these few light sources to slow the thing down. On its own, this isn't bad, but there's a puzzle that requires you to set up the lights in such a way that the FOE ends up getting trapped with nowhere to go. To do this, you need to bait it into a certain spot on the map, but I swear you can't do this without getting caught, and if there is a proper solution to this puzzle, then I think it's poorly conveyed. But that doesn't even compare to what I consider to be the worst dungeon in the game. Yep, I'm talking about the Inaba Pride exhibit. This dungeon can get fucked. There's just too much multitasking in here for it to be fun for me. The main gimmick here is that you need to light a torch and bring the flame to these doors with the red seals to pass through them. The torch only stays lit for 10 steps, so you need to bring the torch to these bonfires so you can preserve the flame and relight it in case you mess up. By itself, it isn't too bad, but very quickly, we're shown that FOEs respond differently to you when you have the torch lit. This labyrinth takes this idea to the extreme and makes it more frustrating than interesting. You need to be so accurate, so precise, that not only do you move in a way that doesn't end with your torch being extinguished, but you also have to make sure the FOEs move in the exact way they need to be. There is a workaround if you don't want to deal with the FOE puzzles. If you're prepared enough, you can actually just fight FOEs. If you manage to kill it, then the FOE will disappear from the map until you leave the floor. 
I was so fed up with the puzzles by the end of the Inaba Pride exhibit that I just ended up fighting FOEs instead of solving the puzzles. I'm actually really mixed on this idea. On one hand, it feels really good to finally take down an FOE that was giving you shit, but on the other hand, it sort of defeats the purpose of having a puzzle if by the end of the game, fighting FOEs becomes easier than avoiding them. I'll be honest when I say I have no idea how to solve any of the FOE puzzles in the final dungeon of the game. I just couldn't be bothered to figure them out because my party was so strong that I could just defeat them in a few turns. But other than the FOEs, the dungeons are pretty alright. I think that some of the floors in the later half of the game go on for far too long, but the level design wasn't that bad. There are many shortcuts you can find that act sort of as a checkpoint, so if you need to leave the dungeon to heal or sell materials, then you can quickly get back to where you were. Something that I'm not a big fan of is the very limited inventory space you have to work with. You can only hold a total of 60 items on your person at one time. This includes things such as weapons or armor that you haven't equipped yet. The only way to earn money in Persona Q is by selling materials earned from defeating enemies, or the ones you can gather from power spots around the dungeon. This space fills up surprisingly quickly, especially if you decide to bring things such as revival beads or items that can remove ailments. I understand that this is the game's way of subtly pushing you to have spells that accomplish the same things as these items, but the entire point of having these items to begin with is to save SP. I ended up rarely buying any items outside of the standard Goho M's, and later on in the game, the items that would lower the encounter rate. There really should have been a way to upgrade how much storage you have in your inventory, or this limit shouldn't have been here at all. Maybe just have the materials sell for less money in order to balance having unlimited space. I know that this is just a nitpick, but it's something that I thought was worth mentioning. I know that a a lot of the things I've criticized stem more so from the Etrian Odyssey side of this crossover rather than design elements lifted from Persona, but that's more so from the execution of the ideas used here rather than the concept in general. I like the idea of FOEs, it's just that Persona Q goes absolutely overboard with how they want you to interact with them. I like a lot of the ideas here, except the limited inventory space, but a lot of them aren't exactly executed well in my eyes. As a reminder, I haven't played Etrian Odyssey at the time of this recording. What I've criticized here could very well be a non-issue in one of those mainline games, but I'm not exactly going to play through multiple full-length RPGs just to compare it to one game. My experience with Persona Q won't influence my opinion on Etrian Odyssey as a whole for whenever I get around to actually playing it, but I will say that the design and mechanics used in Persona Q could have used a lot more polish and reworks. From what I've heard, Persona Q2 is a much better game as a whole. I haven't gotten around to playing it myself, but from what I've seen, they changed some things to be more like a mainline Persona game. Anyways, Persona Q has a surprising amount of optional content. Elizabeth requests make their return here, and they serve as a nice distraction, and a way to get some extra experience, accessories, and new personas. My personal favorite requests are the ones where you do optional boss battles with strong shadows, and even Elizabeth herself. Elizabeth was Persona 3's ultimate boss, but now acts as a sort of skill check for the player. There are a few of these fights throughout the game, with the last one being unlocked once you load a completed save file. I found all of these really entertaining, because she uses the persona that you'll get as a reward against you. It's a cool way of showing off what it can do before you fuse it yourself. When both protagonists are at level 55, you unlock the request to battle Margaret. Do this one as soon as you unlock it. Despite the handicap of being limited to using only two characters, the fight isn't hard at all. Plus the reward you get is insane because that's how you unlock the character's ultimate personas. It's pretty ridiculous that a reward this good is locked behind such an easy task, but hey, I'm not complaining. Once you finish the game with both protagonists, you unlock the optional boss battle against all three Velvet siblings. I haven't done this myself yet because the thought of doing another full playthrough of this game makes me sick, but the fight itself does look pretty fun. You're certainly getting your money's worth at least if you decide to play Persona Q. When it comes to the gameplay, I think that there's a lot of potential here, but it's nothing great. Credit where credit is due. I think the main combat system is actually pretty fun, despite the balance issues, and that can be fixed by playing on higher difficulties. I just find the dungeon design incredibly frustrating and overall just a chore to get through. Something that I can compliment Persona Q for is its great art direction. The dungeons all visually look distinct and are memorable in their own right. My personal favorite one is the Evil Spirit Club for its great atmosphere. For a 3DS game, the character models all look very good despite the aliasing, and there are a few animated cutscenes sprinkled here and there, though they do suffer a lot from compression. I also really like this new art style as well. It fits the more light-hearted tone that this game has for most of its run, with my personal favorite being Kanji because look at him. All that's left to cover is the story of Persona Q, so once again, I'd like to give a reminder that there are going to be spoilers for the rest of the video. So if Persona Q looks interesting to you, then I recommend you play the game yourself before continuing. Not that there's really much to spoil anyway. 
I really wasn't kidding when I said that there isn't much in terms of story throughout the main game. Things happen, but it's nothing of substance. Scenes only exist to provide us with fan service or cute moments of the two casts interacting with each other, and in all honesty, there really isn't even much of that. Persona Q is around 50 hours long, and I don't think the game does enough outside of the combat to really justify that runtime. The most disappointing aspect of Persona Q is the characterization of all the party members, as well as how underutilized the concept of bringing them all together really is. It's pretty unanimously agreed that Persona Q really dropped the ball when it came to how the characters were represented. To be fair, there's over 20 characters in this game. I think expecting everyone to get an equal amount of screen time and be written exactly as they were in the main games is a little too much to ask. Even with that considered, I still think Persona Q really doesn't represent these characters in the best light. A good majority of them are boiled down to one or two recognizable character traits. For example, Chie's entire personality has been boiled down to being obsessed with meat and training. While those traits are taken from her original appearance, the problem is that there's nothing else done with her in Persona Q other than using her obsession with meat as a punchline. This rule applies to a good majority of characters in Persona Q. Akihiko was one of my favorite Persona characters, and he's easily the one who suffered the most from this writing style. Taking a complex character whose motivation came from his self-loathing for not being able to protect someone close to him, and converting that into a hot who doesn't shut the hell up about protein. For a game that's all about the Persona 3 and Persona 4 cast coming together, there really isn't much in terms of inter-party character interactions. This is such a missed opportunity. There was so much potential in having these characters not only bounce off each other, but also being able to relate to each other's struggles. We could have seen Yukiko and Mitsuru relate to the struggle of living up to the family name. Shinjiro and Kanji could have bonded over the fact they have interest in things that contradict the way they present themselves. The one that really blows me away is the fact that Igis and Teddy have almost no character interaction outside of running gags. These two characters embody the major themes featured in their respective games. I guess is a character about finding meaning in life and discovering the will to live, and Teddy's character is about accepting oneself for who they are, despite their background or negative qualities, showing that everyone is able to change themselves for the better by allowing people into their lives. Whether or not you like the personalities of these characters, I think we can all agree that the idea of bringing them together was wasted. Persona Q does feature these little events known as strolls that you can participate in. These are limited time events that see select characters interacting with each other. They're fun scenes for sure, but are mostly used for fan service and don't exactly scratch my itch for meaningful character moments. However, I would be lying if I didn't acknowledge that Persona Q does handle some characters well. I really like what they did to the Velvet siblings in this game. Elizabeth is always fun to watch, and the rewrites to Margaret and Theodore make those characters far more interesting than they ever were. Margaret especially, because she was always one of the weaker attendants when it came to personality in my eyes. But for one moment, Persona Q does legitimately take advantage of the crossover setup. There's an ongoing side story involving the characters Ken and Kanji. It takes advantage of both characters' backstories and culminates in a scene where Ken and Kanji bond over crocheting. While not giving us the whole story, Ken does open up about what happened to his mom and asks Kanji for advice. I like this scene a lot because it actually makes strides to connect these characters other than just using them as jokes. But other than the small moments like this, a lot of the story doesn't really amount to much. I know the counter arguments to my complaints would be to bring up the game's ending. After all is said and done, the characters end up returning to their original timelines and their memories are erased, making the events of Persona Q nothing more than a dream for the protagonists. This essentially would make any character development meaningless because it all has to be undone by the end of the story. While this is true, I can't help but feel as though the writers played it too safe here. I understand that there's always a fear of taking a character in a direction that people wouldn't like, but it's at least more interesting than doing absolutely nothing with them. That's not to say that there isn't anything interesting in this story, but the problem lies in the fact that all of the interesting plot threads are introduced and explored near the end of the game. Throughout the dungeon crawling, the chests at the bottom of each labyrinth are actually a personal item that belongs to Rei. The more of these items the group recovers, the more apprehensive Rei becomes about completing the mission. By the time the team manages to clear out the last labyrinth, the truth is revealed. It turns out that Rei is actually the spirit of a girl who died named Nico, and Zen's true identity is the deity Kronos. Kronos was created by the collective unconsciousness, and his role is to guide people into the afterlife. Nico was a girl who died of a terminal illness at a very young age, and lived a life filled with anger and sadness. Saying that Nico was dealt a poor hand in life is underselling it. She dreamed of going to Yasugami High. She wanted to make friends, go to events, and overall just live life to its fullest. But because of her terminal illness, that was ripped away from her. 
She spent the last of her life contained to her hospital room, resenting everyone who had it better off than she did. Nico begged Kronos for death. She had no idea what her reason for living was thanks to only experiencing suffering. Kronos was filled with human emotions for the first time after seeing Nico's desperation and decided to lock away her memories. Kronos abandoned his duties from then on. He created the fake Yasugami High and the labyrinths to keep their memories from being accessed. Kronos even went as far as splitting off his own power and locking it away in the clock tower. Zen wanted to give Rei the life that she always wanted, in hopes that she could find her own reason for living. But it's because of Zen's other half that the investigation team in Seas ended up in the fake Yasugami High. Chrono summoned these two teams in hopes that they can clear the labyrinths and restore Zen's memory. This information is all dumped on us right after the Inaba Pride exhibit, and it's all very interesting in my opinion. It recontextualizes a lot of events earlier in the game. You can make the comparison that every dungeon is based off of an aspect of Rei's life, and makes for interesting discussion pieces. And since the game actually did spend a good time establishing Zen and Rei as characters and endearing us towards them, we actually care about what their fate is. The final dungeon really isn't about fighting some big bad villain. It's about Zen coming to terms with the duty that he's been running away from, and realizing that he made a mistake by prolonging the inevitable. After all is said and done, Zen is able to tell Rei that though her life was cut short, there was still meaning to her existence. Just her being alive was special, the connections she made, the lives she touched, that was her reason for living. The plot involving Zen and Rei is very compelling to me, but as I said, it takes until the final dungeon for all this to start happening. It makes the finale interesting, but sadly, this makes the rest of the game feel very bare. I really do like the final send-off for Zen and Rei, however. Since all of the shadows are gone, the characters are free to go on one last tour of the culture festival, giving Rei the experiences that she yearned for in life. The credit shows Zen and Rei's journey to the afterlife, where she can finally rest easy. And that's all for Persona Q, and if you really couldn't tell, I'm not exactly a big fan of this game. There are plenty of ideas here that I enjoy, but for everything I like, there's one or two things that are done poorly. The core combat mechanics offer up a lot when it comes to character customization, and is genuinely fun in the moment, even though the difficulty isn't very consistent. But it's pretty much everything else surrounding the combat that either could have used more refining or are just choices I don't agree with. Most disappointingly of all is how wasted this concept was as a crossover. I have certain expectations when it comes to story and Persona titles, spin-off or otherwise, if I'm playing what's sold to me as a Persona game that's also an RPG, I'm going to compare it to those other games that I love. And by doing so, I found that there was a lot of things I didn't like. If you're just looking for some Persona fan service and can put up with the gameplay quirks PQ brings to the table, then I think you can find some enjoyment here. As someone who was looking for some substance with that fan service, I can say that I'm disappointed with the results. Despite how harsh I've been to Persona Q in this video, I won't say that this is some terrible or irredeemable game. But out of all of the games I played from this series, this one sadly does rank pretty low on my list. To those who legitimately enjoy Persona Q, more power to you. I'm glad that you found something here that I couldn't. From what I've heard, Persona Q2 does fix a lot of the issues I've mentioned in this video, and I do plan to get to it eventually. But it's not a priority for me. Ever since its initial conception, the core of the Persona series has been rooted in the foundation of turn-based combat. This is par for the course for this genre, and the Persona games have always done their best to make these systems mechanically satisfying. However, it's hard to imagine this style of game working in a real-time setting without seeing some drastic overhauls, which is why the Persona 4 Arena series was so impressive to me. Both of these games, while taking liberties in some areas, managed to expertly translate the turn-based combat of the Persona series into a one-on-one -on -one fighting game. These games were a collaborative effort between Atlas and fighting game developer Arc System Works, who were primarily known for the Blaze Blue franchise, which was used as a template for Arena's core design. The first Persona 4 Arena game was released back in 2012, with Ultimax following a year later. I'm mostly looking at the first Arena game out of a formality, since, to put it bluntly, Ultimax is mechanically superior, while also offering Arena 1's campaign as DLC. And since these games are so similar at their core, it would be best to just lump them together in one video. I also think it's important to acknowledge acknowledge the foundation set by the first Arena game, so we can get a better grasp as to what was changed and improved upon in Arena Ultimax. Another important thing to note is that, at the time of recording, a modern port of Ultimax was recently announced. This version of the game is going to come with all of the previous DLC for free, and will most likely be the definitive version of the game, assuming they add rollback netcode of course. Apparently this version of the game is also going to be based off of the Japanese arcade exclusive 2.5 version of Ultimax, which saw a lot of tweaks and rebalances. That's 
good and all, but it's not something that would drastically change my verdict on the final product. Something that I feel needs to be stated is that I'm not a professional fighting game player by any stretch. There are obviously going to be some nuances of the design that I'm not going to be able to notice since I can only look at the arena games through the lens of a more casual player. One that's willing to learn the ins and outs, but not someone that can give a full deep dive into every character. While this might make my perspective seem a bit skewed, I would argue that it still has some value in its own right. Not everyone has the drive to play these games on a competitive level, so I'm going to be slanting my review based on my own personal enjoyment rather than how I think the game holds up at top level play. The last thing that I want to mention is that the arena games are considered canonical sequels to the events of Persona 3 and Persona 4. They assume that you've experienced both stories, and for the sake of not having to dance around any potential spoilers, I'm going to be doing the same. So I'll say this one more time. There are going to be spoilers in this video for Persona 3, Persona 4, and both arena games in this video, even if there really isn't much to be spoiled. With all that said, let's just jump right into it. Persona 4 Arena takes place a few months after the events of the original game. With Golden Week just starting, Yu Narukami returns to the small town of Inaba so he can spend his vacation with his friends and family. Plans are cut short, however, when Narukami and his friends discover that the Midnight Channel has returned, advertising an event known as the P1 Grand Prix, a tournament that promises to pit members of the investigation team up against each other in combat. What's even more strange is that Teddy is seemingly the host of this tournament, with Risei acting as his assistant. Narukami, Yosuke, Chie, and Yukiko meet up the following day to discuss what they saw. We find out that Teddy, Risei, and Kanji have all gone missing. Naoto is absent too, but that's because she's busy with her job working with public security, where she's been assigned to keep tabs on the Kurijo group. With no other options, the remaining members of the group decide to investigate the TV world in hopes of finding their missing friends and getting to the bottom of this new mystery. At the same time as all this, we're reintroduced to some of the members of C's from Persona 3. Now dubbed the Shadow Operatives, Mitsuru, Akihiko, and Aigis work to hunt down shadows and deal with Persona-related activity on a global scale. During a mission to escort top-secret cargo, one of Mitsuru's planes is hijacked and the cargo is stolen. This shipment contained an older generation anti-shadow weapon named Labrys, and the Shadow Operatives make it their top priority to locate and retrieve her. The Shadow Operatives manage to track Labrys down to Inaba, where they discover she's somewhere inside the TV world. Without hesitation, the trio gives chase, with Naoto following from a distance. But by doing so, they're unknowingly entering the P1 Grand Prix themselves. This is the basic setup for Persona 4 Arena, and while the premise is simple enough, the main issue is that there isn't nearly enough story content to justify its length. Let's run down the list real quick. There are a total of 12 different campaigns that are anywhere between half an hour to an hour plus in length. You initially only start off with four characters to choose from, with more unlocking as you clear each story. While you technically only need to finish a handful of these campaigns in order to reach the credits, if you want to get the full picture, you need to finish the story mode with every playable character. While this doesn't sound too bad at first, you'll quickly realize that outside of the openings and endings, every campaign is the exact same song and dance. After entering the TV world, your character finds themselves separated from the respective groups. They're contacted by General Teddy and are given a rundown of the situation. In order to progress through the P1 Grand Prix, your character will need to fight and defeat one of the other contestants. The winner will be able to go on, but the loser will be forced to stay behind because of these strange barriers blocking their paths. To get the characters to fight each other, General Teddy uses his mysterious powers to manipulate how they perceive events around them. Usually this results in the opponent targeting the character's insecurities in order to provoke them. These misunderstandings lead to conflict, and after the fight, everything is cleared up between the characters before moving on. This gets repeated a few times before your character confronts General Teddy in the announcement room. After that, the story is left on a cliffhanger, and you're meant to return to it after finishing the unlockable campaign for Labrys. While there is a modicum of development for some characters and the path to the announcement room is different, the general structure is the exact same for almost every story. Scenes become very repetitive since you not only know how most of them will play out, but information exposited in one campaign ends up being retreaded in others. Take for example the cutscene where the shadow operatives meet in Inaba and enter the TV world. You end up experiencing this event three times when going for 100%. While you do get a bit of extra context depending on the perspective, at the end of the day, it's still repeated content. Like I said, you don't have to finish every story, but at that point, why even bother giving every character their own campaign? The game doesn't do enough to justify this decision, and the attempts made to differentiate these stories end up muddying the waters more than anything. Due to the nature of the P1 Grand Prix, only a select few people can realistically make it to the end of the tournament. The issue lies is that there's no clear canon route, since stories blatantly contradict
contradict each other. Some stories, such as Chie's and Akihiko's, feel far more connected than others do, but at the same time, these routes can't coexist, because both of these characters end up fighting and defeating the real Teddy on their way to the announcement room. The reason why this bothers me so much is because Persona 4 Arena desperately wants to be more story focused than the average fighting game, but it doesn't want to elaborate on what actually happened. It's hard for me to get invested in the narrative since I'm not entirely sure if what's being presented to me holds any significance outside of being a somewhat interesting what-if scenario. Having multiple non-canon stories seems more suited to an arcade mode rather than acting as an official continuation to the previous games, though this sadly isn't the only issue I take with Arena storytelling. The general presentation of the story leaves much to be desired. Just like in Persona 3 Portable, the game opts to tell its story through the lens of a visual novel, but in the case of Arena, this decision was most likely made for budgetary reasons. This isn't inherently a bad thing, but the lack of visual variety starts to wear on me not too long into the journey. I would be willing to overlook this if the script made up for it, but I can't quite say it does. A critical flaw with the game's writing is the over-reliance on inner monologues. Just like with the visual novel presentation, this isn't inherently a flaw, since letting us hear the character's thoughts would help us get a better feel for them. The issue I have is that they don't add to the story and end up feeling like wasted time. Any information given through these could have easily been expressed through the dialogue and portraits. Cutscenes end up dragging on far longer than they should because of this, and I think the game's pacing would have been improved if they were greatly toned back. I know that I've been sounding very negative up until now, but admittedly, there are aspects of the story that I enjoy. If we were to look at the scenarios in a vacuum, then I think that some of them are pretty interesting. Yosuke's and Chie's are standout examples since they do attempt to further their characters through self-reflection. Kanji's story is also pretty fun. He accidentally fell into the TV world while he was half asleep, and believes that the P1 Grand Prix is nothing more than a dream. This caused him to not take the event seriously, and absolutely steamroll through all of his friends without a second thought. These are fleeting moments, however, and don't make up for this story mode's otherwise dull and repetitive structure. The most enjoyable campaign for me ended up being the one focused on the brand new character, Labrys. In almost every story, your character will come across this girl who claims to be the student council president of Yasugami High. This girl is unaware that the school the P1 Grand Prix is being held in is fake, and she seemingly doesn't have all of her memories. However, upon making it to the announcement room, the curtain is pulled back. It turns out that the true identity of this girl is the anti-shadow weapon Labrys, and the one orchestrating the P1 Grand Prix is isn't Teddy, but it's in fact Labrys's shadow. By playing through Labrys's campaign, we get to learn her backstory and how exactly she ended up in this situation. When Labrys was being held by the Carijo group, she was forced to fight and kill her sister unit so that the researchers could collect combat data. But at the same time as all of this, Labrys slowly started to develop a sense of self thanks to the plume of dusk that was implanted inside of her. She ended up befriending one of the other models, and as their bond strengthened, Labrys's psyche and identity formed. However, this friendship wasn't able to last since Labrys was forced to kill her only companion during one of the combat trials. This caused Labrys to snap, and she attempted to escape the research facility but was quickly captured and sealed away. But during the plane hijacking at the start of the game, Labrys was stolen and relocated to Inaba where she was forced into the TV world. She was then brainwashed by an unknown entity to believe that she was just an ordinary high school student, which leads us to where we are now. What Labrys wants deep down is for people to accept her and to be treated as more than just a machine. However, her shadow represents her her hatred towards the people that forced her to fight what was essentially her family. There's a part of Labrys that desires for people to go through the same pain that she did, not just out of revenge, but because she believes that this would help them understand her feelings. This longing is the reason why the P1 Grand Prix started when Labrys's shadow manifested, and to an extent, this actually does work. By the end of every campaign, your character is able to help Labrys deal with her inner turmoil and give her the courage to accept those feelings as a part of herself, and by conquering her shadow, Labrys is able to awake into her persona. The story surrounding Labrys is the best part of Arena's campaign for me since it feels the most like the plot of a Persona game. It deals with the themes of self-acceptance and growth that Persona 4 was known for, and I like how it's tied back to Persona 3 by having the Carijo group play a large part in this character's backstory. It's the most interesting part of the story, but it still suffers from being long-winded thanks to the game's style of writing. I'll be honest, I didn't get a whole lot of enjoyment out of Arena's story mode. It's not because I didn't like the premise or general narrative beats, I think those were just fine, it's just that the literal storytelling and execution of these ideas end up leaving me feeling ambivalent to the whole thing. I wouldn't consider the story terrible, but I wouldn't recommend fully completing the story mode unless you're very curious and are willing to put up with the trappings. While the story mode is a substantial part of the overall experience, it isn't the main draw for this kind of game. Obviously, most people are coming to 
this title for the fighting itself. While the story is lacking, this aspect of the game definitely makes up for it. Universally speaking, every character has two regular attacks and two persona attacks. While regular attacks behave exactly how you think they would, persona attacks are far more than just a flashy animation. Your persona has a health bar of its very own, signified by the number of filled tarot cards underneath the player's health bar. Whenever your persona is hit while it's out on the field, it will drain one point from the meter. If all four cards are used up, that character will be inflicted with the persona break status. When this happens, you'll be unable to use any persona related attacks until all four cards are replenished. This can suck depending on who you're playing as, because some characters rely on their persona for attacks far more than others. A character like Yosuke, for example, can actually do quite a bit of damage without his persona, but someone like Elizabeth will definitely need to play on the defensive due to a lack of options. This is a necessary trade off since it conditions you not to be overly reliant on your persona. These attacks, while being a fair bit more powerful than your basic moves, come with a lot of startup and end lag that can easily be punished if they become too predictable. The way the super meter works in Persona 4 Arena is very derivative of other games in the genre. By doing basically anything, you slowly fill up your SP bar. You can spend some of your SP to enhance the effectiveness of your special attacks, or you can spend a large quantity of your SP meter to execute one of your character's super moves. When your character's HP falls below a certain threshold, they'll enter the awakened state. Not only does this increase your maximum SP from 100 to 150, but it also allows you to use stronger super attacks. This is all pretty basic stuff, but the inclusion that I find to be the most interesting is the mechanic called One More Cancelling. By spending a large amount of SP, you'll be able to cancel your current combo and reset yourself back to the neutral position. This is actually a very useful and versatile tool for both mix-ups and combo extensions. It costs the same amount of SP to use a One More Cancel as it does to use a super attack, and when you do decide to use it, you won't get any more SP for the rest of the combo, so it can't be exploited. This is a pretty faithful transition of the One More mechanic from the mainline Persona series. In those games, if you exploited an enemy weakness or landed a critical hit, your party member will be able to perform another action in battle. Obviously, you can't have elemental weaknesses in a fighting game, so I find tying One More Cancels to your SP bar to be a logical fix. Being able to reset your combo at any time is a very powerful tool for continuing strings, and having it share the same resource as your most powerful attacks provides us with some interesting decision making. But at the end of the day, it all falls back on the skill of the player to make the most out of the opportunity. The final main mechanic of Arena is the Burst Meter, which has both offensive and defensive applications. When an opponent is being too aggressive for your liking, you can activate Burst to give yourself some breathing room, though this can't be used while muted or when your persona is broken. Burst can also be activated it in the middle of a combo to cancel your current attack, throw the enemy up in the air, and reset the damage scaling of your current combo. It's very similar to one more cancelling. The third and final application for burst is called the Max Burst. This is easily the most risky version, but yields back a good reward. During the neutral state, if you manage to hit your opponent with a burst, not only will you throw them back to the other side of the screen, but you'll also gain back all of your SP. And as I already went over, SP is a pretty important resource, since it allows you to dish out big damage. Whenever you activate burst, the gauge will be emptied and you'll have to wait for it to be fully charged before you can use it again. The current status of the burst gauge is carried over in between rounds, and when combined with the lengthy recharge time, means that you can't be too trigger happy with it. The burst gauge offers the player with some great on the fly decision making. You can either discharge burst when backed into a corner if you aren't confident in your block strings, or you can tough it out and later use the move to give yourself the extra edge needed for a comeback, and if you manage to pull off the ladder, it can be very exhilarating. Then about sums up the major universal mechanics. Of course, there still are a few things that I haven't mentioned, but that's mostly because they're very self-explanatory. Furious actions require you to spend some health for a character-specific move, all that attacks are overheads that lead into a quick beatdown. From then on, you get the choice of either throwing the enemy up in the air or sending them further back towards the wall. And finally, there are auto combos. These are simple strings that can be performed by mashing the light attack button. They're not super effective, but they exist as an avenue to ease new players into the game. On their own, the mechanics of Persona 4 Arena offer a fun and satisfying combat system. It's nothing that'll set the world on fire or anything wholly original, but it's a good time whenever you decide to load up a match. Each character has a very distinct playstyle that fits well with their established personalities. Of course, some liberties were taken due to the genre shift, but the adaptation still manages to be faithful. Mitsuru strikes enemies with the speed and grace that you would expect her to, along with having access to ice magic and the charm status ailment. Naoto has access to her light and dark spell 
cells, but the proper conditions need to be met for the insta-kill effects to be activated. Igus can enter Orgia mode to increase her power and mobility, but can overheat after prolonged use, and the list goes on. Characters play exactly how you would expect them to, and mechanics that you think wouldn't make the cut end up being a core part of their design. When looking at the content outside of the core combat, Persona 4 Arena offers a few modes for you to choose from. Most of these are very standard. Arcade mode acts as a very abridged version of the story mode. It sees you climbing the ranks and getting little nuggets of story here and there. It's not exactly a substitute for story mode, but if you're just looking for fights against CPUs, then this mode scratches that itch. Training mode also exists if you feel the need to brush up on your skills and refine those combos, but I'm personally more impartial to challenge mode. This mode is a great way to get a general overview of what your selected character is capable of. You pick a character and are given a list of combos for you to perform, ranging from basic ones that anyone can figure out, to more advanced combos that require precise timing to make work. And finally, there's the score attack mode. It's structurally similar to the arcade mode, but far more difficult, to the point where it's borderline impossible to win some of these fights without resorting to cheese. Of course, there's also online multiplayer, but it's not exactly an active community at this point. With all of this considered, Persona 4 Arena is a very fun game to play. There's a lot of tools for you to experiment with, and while the game has a more limited roster than other fighting games, it makes up for it in their sheer quality. Characters have very diverse kits that pay tribute to their roles in the original game, while also taking enough liberties to make them interesting to play as in this setting. The game's general mechanics are easy to grasp, while also having enough depth for a more seasoned player to get some mileage. The largest critique I have with Arena isn't the gameplay itself, but rather its story mode. While I can give praise to certain aspects, such as the character interactions and some narrative beats, it's ultimately a very dull experience that I don't recommend fully completing. Like I said, the main appeal for this kind of game is the actual fighting, but at this point, you may as well just play the game's sequel, Persona 4 Arena Ultimax. Released about one year after the original game, Ultimax takes the foundation established in Arena 1 and improves upon it with the addition of new mechanics, modes, and characters. There's also a brand new story mode for us to chew on, but before I talk about that, let's quickly go over the gameplay changes first. In terms of core mechanics, Ultimax is nearly identical to the original title. Some adjustments have been made, however, and while they may seem minor, the changes do have an impact. One of the standout changes to me is the alteration made to the tarot card system. In the first game, every character's persona could take four hits before being disabled. Now the number of hits a persona can take has been adjusted depending on the character. Fighters that heavily rely on their personas tend to have more cards than characters that don't. This means that they can take a bit more punishment before suffering from a persona break. But at the same time, this makes the status a lot more deadly since it takes longer for the cards to replenish. The flip side is also true. Some characters have really fragile personas personas, but they replenish faster as a result. It's not enough to completely negate the punishment, but it's a substantial enough difference to notice. Of course, that's not all that was changed from Arena to Ultimax, but I'd be here all day if I listed every difference. Instead, I want to highlight the more substantial additions. The roster has been bumped from 13 to 22 characters to choose from. There's the remaining members of Seize, Yukari, Junpei, and Ken, the final member of the investigation team Risei, which is a surprising but fitting pick, and finally the newcomer Shobei Nazuki, who, much like Labrys, has two different versions. But unlike the original game, three fighters were offered as DLC, those being the Velvet Room assistants Margaret and Marie, which was nice to see, alongside Toru Adachi, whose mere inclusion no doubt spoiled Persona 4 for someone. The roster feels a lot more rounded because of these additions, and I like that the new characters have a bit of an unconventional playstyle. For example, Ken is teamed up with Koromaru on top of already having a Persona. The micro game with Ken is to find a way to balance attack from both characters to create devastating combos. On top of these characters, Ultimax introduces shadow variants of most fighters. What sets these versions apart is the retooling of certain mechanics. For starters, shadow characters always have access to their awakened supers, but the trade-off is that they can only have a maximum of 100 SP compared to the regular character's 150. Their current SP also carries over between rounds, unlike their normal counterparts. But that's not the most unique part of these variants. Shadow characters do not have access to the burst ability. Instead, they get a mechanic called Shadow Frenzy, which can be activated when you have max SP. During Shadow Frenzy, you're temporarily granted with unlimited SP, which allows you to perform more super attacks or one more cancels than what's usually allowed. This mode only lasts for a few seconds, however, and will leave you completely drained when it ends. Just like with 
with Burst, Shadow Frenzy can be used to cancel your current action, which can lead to some very deadly combos if used correctly. Shadow characters are essentially trading defensive options for the sake of focusing entirely on offense, and depending on the character, this playstyle could be preferred. Shadow Chie, for example, is able to do insane amounts of damage during Shadow Frenzy since it lets you get away with some pretty absurd shit. But much like everything else in the game, it requires a lot of practice to get the most use out of it. Ultimax has all the same modes as the previous game, but there is one new addition called Golden Arena that, in all honesty, didn't really do much for me. It's a mode that tries to incorporate the more traditional RPG elements of the Persona games into the core combat. As you fight and win battles, your selected character will gain experience points and level up. You get three points to distribute amongst your stats, and you'll gain new passive skills as you hit certain thresholds. From the little of this mode that I played, these stat points didn't make much of a difference in how I would play the game. This makes the implementation feel rather clunky, which is a shame since the other aspect of the Persona games were adapted so well. Maybe these stat increases become far more substantial later on, but I found the mode to be far too repetitive to see it through. I can see this mode being a good time sink in a turn your brain off sort of way, but if you're just looking for consecutive fights, then you may as well just stick with arcade or score attack mode. I don't hate the idea of Golden Arena, but I think its execution is rather lackluster. Aside from that, Arena Ultimax is a straight improvement over its predecessor gameplay-wise. It has the same core mechanics, but with more stuff to play around with. And if you're just looking for an easy-to-learn, hard-to-master fighting game featuring Persona characters, then Ultimax is definitely going to fill that void for you. But this isn't the end just yet. There still is a story to cover, and to be honest, it isn't anything special. It's definitely an improvement over the one from the original Arena, but it's still nothing I'd consider great. Ultimax's story takes place one day after the original game. The Midnight Channel has once again returned, advertising an event called the P1 Climax, with General Teddy taking reins as the host. A red fog has swept Inaba, and a mysterious tower looking awfully similar to Tartarus has emerged. Not only that, but Mitsuru, Aegis, Akihiko, and Fuka have seemingly been kidnapped and are currently being held hostage somewhere within the tower. Because of this, the auxiliary members of the Shadow Operas have been called into action, those being Yukari, Junpei, and Ken. General Teddy explains that if no one can get through the P1 climax within the hour, the world will come to an end, with the shadows of the contestants acting as their opponents. It's now up to the investigation team and the remaining members of the Shadow Operatives to rescue their friends and reach the top of the tower so that they can put a stop to this tournament. The premise of Ultimax is equally as simplistic as the one featured from the previous game, but the main difference this time is the way that the story is structured. Instead of each character getting their own story, there are now only two campaigns. You initially only have access to the Persona 4 side, but after you finish that story, you unlock the Persona 3 side, which while mostly canon, ends up greatly deviating around the halfway point. Each campaign is split into distinct chapters, and you'll be frequently switching between multiple characters' perspectives. This more linear approach is definitely to the game's benefit, since it doesn't need to waste time constantly regurgitating the same information ad nauseum. There are even a few times where you get to pick which character you want to play as in battle, which is pretty cool. While the structure has been improved, the actual narrative isn't anything to write home about. The game's major antagonist is this teenage boy named Sho. While he appears to be a normal high school student, he actually has a split personality, with his other self being referred to as Minazuki. It's eventually revealed that Minazuki was not only the one behind the plane hijacking from the first arena, but he's also working alongside General Teddy, whose true identity is the deity known as the Hino Kagetsuji. Minazuki helped orchestrate these tournaments so that he could slowly carve off fragments of the contestants' personas. He plans on using them to give Hino Kagetsuchi a new form, which will then bring about the end of the world. But what exactly is his motivation for this? Well, it turns out that Sho is actually the adoptive son of Ikutsuki from Persona 3. In case you need a reminder, Ikutsuki used to be a scientist for the Karijo group. He would take orphaned kids off the street and try to have them artificially awakened to a persona. Sho was one of those test subjects and just so happened to be Ikutsuki's favorite. Ikutsuki implanted Sho with a plume of dusk in an attempt to have him manifest a persona but instead, this gifted him with his Minazuki personality. These experiments, combined with his isolation, led Sho to develop a hatred towards all of humanity. What Sho desires above all else is solitude, and believes that the only way to achieve this is to destroy the world and leave himself as the only survivor. While it's his Minazuki personality that's working to accomplish this goal, it's something that originated from Sho's own psyche. From then on, the characters attempt to reach out to Sho so they can help him go down a better path. It's Narukami that does this on the Persona 4, side, with Labrys being the one to do so on the Persona 3 side. While it's canon that Narukami is the one to do this, I actually find Labrys being the one to help Sho reach a new understanding to be a better idea. These 
two characters have a lot in common with each other, and Show even points that out. Labras is able to understand the feeling of being wronged in life, and what it's like to have a burning desire to enact revenge, but it was through the companionship she received from the investigation team and shadow operatives that she was able to learn that the world isn't black and white. This in turn helped Labras put her inner grief to rest. Labras believes that she can help Show in the same way that her new friends helped herself, which is a natural evolution of this character. In general, I actually find the Persona 3 side of Ultimax's story to be far more narratively satisfying. A lot of information regarding Sho and his origins is told through this side of the story, and the fact that they tie into plot elements featured in Persona 3 makes him a great antagonist to the Shadow Operatives. It also just feels really good to see these characters back in action. We get to see small glimpses into the lives of these characters when they're not fighting Shadows, and I really like that the events of Persona 3 clearly had an impact on them. It's stuff like this that makes the Persona 4 side feel a bit lesser in my eyes. That story mostly just has the investigation team speculating on who the culprit is and trying to deduce his end goal. The lack of a personal connection to the antagonist also makes him come off more as a villain of a week than anything, while for the Persona 3 side, it's treated as a phantom from the past re-emerging, acting as a haunting reminder of the trouble they went through in their youths and testing them on how they changed. The Persona 4 side isn't bad, but I think that the Persona 3 perspective fits a lot more with the story that the writers were trying to tell. Though I think Sho is still a rather weak villain, all things considered. His upbringing is interesting, but his characterization makes him come off less as a serious threat and more so as a whiny brat. When the game wants us to sympathize with Sho, it's very difficult since we don't spend much time with him other than a few cutscenes. In contrast, Labras had a lot more characterization before her reveal. The game manages to paint a broad picture of her character and we even get the benefit of experiencing her trauma firsthand, both in terms of her dedicated story mode and also through the symbolism of the P1 Grand Prix. I understand what the writers were trying to do with Sho, but because of the issues I mentioned, it ends up falling a bit flat. The story of Persona 4 Arena Ultimax is an improvement over the original title. It's a massive step up in terms of storytelling since a lot more is accomplished in a shorter runtime. However, it still manages to fall into the same traps as its predecessor. The pacing of the writing is still bogged down thanks to the over-reliance of inner monologues. The presentation still feels very budgeted and would have benefited from having more of a visual flair. But as a whole, I had a much better time going through the story mode of Ultimax than I ever did with Arena 1. I can't quite say that the story mode is the big selling point for to max, but I wouldn't say that it's not worth your time to at least check out. Overall, the Persona 4 Arena series is a pretty good time. It's simple enough for newcomers to pick up, but the mechanics have enough depth for a more seasoned fighting game player to get some mileage out of it. Even if you aren't a Persona fan, there still is fun to be had with its core gameplay. Arguably, the biggest success of the Arena series was how it successfully adapted a turn-based RPG into a fighting game. It takes the unique gameplay mechanics of its source material and effortlessly translates them into a new genre. If you're not too familiar with fighting games and are on the fence, I recommend you at least give them a shot. There's no better time than now anyways thanks to the Ultimax port that's coming out for modern platforms. I hope that this port sparks enough interest for Atlas and Arxis to consider making an Ultimax follow-up. There's a lot of untapped potential here, and I would love to see how mechanics and characters from Persona 5 could be adapted. Maybe even some refs of Persona 1 and 2 if we're lucky. My biggest critique with the Arena series is definitely their story modes. While I can appreciate that the attempt to further the narratives of Persona 3 and 4 in meaningful ways, ultimately, it's it's their storytelling that brings it all down. But that doesn't mean the core idea was flawed, because occasionally, the story does shine through. However, those fleeting moments aren't enough for me to fully justify going through them. You're probably wondering why I spent so much time dissecting the story of a fighting game, and the answer is quite simple. The Persona series has always had a large focus on their narratives, on top of having fun and satisfying gameplay. And if Arena adapted one part of the experience so well, part of me yearns to see what it would be like if the other half got the same treatment. The Persona dancing games are a strange anomaly. They're among some of the most infamous games to come out of the great Persona spin-off era for a myriad of reasons. For those who are unaware, the Persona dancing trilogy is a series of rhythm games where the main appeal is to watch your favorite characters dance to funky remixes of tunes from the respective games. While it's easy to point and laugh at what they ended up becoming, the concept of a Persona-themed rhythm game actually makes a lot of sense when you really think about it. The series is well known for its catchy music, and since Atlas already showed interest in expanding 
expanding the Persona franchise beyond RPGs thanks to the Arena games, I figure they thought, hey, why not, and greenlit the project. Persona 4 Dancing All Night was originally released for the PlayStation Vita back in 2015, but would eventually receive a remaster for the PlayStation 4 a few years later. This version of the game has better texture quality, runs at a higher resolution, has better performance, and is overall just the best way to play Dancing All Night. The only issue is getting your hands on it. For some reason or another, the PS4 version of Dancing All Night is only available as a bonus for purchasing the Persona Dancing Endless Night collection. It retailed for about 100 bucks US at launch, and came with all three games and a few pieces of DLC. And since there's no physical release of this remaster, if you want to play Dancing All Night nowadays, it has to be through this collection. This is a very scummy business decision. You're essentially forced to buy two games that you either already own or might not be interested in just to get Persona 4 Dancing. While this collection does go on sale often, it doesn't excuse the greed motivating the practice. And that's not even getting into the fragility of digital-only content, but that's a discussion for another time. Just like with the Arena games, I'm going to be covering all of the dancing games in one video, since at their core, they're fundamentally the same gameplay-wise. Of course, some differences set them apart from each other, and I'll be highlighting them when appropriate, but it isn't enough to justify giving each game separate videos. The last thing that I want to mention is that there are going to be spoilers for all three dancing games in this video. This warning more so applies to Persona 4 Dancing, since that game has a surprisingly fleshed out single player campaign. P3 and P5 Dancing also technically have a story, but it's very minimal. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. With all that said and done, let's get started. Dancing All Night's story takes place about one month after the epilogue of Persona 4 Golden. Risei has recently gone back to the idol industry, and is going to make her grand reappearance at the upcoming Love Meets Bonds music festival. However, she's not fully confident in her abilities, and requests the help of the investigation team to support her as backup dancers. During the first day of rehearsals, Narukami and Naoto meet a girl named Kanami Mishita, a character that played a pretty large part in Risei's social link in Persona 4, if you remember. We're also introduced to her idol group Kanami Kitchen, and her manager Miss Ochimizu. Late Lately, a strange rumor has spread involving a video depicting a dead idol showing up at midnight on the LMB website, and the next day we learn that the members of Konami Kitchen have mysteriously gone missing. Thinking that this is too much of a coincidence, Risei, Naoto, and Narukami watch the video themselves and are sucked into the midnight stage, an area not too dissimilar to the TV world. The trio discovers a mysterious entity using these yellow ribbons in an eerie song to brainwash people into forming bonds with it. The group is unable to use violence to defend themselves, but they accidentally discover that through the power of song and dance, they'll be able to fight back against the voice's control and summon their personas, which gives them enough time to escape back to the real world. The investigation team meets up the following day where they theorize that the missing members of Konami Kitchen are located somewhere inside the Midnight Stage. Konami is also almost dragged into the Midnight Stage, but is saved by Miss Ochimizu at the last second who ends up getting captured herself. With no one else to rely on, it's up to the investigation team to enter the Midnight Stage, find the missing members of Konami Kitchen, rescue Miss Ochimizu, and get to the bottom of this new mystery. That's the basic setup to Persona 4 Dancing All Night, and while it's simple on paper, there's no denying what it is. A ridiculous premise that's innate absurdity can be seen as too distracting to take seriously. To that extent, I can agree. It's very easy to dismiss the story simply because of its foundation. However, if we were to go beyond the surface level and look at the actual narrative that's being told, then it's actually kind of good. Don't get me wrong, it's not a perfect story by any stretch, it suffers from a few of the same problems as the arena games do, but Persona 4's core themes of identity and self-acceptance are well represented in its new characters. For example, the members of Konami Kitchen all have very similar insecurities. Whenever we come across a member of the group inside of the Midnight Stage, their personalities are far different from how they were initially presented. The main conflict with these characters is the internal struggle between living as their true selves or completely submerging themselves in their idol personas. Each one of them has a deep-rooted fear that if they're unable to live up to the expectations set by their fans, then they'll be abandoned by them. What the members of Konami Kitchen desire are to abandon their true selves and fully embrace what the public wants them to be. This in turn would allow them to obtain the bonds that they so desperately want without having to worry about being rejected or ridiculed because of their quirks. Miss Oshimizu was also used to illustrate this idea. For most of the game, she's portrayed as a very cruel and stern manager that strives for perfection. She often acts cold and looks down on others, especially Risei. However, it's eventually revealed that this attitude is actually a facade. 
Ochimizu used to be a far more caring and supportive person while she was managing the young idol Yuko Osada. The two of them had a very close relationship, however, Yuko hated her job as an idol because she felt as though no one could truly understand her. She desperately wanted to break free from her manufactured idol personality and let the real Yuko express herself, though she couldn't find the courage to do so and fell into a deep depression. She would eventually end up taking her own life, and Miss Ochimizu believes herself to be responsible for what happened. This led her to believe that expressing your true self around others was an impossibility, and that idols would be better off shaping themselves around what the public desired. Miss Ochimizu was villainized by the public and was seen as a cruel person, but rather than fight back against it, she decided to become what the audience saw her as, using the infamy to help push Kahneman Kitchen into the limelight in order to help carry out Yuko's legacy. And finally, there's Kanami herself, who struggles with feelings of isolation. She feels unfulfilled with the bond she has with her audience, since they don't care about her as an individual. Rather, they love the idol personality that's being fed to the public. However, that's not all that's going on with this character. As it turns out, she does have a connection to the events surrounding the idol Yuko. When Kanami was young, she looked up to Yuko and strived to be just like her. But after auditioning to become an idol herself, Kanami witnessed Yuko's suicide and was traumatized by this event. Kanami ended up suppressing these memories in order to preserve the image of Yuko that she built up. Her desperation to form bonds with others as an idol while forgetting the pain Yuko went through eventually manifests as the game's major antagonist. While at first, it seems as though Kanami's shadow is the one pulling the strings, but it's quickly revealed that the true culprit is the deity Mikirutana no Kami. She represents humanity's desire for easy bonds with others, and she plans on using the midnight stage to brainwash all of mankind into becoming the selves that others want them to be, essentially trading away freedom and identity for the sake of painless connections. The investigation team disagrees with this philosophy due to their personal experiences, and rise up to demonstrate the power of true bonds. At its core, Persona 4 Dancing on all Night shares the same values as the original game, but it puts a much larger emphasis on the idea of bonds. The narrative is about learning to have confidence in who you are and not to twist yourself into someone you're not for the sake of appeasing others. While this would be an easy way to form bonds, they're ultimately hollow since they lack any personal connection. At that point, you're less of an individual and more so a puppet that puts on a show tailored made to appease as many people as possible. When taking all of this into account, it's actually a fitting narrative for this kind of game, something that I appreciate about the story is that they acknowledge dancing as a form of expression. Every character in the game has a unique way of moving, their styles match well with their established personalities, which goes a long way in selling that these characters fully embrace who they are as individuals. The final dance even goes the extra mile to incorporate every member of the investigation team into the choreography, not just for the sake of being an impressive finale, but also to demonstrate the bonds that they all share. Yeah, it's very cheesy, but it's executed with such earnesty that I can't help but get swept up in the whole thing. When looking at the plot of Dancing All Night on paper, it's quite interesting. However, much like the arena games, where the narrative falls flat is in its storytelling, mainly the pacing of the writing and how repetitious it is. This is quite a chatty game, and characters are very much prone to going on inner monologues that don't mean much to the overall narrative. The worst example of this is chapters 2 and 3. These two chapters see the investigation team searching for members of Kahneman Kitchen, all the while they try to deduce who the culprit is and what they're trying to accomplish. You'll quickly realize that these chapters follow a very similar formula that is repeated four times. The characters fight some shadows, come across one of the idols who's then kidnapped by the culprit, the group then fights the idol's shadow before moving on to the next one. This, combined with the walls of text you're forced to read in between every song, makes these chapters very draining to experience. And that's the best way to describe the whole of Persona 4 Dancing's story. It's draining. The campaign is about 10 to 12 hours long, which is pretty beefy for this kind of game. The issue is that there isn't enough story story content to fully justify its length. There's a lot of filler in the dialogue that feels as though was included for the sake of having the story mode reach a certain runtime. I'm mainly referring to the constant use of inner monologues. I had the same issue with the arena games, and it's worse here. These add absolutely nothing to the narrative, and if they were removed, the pacing would flow much more naturally. It also doesn't help that the general presentation of the story mode is lackluster. I will say that the visual novel format is more justifiable here since the game was originally developed for a handheld, but I can only cut it so much slack. As a whole, the story mode of Dancing All Night is just fine. On paper, the plot has a lot of potential, and feels very in line with what I expected of the series thematically. It's just that the execution of these ideas end up falling a bit flat for me because the storytelling isn't up to par. I can appreciate the 
ambition and the ideas behind the narrative, but it's not enough for me to want to experience it again anytime soon. While the story isn't exactly great, the gameplay on the other hand more than makes up for it. If you're familiar with rhythm games at all, then you'll be right at home here. Mechanically speaking, things are very simplistic. There are four different kinds of notes for you to hit. There's the standard tap note that requires you to hit the corresponding button with the proper timing, notes that require you to hold the button for a specific duration, notes that require you to hit buttons on the opposite ends of the controller, and finally there are scratch notes, which require you to either rotate the analog stick or press one of the shoulder buttons to hit. Unlike regular notes, you're not punished for missing scratch notes, but they are required to hit if you want to get the best possible rank. Something to keep in mind is the current mood of the audience. If you miss too many notes and the meter falls below a certain threshold, you'll fail the song. It essentially acts as your health bar, but the chances of you failing aren't exactly high. But on the flip side, you're rewarded for putting on a good performance. By maintaining a high audience rating while also hitting special scratch notes, you'll enter fever time. During fever time, your score will be multiplied, the audience rating won't decrease, and you'll temporarily be joined by a partner. While just finishing a song is easy enough, the real challenge and replayability stems from trying to earn the rank of King Crazy. This rank can be earned by maintaining a combo throughout the entirety of a song. Combos only count whenever you hit notes with either great or perfect timing. Anything lower will break the combo. This is a simple enough rule. However, I think the game could have done a better job at conveying whenever you earned a good rating. I mention this because one of the benefits of Fever Time is the ability to keep your combo streak going even if your timing is slightly off. This ended up causing me more harm than good because I wasn't able to immediately tell when I messed up. This meant whenever I finished the song, I'd get the full combo bonus, but I wouldn't receive the King Crazy rank. This is a quirk that's shared between all three dancing games, which is strange because there's an obvious solution to this problem. If I had it my way, I would remove Fever Time's combo protection, so good ratings will always break combos no matter the circumstance. Since earning a King Crazy already requires you to full combo a song, I think that having the full combo bonus is a bit redundant. All this would do is save time, because there's nothing fucking worse than thinking you King crazy a song only for it to be ripped away because of one good rating you didn't even notice. Yeah. When it comes to the main mechanics, that's honestly all you need to know. The game is very simple at its core, but for a rhythm game, that's perfectly fine. Where the real enjoyment lies in Persona 4 Dancing is the design and content surrounding the gameplay. Outside of the story mode, you're mostly going to be spending your time in free play mode. This allows you to play any of your unlocked tracks at any difficulty. You can even dress up the characters in different outfits and accessories, and turn on any gameplay modifiers you have unlocked. All of this is acquired through the in-game shop. You earn cash at the end of every song, which can be used in the store, and your payout varies depending on your rank, difficulty, and number of modifiers you have turned on. I think that this is a great way to encourage players to improve at the game, since the better you perform, the more money you earn. Money that you then use to get cosmetics for your favorite characters, or buy even more difficulty modifiers to add some gameplay variety. Part of me wishes that items in the shop costed a bit more money, however, since once you really start to get the grips with the game, you're already close to owning everything. Either that, or some extra outfits and accessories would have been appreciated. By purchasing all the items in the shop, you unlock the game's hardest difficulty titled All Night Mode. While it may look a bit intimidating at first, it's honestly my favorite way to play the game now, since hard mode was a bit too easy for me. Here's a pro tip for those just starting out. Switch the game's speed to the highest it can go, while also using the Macho Momentum modifier. An issue I had when I first started playing was that the charting felt a bit too cluttered, but having the notes move faster meant that there was less visual noise on screen at a time. This made it much easier for me to tell what was going on, and the modifications gave me a much bigger payout, especially if I got a King Crazy. Persona 4 Dancing has a total of 27 tracks for you to play. This set list consists of songs from the Persona 4 Reincarnation album, songs taken straight from the games, and brand new remixes created specifically for Dancing All Night. These tracks are honestly very well done, with my personal favorites being the remixes of Your Affection, Now I Know, Backside of the TV, and Snowflakes. On top of the already included songs, there are a few bits of DLC offered for you to get some extra mileage out of the game. However, the pricing leaves a bit to be desired. Most songs are priced at $1.50 Canadian a pop, but the tracks that feature new characters and choreography end up costing around $7 each. This is a bit of a tough pill to swallow, since one song costing $7 isn't exactly a good value, but I can see why they're priced like this. It no doubt takes a lot of effort to create a single track for this game. Not only do the songs need to be ordered and charted, but the game uses motion capture for its dances, which is an 
expensive and time-consuming process. So while it does make sense that these specific songs would cost a premium, as a consumer, it's hard for me to justify spending that money on a single song. However, it's hard to deny that watching Adachi bust a move isn't entertaining. Also, shout out to the Dede Mouse remix of Shadow World. I'm not sure what they were going for here, but it doesn't sound good, and it's completely unsatisfying to play. Thank god it was free, because if it costed money, I would have lost it. As a whole, Persona 4 Dancing is a pretty good game, all things considered. The charting is fun and satisfying, the soundtrack fits the tone and energy perfectly, and there's a decent amount of content to experience. The only problem I have with the gameplay is the issue I mentioned involving Fever Time. While it can be annoying, it isn't enough to distract from my enjoyment. However, the largest criticism I have with the game is its story, which seems to be a running trend with the Persona spin-off games. There's a lot of ambition behind the story mode, and when just looking at the narrative on paper, there's quite a lot that I enjoy. The themes fall in line with the original Persona 4, and I think that it's pretty ambitious to give a rhythm game a fully fleshed out story. However, it's the writing and pacing that hold it back for me. I might just not be a big fan of visual novels, since I don't think that relying so heavily on inner monologues is good storytelling. All this does is grind the pace to a halt, and you're forced to read mountains of text that ultimately don't mean much in what's going on. However, some part of me looks back on the narrative with a certain level of fondness, because there are quite a few high points for me, but it's not enough for me to want to experience it again anytime soon. Aside from that, Persona 4 Dancing is a solid experience. But we're not quite done just yet. A few years after the release of Dancing All Night, Persona 3 and Persona 5 received rhythm games of their own, the former being Dancing in Moonlight and the latter being Dancing in Star Night. Both games came out the same day and are meant to be complementary titles. They're pretty much the same, just with different tracks based on the respective games. And just to get it right out of the way, I'm not a big fan of these two games. It's no secret that Persona 3 and 5 Dancing are widely considered to be some of the worst titles the series has to offer. This might seem a bit odd on the outside, especially if you compare them to Persona 4 Dancing. How can games so fundamentally similar differ so much in terms of quality? Before I answer that, I believe I should preface this section by mentioning what these two games do well, because there are aspects of these games that I enjoy. The presentation has seen a massive bump in quality. The character models all look great, and the dancing choreography itself is a lot more impressive. The characters in Persona 4 Dancing sometimes felt a bit stiff, since they were glued in place for most of their routines. The choreography in Persona 3 and 5 Dancing sees the characters move around the stage a lot more. This allows them to perform more flashy moves, and the choreography ends up feeling more dynamic because of it. Character customization has also been greatly expanded upon. Not only are there a few more outfits for you to unlock than previously, but you can now also equip up to three accessories at a time, with headwear having its own classification. Wigs and colored eye contacts were also added. You can now save your favorite outfits as presets in case you're the kind of person who likes to change their clothing a lot, and if you want to keep your old options on standby. And finally, scratch notes have been adjusted to stand out a lot more visually. Admittedly, it can be kind of hard to see those notes in Persona 4 Dancing sometimes, so having them be a bit more pronounced here is a good improvement. That's genuinely everything that I find to be better here, because other than that, P3 and P5 Dancing are a downgrade in almost every way, like almost to a baffling degree. Let's start with the obvious. Both of these games have a total of 25 songs on disc, while Persona 4 Dancing came with 27 songs. While that might not seem like a huge downgrade at first, when looking beyond a surface level, you'll quickly realize that less effort went into these tracks. There are multiple songs in both of these games that don't feature any sort of choreography, and are instead music videos comprised of clips from their respective games. Compare this to Persona 4 Dancing. Aside from the credits theme, every song had unique choreography and its own visual language. You got to dress up the characters in any way you wanted to, and like it or not, this was one of the main draws for the dancing series. Persona 3 and 5 Dancing both have seven tracks each that are dedicated to music videos, even going as far as including live performance renditions of songs and the opening movies as a part of that list. It comes off as a lazy way to pad out the set list due to a lack of budget. I don't mind these songs in the context of being DLC tracks, but I don't think it's too much to ask for all the base game music to be choreographed, especially since its predecessor managed to do that just fine. While we're on the topic of set lists, I want to focus on Persona 5 dancing really quick. Music is one of the most inherently subjective topics because it all boils down to personal taste. What I might like is what you may find annoying and vice versa. I say this because I'm personally not a huge fan of most of the remixes in this game. There are a few tracks I'm a big fan of. I like the remix of Wake Up, Get Up, Get Out There, and the one for the days when my mother was there. But the rest are just downgrades from their original renditions, and honestly don't have the proper energy for a rhythm game. Persona 5 Dancing also suffers from a lack of track variety. The game came out before the releases of Persona 5 Royal and Persona 
Q2, which means that all of the songs featured are from the original Persona 5. This is honestly a huge missed opportunity. The other two dancing games had the benefit of being able to pull from multiple facets of the Persona series, and P5 dancing is restricted to only using music from one game. What we end up with are a couple of repeats, and the inclusion of songs that don't work well for this kind of game. In comparison, Persona 3 dancing does have a healthy selection of songs. Most of the remixes are also top notch, and I'd argue that the game has my favorite overall soundtrack out of all of the dancing games. While I do enjoy the songs, the charting is a completely different story. It can be best described as obnoxious. This mainly stems from the fact that most of the songs have an over-reliance on using scratch notes. This would be fine, but their placements aren't exactly what I'd call intuitive, and feel more like a haphazard way to make the game seem more challenging than it actually is. Quite often are there times where these notes are placed seemingly at random and outside of the rhythm of the track. I get that Persona 3's music took a lot of inspiration from hip-hop and rap, but don't you think that this is a little excessive? You really gotta get used to mashing that bumper button when playing on the highest difficulty. However, the biggest issue I take with the gameplay is the change made to the note colors. For some reason or another, the standard tapping note had its color changed from yellow to blue. I know that this might sound like a meaningless nitpick, but it does have an effect on the gameplay. Something that Persona 4 Dancing went out of its way to do was give every note a distinct color. This made everything immediately recognizable, so that even if the charts were a bit cluttered up, you knew exactly what notes were there. This rule also applies to Persona 5 dancing, so I'm not sure why Persona 3 dancing is the odd one out. Since tap notes and scratch notes share the same color, it can sometimes be a bit visually overwhelming. This isn't an issue 90% of the time, and it's something that I can get used to, but the occasion when I miss a note because I quite literally couldn't see it was frustrating nonetheless. Because of these issues, I actually find Persona 3 dancing to be my least favorite of the trilogy. Don't get me wrong, you can easily make the argument that Persona 5 dancing is worse, but I just find P3 dancing to be far more annoying to play. All that's left to cover is the story mode, and to be honest, you're not really missing much. I do find the premise to be rather entertaining though. After Elizabeth and the Twin Wardens heard that Margaret's guests managed to defeat a god through dance, they become extremely jealous. Due to this, the sisters challenge each other to a dancing competition in order to prove who has the better guests. The members of Seas and the Phantom Thieves are summoned to the Velvet Room in their dreams to partake in this event, even though none of them have much experience with dancing. However, since this is a dream, the characters can just imagine any dance moves they want and their bodies will perform them, but once the night is over and the winner is decided, everyone will forget the events that transpired. It's the same excuse that's used in the Persona Q games, so that the story can technically be considered canon, even though they don't mean anything in the grand scheme of the series. Instead of having a dedicated story mode that tells an overarching narrative, what we have instead is a new take on social links. Each character has their own social link which consists of a total of 8 ranks. In order to unlock more ranks, you'll need to fulfill gameplay requirements, such as dressing up your characters in different clothing and accessories, clearing a certain number of songs across different difficulties, and the list goes on. Every time you view a character's event, you'll earn more cosmetics to dress up the party members in. In order to reach the credits and unlock the last two songs, you need to max out nearly every character's social link. I actually quite like this idea on paper. An issue I have with the story mode of Persona 4 dancing is the cutscene to gameplay ratio. There's a lot of text that you need to read, and it can take upwards of an hour for you to get through the story content just to play a song that only lasts for a few minutes. Gameplay is king for this genre, and the social system is designed in a way to make sure you're always experiencing the game's bread and butter. But in practice, the concept is fumbled. The requirements to unlock social link ranks aren't anything too special, and are something that are meant to be tackled over the course of multiple hours. The issue is that the game doesn't have enough content to match some of these requirements. While you'll reach some of them just through standard play, if you want to unlock all of the social links, you're going to have to grind out songs sooner or later. This makes the entire experience very tedious, and for the love of god, don't play these games back to back like I did. The social link requirements are the exact same between both games. This made fully completing them a slog since right after I finished Persona 3 dancing, I jumped into Persona 5 dancing, only to be met with the same checklist. But how do the social links fare? Well, they're alright I guess. There are some fun interactions here and there, but they mostly exist as fan service and don't offer much in terms of meaningful character progression. Overall, it just feels like a pretty big downgrade of the story mode featured in Persona 4 Dancing. While that game had its own fair share of problems, there was at the very least an attempt to do something interesting with the premise. There were tangible themes that reflected ideas present in the original Persona 4, and part of me hoped that these two games would get the same treatment. I don't enjoy fan service just for the sake of it, and prefer my narratives to have a reason for existing beyond that. I get that the 
story mode isn't at the forefront of these games like it was for P4 dancing. But if we're going to ignore it, we're not exactly left with a lot of content here. So yeah, that was the Persona dancing series. Talk about a mixed bag of quality. I really do enjoy dancing all night, not because I'm biased towards Persona 4, but because I genuinely think that it's a very solid game. There's a good amount of content for you to experience, the story mode is surprisingly decent, albeit flawed, and it's got a killer soundtrack that lends itself well for this style of game. I've sunk in plenty of hours trying to get King Crazy ranks, not just for the sake of this review, but because it's pretty addicting to do so. In comparison, Persona 3 and 5 dancing are a huge downgrade in almost every way. Yes, some improvements were made to the minor aspects of the experience, but it doesn't make up in the areas where they falter, such as in their underwhelming set lists, bad note charting, tedious progression, and lack of meaningful content. These two games feel like products rushed out to capitalize on the recent success of Persona 5 rather than be projects made out of passion. I know that at the end of the day, these games were made to generate sales, but Persona 4 dancing still manages to feel like a complete package with a lot of heart put into it. In contrast, the sequels feel empty and exist solely as platforms to try to squeeze as much money out of the player base as possible. They serve as a perfect example of what happens when greed overtakes making a quality product. Which is a shame because that first game held so much potential potential, and I would have loved to have seen what a proper follow-up would look like. As some of you already know, I'm not a huge fan of the original Persona Q. In case you need a reminder, this game was a crossover between both Persona and another franchise called Etrian Odyssey, which is a series of dungeon crawlers also developed by Atlas. Persona Q was a game filled to the brim with potential, but its execution left a lot to be desired. While there are things to appreciate about the game, as a whole, it's not something that I like to revisit often. Because of my overall indifference towards this game, I never ended up playing its direct sequel, Persona Q2, when it first came out. From the little I saw, it looked to be more of the same, but with the characters of Persona 5 now being thrown into the mix. So I gave it a pass and I didn't really think much of it. However, as time has gone on, I've heard a lot of good things about Persona Q2. Some people have even gone as far as to say that it's one of, if not the best spin-off in the Persona series. While this did pique my interest, what really sealed the deal for me was the number of comments I received on my video covering the first game, telling me how much of an improvement the sequel was. After hearing all of this positive buzz surrounding Q2, I decided to give the game a shot myself and came out feeling rather conflicted. Persona Q2 is a game of many peaks and valleys. It strives to be an improvement over the first game, and in a lot of ways, it succeeds. However, that doesn't mean that all of the issues I had were addressed, and in some ways, I'd argue that the first Persona Q game is better in some areas. Like I said, it's complicated. In order to properly explain why, I'm going to have to analyze the game from top to bottom. This means that there are going to be spoilers for both Q1 and Q2 in this video. So if you haven't played either and don't want to be spoiled, then I suggest you click off the video now and come back once you finish the game for yourself. Who knows, you might even end up liking them more than I did. Persona Q2 handles its story a bit differently than the first game. Unlike in the last game, the main protagonist is fixed. While it was cool that Persona Q1 allowed you to play as either Makoto or Narukami, it didn't really affect much in the grand scheme of things. It only really had an impact on the opening hours, and some scenes played out a bit differently. I'm not necessarily losing sleep over this change, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Our story begins with the Phantom Thieves going on a routine trip to Mementos. While the mission goes smoothly at first, things suddenly take a turn when Morgana suddenly loses control and drives the group into a movie screen. Upon waking up, the Phantom Thieves find themselves in a mysterious city. Before they can get some answers, the group is attacked by shadows and is forced to retreat into a nearby portal, transporting them into an empty movie theater. However, it's quickly revealed that they aren't alone, as they come across a few other people that are also trapped inside this theater. There's the cinema curator Nagi, the reserved film buff Hikari, and finally, there's the silent projectionist Doe. After some investigation, the group learns that the only exit is chained by four locks, and the only way to unlock the door is by venturing inside every movie and changing their outcomes to a happier ending. With each film successfully changed, Doe is able to create one of the keys needed to break the locks. As the Phantom Thieves explore each dungeon, they eventually come across both C's and the investigation team, who are also mysteriously transported into one of these movies. Not only that, but very early on, we find out that the female protagonist from Persona 3 Portable has also found herself 
trapped inside the theater, and teams up with the Phantom Thieves so that she can search for her comrades. And with that, the goal's in sight. It's up to the three teams to join forces so they can clear out the four labyrinths in order to return home. To those who've played the first game, you might be getting a little bit of deja vu. That's because, aside from a few specific details, the basic premise of Persona Q2 is very similar to the first game. But it doesn't just stop there, since not only does the story share the same basic setup, but even some narrative beats might feel very familiar if you've played the first Q game. However, there are enough fresh ideas here to allow the story to stand on its own two feet. For starters, every dungeon now features its own self-contained story. This lends Persona Q2 a more episodic feeling than the first game did, and I find it to be a lot more interesting as a result. These dungeons also serve a much stronger narrative purpose. But before I go into detail as to what those themes are and the quality of their execution, I think we should go over the gameplay aspect first, since there were some alterations made. The core combat mechanics of Persona Q2 are largely similar to what we had in the first game. To give a brief reminder, battles are executed in a somewhat similar fashion to the Etrian Odyssey series, but with a Persona twist. Battles take place in the first person perspective, and the number of active party members have been increased from the usual four to five party members. Just like in the earlier Persona games, the order in which your party members act is decided by their agility stat. While you might be tempted to load up your party with every powerhouse in the game, it might not be the best idea since the agility stat of those characters tend to be on the lower side. Though, there is a workaround to this. By exploiting an enemy's weakness, or by landing a critical hit, that character will be rewarded with a boost. When a party member is boosted, not only do their actions take priority above everyone, but their next skill will cost zero resources to execute. Additionally, in Persona Q2, certain skills deal more damage while boosted. Not only that, but baton passing has also been implemented as a way to transfer boost from one character to another. It costs two bars of your support meter to perform a baton pass, making it not as free flow as it was in Persona 5, but it still offers the player with some interesting decision making. If a party member gets a critical hit and earns a boost, you can then pass it to someone else who might be able to take advantage of that buff, whether that be to get out some emergency healing or to give your heavy hitters an extra advantage. But remember, baton pass still has a cost of its own, meaning you can't be too trigger happy with it. I really like the way Baton Pass was implemented here. While it's not the exact same as it was in P5, the core idea behind the mechanic is still there, just altered enough to fit within the already established combat system of the Q games. The boost mechanic is just as integral to the combat system as last time. What I really like about this system is that it allows for certain skills to always stay useful. While lower tier magic will be lacking in damage by the mid game, it can still be used to earn a boost. And since the SP cost of skills is much higher here than it is in the mainline Persona games, being able to cast powerful spells for free by abusing boost is a solid strategy for longer fights. Speaking of SP management, another major aspect of the combat is the sub-Persona system. Just like last time, on top of having a main Persona, every character is also able to equip a secondary Persona. While their main stats and affinities stay the same, sub-Personas grant the user with extra skills as well as increase their maximum HP and SP. The bonus HP and SP granted by a sub-Persona regenerates after every battle which alleviates some of the punishment for using high-cost skills. There are two methods of obtaining sub-personas. The first is by defeating rare shadows and FOEs, and the second is through fusion, which uses the same rules as Persona 3 and 4. Sub-personas are meant to complement the movesets and stats of the user. For example, giving someone with a high magic status sub-persona designed around physical attacks isn't the best idea since it ignores the character's best attributes. However, if you really want to put in the work, it is possible to adjust a character's role in battle through sub -personas personas and stat changing accessories. It's not something that I did personally, but the option is there for those looking to experiment. The elemental affinity chart has been changed to reflect the one used in Persona 5. This means that on top of having reworked light and dark skills, psychic and nuclear were also introduced, though gun skills are now treated the same as physical attacks. Another notable difference in the combat system is the change made to all out attacks. All out attacks in the first game were pretty random. They had a chance of popping up at the end of a turn if at least three of your party members were boosted, with the odds increasing if you had more characters boosted. This made all that attacks feel out of my control, since even if everyone was boosted, there was a chance that the prompt wouldn't show up. Q2 changes all out attacks to be more in line with the main Persona games. Whenever you hit an enemy's weakness, on top of getting a boost, they'll also be knocked down. Knock down every enemy, and there you go. This small change made to all out attacks make them inherently more rewarding, since it relies exclusively on the player's knowledge rather than being a reward for getting lucky. The final new combat mechanic to talk about is the unison attacks. Think of them as a precursor to Persona 5 Royals Showtimes. These are special team attacks that have a chance of occurring when you earn a boost without knocking down an enemy. 
Unison attacks all come with their own special effects to help distinguish them. These range from strong single target damage, splash damage, and even upgraded support on a few occasions. The unison attacks you'll get is determined by the current members in your active party, and more can be unlocked by completing side quests. Unison attacks are such a fun addition. They follow the rule of cool. Sure, unison attacks aren't complex or that interesting mechanically, but they easily make up for it in just how flashy they are. I love seeing how the different characters' personalities play off each other in these animations. As I said, the core of the combat system is largely the same as in the first game, but there are enough changes and new ideas to give Persona Q2 an extra edge over the original. However, because these games share a lot of similarities, Q2 still ends up falling into a lot of the same trappings. Let's run down the list real quick. To put it bluntly, Persona Q2 has a lot of fucking characters for you to pick from. If we include navigators, the game features a roster of over 25 different party members for you to mix and match. Want to build a team featuring every protagonist and for some reason can? Well, you can do that. Hell, you can even opt to exclude Joker from your party if you don't like the moveset he's rocking, though he's a mandatory party member when playing on risky mode. This, combined with the sub-Persona system, means that the possibilities for party customization are nearly limitless. You can can tailor your party around a multitude of different playstyles, and while this freedom is really nice to have, it comes with a few consequences. One of the issues I took with the first Persona Q game was the lack of an experience share. That game only featured 16 different party members, and all of them were available to you by the time you started the second dungeon. This made it incredibly difficult to experiment, since if you used one party composition for most of the game and wanted to change up your strategy, then you'd be forced to either grind up the new members or tough it out and deal with their lower stats. Of course, you you could always equip the backup party members with the Growth 3 accessory, but you needed to do a lot of grinding anyways to even afford one of those things, let alone enough to cover an entire backup party. To my utter shock, Persona Q2 still lacks any form of experience share, though there are a few systems in place to help mitigate this slightly. For starters, party members are now distributed a lot more evenly and are appropriately level scaled. It isn't until near the end of the third dungeon that you have access to every character in the game, so at the very least, you aren't as overwhelmed as last time. The character motivation system also exists to help mend this issue. Whenever you're about to enter a dungeon, there's a chance that some of your party members will be motivated. This grants them with quite a few bonuses, such as raising the extra HP and SP provided by a sub-persona, increasing their critical hit rate, and most importantly, increasing the amount of experience they earn at the end of a fight. However, this status doesn't last forever, since it'll go away upon leaving the dungeon. Another form of catch-up exists in the growth instances. These are consumable items that'll instantly bring one character up to Joker's level. While these items are incredibly useful, because of their scarcity, I found myself somewhat unwilling to use any of them for most of the game. The only time where I would pop a growth incense was just before a boss battle, since it would let my main damage dealers catch up in case they were benched for that dungeon. Excluding DLC, there were only about 10 of these items in the entire game, and there was no way in hell that I was going to waste any of them on a character that I might not even end up liking. Sure, I could always save scum or look up a party member's potential moveset online, but this doesn't just magic negate poor design choices. I just don't understand why there isn't a shared experience system. Clearly someone at Atlas thought this was a problem because of the inclusion of these catch-up mechanics, but it's the equivalent of putting a band-aid on a bullet wound. While I can appreciate that attempts were made to fix this issue, the solutions given aren't enough to nullify the problem. Another problem plaguing Q2's combat is its inconsistent difficulty curve. To give credit where it's due, for the most part, Q2 does a much better job at balancing the combat, for most of the run time anyways. In Persona Q1, light and dark magic were incredibly overpowered, since a good majority of enemies were weak to it. This made Naoto one of the best characters in the game, since she completely trivialized most random encounters. Instant kill magic received a huge nerf in Q2, which I believe was a necessary change since it forces you to actually play the game. However, that's not to say that there aren't any game-breaking strategies, because holy shit. While it takes a lot more effort to become as powerful as you were in Q1, it's still more than possible with enough time. Skill cards in Sacrifice Fusion are once again mainly to blame for this, though they function a bit differently this time around. Sacrifice Fusion lets you discard one sub-persona and allows you to give experience to another, though this is only free to do so once and you'll
you'll need to pay extra money if you want to sacrifice the same persona again. By using blank cards during a sacrifice fusion, you'll be able to transfer the highlighted skill onto that persona. However, now you're able to perform a sacrifice fusion on a party member's main persona. But if you want to transfer the highlighted skill, you're going to need to use a wild card during the fusion, which are scarcer than blank cards. It's the same idea as skill cards from the first game, but with a few extra steps added in an attempt to keep the mechanic balanced. And I say attempt very loosely. Being able to sacrifice fuse on your main persona is such a powerful tool, since if you really want to, you can give all of that experience to Joker. And since which personas you're allowed to fuse is determined by his current level, you'll be able to quickly gain access to strong skills. Sure, you're only allowed to sacrifice fuse once for free, but the payoff is well worth it since he's easily the most important party member. But that's not to say that the other characters lag far behind, because believe me, they more than pull their weight. Every party member in the game has access to an exclusive skill that fits in with their intended playstyle. While most of them are just alternate versions of already existing skills, what you can do with these abilities is just plain absurd. For example, Aegis comes with a passive skill that has a chance to nullify damage from the standard elements. This on its own is good, but if you combine this with the skill All Guard, which allows her to protect every party member for one turn, Runic Shield to increase the odds of her skill activating, an immunity buffer to potentially cover physical damage, and she easily becomes the best tank in the entire game. Akihiko is also a great party member for boss battles. Not only does he have one of the highest strength stats in the game, but his unique skill gives him the chance to activate physical skills twice in a row, including attacks such as Yoshitsune's Hasatobe. But this doesn't even compare to the amount of damage you can achieve with Makoto Yuki. Makoto's exclusive skill passively raises his elemental damage. What's important about this skill is that it stacks with the other element boosting skills, such as Nuke Boost boost and nuke turbo. Combine this with mind charge, sure a tensei, and maybe a debilitate for good measure, and watch in shock at just how much damage you can deal. <laughs> Yeah, Persona Q2 isn't exactly what I would call a balanced game, but to be fair, it does take a lot of effort and knowledge to get to the point where you're dealing this much damage. Despite how easy the combat can get, I honestly found it rather fun experimenting with different builds to see how much damage I could do. Blame it on my ape brain. I like big numbers, and the game gives me the tools needed to see even bigger numbers. Something that I find really weird about Persona Q2 is that the first dungeon is strangely unforgiving. Not only are your options limited, but the enemies here deal bucket loads of damage, and can even one-shot certain characters if you're unlucky. Even if you know all of the enemy's elemental weaknesses, you might not be able to finish the fight with an all-out attack before they end up getting a turn of their own. But this doesn't even compare to this dungeon's boss battle. Super Kamashita Man is insane. The difficulty spike of going from the random encounters to this fight is absurd. Not only does Kamashita Man have powerful attacks, but he also gets multiple turns which he can use to effortlessly wipe out your party. But the worst part about this fight is that he's able to put party members to sleep with one of his attacks. If you're unlucky enough for this to happen to your line guard user, then you may as well just reset the game. Kamoshina Man, without a doubt, is the most challenging boss fight in the entire game. In all honesty, I don't find most of the bosses to be as difficult as other people say. Not even the optional super boss gave me much trouble. But Kamoshina Man is the sole exception to this, since it was the only time where I felt it was necessary to grind beforehand so I can go into the fight with some better skills. Even with the preparations, I still struggled a lot, and felt as though I only won because I got lucky and landed poor poison. At the very least, things started to get more comfortable by the time I entered the second area, but god damn I don't think I ever want to do this fight again. While the combat mechanics are solid, something that I was dreading going into Q2 was the dungeon crawling. If you've seen my video on the first game, then you'd know that while I liked a lot of the ideas present, I wasn't a huge fan of their overall execution. I thought that the later dungeons were far too complex for their own good, and ended up becoming more frustrating than interesting as a result. However, much to my surprise, I ended I ended up enjoying the dungeons here a lot more than I was expecting to. Just like last time, there are a total of 5 different dungeons to explore, which all vary in terms of length and complexity. While Q1 features dungeons inspired by festival exhibits, Q2 instead takes inspiration from different film genres. Kamoshida Man is the superhero genre, Junesic Land is from disaster movies, Aegis is sci-fi, and finally, Hikari is for musical theater. The only outlier to this is the final dungeon, which more so reflects the aesthetic of a movie theater rather than a film. The core exploration mechanics, much like the combat, is practically unchanged. Dungeons are presented in a first-person perspective, and encounters are completely random, though you're given 
given a countdown prior to an encounter to act as a warning. You still need to manually draw out your own map on the bottom screen, with auto-mapping acting as a way to cut down on the busy work. New icons have also been introduced explicitly for dungeon hazards to make it easier to keep track of them on your map. Power spots have also been altered slightly, though it's such a negligible change that I wonder why they even bothered. When searching a power spot, you can now decide if you want to do a thorough search to possibly yield more items at the cost of increasing the encounter rate. There's no reason to ever not do a thorough search. The reward greatly outweighs the risk since the rare items sell for a lot of money and are used to unlock more equipment in the shop. Also, it's not like the encounters you get from a thorough search are that much harder than the regular ones, so I struggle to see why this was a necessary change. Maybe it's because you still have a 60 item limit on your inventory. I really don't understand why this was needed. I get wanting to limit the number of items you can use in combat, but I don't think that this should also apply to the treasures enemies drop. SMT4 managed to do this just fine, so I don't see why the Q games couldn't do the same. It's not a deal breaker, but I wish that there was a way to upgrade your inventory. Something that was immediately apparent to me was how dungeons are structured a bit differently than previously. Floors are now much shorter, but make up for it in their quantity. While it's overall the same amount of content per dungeon as in Q1, it's more evenly spread out. In the first Q game, it oftentimes felt as though I wasn't making any progress in a dungeon because of how long it took to clear out floors. While shortcuts did help mitigate this slightly, I felt as though certain floors went on far longer than they should, though this was admittedly only an issue during the latter half of the game. The dungeons in Q2 have a much smoother difficulty curve in comparison, starting off rather simple and gradually raising their complexity with each floor cleared. This is a bit of a double-edged sword. On one hand, this makes the exploration far less frustrating than it was in the first game, but I can't help but feel as though the players that were really into Q1's dungeons might feel a bit left out. While I personally thought the game went a little bit overboard with its gimmicks, there's no denying that there was a section of the player base that really enjoyed what that game had to offer. Those players might see the simpler dungeons as a bit of a step back, and when taking that perspective into account, I can see why some players might find the dungeons to be a little bit of a letdown. To a certain extent, I can agree. Some of the gimmicks introduced aren't tapped into their fullest potential. A standout example to me are the rotating fences in the second dungeon. You're meant to flip switches so you can have the fence face the way needed to progress further. This sounds like an interesting concept for a puzzle, but the game doesn't really do much with this idea. It's essentially the equivalent of a door that can only be opened with a nearby key. I think it would have been more interesting if after flipping on one switch, multiple fences would change their orientation. This would make you have to consider their current direction, your position on the map, and knowledge of where you can find the other switches. From then on, you can craft a puzzle around the idea of flipping the correct switch at the correct time to progress further. In the way it's handled now, all you have to do is flip one switch and the puzzle is solved. This isn't the only area where this is the case either, and I can't help but feel as though a good majority of the dungeon gimmicks go underutilized. If you're looking for the same kind of brain-racking experience that the first Persona Q provided, then you're probably going to be left wanting more. For me personally, while I enjoy dungeons that require me to think at least a little bit, I thought that the original game went a bit too overboard. Q2 strikes a much better balance at being both fun and interesting, even though I think some of the puzzle elements could have used a bit more work. Of course, you can't talk about the dungeons without mentioning FOEs. FOEs are powerful enemies that are visible during exploration. Much like the dungeons themselves, FOEs range in terms of complexity and difficulty. They primarily act as obstacles you need to take into consideration during the exploration. However, with enough preparation, it's possible to kill an FOE. Not only does this reward you with a good chunk of experience and rare items, but it also temporarily removes the FOE from the field, making exploration much easier. FOEs are much more forgiving here than they were in the first game. This boils down to the fact that there are far fewer times where FOE manipulation is required for dungeon progression, and in the few times where it is necessary, there's a bit more room for error and there's usually a shortcut nearby to reset their current position without having to leave the dungeon. That's not to say FOEs aren't a threat in Q2, far from it, since getting caught by one can result in a quick death if you aren't careful. Every FOE has a unique movement pattern and behavior. Occasionally, rooms will even include more than one type of FOE in them, so you can't move around too recklessly. There's nothing on the level of the Evil Spirit Club or Inaba Pride exhibit from the first game, but there are a few times where FOEs are used as tools to solve puzzles. This mainly applies to the final dungeon of the game, since the FOEs are used to destroy debris blocking your path or to step on switches to turn on or off fans. As a whole, FOEs are far less annoying than they were previously, and are more so treated as mobile obstacles. While I personally find this to be an improvement, it can be argued that simplicity is a change for the worse. The best word I can use to describe dungeons in Persona Q2 is forgiving. This may or may not
not come with some negative connotations depending on the type of player that you are. I can imagine some Etrian Odyssey fans not liking the dungeon design that much, and I can understand that. Part of the appeal of that franchise was that it was a dungeon crawler designed for the more hardcore player. While I haven't played the games for myself just yet, from what I've heard, the complex dungeon design is a huge aspect of that series' identity. Persona Q2 has a lot more interest in appealing to Persona 5 fans more so than Etrian Odyssey fans because of how much it scales back the complexity of its dungeons. It ultimately boils down to what you're looking for out of your dungeon crawlers. If you're looking for a game that has a bit more complex dungeons than other Mega 10 titles, then the ones in Q2 have definitely got you covered. However, if you want your exploration to be just as, if not more challenging than the combat, then you're going to be left wanting more. For me personally, I like the dungeons, but feel as though they might play it a bit too safe in a few areas. Just like in the first game, Persona Q2 features a myriad of side quests for you to tackle. There are 45 special screenings in total, and each of them rewards you with a few gameplay bonuses. These range from exclusive materials to sell to Theodore so you can buy new equipment, unlocking special fusions, and gaining access to brand new unison attacks, which is the most common reward. Every time you finish a set of side quests, you'll be challenged to a fight by one of the Velvet Room attendants. By coming out on top, you'll receive even more rewards, such as increasing the maximum number of sub-personas you can hold, allowing the boost state to carry over to other battles, and increasing the amount of experience earned when finishing the fight with an all-out attack. This is also how you unlock the character's ultimate personas, which are very useful for the final area of the game. Not only does this upgrade shed most of your weaknesses, but every party member's exclusive skill is upgraded. This happens automatically for the protagonists, but the other characters will need to be at least level 55 to awaken. Once you finish all of the side quests in the game, you'll unlock the game's ultimate boss fight where you fight all five Velvet Room attendants sequentially. As I already mentioned, this boss isn't very difficult, since at this point in the game, you can easily deal enough damage damage to straight up one shot each phase, but I'd be lying if I said that it didn't at least feel good to do so. You're heavily encouraged to tackle as many side quests as you can since the rewards you earn are very helpful throughout the game. However, the quality of these missions leaves a bit to be desired. Most of them boil down to variations of the same ideas. You're placed in an isolated section of the dungeon and are tasked with either finding an item or killing a specific enemy. There are a few times where this mold is broken and they're easily the most memorable quests in the game. A standout example to me was the quest that tasks you with finding the fake police officer in the first dungeon. You need to talk to every cop in the area and use the information given to you to determine who's lying. I also enjoy the quest that asks you to find an item and return it to the dungeon entrance in a limited number of steps. I wish the game had more side quests that tested the player in ways that the main campaign never does. The ones we have right now are passable, but I feel as though the idea could have been taken further. They're at the very least worth completing for the rewards, but I'd be lying if I didn't say that it was pretty weak content over Overall. Overall, I like the gameplay of Persona Q2, though I'd only call it a marginal improvement over the first. While I can appreciate that some of the messier aspects of the gameplay have been cleaned up a bit, unfortunately, there's still a lot of glaring issues that weren't addressed. The game's combat balance is still a complete joke, which results in a very inconsistent difficulty curve. Experimenting with different party compositions is discouraged due to the lack of an experience share system, and the remedies that are in place aren't enough to mitigate this, and the optional content isn't that fulfilling. Something that I do appreciate about Q2 is how it manages to tighten up the dungeon design without sacrificing too much of what made the first game interesting, though this comes at the cost of leaving some of the puzzle elements underdeveloped. But I'd personally rather play a game that's fun than one that's frustrating, even if it does come at the cost of difficulty. With all of that out of the way, all that's left to cover is the rest of Q2's story. While I think the gameplay here is an improvement over the first one, the same can't exactly be said about its story. I actually find it to be a bit worse in some ways, believe it or not. In order to explain why, I'm going to have to start talking about spoilers, so here's your warning now. If what you've seen of Persona Q2 looks interesting to you, then I highly recommend you stop watching the video now and come back once you've played the game for yourself. I'm more so saying this out of a formality since, let's be real here, there isn't exactly a whole lot to spoil. To give a brief reminder, the story centers around the Phantom Thieves, the investigation team, and C's finding themselves trapped in this mysterious theater, with the only way out being this chained up door. Most of the story the story revolves around the journey through the different labyrinths so they can collect the four keys needed to unlock the door and return to the respective time periods. When you break it down, it's the exact same premise as the first Q game, with a couple of differences in some details. However, much like the core gameplay, while there are a few improvements made to the narrative, it ends up falling into a lot of the same traps. 
I'm mainly referring to the writing. Once again, the characterization of the party members leaves a bit to be desired. Nearly every party member in the game has been boiled down to one or two recognizable traits. A lot of the depth that made people attached to these characters is absent, and all that we're left with are a couple of running gags that don't really do much for me. And I get it, there are over 30 plus characters in Persona Q2. It's completely unreasonable to expect all of them to be as fleshed out as they were in their respective games. However, even when taking this into consideration, I still find it to be very distracting. I'll say it before and I'll say it again, I don't like fan service just for the sake of it, and prefer my stories to have a purpose beyond just combining things that I already like. But with that said, Persona Q2 does do much better in this regard than the first game. To me, one of the most disappointing aspects of the original Persona Q was the lack of meaningful interaction between the Persona 3 and Persona 4 cast. While these characters did interact with each other, it was nothing more than reciting ongoing jokes. There were a couple of times where this wasn't the case, but for the most part, what you see is what you get. This isn't entirely true in Persona Q2. A good majority of the side quests are used to flesh out the bonds between certain characters. The writers take advantage of the established personalities of these party members and have them connect with each other through their shared interests or similar backgrounds. The execution isn't perfect, mind you. I would have liked it if these were ongoing side stories rather than one-off events, but what is here is still better than what we had before. But this isn't the only complaint I have with the writing, sadly. Something that Persona Q2 undoubtedly does worse than the original is in its cutscene pacing, mainly in just how much filler dialogue there is. This is an incredibly chatty game, even more so than Persona 5 was. However, unlike that game, a lot of Q2's dialogue doesn't serve much of a purpose, and is intrusive to the game's flow. When exploring a dungeon, the gameplay will constantly grind to a halt so the characters can give their opinion on the current area. Usually, I wouldn't mind this sort of thing, but its execution is what I take issue with. Not only does this happen far too frequently, but the characters usually don't have anything meaningful to say. Of course, there are a few exceptions to this, but for the most part, the characters say nothing of note. But this doesn't even compare to when new party members join the team, since not only does every new character need to give their introduction one by one, but every single current team member feels the need to react to it. This is at its worst when the Persona 3 characters join the team. Letting the Phantom Thieves interact with Cs? I can accept that. But also having the invest investigation team take part in this is going way too far. Like, come on guys, we've seen the investigation team and C's meet each other for the first time on three separate occasions at this point. It's not nearly as cool or as interesting as you think it is. While there are some good moments between these three casts, a lot of these moments end up feeling like a slog. It's especially bad during the last half of the game because of the sheer number of characters, and it ends up dragging on forever. Something that I do like about Q2's story is that the dungeons all have a strong thematic link now. Narrative wise. Every dungeon in the game comes with its own mini story that tackles the themes of individualism and self confidence in their own unique ways. Junesic Land, for example, tackles the idea of herd mentality. All of the herbivores are afraid to speak their true feelings and only go with the majority vote because they're afraid of being shunned from the group. Aegis is about a robot that gains the ability to think freely, but is seen as a malfunction by those around her. The core idea behind all of these stories, and Persona Q2's narrative as a whole, is to not shape yourself around what is considered the norm if it doesn't bring you happiness, and that you should be proud of who you are regardless of what others might think of you. I think this is a good message to have, especially in a game starring a cast of characters in their adolescence who are still figuring out their place in the world. However, Q2's message doesn't quite stick the landing for me. This is because the main theme of the game ties directly into Hikari, who's a character I don't think got the development necessary to make it have a lasting impact. Hikari doesn't get much screen time throughout the game, and it isn't until the fourth dungeon that her character starts to be explored. Explored. While I enjoy the musical theater presentation of the dungeon, it ultimately ends up being an exposition dump of Hikari's backstory and personal struggles. We learn that Hikari has aspirations of becoming a film director, though throughout most of her life, she was told by her peers and family that it was a dream not worth pursuing and ostracized her for it. That is, everyone except her father, who fully believed in her aspirations, and was the only one in her life to encourage her. However, due to a misunderstanding, Hikari would go on to believe that even her own father turned his back on her, which sent her down a downward spiral of depression. This is where Nagi steps in, whose true identity is the goddess Enlil. Enlil has power over the collective unconscious, and is attempting to use that power to give people an escape from their struggles, trapping them inside of the theaters so that they won't need to face the hardships of the real world. Do is also meant to represent Hikari's father, and his personality is reflective of her current mental state and how she perceived her dad. 
The story surrounding Hikari is pretty interesting, but as I said, all of it is dumped on us near the end of the game. It's true that the thematic link has been present throughout most of the runtime, but I'll be honest, I don't really care about Hikari that much as a character. This is primarily due to the lack of interaction we had with her. Prior to the fourth dungeon, Hikari is pretty much a non-entity. I get that this is indicative of her closed off personality caused by her emotional trauma, but there aren't many Hikari focused scenes before this revelation. This might surprise some of you, but I actually think Persona Sona Q1 did a better job at this. Regardless of what you thought about them as characters, Zen and Rei had much more time dedicated to them throughout the game. Not only were there side quests involving them, but what really helped was that they actively joined in on the dungeon crawling. Since Zen and Rei were integral to the story of that game, the time spent endearing us towards those characters made their personal struggles have a lot more impact. Hikari doesn't get the same benefit, and the story suffers as a result. She feels less like a character, and more so like a vessel meant to represent the game's core themes. I'm not trying to discredit those who find Hikari's struggle relatable or anything. If what's here now is enough to get you to feel sympathy for her, then that's good. However, I would have liked to have seen more done with her character, since I find her to be a bit on the bland side. And since the plot ultimately revolves around her personal struggles, I think that it's a bit of a problem. It's not like it even matters that much, since the game's events are wiped from everyone's memories by the end of it. And that's all for Persona Q2. If you can't tell, I'm pretty mixed on this game, but I lean more on the side of liking it. Though, with every step forward Q2 takes, there's another aspect of the game that holds it back. The core combat mechanics are still fun to play around with, and some of the new tools introduced help give Q2 that slight edge over the first game. Though the difficulty balance still isn't very good since the game starts off incredibly brutal only to get easier the further you go along. Dungeons are a lot less frustrating to travel through, but this comes at the cost of certain ideas not being fully developed. Some of the gameplay issues I took with the original game were addressed, but at the same time, a good portion of the obvious flaws went untouched. The same can be said about the story. Thematically, it's much stronger and attempts to tell a much more ambitious story, but in its execution, some of these ideas don't fully stick the landing and in some ways end up being worse than the original. Characterization still leaves me feeling very mixed, and some cutscenes drag on far longer than they should due to repetitious dialogue. However, I'm hesitant to call the story bad, because the good qualities it does have shine through on multiple occasions. I have a very love-hate relationship with Persona Q2, but I don't regret the time that I put into it. I'm at the very least glad that I gave it a shot, and while there is stuff that I enjoy, I don't think this is a game I'm going to be revisiting anytime soon. Well, this is it. Out of all the games I've covered on this channel so far, Persona 5 is by far the most requested one, and for good reason too. When the game first launched back in late 2016 in Japan and April of 2017 for us Western players, the game received overwhelming praise from both critics and fans alike. People were aware of Persona 4. Everyone played Persona 5 when it came out. This, combined with the inclusion of Persona 5's protagonist Joker in the long-running Super Smash Bros. franchise, helped fully bring the Persona series into the mainstream. The momentum didn't stop with that either. Much like Persona 4, P5 received a handful of spin-off titles, a manga run, a bad anime, and multiple stage plays that I still really want to see. Much like the previous Persona games, Persona 5 would eventually see an enhanced re-release titled Persona 5 Royal. This version of the game brings many changes and additions to the table. These range from some mechanical changes all the way up to the addition of a new school semester featuring an entirely new palace as well as the addition of new confidants and characters. For all intents and purposes, this is the definitive version of Persona 5 to play if you're interested in picking up the game yourself. Just like always, there's going to be full spoilers for both the main story as well as all the game's confidants. This is your spoiler warning now. I like to go in depth with my reviews of games, so if you wish to go into Persona 5 spoiler free, then I suggest you click off the video now and play the game yourself before watching. But before we jump right in, I believe I should explain why it took me so long to get to this game. It's honestly a combination of a few things. As of right now, Persona 5 Royal is only available on the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5 through backwards compatibility. When I recorded Persona 4 for my video on that game, I ended up getting burned because right after getting all my footage, the game received a Steam port the following day. 
That's right, I'm still not over that. I'm mostly kidding, of course. The main reason is actually far more complex than you might first think. I started my Persona retrospective with Persona 3 FES on the PlayStation 2. If we're counting Eternal Punishment as its own game, that means I started on the fourth major installment in the Persona series. Since then, I've not only reviewed every other mainline Persona installment, but I've also covered a few of the spin-offs, talked about my feelings on Persona 3 Portable, and have also dipped my toes into other Megami Tensei titles on this channel. I bring this up not to say that my opinion should be considered more valid, but I feel the need to mention this so you all understand my perspective. I'm a huge fan of Megami Tensei as a whole, but I wouldn't consider myself to be a blind fanboy. These videos have always been about my personal opinion on the subject in question, complimenting the highs and criticizing the lows. I intend on giving Persona 5 the same treatment because while I think highly of the game, there are plenty of issues that hold the game back in a lot of areas. It's not a big deal if you end up disagreeing with my opinion, and I'm totally up to continuing the discussion to reach a new understanding. I just want to remind people to be respectful of what others have to say on the topic at hand. I've never had an issue with this in the past, but I've seen a lot of discussion about Persona 5 devolve into needless insults. Just because someone disagrees with another's perspective, that isn't an excuse to treat them poorly. With that being said, let's get started, shall we? Unlike the other games in the series, Persona 5 is very different when it comes to how the narrative is framed. The game opens up very late into the journey, with the attempted escape and eventual arrest of a teenage boy named Ren Amamiya, leader of the group known as the Phantom Thieves. Most of the plot is told through Ren's interrogation at the hands of prosecutor Sai Nijima, where hinted that the Phantom Thieves are wanted for many crimes that have been committed all over Japan, ranging from the possession of weapons to even something as major as suspected manslaughter. Since Ren has been drugged up with truth serum and has no way out of this situation, he's forced to recount how things ended up the way they did. This is when we're dropped back to early April to witness the origins of the Phantom Thieves and learn exactly what's going on here. Much like the previous protagonists, Ren Amamiya is a transfer student who's going to be attending Shujin Academy for one year. Unlike the other characters, however, Ren is attending this school due to his criminal record. Before the game began, Ren was charged for assault when he tried to save a woman from being harassed by a drunken politician. Things go sour, however, when the man injures himself and sues Ren for assault, abusing the power that comes with his status to pay off the woman in question. As a result, Ren is put on probation for one year and is expelled from his current high school. Shujin Academy is the only school willing to accept Ren, and even so, they're only doing it to improve their public image. Before Ren can even attend his first day at school, things take a strange turn when an app that appeared on his phone ends up transporting him and another student named Ryuji Sakamoto to an alternate reality known as the Metaverse. At first, everything seems normal, that is, until the boys discover that their school has been replaced by a giant castle. Before they can find out what exactly is going on here, the two boys are captured and thrown into the dungeons under the order of the supposed ruler, Suguru Kamoshida. But this isn't exactly the same Kamoshida from the real world. More on that in a second. This Shadow Kamoshida attempts to execute Ryuji and Ren for trespassing in the castle, but the sight of Ryuji suffering at the hands of a greater power triggers something inside of Ren. A mysterious voice rings inside his head. A white mask appears on the boy's face, and with a firm resolve, Ren tears away the facade he wears around others, exposing his true self. <laughs> The concept of a persona in this game stems from the idea of being wronged or taken advantage of emotionally or physically, and wanting to rebel against that. When a character awakens to their persona, we see that their outfit is altered to represent what that character's idea of a rebel is. All this is topped off with a mask that they need to remove in order to summon their persona. As I mentioned with Ren, this is supposed to symbolize the idea of discarding the mask you wear around others and living as your true self. It's pretty obvious symbolism when compared to the other games, but man does it look cool when a character awakens to their persona. Anyways, after Ren awakens to his persona, he and Ryuji make their escape from the castle, but not before coming across this mysterious cat-like creature named Morgana. While Morgana doesn't have all of his memories, he does prove himself to be useful since he has a bit of an idea as to what's going on here. Much like the Midnight Channel from Persona 4, the Metaverse hosts shadows of people in the real world. Where things begin to differ is actually what these shadows are meant to represent. In Persona 4, and by extension Persona 2, shadows are solely the manifestation of suppressed qualities of an individual 
Usually these are aspects of someone that they bury deep down in their subconscious and are unwilling to accept as part of themselves. In Persona 5's case, a shadow represents the warped desire of an individual. Depending on the severity of one's distortion, these shadows can be complemented with these massive areas known as palaces. These palaces and what's inside of them are based on the ruler's views. For example, Kamoshida views Shujin Academy as his castle and himself as the ruler. The students inside are his subjects and the teachers act as his guards. But what exactly does this all mean in the context of the real world? What's going on with Kamoshida that's causing his desires to be distorted to begin with? After Returning to the real world, we eventually learn of rumors that Kamoshida is abusing his power in order to take advantage of the students at Shujin. Because of his reputation of being a former Olympic level athlete, the fact that he's able to bring Shujin Academy a good name, and his position of power as a teacher, he's able to get away with some pretty heinous shit. We learn that Kamoshida has been physically abusing the students on the volleyball team, as well as making sexual advances towards the female students. It's unknown how long this has been going on for, but it's implied to have been happening for a long time at the very least. The students are powerless to stand up against Kamoshida out of fear of either being abused or even expelled, and the faculty is letting his actions slide due to not wanting to tarnish the school's reputation. But there is a way for Ren and the others to put a stop to Kamoshida's actions. Everyone's distorted desires have a source known as a treasure. As explained by Morgana, if someone's treasure is removed from their palace, then their palace ruler will forcibly have a change of heart and attempt to repent for their crimes. This method is risky, however, because if something happens to the ruler's shadow, then it will have an effect on the real-world counterpart. In the worst-case scenario, this could result in death. But with no better options, this is a risk that the team is willing to take. I know that this is probably a lot to take in if you're unfamiliar with this game, but what I gave was just the general information needed to understand the premise of the game. In actuality, this information is spread over the course of the first 10 hours of the game. Persona 5's first dungeon can be viewed as the origin of the Phantom Thieves group while acting as the game's basic tutorial. We get the introduction of the first few party members and have their motivations established. The Phantom Thieves, as a group, have the goal of reforming society by changing the hearts of corrupt individuals. Mainly, they focus on targeting people who are abusing their powers to make life miserable for others, with the only rule being that the team needs to unanimously agree with who they're going to target next. Persona 4 had an admittedly very long-winded intro that wasn't to everyone's liking. I personally didn't mind it because I found the mystery intriguing enough to keep me engaged, but I understand where people are coming from with their complaints. Persona 5 actively works to fix that pacing issue Persona 4 had by splicing in more gameplay and spreading this information out more evenly. Within the first hour of Persona 5, you get a taste of what the battle mechanics are like, as well as a teaser to the dungeon design. Sure, it's not a lot and it's mostly on rails, but it's a far more exciting way to start the journey than having to wait like three hours to get to the first battle. Come to think of it, Persona 5 puts in a lot of work to be the antithesis of Persona 4 in many ways. While replaying the game for this video, I took note as to how similar yet different P5 is when compared to its predecessor. Persona 4 is about a city kid who moves to the countryside to live with his uncle and cousin for one year. He is greeted with open arms by his new home, makes fast friends, and is overall just in a welcoming environment. That is, until he ends up getting involved with the Inaba murder cases, of course. Persona 5, on the other hand, is about a country kid who, after attempting to help someone in danger, is punished for that heroism because he stepped out of line. This causes him to be expelled from his old school, forced to move to the big city where he has to live in the attic of a coffee shop, and is treated as an outcast at his new school because word gets out about his criminal record. When comparing the settings of these two games, the difference is night and day, despite how familiar the idea of playing as a transfer student is. That's not to say that one is inherently better than the other, I just thought it was worth bringing up the observation. As much as I really want to dive into the minutia of Persona 5 story now, I believe I should cover the gameplay aspects first. Much like the previous two installments, Persona 5 splits its main gameplay into two halves. There's the social simulator aspect where you spend your time improving your social stats and working on confidants, this game's version of social links. Then there's the dungeon crawling aspect of the game where you either infiltrate palaces to steal the ruler's treasure or explore mementos, which is a dungeon consisting of randomly generated floors. The same basic DNA still exists in Persona 5, so I'll mostly be covering what exactly this game does to stand out from Persona 4. Persona 5 introduces two brand new elemental affinities, Psychic and Nuclear, while also seeing the return of firearms in combat. The game goes out of its way to justify that the Phantom Thieves aren't using real guns, however. There's an explanation early on in the game that the guns you're using in combat are actually just airsoft guns, but due to the fact that the metaverse is linked to human cognition, they behave as real guns. In the original Persona 5, guns would only have a certain amount of ammo to them that you could spend per visit into the metaverse. This could be replenished if you crafted ammo boxes in the real world before heading inside. I always thought that this was a strange limitation because the game explains that these fake guns only work because of human cognition. 
Question. If someone were to point a convincing looking model gun to you, your brain would fill in the blanks and you'll assume that it's actually real. It's a very believable explanation. That's why it always struck me as odd that the ammo for the guns didn't replenish in between fights. Chances are, if someone were to point a firearm at you, there's a high chance that it's loaded. So through the rules of human cognition, wouldn't guns always be loaded at the start of battle? Basically what I'm saying here is that guns were pretty useless in the original Persona 5 outside of knocking down enemies that were weak to gun skills. Clearly, someone at Atlas thought the same thing because Persona 5 Royal fixes this issue. Much like the standard weaponry, every member of the Phantom Thieves has a firearm exclusive to them. Ryuji uses shotguns, Makoto uses revolvers, and so on. They all function pretty identically aside from ammo capacity and damage. The party members An and Haru are the exception to this rule as their gun attacks attack all enemies instead of needing to target them individually, but it isn't exactly a game changer. Guns do count as their own elemental affinity as well, meaning that new Persona skills specifically made to deal gun damage have been introduced. They function the same as physical skills, meaning that they cost HP to use and are also affected by the physical buffing skill Charge. They can be pretty powerful attacks, especially the mid-game skill Triple Down, which sees you dealing gun damage to all enemies three times. When it comes to the actual battle mechanics, things are very familiar yet different. In case you need a reminder, the modern Persona games use a modified version of the press turn battle system called the One More system. Whenever you strike an enemy weakness or land a critical hit on an enemy, you'll be able to immediately perform another action with the character. When all enemies are knocked down, you're granted the opportunity to perform an all-out attack. On the surface, it's pretty similar as to how the previous games functioned, but there's a lot done here to give Persona 5 an identity of its own. New to Persona 5 is that whenever you gain a One More, you can perform a baton pass to switch who you're currently in control of regardless of turn order. You can chain up to three baton passes if you play your cards right, with each time you switch characters increasing the amount of damage you can dish out. This is such a great idea. There's a lot you can do with baton passing, such as starting a chain of passes and ending off with a healing spell in order to boost its effectiveness. Or you can end off your passing chain with an attack all skill to really rake in the damage. A lot can be done with baton passing if you're willing to get creative with the ability, but its primary use is to set up all that attacks. Another idea that Persona 5 brings back from earlier titles is Demon Negotiation. When you knock down every enemy on the field, you'll enter what's known as a holdup. During a holdup, you can either perform an all-out attack or start a conversation with one of the demons on the battlefield. This system has been simplified and streamlined for the better in my opinion. You still have the general idea of appealing to the demon's specific personality trait in order to convince them to join your party, but it's far easier to do so now since there isn't an overwhelming amount of contact options. Demons now only have one personality type and you select your answer from a small list. Just pick whatever the demon would like to hear, and there you go. Something that I always hated about the earlier Persona games was that the negotiation system was far too complex for its own good. For the sake of not repeating too much of what I said in those videos, I thought that there was too much trial and error involved with the contact system. I go into it a lot more in my Persona 1 and 2 videos, so you can get my full thoughts there. Persona 5, while making the contact system more limited, makes the process of getting new Personas far faster, and is just more enjoyable overall. I also find this to be an improvement over the shuffle time mechanic from P3 and 4. In those games, you had to play a mini game in order to gain new personas, and while it got the job done, it wasn't nearly as engaging as actually talking to the demons. Persona 4 Golden tried to make shuffle time more interesting with the sweep bonus mechanic, but I still prefer the way it was handled in this game. Another mechanic introduced to Persona 5 are technical attacks. When you inflict an enemy with a status ailment, depending on which attack you used after, you can follow it up with a technical hit. For example, let's say you cast a fire spell to burn an enemy. If you then use a wind or nuclear attack, you'll deal out bonus damage. Damage. In Persona 5 Royal, technical attacks have a chance of knocking down an enemy, which could potentially lead into getting a one more. I personally didn't rely on technical attacks as much as I did with just exploiting weaknesses, but they could really help when taking down a powerful enemy. I found them to be at their most useful early on in the game when my party had a very limited skill selection. Persona 5 adds a lot to the already established formula introduced in Persona 3, making this by far the most expressive and deep combat system in the Persona series so far. I still think I prefer the press turn mechanics from the mainline SMT games, but there's a lot of fun that can be had when you chain together a string of baton passes to completely decimate your foes. However, Persona 5 Royal suffers from one major issue that could be considered a fatal flaw depending on who you ask. Much like Persona 2 Innocent Sin, Persona 5 Royal's Achilles heel lies in the fact that the game is far, far too easy. The original Persona 5 was already a game that fans found to be much easier than the previous two installments, but Persona 5 Royal, with the new additions and tweaks made to the combat system, absolutely suffers from one of the most inconsistent difficulty curves I've seen in a while. This is one of those games that starts off rather challenging, then gets 
gets easier and easier with each passing palace. An idea that's introduced at the start of the second dungeon are persona traits. Think of them as passive abilities that every persona has access to. These traits range from increasing the success rate of ailments landing, reducing the SP cost of certain skills, or even just flat out increasing how much damage certain skills can do. There's a pretty decent selection of persona traits, and you can transfer any trait onto any persona when you fuse them. This allows for some pretty decent customization when you're trying to go for a specific persona build. Every party member also has their own unique trait, such as Morgana's ability to boost the effectiveness of healing spells, and Yusuke's trait to increase your party's evasion against physical attacks. Kichi Joji is an area that's unlocked after you finish the second palace. In this area, you can play darts and billiards with your party members to upgrade your baton pass and technical damage respectively. Not only that, but by visiting the jazz club on certain days, you can actually teach your party members skills that are completely outside of their skill tree. Ever wanted to give Morgana a skill like debilitate or on the passive skill spellmaster? All you need to do is just invite that party member to the jazz club and bada boom. It doesn't end there for customization either, because certain accessories now have skills attached to them, so even if you miss out on the jazz club drinks, you can still get some pretty powerful skills to your party member at the cost of losing an accessory slot. But that's not even what I consider to be the main game breaker of Persona 5. Introduced in Persona 4 was the idea of your social links having more of a gameplay impact than just boosted experience. This was exclusively used for the party members. By ranking up your social links with your teammates, you can gain new abilities for them such as the opportunity to instantly cure status ailments, provide a follow-up attack, and protect the protagonist against an attack that would kill them. This was a great idea, because it gave more of an incentive for the player to actually work on the social links, and was a much more interesting benefit than what we had prior. Persona 5 not only brings this idea back, but also expands on it by giving every single confidant their own unique ability tree. The confidant with the character Shinya, for example, will unlock new gun-related skills, such as the ability to perform a special shot to automatically down one enemy, start the battle with a gun-based all-out attack, and even allowing Joker's bullets to ignore enemy resistances. This is a great way to convince players to max out as many confidants as they can, because not only are you getting boosted experience when you fuse a persona, but you're also upgrading your character's combat abilities at the same time. As good as an idea as this is, the problem arises with the lasting effect these skills have on the difficulty. It's honestly shocking at how over powered some of these confidant abilities are. Mishima's confidant focuses on awarding the player with the ability to earn double experience at the end of battles. Hifumi gives the player access to switch party members during combat and also eventually lets you earn double money at the end of fights. But this is only scratching the surface. The confidant with the new characters Maruki and Kasumi provides some incredibly powerful buffs. Maruki specifically gives Joker the chance to not only instantly cure himself of status ailments, even if it's not his turn, but also the ability to start off a random encounter with both charge and concentrate. I'm not entirely sure what the success rate of these skills are, but they activate far more often than they should considering how powerful this buff is. Kasumi's confidant pretty much makes it impossible for an enemy to ambush you. You not only get the ability to straight up just dodge enemies, but you also gain access to a skill that allows you to ambush enemies from a much further distance while also starting off the battle with status ailments on enemies. But these skills don't even compare to what I consider to be the two most powerful confidant abilities. Once you reach rank 7 with Ryuji, you unlock his instant kill ability. When you're exploring a palace or mementos, by holding L2, you're able to view how powerful the shadows are. This is indicated by their colored outline that changes depending on the player's current level. If a shadow is outlined in green, that means you'll be able to instantly kill it without having to engage in battle. However, you're still awarded with money and experience points, meaning that you can earn some fast cash and quick make yourself incredibly overpowered. While this does make grinding go by much faster, the problem is that now the level balance of your characters is going to be completely out of control. In the later half of the game, you'll be able to instantly kill almost every enemy aside from boss battles. The last one I want to bring special mention to is the Strength Confidant with the Velvet Twins, Caroline and Justine. Their Confidant functions exactly like Margaret's did from Persona 4. This means that to rank them up, you'll need to fulfill fusion requests. Their Confidant tree focuses on locking new methods of fusion, starting you off with only the basic two Persona fusion before gradually giving you new tools to play around with, such as itemizing a Persona into a new piece of equipment, or sacrificing one Persona to give its experience and a random skill to another. In the original Persona 5, maxing out this Confidant gave you access to the ability to fuse personas that are a higher level than Joker at the cost of Yen. This was a pretty insane skill in the original game, but you unlocked it somewhat late into the journey. But for some reason that I can't even explain why, this was changed to be their rank 5 confidant award with their rank 10 ability 
ability being a discount to how much yen you need to pay. That is way too early. These fusion requests aren't even that hard, so it's entirely possible to max out this confidant before you even start the fourth palace. That's absolutely insane. Sure, this will cost you a crazy amount of money to do, but with Ryuji's instant kill, Hifumi's bonus money, Mishima's extra experience, and the stamp system that Mementos functions off of, this won't be a problem to do. While Persona 5 can get ridiculously easy, I still think that Innocent Sin is worse in this regard. I never got bored of Persona 5's main gameplay because there was always something that I was working towards, and I found the core mechanics just far more interesting to play around with. You're not just granted these game-breaking abilities right out the gate, as most of them come from ranking up your confidants in the real world. The start of Persona 5 Royal is actually more brutal than I remember. You can very easily get your ass kicked in certain fights at the start of the game if you're not careful, but the problem lies is that none of the palaces after Kamoshida seem to be designed with the confidant abilities in mind, meaning that the game actually gets easier the further you progress through the story because you're gaining so many more options, but the game was designed as if you had none of these tools. I understand that the developers wanted to make sure the player wouldn't get stuck in a palace due to not having the proper confidant abilities at their disposal. The problem is that for players like myself who end up doing all the confidants have nothing left to test our skills. Not even the infamous Okumura boss gave me any troubles. It's also just not really that hard guys, just uh, putting that out there. For this video, I ended up playing the game on hard mode and I recommend you all do the same. I absolutely do not recommend you play on merciless mode if you're looking for a challenge. On paper, this should be the hardest difficulty setting as enemies will deal 1.6 times the amount of damage and you'll only deal about half the damage as usual. But that's only when you're looking at this difficulty on a surface level. Calling this city merciless is a bit of a lie and a more appropriate name would be challenge or remix mode. What you'll come to realize fairly quickly is that during merciless mode, you earn money and experience at the same rate as you would during easy mode. Not only that, but landing critical hits, exploiting enemy weaknesses, and abusing technical attacks will cause you to do triple the damage that you normally do. Combine this with baton passing and the previous upgrades that I mentioned, then you'll find yourself with what is honestly one of the most forgiving difficulties in the game. I appreciate the idea of making merciless mode something more interesting than just damage modifiers, but I think that the execution was poor. So, how do we fix this issue with difficulty? I may not be a game designer, but I think I have a few ideas that could help provide a better gameplay experience. For example, the first thing I believe should be introduced are custom difficulty options. In Persona 4 Golden, once you beat the game, you unlock the ability to modify the game to your liking. You can change how much money or experience you earn in battle, and how much damage you take and receive from enemies. In the Steam port of P4G, this was unlocked right from the start, so you can set the game's difficulty to your preference. I think Persona 5 Royal would have greatly benefited from having this implemented, maybe even add a few more options for us to play around with, like the ability to toggle on and off the triple damage Merciless Mode introduces. Basically, what I'm asking for is the opportunity to just play Merciless Mode without the triple damage and bonus experience. I don't find this to be an unreasonable request because they've already done this before. When it comes to the Confidant abilities, most just need a slight tweak to them in order for them to be more balanced. I'd rather not waste a lot of time going over every single ability and give fixes, so I'll just focus on the two I find the most egregious. If I had my way, I'd just remove Ryuji's instant kill and the special treatment perk, but let's just assume that the abilities would have to stay in the game in some form. For Ryuji's ability, I'd greatly tighten the level threshold for this skill to work, as well as only allow it to work while in Mementos. Having this ability work in the regular palaces is just too game-breaking in my opinion. Allowing it to only work in the dungeon designed for grinding just makes a lot more sense to me. For the special treatment ability, I think that the developers could take a page out of Persona 2's book. In that game, you can fuse Personas that are a maximum of 5 levels above your characters. This on its own is a good idea already, so having it act as the Strength Confidant ability would be a good reward. You get a good power boost, but it's not enough to break the game. Have the rank 10 ability increase the level cap just a bit more and we're good. Of course, this is all just my opinion. For all I know, these ideas might not pan out too well, but I think that these changes will work out better in the long run. I also feel sort of obligated to talk about the DLC personas in this game when it comes to how they affect the difficulty. P5 is the first mainline persona game to have specific personas locked behind a small paywall. In Persona 5 Royal, all the previous DLC personas are now available for free, with brand new ones being introduced in a pack that you can buy for $10. 
It's safe to say that these personas are pretty overpowered and should be avoided if you want any sort of challenge. In a game that touts itself as the definitive Persona 5 experience, I think introducing more DLC really makes me question Atlas's business practices, but that's a discussion for another day. What I mostly want to focus on is one specific DLC persona. Yu Narukami's ultimate persona, Izanagi no Okami, was brought back as DLC, and is easily the single most powerful persona in the entire game. This is entirely because of its unique skill and trait. The trait Country Maker boosts your attack and defense based on how much of the compendium you filled up. It's a trait that scales with you throughout the entire game, and if you decide to fuse every persona, you just naturally become twice as powerful. But this doesn't even compare to its unique spell. Myriad Truths is a heavy almighty spell that targets all enemies. What makes this spell different from the rest is that it does damage to enemies three times, making it easily the most powerful almighty skill in the game. Combine this with its natural trait and passive skills to increase almighty damage, and you'll have yourself a persona that can easily deal thousands of damage. Here's me fighting the Reaper! It's worth clarifying that despite the issues I take with Persona 5's difficulty, I don't dislike the main gameplay because, mechanically speaking, it's the strongest set of any Persona game. I still prefer the press turn combat feature in the mainline SMT games because the game's challenge takes advantage of the tools at your disposal. Persona 5 Royal starts off with this mindset, but the rest of the game doesn't compensate with the eventual buffs you gain access to. This is probably the most disappointing aspect of Persona 5 in my opinion. I think that this is such a good combat system, but it sadly falls off in the latter half of the game because the confidant abilities trivialize encounters. I keep falling back on this, but I really think that they're the main cause of the difficulty issues present in this game. I really like the idea of rewarding the player for doing confidants outside of just fusion bonuses. I just think that the developers underestimated how strong you'd become from having all of them unlocked. I at the very least hope that this idea is brought back in later installments. With some tweaking, these abilities could be far more balanced while also feeling like decent upgrades for going the extra mile. Either that or Atlas could make the next game much more challenging to compensate. While you can't guarantee that every player will have the same confidant abilities unlocked, I think that a less forgiving overall experience would be a welcome change. Persona 5 handles dungeons in a slightly different way than the previous two games. For starters, there are two types of dungeons. Palaces are the main bread and butter when it comes to the dungeon crawling. These are handcrafted dungeons that are visually based off the palace ruler's cognition. The second type of dungeon is pretty much your grinding and side quest area known as mementos. This place functions a lot like Tartarus from Persona 3, where the areas are randomly generated. It's pretty much the same deal with the different blocks being locked off until certain in-game days. A lot of what I said about Tartarus from my Persona 3 video can be applied to mementos in Persona of five, but there are some differences that make the place feel distinct. Mementos is primarily used to change the hearts of people who don't have a fully developed palace, also known as people whose desires aren't quite as distorted as Kamoshida's and the others. It's a way to get some quick experience and cash while also providing the player with some more content to mess around with. Persona 5 Royal actually adds a few things to Mementos to encourage exploration. Throughout Mementos, you'll find these flowers scattered around every floor, as well as come across these station hosting stamps. You can take these stamps and flowers to this kid named Jose, and exchange change them for items and even altering the cognition of mementos. You can change the rate you earn money, experience, and how many items drop from chests and enemies. Just like the confidant abilities, this is a good reason to be thorough with your playstyle, but it has an effect on the game's overall challenge. I don't find the boost to money and experience here to be as unbalanced since it only works in mementos and only serves to cut down on busy work. When it comes to the palaces, however, that's where things start to get a bit more interesting. For the first time since Eternal Punishment, the Persona series has actual level design, and good level design at that. It isn't anything too complicated, but there are a few puzzles for you to to solve and will seeds to collect. By finding all three will seeds in a palace, you'll gain a special accessory that provides you with a new skill to use. Each palace has their own unique puzzle or gimmick that you need to deal with. Okumura's palace, for example, sees the player listening in on conversations to find the chief director in order to get an ID card. There's also the airlock mazes near the end of the palace that I really enjoyed. I see a lot of people critique the mazes for being too difficult or confusing. I never agree with this statement personally. I never had much of an issue of getting lost inside of the palaces, but that could be because of my previous experience experiences with other Mega Ten titles. Even if you've only played P3 and P4, games that are incredibly linear with little to no puzzle solving, the palaces here are still pretty beginner friendly. However, I can understand the complaint that some of these gimmicks overstay their welcome. To use a late game example, the rat mazes near the end of the game caused a lot of frustration
frustration among certain players. Not because the puzzles were necessarily difficult, but because this gimmick was used too many times throughout the palace, especially in the original Persona 5. I didn't mind the inclusion of these sorts of puzzles because it kept the level design fresh and made the player do more than just rush to the end without a care in the world. An aspect about the palaces I find very strange, however, are the safe rooms. In terms of gameplay, these functions as checkpoints where you can get your bearings, save your game, and even fast travel between different safe rooms in a palace. This is how you return to the entrance to either go back to the real world or fuse a new persona. In terms of story, the characters explore palaces to plan out an infiltration route to steal the ruler's treasure. In the final game, however, there's always a safe room just before the treasure's location, meaning that once you send the calling card and re-enter the palace, you can just warp to the treasure instantly. Part of me feels as though that you were supposed to originally make your way back to the treasure room manually. Something that I noticed, even on my first playthrough of the game, was that Kamoshida's palace had a lot of shortcuts to get you back to the entrance quickly. About halfway through the palace, you can open up a window that brings you back to the courtyard. Morgana even mentions that this is something you should remember for the infiltration. Near the end of the palace, you can jump through this painting here and end up in the main halls of the castle, which is very close to the palace entrance. I can imagine that you were expected to find these shortcuts so that when you sent the calling card, you had an easier way to get back to the treasure. I think that this would have been a more interesting idea than just fast traveling to the treasure. The way it is right now is fine, it's just that I've been thinking about this for years and I haven't seen anyone bring this up yet. To summarize, if Persona 5 was setting out to be a more beginner-friendly experience, then I think that it accomplishes that and then some. Mechanically speaking, it's easily the game with the most amount of stuff you can play around with and is incredibly user-friendly. As a self-proclaimed veteran player, which is something that I think I can say considering I've played all the mainline games at this point, I believe that Persona 5 has the best gameplay in the series. Where it suffers the most is the difficulty balance. This is an issue that permeates throughout the entire experience, which is why it can't be easily ignored. I'm more willing to excuse it here than I am in Innocent Sin for one major reason. You do a lot more in the modern Persona games than just dungeon crawling. A good majority of your playtime will be dedicated to the social simulator aspect of these games. Compare that to Innocent Sin, where all of the game time is spent dungeon crawling and battling enemies. This means that any flaws in the combat system there will stick out far more than in the modern Persona games. That doesn't mean I'll excuse when and where these games falter, but it wouldn't be fair if I were to treat these flaws as equal. Basically, what I'm trying to say here is despite how easy Persona 5 Royal is, I still had plenty of fun playing the game. The social aspect of Persona 5, much like the previous game, is the main appeal for a lot of players. By spending time with a character, your bond deepens with them. You can increase how quickly you rank up a confidant by having a persona of the matching arcana in your arsenal, and by answering questions that appeal to the character's ideals the most. It's the same as in the other games, but what I like this time around is that your reason for spending time with these characters are presented in a different light. Instead of trying to bond with someone for the sake of becoming friends, it's more so for mutual benefit. It's a way to contextualize how ranking up a confidant grants Joker a new skill to use in the metaverse. As the characters grow closer, they teach Joker new skills relating to the deal that he made with them. Persona 5 gives you a lot more free time than the previous two games, especially Royal. It's more than possible to max out every confidant without using a guide while having time to spare. Just be mindful of when you visit palaces and mementos while also abusing certain confidant abilities. There are a total of 23 confidants in the game, but I'm going to exclude talking about the plot-related ones, the reworked Garu Akechi confidant, and the confidant with the new party member Kasumi Yoshizawa. This is primarily because those confidants are mostly used to flesh out the characters in the main story and would require a lot of context for them to make sense. It would overall just flow better if I discuss their confidants along with their characters when I get to them. This leaves us with a total of 18 confidants to talk about this time around. In case you're new to this channel, I look at two things when evaluating a confidant. What is the story that's trying to be told with this character, and how well is that story told? I'm also going to be structuring the way I look at these not in the order of their arcana number, but what I personally believe will be the smoothest transition from each group. Main party members first, students second, adults third, and finally the new characters introduced in Royal along with Caroline and Justine. As a reminder, this is all just my personal interpretation of these stories, meaning that I don't expect everyone to agree with me. I just hope that we can respect each other's perspectives. With that out of the way, let's get started with... Number 1. The Chariot, Ryuji Sakamoto Ryuji is one of the founding members of the Phantom Thieves and is one of the first confidants you unlock. Ryuji's confidant story revolves around the track team that he used to be a part of. Sometime before the start of the game, Ryuji got into a fight with Kamoshida after he was talking shit about his family. Kamoshida made it seem as though it was out of self-defense and ended up forcing the track team to close down out of spite. Not only did Ryuji's leg get messed up from this event, but the old members of the team now despise him for not enduring Kamoshida's punishment like the rest of them did. And in Ryuji's perspective, he honestly doesn't blame them. As an outsider looking in, we see that Ryuji made the right decision to stand up against 
against Kamashita during that moment, but Ryuji himself feels the opposite. He feels immense guilt for what happened to the team, and most of his confidant is dedicated to him trying to right that wrong, with the other portion showing off Ryuji and Ren's training. The basic premise of Ryuji's confidant is that his old track team is trying to get back together, but the team's coach is someone who was a supporter of Kamashita. Ryuji, out of fear of history repeating itself, sets out to expose this person for the scum that he is. We learn that this new coach, Yamauchi, is only interested in rebuilding the track team for the sake of garnering fame and attention. He wants to be looked at as the sympathetic teacher who helped to reestablish the track team after Kamashita was exposed. Only with the help of Ren is Ryuji able to gather the necessary information to prove to his old teammates that Yamauchi is no good. The group is able to bury the hatchet, and the track team is able to rehire their old coach before Kamashita. Ryuji is given the opportunity to rejoin the track team, but ends up turning down their offer. While the track team was once a huge part of his life, and he still has a passion for running, the way I see it, this is supposed to show that Ryuji is finally able to move on from his own perceived failures. In my opinion, Ryuji's confidant focuses on the idea of forgiveness, not just forgiving your colleagues for wronging you, but also learning to forgive yourself for your own mistakes. When given the opportunity to get some sort of revenge on a trackmate who fed Kamashita information about Ryuji's parents, instead of indulging in that revenge, he instead shows forgiveness. The entire reason as to why Ryuji went to such lengths to ensure a bright future for the track team was so that he could forgive himself for buckling under Kamashita way back when. So him turning down the invitation to join the track team in the end is supposed to symbolize his new resolve to move on from those old days. I like Ryuji's confidant, it works very well as a supplement to his main character arc in the story, and gives some more insight into the reason as to why Ryuji is considered an outcast to the people at Shujin. I see people bring up the fact that this confidant focuses on the track team as a flaw, and I can't help but disagree with that notion. Ryuji's connection to track and field is a very big part of his character. It was his main hobby, and at one point in his life, he wanted to get a scholarship in order to make things easier for his mom, but that was all ripped away from him because he couldn't endure what he was put through. I think that it's a great idea to focus on how Ryuji feels about those events, and having a side story dedicated to him moving past that. He still is the center focus of the story even though the track team is used as an ongoing backdrop. I think that when it comes to pacing, this confidant moves at a very brisk pace. Once the main conflict is introduced, it becomes the center focus for the remainder of the confidant. Overall, I'd say that this story is pretty solid, but it struggles to leave that much of a lasting impact on me personally. This is mostly because his character arc and the main plot certainly overshadows the stuff that's shown here. That's not a criticism, mind you, because it just goes to show how fleshed out Ryuji is as a party member, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here. Number 2, The Lovers, on to Kamiki. On's confidant, if I'm being honest, feels rather unfocused. Much like Ryuji, On is one of the founding members of the Phantom Thieves and also has suffered through Kamashita's abuse. The confidant starts off with On wanting to learn to improve the strength of her heart so she can not only become a better Persona user, but to also be an inspiration to her best friend Shiho. At first, it seems as though this story is going to be about On's relationship with her friend and learning to better herself. I find all these scenes very compelling, and it does a great job at showcasing An's personality outside what's provided in the main story. But partway into the confidant, An's modeling career is thrown into the mix along with her industry rival, Mika. The idea here is that Mika is supposed to be An's ultimate test of her own heart, as she represents all the qualities that An admired from the villains she watched on TV. Things such as self-confidence and the drive to never give up what you value. This doesn't end up working too well because the sides of Mika that are end up showed to us only portray as a very spiteful individual who's willing to use dirty tactics to get an edge in the industry. She's portrayed with only the toxic qualities of the antagonist that An took interest in. I get the idea that they were going for, but I don't think it's executed all too well. Maybe An's confidant would have been better if her modeling gig was cut from the story, and we instead focused on her relationship with Shiho in the aftermath of the Kamashita incident. Bits of this idea are shown, and I find those parts to be the best aspect of her confidant. The reason as to why I like the track team stuff featured in Ryuji's confidant was because his relationship with his teammates was a core aspect of his character. The same can't really be said about An's modeling, because it's far less important to her overall character. The decision to include this aspect of her character into this confidant doesn't really do much but deter from the more interesting parts of her story. Overall, I'd say that An's confidant starts strong, but loses its focus later on and it makes the conclusion have a lot less impact as it could have. I'm not calling it bad per se, but it's just a bit disappointing. Number 3, The Emperor, Yusuke Kitagawa. Yusuke is the ex-pupil of the famous artist Madarame. After joining the Phantom Thieves and exposing his sensei for the scum that he is, he falls into a bit of an artist's slump. The main plot of his confidant focuses on him regaining his passion while also helping Yusuke grow as an artist. 
His first attempt at getting back on the horse ends in nothing but failure for him. He ends up submitting a piece of work to an art exhibit that's based on his interpretation of human desires. Yusuke ends up using Mementos and Madarame as his interpretations, and believes that he managed to capture this twisted corruption in his new painting. However, despite his technical skills, both critics and patrons end up finding this piece very empty, and Yusuke struggles to swallow this truth. But upon closer inspection of the piece, Yusuke is able to come to the realization of where he went wrong. This interpretation of the human heart was nothing more than a surface level inspection of the subject. Sure, desire was what Yusuke was intentionally trying to capture, but the painting in question lacked any sort of nuance or meaning to it. The general idea that Yusuke's confidant tackles is him expanding his horizons so we can find a way to fully understand the human heart. I find this to be a very solid premise for a story revolving around this character. Painting and just artwork in general is a core aspect to Yusuke, even more so than what track and field was for Ryuji. Throughout the confidant, Yusuke attempts to expand his horizons to get a deeper understanding of the human heart, but all this does is give him more questions than answers. This search eventually has Yusuke admit that deep down, he fears that he'd walk down the same path as Madarame. Through the help of Ren and the other members of the Phantom Thieves, however, Yusuke is able to gain a new perspective on the human heart. Desire isn't inherently as corrupt as he made it seem to be. You can profit off of art as long as you're making it with the intent of giving a new experience to someone else. Where Madarame went wrong was that fame and fortune ended up distorting him, and that became more important to him than the genuine artistic intent. The words of his friends help Yusuke finally grasp the human heart, and he decides to take another shot at his painting. This new piece, Desire and Hope, has much more passion behind it than before, and it perfectly encapsulates the lessons that Yusuke learned. The painting itself is supposed to represent the differing aspects of the human heart, both the beauty and the grim ugliness that come along with it. In the painting itself, hope is represented by this blinding colorful light that's keeping the darkness of desire from overtaking the heart. In Yusuke's own words, he won't be stained by desire like his old sensei. His hope is personified in his friends and he has faith that they will guide him down the right path, chastising him if he begins to falter. I really enjoyed Yusuke's confidant. It has a good pace with each confidant rank being used to develop his new perspective. The idea of this confidant fits really well with the character in question, and gives us some extra insight into Yusuke's feelings about Madarame that weren't expressed in the main story. I honestly don't hear a lot of people discussing the overall message that this story has. Most discussion surrounding Yusuke ultimately falls back on the silly situations that he and Ren end up in, such as this one scene where they're in the church and Yusuke wants Ren to pose for him. While this helps endear us to his character, maybe this stuff could be considered a little too distracting. Either that or people really just didn't care much about his confidant's message. I hope that isn't true because I really like what I experienced with Yusuke overall. I think that this does a great job with his character and is one of the better ones in the game for me. Number 4, The Priestess, Makoto Nijima. I'm not sure if I'm going to upset anyone when I say this, but I find Makoto's confidant really disappointing. A common criticism is that this confidant doesn't focus enough on Makoto as an individual, but rather spends too much time on the relationship she has with her new friend. While I defended Ryuji's confidant, I think that the problem is a lot more apparent here. The main bulk of this confidant story focuses on this girl named Aiko and her relationship with a shady host named Tsukasa, who's infamous for taking advantage of young girls and forcing them to work for illegal businesses. The confidant focuses on Makoto and Ren trying to get to the bottom of these rumors and trying to convince Aiko that her new boyfriend is bad news. The problem I have with this story is that it's so interested in the Aiko stuff that Makoto doesn't feel like the central focus at all. You could very easily tell this exact same story with another character and nothing would change. Makoto doesn't get enough focus for this story to be justified as her own confidant. There are a few ranks where we do learn about Makoto, but it's very brief. The Rank 7 Confidant event is one of the only examples of this story putting an emphasis on Makoto as a character. Her family has ties to the police, and we learn that her father was assassinated when he tried to expose a gang of criminals. It's because of this that Sai, her older sister, became a prosecutor to begin with. It seems like this where we get a taste into Makoto's home life that really make me wish we had more time spent on it. That's way more interesting to me than this other girl that only exists in this confidant. This suffers a lot from the same problems that An's confidant does, but it's even worse here since there was at least some closure with An and Shiho. The modeling stuff was at least also an already established part of her character too, even though it wasn't a huge aspect of An as a person. I would have definitely preferred a story that focused more on Makoto as an individual over what we ended up getting. Maybe tell a story that revolves around her personal beliefs of what justice should be, or maybe even focus on her family reputation and the expectations that come along with that. When she's introduced in the main story, it's mentioned that she has expectations as a Nijima, so maybe the confidant could have been about her feelings towards her 
family name. Even if I ignore what could have been, there's no denying that this confidant suffers greatly from the way it's presented. Show Don't Tell is a common rule that Atlas surprisingly struggles with a lot when it comes to Persona social links. In Makoto's case, there's way too many scenes where instead of showing us new information involving Aiko and her boyfriend, we're instead just told it by Makoto. There are a few interesting moments, such as having to pretend to be Makoto's boyfriend and go on a double date to advance the story, but stuff like that is pretty rare. Overall, I think that this confidant has pretty boring storytelling, and is a missed opportunity to flesh out this character. Not a fan. Number 5. The Hermit, Futaba Sakura Futaba is a young girl who shut herself off from the outside world due to her past trauma. Without giving too much away now, the main story focuses on her coping with that trauma, and her confidant is the aftermath of those events, with the logical next step. A good majority of the story focuses on Futaba being reintroduced to real-world interactions, and filling out the promise list she made with Ren. These tasks would involve doing things such as visiting Shujin Academy, interacting with people her own age, and going to a place with lots of people. This is honestly what about half of her confidant amounts to. We get to spend time with Futaba and get a good idea of what her personality is like. Futaba is someone who, for the past few years, pretty much lived exclusively on the internet. Almost all of her social interactions came from online chat rooms and forum posts. Just by looking at her room and seeing her lifestyle, you can tell that she's a shut-in. Something that bothers me about Futaba's confidant is that it doesn't feel as though there was enough content to justify the 10 rank format. In Rank 6, we're introduced to the idea that Futaba had a childhood friend growing up who was abused by their parents. When Futaba found out about this, her friend pushed her away and Futaba lied to her mother about what happened. Still wrapped up with guilt from these events, Futaba wants to right her wrongs and change the hearts of the girl's parents. This is the first confidant I'm talking about that brings up the idea of changing someone's heart for the sake of progressing the story. There are quite a few confidants that require you to visit Mementos and fight a shadow. I've heard from people that Mementos is a cheap way of solving a character's problems and diminishes character growth. I don't really agree with this statement. First of all, other than one exception, the Mementos requests appear near the end of the Confidant stories. The one outlier is also used before you start the Confidant with that certain character, so I don't even really count that one to begin with. By this point in the Confidant, the character in question has already found their resolve and are making strides to better themselves as people. In order for these characters to fully make that leap, the Phantom Thieves change the hearts of the people who are keeping them down. Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't that the entire point of this group? To be an inspiration to the people around them, and to give a voice to the people who have been unfairly treated by the world? I think that it makes perfect sense that Mementos is used throughout the Confidants, as it would be completely against the Phantom Thieves' agenda if they ignored people who are suffering. If the complaint people have is that this Make some confidants feel formulaic, then I can totally see why someone would think that. The social links in the modern Persona games are pretty formulaic to an extent, but Persona 5's is more noticeable as you, on multiple occasions, are forced to go to mementos for the sake of advancing the story. But I don't see how this is any worse than the previous two games where the protagonists are the ones to bring the change in people. The difference here is that Persona 5 has a more hands-on method than just being the shoulder for someone to brace themselves on until they're ready to be on their own. Sorry to get a bit off topic, but I know if I didn't address this now, then someone would bring it up. Anyways, back to Futaba. The characters and scenario that is introduced in our Rank 6 event is completely different from the stuff that came before it, leading me to believe that this story was written by multiple people, two different writers with conflicting ideas coming to a compromise by including both of these ideas into one story. This leads to both of these ideas feeling underdeveloped and also having the effect of the confidant being unfocused. At the very least, we do get to spend time with Futaba as a character, which depending on how you feel about her, can be a good or a bad thing. Number 6, The Empress, Haru Okumura. Haru's confidant, much like Yusuke's and Futaba's, focuses on the aftermath of their introduction in the main story. In Haru's case, her story largely surrounds her relationships with the Okumura's food company and her role in it after her father's death, while also sprinkling in a bit of her gardening hobby for good measure. One of the main topics dealt in Haru's confidant's story is the idea of doing things for yourself rather than blindly following what would be good for others. Since her dad passed away, Haru is now the most valuable asset to the company as constantly being pressured into either selling stocks for the company, or going through with the arranged marriage proposal. What this confidant really focuses on is Haru learning to live life and make decisions for herself rather than just being complacent with what others tell her to do. This was something that was brought up during the Okumura arc in the main story, but ends up being the driving point for Haru's character development. What Haru desires the most is to bring the company back to its roots and run it the way her grandfather did, but in order to do that, 
that, she's going to have to learn to speak up for herself and become confident in her decisions. These are the things that she ends up picking up from spending time with Ren. What I really like about this confidant is just how much time we get to spend with Haru as a person. We learn what she wants and what she fears, and even goes through moments where she doubts herself. It reminds me of how Persona 4 handled party members' social links, where the main story is used to give us an insight into their issues, while the social links were used to help them overcome these flaws. I wouldn't say that any of these ranks are wasted, and the story idea matches perfectly with the character. I actually really did enjoy this one, and if you thought that Haru lacked enough time to shine, then this gives us a lot more to bite into. It's pretty solid in my eyes. Number 7, The Moon, Yuki Mishima. For those of you who follow me on Twitter, then you may have seen me discuss Mishima in the past. I regard his character and this confidant very highly, not just because I think it's a well-told story, but because Mishima is a far more relatable and realistic character than what people give him credit for. Dare I say that I think he's pretty underrated. For a little introduction, Mishima is introduced during the Kamoshida arc. He's one of the members of the volleyball team and was forced to endure the abuse that was running rampant throughout the school. Mishima discovers rather quickly that Renan and Ryuji were behind Kamoshida's sudden change of heart and decides that he wants to support their noble cause. He creates the Phantom Thieves aficionado website so people can vote in polls and even request changes of heart. This is how the mementos requests are contextualized in universe, as Mishima will text Ren about certain things going on in Tokyo. Mishima is sort of like your guy in the chair and specializes in giving intel to the Phantom Thieves. Mishima's confidant focuses on learning about him as an individual and how his newfound purpose slowly begins to corrupt him. Since he's the admin of the fan site, he's no doubt a a valuable asset to the Phantom Thieves and their cause. But where Mishima falters is that he lets the hype surrounding the Phantom Thieves and his own involvement get to his ego. Throughout his confidant, we see Mishima slowly become more corrupt, doing things such as attempting to misuse donation money and attempting to send Phantom Thieves after people who aren't doing anything wrong, mostly using it as a stunt to boost the popularity of the group. Obviously, when things start to get out of hand, the team takes action and finds Mishima's shadow in the metaverse. This scene gives us a pretty good insight into his mindset while running the fan site. In his mind, the Phantom Thieves' success only comes from Mishima's hard work with public relations. His shadow really highlights his grandiose sense of self while acknowledging that he secretly feared the Phantom Thieves would turn on him. But what exactly led Mishima down this dark path to begin with is something that's overlooked when discussing his character, even though it's presented right in the player's face during this scene. Before the Phantom Thieves, Mishima was an outcast. He had nothing special going for him, and was the target of both Kamoshida's abuse as well as frequent bullying in middle school. This was something that Mishima had to begrudgingly accept about himself. That is, until he discovered that Ren was a member of the Phantom Thieves. After seeing someone who he considered a close friend do these amazing things for the world, Mishima couldn't help but yearn for the same attention that the group he admired received. It's the reason as to why he spent so much time dedicating himself to the Phantom Thieves. In the back of Mishima's mind, he thought if he were to push his idols further into the spotlight, he'd be able to make a name for himself as well. Though, as we see throughout his confidant, this desperate desire to be someone special ended up leading Mishima down a destructive path. Without really realizing it, he became someone who was willing to abuse their position of power for selfish gain. He himself became the bullies that he despised. But the thing I like the most about Mishima's confidant is that his resolve doesn't come from a forced change of heart. Instead, it involves Ren confronting Mishima's shadow and helps him realize that he's going down the wrong path. Instead of forcing the change, he instead leaves it up to Mishima to discover where he went wrong, and gives him the chance to better himself, which does end up happening near the end of the confidant. I really don't understand the hate that this character gets. When I look at Mishima, I don't just see an annoying kid who's obsessed with the Phantom Thieves. I see a victim of abuse who doesn't want to be in that position anymore. Someone who wants to be recognized but ends up losing his way for a short time, only to be steered back onto the right path thanks to a close friend and becomes a better person through those experiences. I find this confidant super compelling and it's one of my favorite ones in the game. It's so disheartening that Mishima is written off so much because he's an annoying character. There's so much more to him than just that trait, and I hope I managed to bring a new perspective to the conversation. Number 8, The Star, Hifumi Togo. Hifumi's confidant is a pretty standard one, but this comes with the consequence of being somewhat unremarkable and honestly forgettable. She's a competitive shogi player, and her confidant focuses on her feelings towards the game along with the relationship with her mother. Hifumi wants to become a great shogi player like her father was, but her mother was more focused on Hifumi's public image than anything else. She constantly sets up photo shoots and interviews for her daughter in order to live life through Hifumi, indulging in the fame that she desperately desired for herself. Hifumi's mother even goes as far as suggesting that Hifumi should throw her match against a professional in order to boost her popularity. The idea here is that Hifumi's mom has been so enraptured by the media attention surrounding the family that Hifumi is more of a tool for success rather than being 
being a person to her. Once we learn this information, Ren and the others take a trip to Memento so that they can change Hifumi's mother's heart. Once the change of heart occurs, Hifumi's mother admits to her daughter that many of the matches she participated in were actually rigged in her favor. This briefly causes her to question her own shogi abilities, but she ends up getting over this rather quickly. Despite all of this, Hifumi does attempt to play against the professional player and gets absolutely destroyed by them. But this was a positive experience in her eyes because she was able to face a shogi player in a fair and square match. Yeah, this confidant really didn't do it for me. A lot of this story is mostly spent setting up the basics for the character of Hifumi, but never fully exploring many of the more interesting sides of her. We learned that her father was a pro shogi player who ended up retiring due to an illness, and that Hifumi herself wants to go pro in order to support her family. Another idea that's brought up is the fact that she doesn't care about the photo shoots or the interviews because her passion lies in the game itself and not so much the idle lifestyle that would come along with that. None of this is ever explored past its initial introduction, and that's a shame because it would have made Hifumi a far more fleshed out character. What baffles me is that Hifumi has almost no reaction to learning that her past games were rigged. All that we get is her affirmation that she's going to give it her all, and prove to herself that her shogi skills were more than just a fabrication. Him. If this twist was revealed much earlier in the story, it could have honestly made the confidant more compelling. As of right now, Hifumi doubting herself is just a single throwaway line in her rank 8 event before she quickly regains her resolve. This should have been explored more so that there were more stakes to the confidant outside of the situation involving her mother. Maybe show a scene where Hifumi initially wants to back down from playing her match against the pro before going to her father for guidance. He could act as the spark needed for Hifumi to rediscover her love for Shogi. The rank 9 scene can be the same where she loses with pride, but now we have a new context behind those events that are a lot more personal. I think the biggest problem I have with Hifumi's confidant is that not a whole lot really happens in it for me to stay interested. We learn different aspects of her character, but none of it's used to craft much of a compelling story around it. Hifumi is a somewhat fleshed out character because we learn what she likes, dislikes, her hopes, her motivation for playing shogi, but that's about all we get. I see a lot of people discussing how much they like her character online, but I don't really see much discussion surrounding the actual confidant story itself, which probably goes to show where the priority was when the writers made this story. If you're the kind of person who enjoys confidants more so for hanging out with the characters, then I can see why you would enjoy this. But for someone like myself who enjoys the confidant format more so for telling interesting smaller scale stories, then there really isn't much to sink your teeth into. I'm hesitant to call it bad, but there's a reason as to why I tend to forget many aspects surrounding this confidant. Number 9. The Tower, Shinya Oda. Shinya is an elementary schooler who spends most of his time at the arcade in Akihabara. He's an expert at the game called Gunabout, and his skills earned him the nickname of the Gamer King. Shinya's confidant focuses on his relationship with his peers as well as his own mother. We learned somewhat early on that the young boy's family situation isn't exactly glamorous. His mother and father divorced recently, and it's been a very rough time for them. His mom has been under a lot of stress because she now has to provide for her son on her own, which leads to frequent moments of her snapping at the littlest issues. When the kids at Shinya's school find out about the complaint she's been making, they begin to bully him for it. Something that this confidant does really well is highlighting Shinya's warped perspective of these events. Since he's just a kid, he doesn't fully understand what's going on with his mother and ends up blaming himself for not only the divorce, but for causing his mom's stress too. He refers to the bullying he sees as an act of war, and that the kids are only doing this to him because he's weak. This is the reason as to why Shinya spends so much time dedicated to practicing at the arcade. In Shinya's point of view, him being the best at gun about equates to having some sort of strength or authority, at least amongst his peers. Shinya's perspective spawned from his own mother's. Since she's been so stressed with raising the boy on her own, she ends up developing a very toxic behavior. We learn from her shadow that the world doesn't care about single mothers like herself. She needs to be strong to support her kid, and how everyone else is her enemy. We can see this mindset start to rub off on Shinya, as he himself starts to act more antagonistic towards his peers. It's only when he realizes that he's no better than the criminals that the Phantom Thieves go after is when he starts to make changes to himself. Himself. Out of all of the social links involving kid characters in this series, I'd probably say that Shinya is my least favorite. This confidant is a bit messy since it's trying to do too much at once. This leads to some ideas not feeling as well developed as others. For example, there's a few ranks dedicated to a pro player that beats Shinya because he cheated at Gunabout, but it doesn't really feel necessary to this story at all. It would have flowed much better if this derailment was cut out, and instead we fully focus on the idea of Shinya slowly adopting his mom's toxic behaviors. I can't say I'm the biggest fan of Shinya's confidant, but I wouldn't go as far as saying it's bad. There's at least a compelling story that's trying to be told here, but it just has a less than stellar execution. Number 10, The Temperance. Sadayo Kawakami. Kawakami is Ren's homeroom teacher at school, 
not too long into the game, we discover that she's actually moonlighting as a maid in order to earn money. The reason for doing so isn't exactly clear at first, and Kawakami doesn't give the truth of the situation, though after spending enough time with her, she eventually does come clean. It turns out that Kawakami has been making payments to the Takase family. The reason why she does this is because she feels responsible for the death of their child. Takase was a bit of a problem student to the teachers at Kawakami's old school, and she was assigned to have him transferred away. But after meeting the young boy, it turns out he wasn't a bad kid. Apparently, Takase was an orphan child who was forced to work multiple part-time jobs in order to get by. This caused his academic performance to falter as he had no time to study. Kawakami decided to privately tutor Takase so that his transfer could be avoided. Eventually, she had to distance herself from the boy due to some dark rumors surrounding the two. This emotionally crushed him, and while on his way home from one of his jobs, he ended up getting into a car accident which resulted in his death. Kawakami was racked in guilt because of these events, and Takase's guardians blamed her for what happened. They used this opportunity to blackmail her into giving them money so that they wouldn't reveal the truth. These demands are the reason as to why she began to moonlight as a maid. Takase's guardians demand an insane amount of money from her, which is well above her teacher's salary. Kawakami has to overwork herself to the point of collapse in order to meet their demands. What I really like about this reveal is that it not only recontextualizes a lot of the earlier scenes involving her character, but it opens up the avenue to explore her character on an emotional level. Kawakami is someone who is first presented in a pretty negative light. She comes off as someone who doesn't care about her students and sees any attempt at connecting with them a bother. This is something that's established pretty early on in the game when she describes Ren as a problem child. In actuality, Kawakami is the exact opposite as the game made her out to be. Kawakami genuinely cares about her students and loves her teaching job, but in a moment of weakness and fear, she ended up going against her morals and backing away from a student in need. Kawakami's character from here on out is learning to cope with the guilt and eventually realizes that the best way to honor Takase would be to become a better teacher, extend other people the kindness that she showed him. I think that this is a really interesting story for this character, but it sadly isn't perfect. There are a few ranks in this confidant that feel wasted, in a sense that we learn no new information about Kawakami or advance her story. I understand that these scenes are supposed to establish that she's being overworked by Takase's guardians, because she begins to develop a cough and talks about how exhausted she's been feeling. But this is stuff that could have easily been implemented during other scenes where the plot is advancing and the pacing would have been improved. Other than that, I actually really did enjoy this confidant story. We learn a lot about Kawakami and it's satisfying to take down Takase's guardians near the end of it. Number 11, The Sun, Toranosuke Yoshida. Yoshida is a politician looking to steer the country into a better direction. He's an ex-member of the National Diet and has become quite infamous due to his failings in the position. These are known as No Good Tora's Three Strikes, and the nickname even persists with him to this very day. Due to this infamy, Yoshida has a lot of self-esteem issues. He even freezes up in the middle of a political speech because someone reminds him of his past. This confidant mostly focuses on improving Yoshida's self-esteem, and learning more about him on a personal level. It's a simple story for a simple character, and there isn't much in terms of deep analysis to be had. Throughout the confidant, Yoshida slowly gains confidence in himself thanks to Ren, and actually ends up gaining a decent following from his speeches. The name No Good Tora eventually stops being a shackle holding Yoshida down. He instead uses the infamy that name brings in order to illustrate how people are able to change when given a second chance. During Yoshida's youth, he became a politician only for the sake of power and the popular the position would provide, but after his own failings and having time for them to stick, he is able to eventually realize that there is a change that needs to be made to the country. Something that Yoshida's confidant really succeeds at is affirming how corrupt the political sphere of this country actually is. People selling out their beliefs for the sake of guaranteeing themselves a position of power, and internal blackmailing to keep certain people bound to the leash of their superiors. This is the main reason as to why Yoshida is able to sympathize with the Phantom Thieves. Without really knowing much about them, he understands the feeling of wanting to make a change to the status quo, and even correctly assumes that the group is composed of people who have been unfairly treated by those in power. We do eventually learn that the embezzlement scandal that ruined Yoshida's credibility was actually a false accusation made by his old mentor, and when given the opportunity to get revenge on the one who wronged him, Yoshida instead declines the offer. Yoshida is firm in his belief to change the country, but he wants to do it through legitimate means. I like Yoshida's confidant, but as I said earlier, there isn't much to discuss that isn't already just explained to the player. I think that the pacing is solid, no rank really feels wasted at all, and the story ramps up at a constant rate. The reason as to why I don't consider this one great is because there isn't much emotional investment for me personally. I think it's a solid story with a good payoff, but it doesn't have that emotional kick for me. The idea here is to not let your failings define you, and to always stick to your beliefs even if they aren't popular, and I think it's done well enough here, but I don't personally relate to the struggle to begin with. I can see why this is considered to be a lot of people's favorite confidant, but I just don't share the same perspective. Number 12, Death, Tai Takemi. 
Takemi is a back alley doctor who's stationed at Yungan Jaya. In terms of gameplay, this place acts as the store where you purchase HP restoration items. In context of the world and thus confidant, she sells these items in exchange of using Ren as a test subject for her medicine. Her confidant is one of the better non-party member ones in my opinion. It manages to balance multiple ideas that all end up coming together near the end of it. We learned that Takemi used to work at a university hospital, but was fired after she was accused of a disastrous medical error. There was this young girl named Miwa who was suffering from a very rare medical condition and Takemi was trying to create a medicine in order to treat it. However, this ended up not going as planned as Miwa ended up falling into a coma because of said medicine. Takemi ended up taking the blame for this mistake, and it's revealed that she's been trying to perfect the medicine in her own free time to make things right. That's the general core of Takemi's story. She wants to regain her credibility while also earning the forgiveness of the girl she failed, but there's a lot more supplementary material to be found throughout the confidant. The first few ranks do a really good job at establishing Takemi's personality, while also giving us a taste of her dark past before fully revealing it. There aren't any of what I would consider to be wasted rank since everything is relevant until the end of the story. There's a scene about halfway through that shows Takemi having to take in a sick child because she was turned away from the hospital. Takemi's going to charge an outrageous price for her services, that is, until she hears that the person who turned the girl away was her old boss named Oyamada. After hearing that name, she decides that she wouldn't charge the dad for helping them out. This naturally leads into Takemi telling us about who Oyamada is and what exactly happened that got her fired. Oyamada is even revealed to be Takemi's antagonist starting with rank 7, along with some dark information involving the clinical trial. Oyamada ends up being a target for the Phantom Thieves because he's actively trying to crush Takemi's business, and even almost succeeds at that. When confronting his shadow, we see that he only gotten as far as he has in the medical industry because of nepotism, and resents Takemi for her skill. He even went as far as lying about Miwa's death in order to ruin her credibility and protect his own reputation. Changing Oyamada's heart doesn't discredit Takemi's character development since her resolve to help others and even a slight repairment of her reputation came from her own actions and not the Phantom Thieves. Just because they ultimately helped Takemi in her time of need, that doesn't mean her choices in development up until this happens to suddenly be nullified. Mementos is just used to give Takemi one last push, and clear up any misconceptions. Overall, I like this confidant a lot. As I mentioned earlier, there aren't any wasted scenes, and I think that her character is well-rounded. Since this confidant is unlocked at the start of the game, you get a good first impression of the type of stories you're going to be experiencing. Number 13. The Fortune Chahaya Mifune This confidant requires a decent amount of effort to initiate, and honestly feels like it's mostly being done out of spite. Chahaya is a fortune teller, whose booth is located in the red light district of Shinjuku. She's selling people these bogus holy stones for an insane amount of money, and even ends up tricking Ren into buying one. The main core of this story is the conversation of whether or not fate is absolute. Chahaya uses tarot cards in order to predict the future. She sees her readings as absolute, and that there's no use in fighting against Against it. You'll be better off just being a slave to fate and enduring whatever downfalls it may entail. Ren, and by extension the Phantom Thieves, believe that you can change the course of your life if you have the drive and willpower to stand up against fate or powers greater than your own. The first few ranks of the Confidant are dedicated to showing Chahaya that there's plenty of merit with standing up against fate. As Ren attends her fortune readings, he offers advice to those struggling in life. By giving them a new perspective or words of encouragement, Chahaya's tarot readings end up changing to a more positive outcome. Convinced that Ren's ability to defy fate is real, the course of the confidant then changes to whether or not Chahaya can defy her own fate. We learn a lot about Chahaya's past and her current situation in Tokyo. Chahaya was originally from a small traditional mountain village. She made a name for herself by using her fortune-telling skills to predict the future. However, when she began to predict natural disasters, the people of the village turned on her, blaming Chahaya for those disasters. Her house was burned down and she was run out of the village. Chahaya was eventually discovered by a cult calling themselves the Assembly of the Divine Power. They ended up manipulating her by saying that she was a real psychic and getting her to sell holy stones to her customers even though that deep down she knew that they didn't work. Chahaya only went along with it because she wanted to be with a group that didn't consider her a monster like her village did. It's through spending time with Ren and seeing how he's able to make changes in faith that she's able to find the courage to stand up against the cult. Once we get a hold of the cult leader's name, the Phantom Thieves make it their mission to hunt his shadow down in Mementos and have him put a stop to all of his shady businesses. The lesson that Chahaya learns from all this is that people shouldn't rely strictly on fortune telling or superstitions to dictate the course of their lives. Thinking for yourself and taking 
action on your own is the only way to make any sort of meaningful change. In a way, the lesson here is like a miniature version of the game's overall themes. I think that Chihaya's confidant is pretty decent overall. Much like Yoshida's, there isn't a whole lot for me to really analyze. Pretty much most of what I said there applies here. It's a standard Persona social link story and has a good execution, but lacks any sort of personal investment on my end. Number 14, The Hanged Man, Munahisa Iwai. Iwai is the owner of Untouchable Airsofts, which acts as the game's weapon and armor store. Early on in the game, you assist Iwai with some shady business involving an incredibly lifelike airsoft gun, and can even start a confidant with him once your courage is at least rank 4. This confidant revolves around Iwai's job, and his responsibility of his adoptive son Kaoru. We learn early on that Iwai is an ex-Yakuza member, and the first few ranks of his story are dedicated to Ren assisting him in his shady business practices. It's around rank 5 when the real conflict is introduced. EY is being blackmailed by a man named Suda. He's using EY's past as a bargaining chip. If EY doesn't do what Suda says, he's going to tell Kaoru the truth about why Iwa took him in, along with his ties to the Yakuza. It turns out that Kaoru's blood mother tried to sell her baby off to EY for some drug money. When he refused, she ended up abandoning him anyway, so EY took the boy in. He ended up having to leave his clan and his old life in order to take care of his new son. EY doesn't want Kaoru to learn the truth and get held back by it. EY telling Ren all this really shows how much he trusts him. EY is probably one of the coolest fucking characters in the game, and it's a shame he isn't talked about that much. His confidant is not only intriguing, but it's also immediately exciting. Not too long into the story, EY is able to relate to Ren, since both of them know the feeling of having a bad reputation forced onto them, and how it affects their daily lives. We learn a lot about EY's upbringing and the reason as to why he joined the Yakuza in the first place. He had a rough childhood, his parents were low lives, and that family name held him back from achieving anything for himself. There wasn't anything else he could do other than joining a clan. EY desperately wants to be the parent that he never had growing up, and guarantee a good future for his son. Adopted or not, Kaoru is family to EY, and by the end of the Confidant even considers Ren to be a part of it. My favorite scene in the Confidant has to be near the end. After Suda has a change of heart and is excommunicated from the Yakuza, his lackey Masa kidnaps Kaoru and holds him at knife point. EY is forced to tell Kaoru the truth in order to protect him. Kaoru accepts the past for what it is. He doesn't care about what happened back then, and he won't let this revelation ruin the relationship he has with his dad no matter what. That's some powerful shit, and it only works as well as it does because we got plenty of time to spend with these characters. I think EY's confidant is pretty great overall. His character is really fleshed out, and the story he's involved with is super interesting. I was pretty invested in this character because he has a strong moral code and just wants to be a good dad so his son can live a good life. He's willing to go as far as die for him for that to happen. What can I say, I'm just a sucker for good dad stories of my Persona games. Speaking of which... Number 15, The Hierophant, Sojiro Sakura. Sojiro is Ren's caretaker while he spends the year attending Shujin Academy. He reminds me a lot of Dojima in Persona 4. Both are of the Hierophant Arcana, and their confidants have a heavy focus on their relationships with their daughters. What makes this confidant interesting is that you can't fully complete it until Futaba joins the main party. You can complete the first few ranks no problem, but then you'll need to wait a long ass time until you're able to progress it anymore. I don't really think the game does a good enough job at telling you this, because you can waste a lot of evenings trying to rank up Sojiro. This only applies for first time players, but it's bothered me since the game came out. Anyways, Sojiro's confidant takes until rank 5 for things to really get started. We learn that Futaba's uncle and Sojiro are in a constant battle for Futaba's custody. When Futaba's mother passed away, she was originally supposed to stay with her uncle, as he was the only relative willing to take her in. But after witnessing the abuse she went through while living with him, Sojiro decided that he needed to step in. Sojiro and Futaba's uncle, Yuji Ishiki, come to an agreement that Sojiro will have custody over Futaba as long as he makes payments when asked. This has resulted in Sojiro getting extorted out of large sums of money in order to keep Futaba safe. He can't refuse either as Yuji would just sue Sojiro for custody, and thanks to the corrupt justice system, he would end up winning in the end. The main use of this confidant is to tie up any loose ends and answer some questions posed in the main story. Despite Sojiro being Futaba's caretaker, the two have a very strained relationship. Thanks to Futaba's past trauma and her shut-in lifestyle, there wasn't any way that Sojiro could easily reach out to her. All he ended up doing was making sure she ate and gave her housing. In a way, he blames himself for her becoming this way. An aspect of Sojiro's confidant is him battling with the idea of whether or not he's even fit to take care of Futaba. He genuinely wonders if him taking her away from her blood family was even the correct decision. 
Something that he admits to somewhat late into his confidant is that he's actively trying to avoid any sort of conflict that comes with a genuine relationship. He'd rather just take a back seat and let things sort themselves out than actively get involved in them. Though it's through spending time with Ren that he's able to gain a new perspective. He always told himself to never step out of line, and just deal with the hand you're dealt with in life to guarantee yourself an easy way out of trouble. But Sojiro learns that there is always something worth fighting for, and even if there is conflict as a result, that shouldn't demotivate you into just being idle. I like Sojiro a lot as a character, but a problem I have is just the pacing of this story. The first half of the confidant is completely irrelevant to the rest of the story. Sure, it sets up the appearance of Yuji, and even teases the existence of Futaba and Wakaba before they're mentioned in the main plot, but other than that, we don't get anything else out of it. If these starting ranks were removed, I really don't think the overall confidant would have been affected that much. On the opposite end, I think the latter ranks go by way too fast. The idea is supposed to be that Sojiro slowly begins to feel more attached to Ren throughout the story, and this gives him the courage to finally take that first step into rebuilding his relationship with Futaba. The problem I have is that not enough time is given to this aspect of the story for it to feel natural. In the span of a single rank, he realizes where he went wrong and clears things up with Futaba to the point where there's no issues between the two of them. It's almost as if we ran out of space for ranks so the conclusion was quickly rushed in. Overall, it's a fine story that should have had more breathing room. How about just lock Sojiro's confidant away completely until after Futaba's palace? Then we can have the entire story focus on the relationship rather than just the second half. I think this would go a long way in fixing the issues that are presented here. Number 16, The Devil, Ichiko Oya. Oya is a journalist that the Phantom Thieves use for intel during the second and third palace of the game. Once you unlock her confidant, you can find her located at the Crossroad Bar in Shinjuku. This confidant gets a lot of shit online, and in all honesty, it isn't stellar. In fact, I struggled to call it particularly good overall. The main use of this confidant is to foreshadow the influence of the late game antagonist Masayoshi Shido, while also giving us a glimpse of what happens to the people who cross him. Oya was originally working to expose a scandal involving someone connected to Shido. Oya's partner, Keio, made a big break in the story, but not too long after that, the investigation was swiftly canned and swept under the rug. Shido's associate was found dead the following day, and Keio vanished without a trace. Oya was also forced off the investigation because of her professional relationship with Keio. This has caused her to have a more cynical outlook on the world, and has been the main fuel for her drinking habits. In her free time, however, Oya slowly begins to investigate the case on her own in order to discover the truth, all the while her boss is trying his hardest to flood her with work to keep that from happening. This is a very interesting story on paper. I really like how it's connected to the main plot, but it's still justifiable as its own standalone experience. The execution, however, leaves a lot to be desired. Show Don't Tell is a common rule in media, and I think Oya's confidant is crippled because of it. It's a very hands-off story, where most of it is told to us through Oya's own words rather than experiencing any of it ourselves. Part of the reason why EY has such a great confidant is because we're actively participating in the story and Ren's actions are what helps EY get through his rough patch in life. In Oya's confidant, Ren is mostly used as a brick wall for her to spill her problems at. A lot of the confidant feels as though it solves itself rather than us, the player, having much of an impact on it. Other than changing the heart of Oya's boss so she can finally pursue the truth, we don't really end up supporting her as much as I'd like to. I don't really think the confidant is well executed and is probably one of my least favorite ones in the game. I don't have the same overwhelming hatred towards her as most people do. I mean, as a character, Oya is perfectly fine and the story has good intentions, but it's the execution of said story that's pretty boring to sit through. Number 17, The Strength, Caroline and Justine. Just like Margaret from Persona 4, there's a confidant dedicated to the new Velvet Room assistants. The way you rank up the confidant is also the same as Margaret's social link. You need to fulfill the fusion requests that are handed out to you, and by completing the tasks, you're awarded with another rank. While I do find this to be a slight improvement, improvement over Margaret's confidant, a lot of the same issues sadly still apply here. Nothing of substance happens in this confidant other than foreshadowing the true nature of the twins. Every scene plays out almost the exact same as well, with Caroline and Justine giving backhanded compliments towards Joker while also experiencing some deja vu. It gets super repetitive after a while because of this. I can't even say we learn anything new about Caroline and Justine's personalities either, since we honestly learn a lot more about them through their menu interactions than anything. So we already have a clear idea what these characters are like, and this confidant doesn't offer anything new to us story-wise. So is this confidant even necessary to the game, or was this done because Margaret had a social link? 
I have a slight feeling that the answer is the latter. Persona 5 Royal does introduce the ability to hang out with the twins outside of the Velvet Room, and I really do appreciate this inclusion. We get to see their wildly different reactions to normal everyday places like a burger joint or the aquarium. Honestly, even though this is mostly just a callback to the Elizabeth dates in P3, this stuff would have worked out way better as the compound than what we ended up getting in the vanilla game. I really do enjoy Caroline and Justine's characters. They're probably my favorite Velvet Room characters in the series, but I'm super disappointed with this decision. It's easily the worst confidant in the game, no questions. Number 18, The Counselor, Takato Maruki. Dr. Maruki is introduced right after the Kamoshida incident goes public. Maruki takes his job very seriously and genuinely wants to help these kids cope with the horrible events. He offers Ren and the others the opportunity to visit him when they have the chance to. He's a limited time confidant, however, and needs to be maxed out before he leaves the school in the middle of November if you want to access the third semester. While these counseling sessions initially start off with Maruki learning about Ren, his criminal record, and what he endured with Kamoshida, the conversation eventually takes a turn. Maruki reveals that he's been researching in cognitive science and wants to better the world with it. He's writing a paper on the human heart and asks Ren to assist him in conducting research. Really, this just means having Ren listen to different theories about this subject and see if any of them sparks inspiration. This confidant focuses almost entirely on his research, while also giving us a look into where his philosophy originated from. Marky believes that emotional pain shouldn't exist in the world. He wants to find a way to understand the human heart so he can locate someone's emotional pain and treat it. In his own words, it would be like using an antibiotic to treat a physical wound. His motivations actually come from personal experience. Maruki's fiance at the time, Rumi, experienced a very tragic event that left a deep emotional scar on her. A burglar broke into Rumi's family home and attacked her parents. Out of desperation, the criminal attacked her as well. While her physical wounds healed, the mental toll that this took on her was intense. Maruki seeing his lover suffer from post-traumatic episodes left a huge impact on him as well. He vowed that one day that he would find a way to treat these sorts of emotional scars so that no one would have to go through that pain ever again. Maruki he despises the cruel unfairness of reality and wants nothing more than to help people who have been wronged. That's what's at the core of his research paper, as well as the main topic of the story. This confidant honestly surprised me when I first played the game. I really enjoyed how thoughtful this confidant was, and just how well Maruki's character was developed throughout. We learn a lot about the guy and the way he thinks, while also discovering that he himself isn't immune to emotional pain. He's genuinely a really nice guy and wants the best for people. I also really like the topics that it brings up, such as the idea of people giving something value due to the scarcity of it, and how collective human thinking can have an impact on the world. It has great pacing, a well-developed central character, some genuine emotion to it, and is super relevant for Royal's third semester. Let's just say that I have more to talk about involving Maruki later in this video. When it comes to the individual confidant discussions, that's about all I had to talk about. In terms of my overall thoughts on these stories, I like a good majority of them, but there were also quite a few that missed the mark for me. In my opinion, the highs don't quite reach the same level as some of the ones from P3 and P4, but there's also the fact that the lows aren't nearly as rough as those ones too, especially when compared to Persona 3, which had a lot of social links I really didn't like. I mentioned it earlier, but because of the inclusion of Memento's request, the confidants feel far more formulaic this time around. The social links in previous games all followed a pretty simple guideline. We'd meet a new character, and after getting to know them for a bit, we learn of their insecurities or life issues that they're going through, and eventually help them overcome said issues. Because of how generalized and non-specific this formula is, a lot of different stories can be told with social links. The confidant structure in Persona 5 puts an inherent limit on what kind of stories can be offered here. If you were to strip away the character specifics from the confidants, and look at how all of them are structured, then you'll notice just how similar the confidants really are. Almost every confidant revolves around an individual who's been wronged by someone of greater power than them. As the protagonist, it's your job to not only mend the wounds caused by the injustice, but also use your power as a phantom thief to change the hearts of the individual who wronged your confidant. A good majority of confidants follow this same structure, which leads them to feeling somewhat samey at the end of the day. Of course, there are a few outliers to this formula such as Mishima and Yoshida, but a good majority of confidants are structured like this. This makes some of the stories themselves feel a bit more predictable, but I wouldn't say that it cripples my enjoyment of what's offered. As I said earlier, Mementos doesn't negate character growth, and makes sense in context of who the Phantom Thieves are as people and fits their motives. I would find it completely out of character if Ren didn't step in and try to handle the situation, since he knows the feeling of being wronged by society and doesn't want anyone else to go through the same. The momentous requests pop up near the end of a character's arc, when they've already found their new resolve and want to better themselves. The Phantom Thieves just give them the opportunity to finally spread their wings. So all in all, I like the confidants in this game. While the inclusion of mementos can make them feel a bit too formulaic at times, it doesn't detract from the overall stories that are trying to be told here. Anyways, with all the gameplay and confidants under the 
the way, it's time to dive into the meat of Persona 5's main plot. This is a controversial topic to discuss. I've seen a lot of people sing this story's praises and just as many hold the opinion that it's disappointing when compared to the other entries in the series. I personally lean on the more positive side of this discussion, but that doesn't mean I'm going to ignore the areas where this story falls flat. Even though I like Persona 5's plot and I think it gets a little too much shit, that doesn't mean that I think it's perfect. Before we get started with the characters, I believe I should mention my thoughts on the way the story is presented. As I said early on in this video, Persona 5 uses Sai's interrogation of Joker as the framing device for this narrative. This means that almost everything we experience takes place before he was arrested at the start of the game. The flashback plot setup works very well when it comes to hooking players in right away, but I honestly think that it ends up doing more harm than good to the way the story is structured. Every time you establish a confidant, start a new story arc, end a story arc, or even just when the game feels like it, they'll be thrusted back to the present for size interrogation. I dislike this for a few reasons. First of all, most of these scenes are used to repeat information that we already learned from playing the game. I get the idea of wanting to remind players of relevant story details, but that could have easily been solved by checking the game's glossary. But the main reason as to why I dislike this is because the game just flat out spoils certain story events for you. The palace rulers are all revealed through these interrogation scenes, and in my opinion, I think that this kind of ruins the idea of player agency. When it's Sai establishing who rules the palace, it doesn't feel like the Phantom Thieves themselves are the ones making the decisions, but instead are just following the game's script. For example, Madarame is the second palace ruler and there's a scene where the Phantom Thieves discuss whether or not he has a palace. They just met the guy and he seems to be a very innocent old man. However, the game already told me that he has a palace and the Phantom Thieves exposed him. While the characters themselves don't have the knowledge I do, at the end of the day, I'm still in control of these characters. There's no tension for me now since I already know that the mission was a success and the Phantom Thieves are still going to be operating after this. There are a few effective uses of this narrative device, however. The Medjed incident because the media had no idea of Futaba's palace or her involvement since it never went public. The reveal of Sai Nijima's palace since it works as a great oh shit moment when she shows you that she herself got a calling card. And finally, the reveal of Goro Akechi's betrayal. However, these three good uses of this narrative structure doesn't make up for the over 20 times I think it's misused. I would have preferred it if we had the same story, but it's told in a linear form fashion. While this would have made the Akechi twist weaker, I think that the tension of the characters knowing his betrayal is coming would completely recontextualize their actions during that story arc. Of course, this doesn't ruin the story, but it's how I've always felt about flashback narratives, and I'm not going to make an exception because of the few good uses of it. Anyways, onto the main meat of this discussion. I want to talk about the main party members first. Since I've already discussed their confidants, I just want to give a brief overview of their introductions to the story, and my overall thoughts on how their characters were executed. Let's start off with the game's best friend character. Character, Ryuji Sakamoto. Since Ryuji is one of the first party members in the game, I already somewhat went over his origins. He's an ex-member of the track and field team who suffered a lot from Kamoshida's abuse. He's a very brash and hot-headed individual who isn't afraid to speak his mind. This, combined with Ryuji's short temper at times, lands the group into hot water on more than one occasion. Though at the end of the day, Ryuji definitely has a heart of gold and genuinely wants the best for the people around him. Ryuji is one of the few characters in the game whose main story arc lasts throughout most of the runtime. While he takes Phantom Thieves business very seriously and genuinely wants to make changes to society, he can't help but end up getting caught up in the hype of it all. In Ryuji's own words, he wants to change the world with a bang. Throughout the start of the game, we see that Ryuji's desire for fame and popularity end up taking priority over his initial goals. He actively encourages the rest of the team to try to up themselves when it comes to who they target. Even somewhat early on, he suggests that they go after the CEO of a company for the sake of getting attention. On more than one occasion, Ryuji even tosses the idea around of revealing his identity as a phantom thief. Ryuji's character arc after he's introduced is him losing sight of what's important, before rediscovering why the phantom thieves exist to begin with. I think that this is a perfectly realistic flaw with his character. For the longest time, he was considered an outcast because of the Kamoshida incident, and began to distance himself from everyone by acting like a thug, so the fact that he's making a difference in the world and receiving praise for it makes him yearn for more. This excitement leads him to act carelessly on multiple occasions. It's because of Ryuji that Makoto finds out who the phantom thieves these are. His obsession with fame is also one of the main instigators to the momentary breakup during the Okumura arc, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Ryuji gets a lot of flack from players because he can be pretty obnoxious and I can't help but feel as though that group specifically missed the point. 
He's just a teenager at the end of the day, so it's totally believable that the notoriety of the Phantom Thieves would have an effect on him. His main character arc is him stumbling a bit before getting back on track and realizing that the popularity wasn't the reason as to why he fights for justice. There's also the fact that on multiple occasions, you can directly call out Ryuji for being full of himself. Ryuji is one of my favorite members of the Phantom Thieves, because not only does he have a strong arc in the main story, but a solid confidant that wraps up any loose ends with his character. For me personally, Ryuji never crossed the line of being endearingly obnoxious to being flat out infuriating, which really shows how much restraint Atlas had with his character. Next up to bat is On. Much like Ryuji, she's introduced during the Kamoshida arc. On is a foreigner who doesn't have many friends outside of her best friend Shiho. On was forced to endure Kamoshida's advances for the sake of keeping Shiho on the volleyball team, but ends up joining the Phantom Thieves when her friend attempts to commit suicide after being sexually assaulted by Kamoshida. On starts off as an incredibly strong and forward character. She doesn't take crap from anyone and is one of the most level handed members of the team. On joins the Phantom Thieves not just out of the desire to help the weak, but it's so she can also improve the strength of her own heart. As I mentioned earlier, that was one of the topics that On's confidant attempted to tackle. On makes a great first impression, but sadly doesn't have a whole lot else going on for her after she's introduced. We get some glimpses here and there as to what her personality is like. She isn't exactly academically inclined, is a pretty terrible actress but has convinced herself otherwise, and has a talent for being able to correctly judge someone's character based on a first impression. Her confidant is where her real character development lies, but as I mentioned earlier, I can't quite say that it was flawlessly executed. I enjoy An's character a lot during the more light-hearted slice of life scenes in the game, but other than that, I think she's pretty underutilized in the main story. That doesn't make her character on its own bad, but I would have liked to have seen her have a more active role as a member of the team. At the very least, I can say that An is a well-defined character. Her introduction, along with her confidant and slice of life scenes, really do paint a good picture of her as an individual. We get to see her likes, dislikes, and her moments of weakness. She's a good character that sadly doesn't have as much time to shine as the others. Yusuke is the fourth party member that joins the Phantom Thieves. Yusuke is an artist, and he's introduced as Madarame's current pupil. The Phantom Thieves first meet him because he asks On to be his model for a painting. There are also some nasty rumors floating around about Madarame plagiarizing artists' work online, so they use the opportunity to confirm the validity of them with Yusuke. While at first he denies these accusations, it's eventually revealed that Yusuke has been creating pieces and letting Madarame take credit for them. In his own eyes, Yusuke sees this as a form of repayment for Madarame being his foster parent. Yusuke doesn't know the truth behind Madarame's schemes, so he has a bit of a warped viewpoint of what he's doing. It's only when Yusuke accidentally enters the metaverse and discovers Madarame's palace when his eyes finally open. Yusuke cares very deeply about art and looked up to Madarame because he believed that he was the one responsible for the Sayori. So discovering that Madarame never cared about art on the same level as Yusuke originally thought he did shook the young man's world. Madarame only cared about the fame and fortune that this medium could provide, and only saw Yusuke and his previous pupils as a means of achieving this. What Yusuke learns from this experience is that just because you care about someone, or feel like you owe them something, that doesn't mean you should excuse their terrible actions. A lot of Yusuke's character development after this comes from his confidant, which I thought was a pretty great story. It questioned Yusuke's artistic abilities and had him find a new understanding in the medium. I really enjoy Yusuke's character, but much like On, he doesn't really have a whole lot to do in the main story. His confidant more than makes up for that, however, and it really does give Yusuke some very strong character development. There's a strong balance of Yusuke's social unawareness being used for comedic relief while also having some genuine emotional moments in his confidant. A lot of what I said about An could be easily applied to Yusuke, but I find the execution of the ideas more impactful for him than I did for her. But there's no denying that both characters aren't really used much in the main plot other than just being more firepower for the Phantom Thieves. Makoto Nijima is the student council president of Shujin Academy and the younger sibling of prosecutor Sai Nijima. Makoto's character highlights the stress that comes from not only living up to the family name, but also has a great focus on the stress and isolation she experiences from social expectations. Makoto, at the start of the game, is portrayed as a bit of an antagonist. As student council president, she's given the responsibility to follow with any order the principal gives her. She knew about Kamoshida's abuse, but was powerless to put a stop to it, as it could put her own future at risk. What I like a lot about Makoto is that the writers do actually portray her as a pretty sympathetic person, even though she's initially at odds with our characters. She represents what this society expects out of the youth, being obedient until the very end and not questioning any authority. This is portrayed in a way that while Makoto was given a successful future, she absolutely hates the position she's in. Success doesn't necessarily equate to a happy or fulfilling life. She can't really relate to the other students her age, since she's seen as a stuck-up, emotionless lapdog. Makoto's strained relationship with her older sister Sai is also a core aspect of her character. After the death of their father, Sai was the one shackled with the
the responsibility to provide for herself as well as her younger sister. This has caused her to become very stressed, and she sees Makoto as a burden more than as family. It's because of this that Makoto's self-esteem is very low, and her main desire is to prove herself to be useful to others. But no matter how hard she studies or how well she follows the rules, that still can't change the fact that she's an incredibly lonely person. Makoto's primary motivation for joining the Phantom Thieves is rooted in her own experiences of being conditioned to conform to society's expectations, ignoring obvious flaws or terrible people out of fear of being reprimanded for stepping out of line. She genuinely wants to make a change in the world, but at the same time, she also wants to prove to herself that she isn't useless outside of her academics. Makoto acts as the main strategist, as well as the voice of reason to the Phantom Thieves. I like Makoto's character a lot in the main story, but where she falters the most is in her confidant. We're front-loaded with a lot of interesting information regarding Makoto, but the confidant doesn't seem to take any advantage of this. As I mentioned earlier, it's far more focused on her friend than it is on Makoto as an individual, but that doesn't diminish her worth in the overall narrative. A common criticism with Makoto is that after her introduction, she essentially takes the leadership role of the Phantom Thieves, kicking Joker out of the spotlight. While she is a very prominent member and does have a lot of moments to shine, I don't really agree with this. The entire point of her character is proving to herself and the others around her that she's a capable person. Since she's the student council president, she already has some leadership abilities, so it's only natural that the other characters would rely on her. At the end of the day, Joker still does call most of the shots, and is easily the most viable member thanks to his wildcard abilities. Everyone has their own dedicated role in the team, but Makoto's just so happens to be a very integral role compared to the rest. That's just my opinion on it anyways, and it's understandable if you think she does get too much screen time, especially if you're not a fan of her character. Futaba is the team's elite hacker and resident shut-in. What makes her stand out amongst the rest of the Phantom Thieves is that she herself has a palace. Futaba's mother Wakaba was a lead researcher in the field of cognitive science. She was specifically studying the idea of the existence of a cognitive world and how it can affect people. Obviously, this is supposed to be the metaverse, but at the time, no one had any idea of its existence. One day, Futaba's mother suffered from a mental shutdown and ended up committing suicide right in front of her young daughter. This event traumatized Futaba, to the point of shutting herself off from the outside world. Since she never learned the truth of what happened, Futaba's self-hatred and warped perception of the events around her are the source of her heart's distortion. She sees her room as a tomb that she's going to stay trapped in until the day she dies. This is reflected really well visually in the metaverse. Of course, there's the obvious, such as Futaba being the pharaoh of said tomb, but what I really like is how far away this place is from the rest of the village. Futaba is so closed off emotionally that she sees anything outside of her room as a massive distance from her tomb. Futaba reached out to the Phantom Thief so that she can have her guilt erased, and in return, she'll deal with the hacker group Medjed. By the end of the palace, however, Futaba ends up gaining access to the Metaverse navigation app and explores her own heart. It's in here where she encounters her own shadow, and she's finally able to accept the truth. By doing so, she's able to awaken to her persona, and with the help of the Phantom Thieves, she battle against the warped cognitive version of her own mother. This boss fight represents Futaba finally putting her guilt to rest. The remainder of Futaba's character after this is dedicated to having her reintegrate herself into society. It's the main focus of her confidant, along with something that's worked on throughout the main story. Her main motivation for joining the Phantom Thieves is so that she can find out who was responsible for stealing Wakaba's research, and forcing her to have a mental shutdown. I find Futaba to be a pretty compelling character. The way her issues are presented reminds me of the way it was handled in Persona 4, where the characters themselves had to face their own shadows and accept the truth that they've been running away from. In Futaba's case, the truth is something that she was inadvertently hiding from herself because of her trauma. Even when she confronts herself and tames her shadow, it doesn't fix her social anxiety. It's a major part of her character that's worked on throughout the remainder of the game. Something that I'm not personally a fan of is some of Futaba's dialogue. She's very keen on using internet slang and making references to pop culture such as anime, manga, video games, all that other stuff. I'm personally not the biggest fan of this type of dialogue because it has the potential of aging terribly, but in the context of this character, it definitely makes sense. She spends an unhealthy amount of time on the internet and isn't exactly familiar with face-to-face -face social interaction. It only really makes sense that she would relate unfamiliar social ideas to stuff that she already knows and likes. People make references all the time in the real world, but in a story, I personally feel as though this has the potential of making the dialogue feel dated. I don't think that they go too overboard with the references, but I would have preferred it if they toned it down just a bit. Next up is Haru Okumura. She's the daughter of the fifth palace ruler, Kunikazu Okumura, and is the next heir of Okumura Foods. Haru was raised to be very obedient and do what's best for the company. Her relationship with her father slowly began to degrade when his ambitions began to overpower his love for her. Haru was eventually forced 
forced into an arranged marriage agreement with an abusive spouse, so that Okumura could achieve presidency over an associate. While Haru wants to avoid her arranged marriage, she still can't bring herself to fully stand up against her father. This is the main reason as to why she's the only character to not fully awaken to their persona right away. There's a part of her that's deluding herself into believing that her father isn't as corrupt as everyone else thinks, and that he still cares about her. But upon confronting his shadow and learning that Okumura foods and even Haru herself are just a means to an end, she finds the resolve to finally stand up against his authority and fully awakens to her persona. The most common complaint with Haru is that she doesn't get enough screen time to make her a compelling character. This is something that I fully agree with. Haru was introduced during a very hectic point in the game's story, and sadly ends up being sidelined in favor of focusing on wrapping up the Morgana drama. What's even more disappointing is that after she's introduced, Haru takes a complete back seat, and is almost entirely relegated to being the team's firepower. Haru is probably the most disappointing member of the Phantom Thieves because there wasn't enough time for her to shine. All of this would be a different story if Haru got the same treatment that Naoto did in Persona 4. In that game, Naoto was an active force throughout most of the game until they became a mainstay party member. Even after they joined the party, Naoto is easily the most proactive and useful member on the team next to Narukami. Haru would have greatly benefited if her character made more frequent appearances before joining the party. The only time this happens is during the school's Hawaii trip, and even then we don't learn too much about her at that time. Completing Haru's confidant feels almost essential for her character because there just wasn't enough room to include that stuff in the main story. As I said in the confidant section, I actually really enjoyed my time with it and I think it's one of the better confidants in my opinion. Haru has always been a pretty entertaining character for me. She has a very sweet and gentle personality in the real world, but using her in battle is such a contrast to that personality as she talks about the thrill of cutting down shadows. But these small glimpses of her personality aren't enough to fulfill my desire for her character to shine. The last party member I want to discuss for now is Morgana. Much like Teddy from Persona 4, Morgana is an amnesiac creature that originated from the alternate world. He's knowledgeable with how the mechanics of the metaverse work, and his primary motivation is to discover more about his past. His character arc is spread throughout the entire game and is presented as an automatic confidant. To say that Morgana is a mixed character for players would be a huge understatement. A lot of discussions surrounding Morgana tend to be on the character's negative aspects rather than what the story is actually about. In my opinion, Morgana has a very interesting character arc that sadly isn't executed with the grace needed for it to stick the landing. Morgana is one of those characters that was written to be intentionally unlikable at the start of the game. The general idea is that throughout the game, you're supposed to learn more about them so you can sympathize with their situation, so that when the character goes through their redemption, it's all the more satisfying. In Morgana's case, we slowly learn more about his insecurities and his longing to find a place where he belongs. He wears a metaphorical mask around others so that he can hide his weaknesses from the other members of the Phantom Thieves. He comes off very cocky and abrasive most of the time, but deep down, he's afraid of what the future holds for himself, and he's very reluctant to share his emotions. Throughout the game, we get to see glimpses of Morgana's insecurities as more members join the Phantom Thieves. Each passing member slowly begins to phase him out of the group. Makoto takes the role of being the group's strategist, and Futaba's knowledge and ability to manipulate the cognitive world surpasses Morgana in every way. So Morgana's character is about realizing that even though he can't fully relate to the Phantom Thieves and may not even be human, he still has a place where he belongs. At the end of the day, they're all friends and that's all that should matter, not what you can bring to the table as a member of the team. This is a pretty decent idea for this character. The problem with Morgana, however, is that the execution of this leaves a lot to be desired. Much like Yukari from Persona 3, I think that Atlas tried way too hard to make the character unlikable at the start. It becomes a lot less about the character using aggression or sarcasm to hide away their true feelings, and more so just comes off as the character just being an all-around asshole. When people talk about Morgana as a character, most of the things brought up are his self-grandeur, selfishness, cockiness, and all around just his generally toxic behavior. The reason as to why this is the first thing people think of is because this is the side of Morgana that we see throughout most of the game. I understand that Morgana doesn't want to be seen as emotionally vulnerable, but we get way too much of his abrasiveness. Combine this with the fact that Morgana is almost always with the player, then I can definitely see why someone would find him irritating. I believe it's time to address one of the most infamous scenes in the game. Early in September, the Phantom Thieves discover that Kinokazo Okumura has greatly risen on the fan site for the most requested target. This prompts Ryuji to immediately suggest that they go after Okumura once they discover that he has a palace. While Morgana initially agrees with the idea, that all changes when he hears Ryuji's main motivation for doing so. In his own words, Ryuji suggests that they go after Okumura because if they didn't, it would go against what the general public would want. However, most of the team is rather mixed on the idea due to not having enough evidence of him being a criminal. At this point in the story, Morgana is at his boiling point and wants to prove himself to be a useful asset to the 
13. So hearing everyone suddenly back down from going after Okumura is what causes him to lash out and decide to go after the man on his own. This is an event that takes a lot of in-game days to resolve, and while the idea behind the scene is admirable, it just doesn't work out for one major reason. This is the first and only time the Phantom Thieves ever disagree on a target, so Morgana storming off in a fit makes him look very childish. While the intention was that he wanted to prove himself as a useful asset then and there, him storming off like this is possibly the worst decision that he could ever make. That decision is very inconsistent with the rest of his character where he's previously shown to be someone who doesn't take any unnecessary risks. Morgana snaps over a simple disagreement and it comes off as an overreaction. This would easily be more believable if there were more times where the Phantom Thieves disagreed with each other, or if there was already tension within the group. The actual dialogue in this scene in question also elevates far too quickly. While the real reason as to why Morgana left was due to his insecurities, people still misinterpret this part of the game as Morgana leaving because of Ryuji. That definitely wasn't the intention, but the fact that so many people believe this shows that there was a bit of a problem with how this was presented. I like Morgana's character at points. When the writers show restraint and portray the character in a more neutral position, or even near the end of the game when he finally starts opening up to his team, I find myself genuinely caring about him. But when his flaws are drilled in so often, the only things I can ask myself is when he's going to shut up. Comparing Morgana to Teddy also doesn't do him any favors. While Teddy can be annoying, it was more so in the way that you get annoyed with your little brother or a close friend. At the end of the day, he means well, and in my opinion, he perfectly represents the themes of Persona 4. His story does heavily rely on whether or not you enjoy his personality, but there still is a very clear and very strong message of identity and not letting your upbringing define who you are. I struggle to say the same things about Morgana. I don't hate this character, I want to make that clear. There's a lot of good ideas here, but it's the execution that I have to call into question. I also think that they should have resolved his character struggles later in the story. There's a lot going on in the Akumara arc and sadly, the Morgana stuff ends up taking priority over Haru's introduction. Or at the very least, this section should have put an equal amount of focus on both characters instead of just sidelining Haru. Overall, I like the cast of Persona 5. There are some really interesting and well-crafted characters in here, and while some don't reach their fullest potential, I struggle to call any of them bad or underdeveloped. Persona 5 handles character development the same way Persona 4 does, where after the character's introduction, it's up to the player to do the confidants to not only wrap up their stories, but learn more about them as people. However, I think that the confidants for the party members are a bit weaker than Persona 4's overall. There are some really good ones here, like Ryuji and Yusuke, but I found myself enjoying the Persona 4 social links more. A lot of the party member confidants this time around lacked focus, which is something that I couldn't say about the investigation team. All the social links there were dedicated to wrapping up the characters' issues that were brought up in the main story. Overall quality notwithstanding, the idea was much tighter in Persona 4. Persona 5 only does this with a few select party members while others end up getting confidants that focus on entirely different aspects of themselves. This creates a much more broad view of the character as an individual, but in terms of a compelling story, I find it a bit lacking. I think that the cast here is well-rounded, and while some don't get as much attention as I would have liked, I wouldn't go as far as saying that any of them were underdeveloped. Haru is probably the weakest character overall, but at least she has a good confidant to make up for it. I've seen people say that the Phantom Thieves don't feel like friends, and I really don't agree with that. They spend a lot of time with each other and have good chemistry. Morgana's entire character arc is learning to confide in his friends for crying out loud. While they don't spend as much time together as the investigation team does, they still constantly talk to each other through text messages and make the time to go to events as a group, even if there aren't as many in this game as there are in Persona 4. Depending on who you ask, this can be either a good or a bad thing. Persona 5 is a much darker game than Persona 4, but it still does have moments of levity to keep the game from feeling grim and to make moments of tension hit much harder. However, something that I have to bring up is the use of humor in certain areas. Don't get me wrong, Persona 5 is a funny game when it tries to be, but there are moments where the attempts at humor either fall flat or causes some tonal whiplash. The biggest offender of this has to be one of the final palaces in the game. At this point in the story, the tension is high. The Phantom Thieves are going after their biggest target yet who poses a threat to the entire country. Everyone gets their moment to shine and during the escape, Ryuji is seemingly killed after he secures a life raft. When the rest of the thieves come back to reality, it's revealed that Ryuji actually survived the explosion without any scratch. Instead of, oh, I don't know, thanking him for saving their lives or being happy that he's safe, what happens is that the girls end up kicking the shit out of him for making them worry. I get that this was supposed to be a joke, but it undercuts the genuinely fantastic scene that came before it. Thankfully, this is about as bad as the problem gets, but stuff like this happens just enough time for it to be worth mentioning. 
Alright, so I believe it's time for me to discuss the main plot and themes of Persona 5. I'm going to be ignoring each individual palace ruler and instead just focus on the story as a whole. Unlike the other Persona games, Persona 5 is a more traditional Villain of the Week setup. Each story arc has their own dedicated antagonist that's meant to highlight the flaws in Japanese society. While I like most of the palace rulers in this game, I struggle to say that any of them are particularly great. It feels good to send in the calling card and expose their crimes to the world, but as villains on their own, there is isn't a whole lot for me to really analyze that isn't just shown in the game. I think that they serve their job well enough, but aren't exactly what I would call the main attraction. The more interesting palace rulers end up being Futaba because she's a party member, and Sai Nijima because she isn't exactly evil per se, but does have a very warped idea of justice that slowly begins to corrupt her. The only one that I can't give a whole lot of credit towards is the third palace ruler, Junya Kaneshiro. He highlights the shady criminal underside that's hiding in plain sight, but I struggle to say that he makes any sort of lasting impact on me personally. Persona 5's antagonists all have at least one thing that make them stand out. Kamoshida was the origin story that deeply affected the founding members, Matarami was the Phantom Thieves' first big case outside of their debut, and focused on a student being mentally and physically abused. Okumura's palace was the peak of the group's popularity and eventual downfall. I struggle to think of what effects this palace had on the main story that wasn't covered by any of the others. I also find Shido to be a pretty disappointing villain overall. He has a lot of build-up throughout the main story, as well as a very ambitious plan, but we don't really learn much about him or where his mindset spawned from. The reason as to why I'm not as critical towards the previous antagonist is because their purpose was to be stepping stones towards Shido. He's the main antagonist of the story, and the reason why Ren has a criminal record in the first place. I would have appreciated if we learned more about Shido's motivations or background so that we can get a better idea as to who he is as a person. My thoughts on him are the same as Strega from Persona 3. He's more so just a means to an end rather than being interesting on his own. It's a shame because of how involved he is in the world of Persona 5 and his relevance to the backstory of characters. Where the antagonists truly shine are on the effect they have on the Phantom Thieves as a group. Something that Persona 5's story tackles is the impact that fame and popularity has on the Phantom Thieves. While Ryuji is the obvious example of this, the status of the Phantom Thieves does have an impact on the other members. Something Thing you'll start to notice is that the people the Phantom Thieves target slowly become less about their main goal of inspiring people to stand up against injustice, but more so what would increase their popularity. It's impossible to doubt that the Phantom Thieves act for a force of good and have good intentions, but they aren't above having their views shaped by public opinion. This all culminates in the Yokumura arc. While he does have a palace and is going down a dark path so they can potentially break into the political world, when you think about it, he really isn't as despicable as the previous targets. The only reason as to why the Thieves initially began to look into him was a combination of his name being associated with mental shutdown cases, and more importantly, because of where he was on the fan site rankings. We don't find out until later in the game that the fan site was tampered with by an outside force trying to sabotage the Phantom Thieves. Since they were so focused on giving the people what they wanted, they ended up being manipulated into targeting Okumura. So when Okumura has a mental shutdown, the Phantom Thieves end up taking the fall for the incident. It takes until the group hits their lowest point for them to realize where they went wrong. It became less about making a change in the world World, but improving how many people would support the group. I find this stuff really well executed and super engaging. I wouldn't call Persona 5's plot perfect by any means, but I'd like to give credit where credit is due. A main plot point throughout most of Persona 5's runtime is whether or not the Phantom Thieves are doing the right thing. Not only do the Phantom Thieves constantly doubt themselves throughout the entire game, but the general public also have some concerns over their activity. This is where Garo Akechi comes into play. For most of the story, he's supposed to represent the voice of the general public, and challenges the Phantom Thieves' view on their own actions. While we know what we're doing is morally correct in some way, the general public doesn't know that. From their perspective, the Phantom Thieves are a group that operates exclusively in the shadows, and only choose major targets seemingly at random. The question that ends up being proposed is whether or not the Phantom Thieves should be the ones making the decision of who should or shouldn't be punished for their crimes. But let's talk about Akechi real quick. Akechi is by far one of the most interesting characters to talk about. He's a young prodigy detective and assistant to Sai Nijima. He has a strong sense of what he believes in, and his sense of justice makes him constantly at odds with the Phantom Thieves. From what we're shown and told throughout the game, Akechi is supposed to represent the side of the law that follows the traditional justice system. However, the problem with Akechi is that there is far too much going on with his character for it to really feel coherent. There's a lot more to Akechi than what's first shown to us. Very early on, we're told of a mysterious Persona user in a black mask that's using palaces for their own personal gain. It's an ongoing mystery throughout, and we're even shown that this person is a hitman for for powerful or influential figures. When Akechi temporarily joins the party, he says that he only just recently gained access to the metaverse and has gotten a lead on who this person is. However, since Sai is slowly losing her sense of 
justice and is willing to break the rules to catch the Phantom Thieves, her heart needs to be changed. Akechi ends up blackmailing the group with incriminating evidence and requests them to change Sai's heart with him. His only condition is that after they change Sai's heart, they'll have to disband their team and leave the rest of the investigation up to the police. But as it turns out, Akechi ended up selling out the Phantom Thieves, which leads to Joker's capture at the start of the game. Not only that, but he's also revealed to be the Black Mask Killer and was planning on assassinating Joker in the interrogation room. Due to him having a slip up way earlier in the game, the Thieves anticipated this and used the metaverse to their advantage. It's a pretty complicated and long plan. It hinged on Joker being able to convince Sai to have a change of heart without stealing her treasure so that her palace would remain. I actually really like this because it incorporates an aspect of Mishima's confidant and reinforces the idea of the way bonds can affect someone. Akechi is one of the most polarizing characters in the entire Persona community. When Akechi's facade is finally dropped, his personality takes a complete 180. The main problem with Akechi is that they stretch his character too thin so that he could fit multiple contradicting ideas. The basic of Akechi's character is pretty simple. We have someone who wears a mask around others and pretends to have a strong sense of justice. His true feelings and motivations are the complete opposite with how he presents himself. Akechi is a very emotionally damaged person who desperately wants to get revenge on his father, Masayu Shishido. Before Akechi was born, Shido abandoned his mother and left her to raise her son on her own. In Japanese society, having an illegitimate child can ruin your career, so Akechi's mother ended up being shamed to the point where she committed suicide. Akechi was passed around child institutions as an orphan. He vowed to make Shido pay for ruining his life along with his mother's. This on its own is a great motivation for Akechi to commit his crimes. He was wronged in life and he wants revenge. That makes total sense. He's supposed to be a warped reflection of the Phantom Thieves, an outcast that was wronged by society, but instead of using his gift to make a positive change in the world, he instead used it for selfish gain. He desperately wants Shido to pay for his crimes, but ends up throwing his own life away in order to achieve that goal. I actually really enjoy this, but the problem for me stems from the fact that there's no clear line drawn for what Akechi's true beliefs are. The game acts as though Akechi is supposed to be the law representative while Joker is the chaos representative. However, Akechi doesn't exactly fit the bill for being a law representative. He certainly does in the first half of his character. He wants to uphold the status quo, and is in support of the current justice system. However, was that sense of justice just a part of his facade, or did he actually believe in it? In the original Persona 5, we never get to see that dividing line, and are only show the extremes of both sides. If that one line was removed, I honestly think that Akechi's character and role in the story would make a lot more sense. He already had enough to his character. Him secretly working for Shido so that he could eventually act his revenge is all that he really needed. Trying to force a connection with Joker and how they're two sides of the same coin is pretty unnecessary and doesn't really hold up when he reveals himself as the Black Mask. The idea that Joker and Akechi had some sort of strong bond in the original game falls pretty flat too. His confidant was one that automatically ranked up, and and because of that, it felt less like we had a rivalry with Akechi, and more so that we were told that we did. Thankfully, Persona 5 Rural takes strides in fixing these missteps with Akechi's brand new confidant. Instead of being an automatic one, this is a confidant that you have to do manually, and focuses on learning about Akechi as an individual, as well as hinting at his true nature. I find this to be way better than what we had before, not only because the information is presented in a much more natural way than previously, but making the player choose to spend time with Akechi makes his eventual betrayal all the more effective. However, the best part of this new confidant has to be his rank 8 event. Throughout the confidant, we see that Akechi has a bit of a competitive spirit, and is at first shown to be going easy on Ren. However, Akechi makes the promise that if Ren beats him, he won't hold back next time. The rank 8 event is the payoff to this buildup as Akechi takes Ren to Mementos in order to fight him. This alone gives us a good insight into Akechi's true nature, and his dialogue shows just how envious he is towards him. Despite how much Akechi hates Ren, he still very much respects him as a rival. They're in a very similar circumstance in life, but their bond doesn't come from a place of friendship. Instead, it manifests in how they're able to push each other beyond their limits. This new confidant does so much for Akechi that I'm able to feel more sympathy towards him. While I would never try to justify Akechi's actions, I'm not going to pretend that I didn't feel bad for the way he ended up. Granted, Royal doesn't change the fact that he's supposed to represent Law, and while I still find that a pretty dumb decision because it just doesn't work, it doesn't ruin his character for me. The last main plot element to address in Vanilla Persona 5 is the final dungeon as well as the overall themes present there. We're going to need a little bit more context for what's going on here.
here. After the group steals Shido's heart and makes him confess for his crimes, the public seemingly doesn't react to this at all. Not only that, but the Phantom Thieves are being treated as if they never existed. Morgana believes that something has to be going on inside of Mementos that's causing all of this, and with no better options, the group decides that they need to investigate. What they find is rather unsettling. We discover that the shadows of society are willingly being held inside of these jail cells. This includes the shadows of the previous palace rulers. They are grateful that their desires were stolen so that they could be sent to the jail where they no longer have to think for themselves. The Phantom Thieves begin to suspect that there's some greater power in charge of containing all the shadows and making them act like this. Upon reaching the bottom of Mementos, the thieves come across the treasure of society, the Holy Grail itself. Every palace in Persona 5 is supposed to represent one of the deadly sins of mankind. In case of the Memento Steps Palace, this one represents the sin of sloth. The idea that's supposed to be represented here is that humanity is either too afraid, ignorant, or lazy to live their lives on their own. What humanity yearns for is someone to guide them and make all their life decisions for them. This desire is what gave birth to the god of control, Yaldabaoth. In the Persona series, gods are linked to the collective unconsciousness. For example, in Persona 3, the goddess of death Nyx was created due to man mankind's secret yearning for death. The same rules apply here. Humanity desires to be controlled so that they no longer need to think for themselves, and Yaldabaoth is there to fulfill that role. When Yaldabaoth manifested, it created the metaverse along with it. Yaldabaoth secretly had a hand in everything that happened in the story. It's because of him that Shido rose in popularity and was about to be elected to rule the country. Yaldabaoth's experiment was to see which side of humanity's desires was stronger, the side of humanity that wanted to rebel against the status quo and reform the world, or the desire to remain complacent and keep things the way they were. As I mentioned briefly earlier, Yaldabaoth chose Joker and Akechi as the Chaos and Law representatives respectively to see which side would prevail. At the end of the day, Yaldabaoth decided that humanity wouldn't be able to learn from their ignorance, and decided that the world would be better off destroyed and recreated from the ground up. Yaldabaoth was actually built up throughout most of the game, believe it or not. It's stated that he forced his way into the Velvet Room and imprisoned Igor while also splitting the true assistant Lavenza in half. The Igor that we've been seeing has actually been Yaldabaoth about throughout the entire game, and as a longtime player of the series, I really enjoyed this twist and didn't see it coming. When I first heard how deep and menacing Igor's voice was in this game, I at first took it as Atlas wanting to change voice actors. Igor's purpose in the Persona games is to help guide the protagonist through the fool's journey, but in Persona 5, Igor seems very antagonistic this time around. The fusion methods are far more brutal, and he refers to the journey as a rehabilitation. Igor's very first line in the game gives it away if you're keen enough. When he greets the protagonist, he usually says, Welcome to the Velvet Room. However, in Persona 5, he says this, Trickster, welcome to my Velvet Room. It's a small detail, but it's appreciated nonetheless. The Igor twist might not work as well if you're a new player to the series, but as someone who played a lot of these games before Persona 5, I was thoroughly surprised. This finale is a very strong one in my opinion, not just because it pays off the mysteries that were built up throughout the entire game, such as Morgana's true identity and the stuff surrounding Caroline and Justine, but because it perfectly encapsulates the themes of the game. Our lives aren't set in stone. We can change not only ourselves, but also forge a new path to follow if it's one that we believe in. We as people have the power to make a difference if we put our minds to it. While life can be difficult and there will always be people that try to hold you down, you can and should stand up against it. This is shown with our party members, our confidants, and by the end of the game, the entire country. With the combined hope of everyone, we can finally break free from our chains. Be gone. Preposterous! You dare all your evil wishes! Normally, this is where Persona 5 would end. Now that Yaldabaoth has been destroyed and the metaverse has been erased, Shido can now be put on trial. However, Sai explains that Ren needs to testify in order to prove him guilty. Because of his association with the Phantom Thieves as well as his criminal record, there's no doubt that he'll end up being sent to Juvenile Hall. With no other options, Ren accepts the deal. However, there still is hope for him. With the combined effort of the remaining members of the Phantom Thieves, as well as the Confidants, they're able to get in contact with the woman who was paid off to testify against Ren and clear his name. 
With his assault charge now scrubbed from its criminal record, Ren is finally able to walk free. A few months go by, and it's finally time for Ren to return home, but not without going on one last road trip with his close friends. But, since this is Persona 5 Royal, things end up playing out a bit differently. If you've met the right conditions, you'll gain access to the game's brand new content. And I'm probably not alone in saying this, but the third semester of Persona 5 is easily the best part of the entire game. Once the new year rolls around, you'll notice that everything seems off. This ranges from smaller things such as On hanging out with Shiho even though she moved away, Ryuji being the star runner of a track and field team, and even more crazy ideas such as Morgana having a human form, and Wakaba Ishiki being alive. Not only that, however, Goro Akechi is also alive and he comes to LeBlanc to find out what's going on here. This leads the two of them and the character Kasumi Yoshizawa to investigate the palace that's appeared at a construction site. Upon investigating, they discover that the one behind what's going on is none other than Dr. Maruki himself. He somehow obtained the power to manipulate reality however he chooses, and has been using this ability to grant the dreams of everyone all over the country. Alright, this is a lot to take in, so let's break it down bit by bit. Throughout the game, Dr. Maruki has been visited by different members of the Phantom Thieves for therapy sessions. In these conversations, they had explained their emotional troubles and struggles that they had to go through. When Yaldabaoth was defeated after Mementos was merged with the real world, the Phantom Thieves ended up taking the place of humanity's saviors. However, since the Phantom Thieves confided in Maruki and wished for the reality like the one he suggested, they unconsciously handed over the role to him. That's a very basic rundown of what happened, but the game goes into a lot more detail about how his power actually works. I won't waste your time and explain that. Right now, I want to give Kasumi her time in the spotlight because at the start of the third semester, the truth about her is revealed. When we were first introduced to Kasumi, we learned that she's an honor student who received a Shujin Academy scholarship for her talents in gymnastics. Something that should immediately catch your attention about Kasumi is that her confidant only has five ranks to it. When going through this confidant, we learn a little bit about Kasumi. She's a very cheerful and friendly person, but we learn pretty early on that she's going through a bit of a slump, and her coach has told her to take a break to think about who she really is. She remembers hearing that her best trait was her boldness, so she requests to spend more time with Ren in order to regain her confidence. We learn a little more about Kasumi throughout her confidant, such as her interest in cooking and her anxiety about failure. On its own, it's nothing that I'd call particularly special, but what makes this interesting is that Kasumi has a lot more complications than what she's letting on. We learned that somewhat recently, her sister Sumire passed away in a car accident. It's a rather touchy subject for her, so many people respectfully don't bring it up. However, we're not told the truth of what actually happened until the third semester. The girl that we've been seeing in front of us is actually Sumire Yoshizawa, and the girl who died was her twin sister Kasumi. Sumire's true personality is radically different from the Kasumi persona that she immersed herself in. Sumire has a deep inferiority complex, and was incredibly jealous of her sister. Kasumi was a prodigy at gymnastics. She'd be able to quickly memorize routines and perform them with grace, while Sumire would often struggle and lag behind her sister. Kasumi would outperform Sumire in almost every way, and because of this, Sumire developed a very toxic mindset. She thought that if she didn't live up to the standard set by her sister, that she was a worthless person that wouldn't even be pitied if she died. This caused her to spiral down in a suicidal depression, and one day after practice, tragedy struck. In an emotional outburst, Sumire ran away from her sister and was almost hit by a car speeding down the road. At the last second, Kasumi pushed her out of the way and ended up dying because of it. Sumire became chained down by her survivor's guilt. She felt as though she was the one who deserved to die and that she stole Kasumi's life away from her. She started to see Dr. Maruki in order to help overcome her depression, and after hearing her story, Maruki decided that he needed to take action. With the power of his persona, he subconsciously made Sumire believe that she was Kasumi, as that was what she said would bring her happiness. Once you learn this information, it completely recontextualizes everything you knew about this character beforehand. Sumire has one of the most tragic backstories out of any character in the Persona series. She's someone racked with so much regret and believes that her life has so little value that she'd rather be someone else than herself. When Sumire is reminded of the truth, she completely breaks down and ends up joining Maruki's side initially. She can't accept what happened and doesn't want to live her life with regrets anymore. Sumire's main character arc is learning to no longer run away from the truth and gain the strength to stop living a fake life. No matter what she does, Kasumi isn't coming back to life, and the best way to honor her memory isn't to become just like her. She needs to learn to have faith in her own abilities, and to not let her life be ruled by the desire to be someone that she isn't. The last five ranks of her confidant are unlocked after she rejoins the party, and the focus is on Sumire accepting her true self. While she initially struggles to get over her instinct of mimicking Kasumi, she does eventually realize that she can no longer live in the shadow of her deceased sister. The best way to honor Kasumi 
would be to accomplish their shared dream, but only if Samiri does it in her own way. I really like this character, which is something I certainly wasn't expecting. If you've seen my past videos, then you know that I'm not usually a fan of the added content Atlas puts in their re-releases. The prime example of this would be Marie from Persona 4. When Samiri was first introduced as Kasumi, I'll admit, I was a bit worried. I think Atlas did a great job at subverting people's expectations for this character and crafted a compelling story out of it. She's a far more interesting and thoughtful character than what I was initially expecting. It tackles the idea that Persona is known for, but it's done in a refreshing way. She desperately wanted to become like her older sister because she was everything that Sumire wanted in her life. She wanted the respect, fame, and talent that her sister had, but this obsession was what caused her to spiral down in a pit of depression. I find Sumire to be a relatable character to some degree. I have, in the past, struggled with the idea of feeling inferior to my older siblings. Seeing that they're far more talented and successful in life than I am is really disheartening, but something I can remind myself of are my own accomplishments or my own skill. I don't have to be like them or compare our successes to find happiness. I should be proud of who I am and not try to be someone I'm not. So yeah, you can probably see as to why I was surprised with the overall quality of Samiri's character, but in my opinion, this isn't even the best part of the third semester. I think it's time that we end this and talk about the complexities of Dr. Maruki and the questions his character asks. Dr. Maruki is easily the best written antagonist in the entire game, and I'm fully willing to go a step further and call him my favorite Persona antagonist. Notice how I didn't say the word villain. Unlike every other antagonist presented in this game, Maruki is someone who is genuinely trying to make the world a better place for everyone. To reference his confidant again, he's using cognitive science to locate and eliminate emotional pain. When he gains access to his persona Azathoth, along with full control over reality itself, he puts his plan into motion. The way he eliminates emotional pain is by giving everyone what they desperately desire, ranging from achieving their dreams, bringing back dead family members, or even removing traumatizing moments from someone's life. Sumire is the best demonstration of Maruki's viewpoint. She's someone who felt inferior. She's racked with survivor's guilt and thinks no one cares for her. She desperately wants to be someone she isn't. Maruki grants her wish to become Kasumi because that's what would make her happy, and as shown throughout the game, it really does have a positive effect on her. It isn't until she's reminded of how unfair the old reality is when Sumire breaks down. So clearly his methods work, right? Sumire was happy living her lie and he helped remove her emotional pain. There's a more obscure example of Maruki's actualization that raises an interesting question. Through a text conversation, we learn that one of Yusuke's colleagues is no longer painting and instead is participating in archery. In this reality, it seems as though their painting history never existed. So clearly, Maruki looked into this person's brain and saw that archery was their dream and made it their reality. However, wasn't it the failure of achieving the archery dream what caused this person to discover a new love in painting? Is a world where failure doesn't exist something that would benefit everyone? The entire point of growing from pain and failure is to learn how to deal with those emotions more effectively. So would it be better if we never had to deal with those emotions? While Maruki has good intentions, he ultimately ends up being very similar to Yaldabaoth when you really think about it. With Maruki in control of your life, you're exchanging your free will for the sake of happiness. While it's an easy way to avoid suffering, suffering and failure, you're ultimately doing nothing but running away from your problems. That's the flaw in Maruki's reality, and the reason why the Phantom Thieves disagree with it. While they were happy getting what they wanted out of Maruki's world, they can't deny that they've grown and changed into better people thanks to their heartbreak. Life can't always go your way, and that's okay. If there's something you really want but couldn't get, you can always find happiness elsewhere. Where the Phantom Thieves and Maruki fundamentally disagree is their use of the cognitive world. The Phantom Thieves change the hearts of criminals so that they can inspire people to stand up for themselves. It gives people the opportunity to be be the change that they want to see in the world. Maruki instead wants people to hide away from their problems and put faith in him. He tries to reassure people that everything will be alright as long as they let him help. On a side note, I just want to bring up how fantastic Akechi is throughout the third semester. It finally answers my question of what Akechi's true personality is like. He comes off as tired and believes that the best solution to a problem would be to just deal with it outright, even if that means getting his hands dirty. And I greatly appreciate that at no point they try to redeem Akechi as a person. He's a bad guy who's done terrible things to the Phantom Thieves, but they have to put aside their differences so that they can stand up against a greater power. I really just like how to the point he acts, and Robbie Damon does a great job with 
with the performance. The most interesting aspect of Akechi from the third semester is just how disgusted he is with Maruki's reality. Even if it means he might not exist anymore, he stands up against the new world because in his mind, he would rather be dead than live in a world designed to cater to him. He spent his life living under the control of Shido and Yaldabaoth, and he doesn't want to live under the will of Maruki. Even if it means death, Akechi wants to carve his own path in life because at the very least it was his decision to make. That's pretty badass if you ask me. Maruki's palace does a great job at fleshing out his ideals alongside giving us full context into his motivations. We learn the full story of what happened to his fiance, Rumi. When she was traumatized from her family's incident, Maruki became extremely distressed at the sight. This caused him to awaken to a fraction of his persona's ability, and he used it to change Rumi's cognition so that she'd forget about what happened. However, this came with the consequence of permanently wiping Maruki from her memory. While he was initially shocked, he decided to play along with it for the sake of her happiness. He gave up his own dreams so that someone else could achieve theirs. This is why Maruki is such a compelling antagonist for me. He wants to help everyone avoid emotional struggles, but at the end of the day, all he's doing is projecting his own fears onto everyone else. Maruki is afraid that if he faces his emotions, he won't be able to come back from it. It's something that takes until facing the Phantom Thieves for him to finally understand. Maruki desperately holds out hope that he can convince the group that their life would be better off in his reality. This is shown perfectly in the dialogue as well as the boss theme. Throw Away Your Mask is without a doubt my favorite song in the entire game. The main message of this piece is Maruki's attempt to appeal to the Phantom Thieves by telling them that their dreams can finally be achievable, as long as they let their guard down and allow him to fix their lives. The most powerful scene in the game for me has to be the aftermath of his boss battle. Despite the Phantom Thieves overpowering Maruki and defeating his ultimate persona, Adam Kadmon, Maruki still can't fully grasp where he went wrong. With the help of Joker, Maruki is able to finally realize that he's just been using his reality as nothing but an excuse to run away from facing his emotions. Once Maruki reaches his understanding, the only thing he requests now is for Joker to help him kill his regrets. No personas, no masks, just two people venting their frustrations through a fist fight. This is why the third semester is my favorite part of the game. Dr. Maruki, at the end of the day, is an incredibly sympathetic and relatable person. His character arc is learning that while life can be cruel and unforgiving, it'll all work out in the end as long as you don't lose hope. Failure and emotional pain is okay. What makes us grow as people is how we respond to it. But most importantly, if something doesn't work out, there's no harm in starting over and going down a new path in life. The third semester is pretty powerful, and it's honestly shocking at how well executed it is. It asks some genuinely very interesting questions, while also having the most fleshed out antagonist and the most emotional impact. A consequence that comes from this level of quality is that it really highlights how lackluster the other antagonists are. I understand the idea of saving your best for last, but I think that no palace ruler comes even close to the depth and complexity as Maruki. The only real complaint I have is that at this point in the game, random encounters are meaningless because you can instantly kill them with Ryuji's ability, so it's pretty weak on the gameplay side of things. You're mostly playing through this for the story, and it's a fantastic story, but much like the rest of Persona 5, I wish the game was designed with the confidant abilities in mind. So, in conclusion, I think that Persona 5 Royal is a pretty good game overall. It's not my favorite in the series, but it's definitely up there for me, and I think that this game gets an unnecessary amount of hate at points. I'm not saying that you're not allowed to dislike Persona 5, but I see people out there treating this game as if it's the worst in the series, and if you made it this far into the video, I think you can safely assume that I don't agree with that statement. Persona 5 is not a perfect video game. The gameplay flaws in Royal specifically are a big issue. There's a lot of combat and dungeon crawling done in Persona 5, so the fact that the gameplay experience offers very little challenge can potentially make the overall experience very boring. Not every character is used to their fullest potential, and some are just poorly executed. And the confidants, while good, are far more formulaic this time around, and only a few stand out as particularly great. However, Persona 5's heart is in the right place, and more often than not, I find that the game shines in multiple ways. I really like the main cast of characters, the game is solid mechanically speaking and has some pretty good level design, and I personally get a lot out of the themes that are presented. Since Persona 5's original North American release back in 2017, the game along with the rest of the series has been thrusted into popularity. The thing about mainstream success is that it comes with a few consequences. I've met a lot of really cool people thanks to Persona 5, and I love hearing how this game had a personal impact on them. However, when there's a massive influx of new fans, there will always be a vocal minority of new players that are a bit overzealous with their enjoyment. 
Entertainment. Combine this with Atlas's tendencies to capitalize on their popular games, and you'll notice that Persona 5's reception has been shifting over time. There's no doubt that there are people who legitimately just don't like Persona 5 that much, and that's totally fine, but I've been noticing that people are taking their frustrations towards that vocal minority of Persona 5 fans and letting that influence their opinion towards the game itself. There were a surprising amount of people that were expecting me to shit all over this game, and I can't begin to tell you why. I always make sure to stay honest with myself and you viewers throughout all of my videos. I don't make these videos just to give people the opinions that they want to hear. In my point of view, Persona 5 stands heads and shoulders with the other titles in the series. I'll even go as far as to say that it stands above the other games in some areas, which is why it's so frustrating to see people overlook the legitimately great aspects of Persona 5 and only focus on the dumb small parts of the game that have little effect on the game's overall quality in order to prove that it's a bad game. It's good to be critical of the things you like, but you shouldn't give out criticism just for the sake of it. You also need to acknowledge the positive aspects of a piece of media, and in Persona 5's case, the highs heavily outweigh the lows. I just hope that when the dust finally settles, we can look back at Persona 5 with the same amount of fondness as we do with the previous games and truly appreciate the good times that it brought us.